And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense. Welcome to the fear you can hear. But mostly, welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. In this story, you're going to meet what some people call a shutterbug. You know what a shutterbug is. The kind of person who never goes anywhere without a camera swinging from a strap around his neck. Who is never content unless they're aiming a lens in your direction, whether you want to be photographed or not. But unfortunately, this particular bug is the kind that many people want to crush under their feet. Our mystery drama, A Choice of Witnesses, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Paul Hecht. It begins on a warm day in early spring, the kind of day which tempts office workers to leave their desks and stroll through the nearest park on the noon hour. Among the strollers is an amiable young man named Gordon Bailey, who is enjoying the sunshine so much that he's taken a sandwich lunch to a park bench. He knows it's not going to be a very good sandwich, his wife, Pam, prepared it with her own loving hands. And even after two years of marriage, Pam seems unable to cope with even a hard-boiled egg. Oh, uh, excuse me, mister. Okay if I sit down here? Oh, yeah, sure. Plenty of room. Thanks. <laughs> nice day, isn't it? Yeah. It's about time we had some good weather. That's a good idea. I mean, uh, bringing your lunch to the park. Oh, that's my wife's idea. We're on an economy drive. Yeah, money's tight these days. Very tight. Um, what line of work did you say you were in? Oh, I think I said I was in the insurance business. No kidding. Well, now, that's what I call a good business. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> hey, that ought to be a cute picture, huh? That little squirrel up there, cute as a bug, huh? Well, you like to take pictures of squirrels? Oh, me, I like to take pictures of everything. In fact, I do this for a living. Oh, you're a professional photographer? A kind of. I make a buck out of it sometimes. I suppose you sell pictures to the newspapers? Oh, no, no. I never sold no pictures of the papers. I sell them to people. Well, well I guess I'll be uh, heading back for work. Uh, wait just a minute, Mr. Bailey. I don't remember telling you my name. I guess I know your name on account of the badge. Badge? What are you talking about? The badge you wore at the convention at the hotel in Atlantic City. Oh, wait a minute. You were at the insurance convention last month? Yeah, I was there. I get a lot of good pictures at conventions. Some of my best. I see. <laughs> or uh, maybe I don't. Well, you know how it is. A bunch of guys get away from home, away from the wife. They do a lot of crazy things. Oh, uh... Would you like to see the picture? Of uh, the insurance convention? I'll tell you the truth, Mr. Uh, My name is Kellerman. Frankly, I just don't understand why you'd be carrying around pictures of a bunch of drunken insurance men. <laughs> yeah, you were gassed, all right. I've never seen anybody more gassed than you were, Mr. Bailey. 
You don't mean you have pictures of me? Yeah. That's what I was trying to tell you. You like to see them? They're real beauts. I don't think I ever took better, Mr. Bailey. All right. All right. Let me see them. Oh, yeah, sure. Here they are. I'm in my pocket here. Yeah. Look at this one. Oh, no. She was really stacked, huh? How did you get this? Well, I told you with my trusty little camera. But how? Hey, come on. What do you think? I'm not giving away no professional secrets. You were in that hotel room? Hey, she let you into that room, didn't she? You must have been hiding someplace. Hey, 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 hey. don't do that. Don't tear that What do you up? think I'm going to do with them? Oh, come on, Mr. Bailey. You know I got negatives. I can print up 2,000 of them if I want. What is this? Blackmail or something? Nah, nah, nah. It's like a business deal, that's all. I figured I got some pictures that you want to buy. And I got them to sell. How much did you pay her for the privilege of being in that room? The question is, how much are you willing to pay? I mean, so your wife don't get a complete set. Look, are you willing to sell me the negatives? I didn't say that. I got a different kind of deal of mine. You know what would happen if I told the police about this? Well, a guy did that to me once. It was a meat packers convention. He called the cops. They hauled me in. I said I was just a photographer working the convention. That's all. I was selling pictures of the guys there. He couldn't prove nothing against me on a account of you know why. It was true. I am a photographer. I do work conventions. I sell regular type pictures, too. But they're not as profitable as these, are they? You know, that guy became one of my steadiest customers. Only then his wife divorced him anyway. He wouldn't make no more payments. Payments? Are you saying this is a regular thing? How much you iron at that insurance company? I figure a young guy like you, they pay about uh, 15, 18,000 a year, am I right? Listen to me, Kellerman. The woman at that convention, I... I didn't want to get mixed up with her. I, I was just so tight, I, I didn't know what I was doing. Ah, oh, hey, you don't have to tell me about stuff like that, Mr. Bailey. I've been around plenty. I know how guys no, are. No, 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 you don't understand. Look, I, I'm only married two years. I, I love my wife very much. And the only reason I got into that stupid mess was... It was because of my boss. I, I didn't want to insult him. He... He was drunker than I was. Oh, come on, Mr. Bailey. You don't have to explain nothing to me. I know you don't want that nice little wife of yours to see these dirty pictures. And I don't want to show them to her. Believe me. She'd never understand. Pam would never... Listen. Listen, I'll tell you what. I I'll give you a flat price for the negatives, and that'll be it. Understand? I, I got a nice bonus recently. I'll give you uh, 300 cash tomorrow afternoon. How does that sound? Now, listen to me, Mr. Bailey. People are real funny about this kind of business. They never believe a guy like me can, well, like, be honest, you know? Honest? <laughs> That's some word. Well, Come what on. I mean is, they always think that if they pay me a flat fee, I'll be coming back at them again. You see what I mean? Even if I did give you the negatives, you'd figure if I had copies someplace that I could hit you again any time, right? Look, I'm willing to take your word for it. Nah, Mr. Bailey, nah. You just spend the rest of your life worrying about me coming back, am I right? But this way, you just make one small payment to me every month, like you pay the electric bill at a rent, you know? How much? How much do I have to pay? I figure you for about, uh, 40 bucks a month. Now, that's not so terrible, is it? Just 40 bucks a month? How do you collect the money? Oh, in person, Mr. Bailey. I just go around to all my customers once a month, and I collect in person. <laughs> it's better that way, believe me. Forty dollars. It's 480 a year, you never miss it. And everything will just be fine between you and the missus. That you, honey? Yeah, it's me. Hey, shut up, you mutt. Hi, darling. Yeah. Don't be quiet, Lockjaw. It's your Lord and Master. I'm sorry I'm late. I decided to do a little Christmas shopping after work. I forgot how long it takes to fight those crowds. Oh! What a gorgeous package. Is that something for me? Never mind. <laughs> well, just in case it is, here's a big kiss in advance. Mm. Hey, you smell good. Is that a new perfume? Mm -mm. It's the same old stuff. The one I'm practically out of. 
Hint, hint, hint. Oh, cut out that hinting. I've already spent more money than I should. Oh, uh, speaking of money, that man was here. What man? Well, you know, the one that comes around every month. That Mr. Uh, Kellerman. Kellerman? What the heck was he doing here? It's only the 19th. Well, I don't know, Gordon, but he was here just the same, looking for you. What did he say? Nothing. Just that he'd be back later. Later today? Mm-hmm. You know, Gordon, I just can't bear that awful little man. Did you ever get a look at his eyes? And that camera he wears around his neck. Listen, is he going to be coming around every single month? I told you, honey, he's collecting payments on the car. Well, why can't you make the payments by mail? Well, because that's the way he likes it. Maybe he moves around a lot. Well, he gives me the creeps. Honey, I'm feeding the dog. Yeah, okay, I got it. Oh, it's you. Evening, Mr. Bailey. I heard you came earlier today. Yeah, but you aren't home yet. Hope I didn't disturb your wife too much. Look, we'll talk in the hallway. Oh, yeah, of course. All right. What's this early visit all about? You going away for the holidays? Oh, no, I never go anywhere this time of year. This is one of my busiest times of year, you know? Yeah, I can imagine. I get some of my best pictures around, huh? You'd be surprised. You know how it is. People get all filled up with the Christmas spirit. All right, all right, get to the point. You want your payment now? Well, I wouldn't mind, of course, but uh, that's not the reason I came around, Mr. Bailey. You see, I want to tell you that uh, the payments are going to go up. What? I really hate to do it, but it's the inflation, you know? Everything costs more, food, clothing, film, gasoline. I just got to have an increase, Mr. Bailey, I'm sorry. How much of an increase? Well, just another $15 a month. Fifteen? Terrific. Now it's 55 What's it going to be a couple of months from now? Shut up, Lockjaw. Hey, excuse me, Mr. Bailey? Yeah. What, it, what can I do for you? Uh, may I talk to you for a moment? Do, do I know you? Uh, no, I don't think you do. My name is Bliss. Uh, Dave Bliss. Yeah? Uh, look, can we sit down and talk a minute? Well, it's kind of chilly. Why don't we talk standing up? I'm trying to walk my dog, and so far he's he's been a non-performer. Well, I want to talk to you about... Ed Kellerman. I don't know any Ed Kellerman. Well, I know you do, Mr. Bailey. I made it my business to find out. Now, I'm not asking what he's got on you, Mr. Bailey. I'm sorry, you're making a mistake. It doesn't matter. I won't ask you why Kellerman is blackmailing you. I expect you'd do as much for me. Only, would you mind telling me how much you pay him? He hits me for 60 a month. Used to be 40. Price went up last month. 55. You mind paying it? <laughs> of course I mind. So do I. I'd mind if it was 10 bucks a month. And not just because of the money. I hate that slimy man, and I'm sure you hate him as much as I do. Now that's why I wanted to talk to you about putting a stop to him. A permanent stop. You mean going to the police? No. That's not good enough. I'm talking about killing him. Every problem has a solution, they say. And Mr. Dave Bliss seems to have arrived at his. The obvious question here is, do two wrongs make a right? We'll find out what Mr. Gordon Bailey thinks about that dilemma when we return shortly with Act Two. Blackmail is an interesting, if dishonorable, crime. It has the unusual facility of making the criminal feel virtuous himself. After all, he's only punishing wrongdoers by making them pay for their sins. But the profession has some serious drawbacks. For one thing, it inspires one's victims to think in drastic terms. 
And when there are more than one victim, and they meet, well... Mr. Bliss, I know how you must feel about Kellerman, and you're right. He is one of the slimiest characters who ever crawled out from under a rock. Those eyes. You ever get a look at his eyes, Mr. Bailey? My wife can't stand the sight of him. Well, I'm not married. It's my job he's threatening. Is it your marriage he's after? Uh, never mind. I don't want to know any details. None of us know each other's problems. None of us? You mean you know others beside me? I know others. How oh, come? Cool. Well, I made it my business to find others. Oh. One day when I got fed to the teeth with Mr. Kellerman and his payments and his wet eyes, I decided to find out more about our friend. So when he left one day, I followed him. Uh-huh. Followed him on his rounds. And that's how you found me. Yeah, that's right. You're in the root book, Mr. Bailey, just like all the rest of us. How many are there? Now, there's no way of telling for sure... All I managed to find was a dozen, an even dozen. The man really gets around. He keeps raising his price. Do you know that? He's only had me in his bag for about six months. This is my fifth. But others I've spoken to, they say he raises the ante every few months. Three of the people I've talked to are paying well over a hundred. Mr. Kellerman does very well, that's obvious. Yeah, too well. (laughs) You know something? It's funny, but... Well, it's kind of a relief to know that I'm not alone. Yes. That's what I felt at first. Misery loves company. But the satisfaction doesn't last, Mr. Bailey. You still live every day of your life with that sword over your head. I know, I know. But it's still not a reason for using words like... like killing. Don't you know that's the only possible way to deal with a blackmailer? I wouldn't know. Kellerman's my first... Well, think about it. No, no, you must have thought about it already. You wouldn't be human if you hadn't thought about it. It crossed my mind. Not that I should kill Kellerman, just the wish that he were dead. That someone else would kill him. Yeah. I guess I wouldn't shed too many tears. You just didn't want to dirty your own hands. I didn't want to take care of one problem and have another one even worse. And don't tell me that doesn't make sense. The only thing that makes sense is making Kellerman a corpse. I'm sorry. I'm just not interested in anything like that. The others weren't either. Not at first. But now. Now they all are. All? Look, what are you talking about? We all want to get rid of Kellerman. We want to kill him. And so do you. That's a lie. You hate his guts as much as we do, Mr. Bailey. Why don't you admit it? Of course I hate him, but that doesn't mean I'm... It doesn't mean I'm ready to commit murder. Well, we're ready, Mr. Bailey. And you better be, too. Ready for what? To commit murder. If you don't mind my saying it, uh, perfect murder. Perfect? Foolproof. I'm sorry. Look, that's a stupid dream, and you know it. Ah, uh, you won't say that after you've heard the idea. Everybody who sets out to commit a crime thinks it's foolproof. They wouldn't commit it otherwise. Right now, all I want to know is if you'll cooperate. That's easy. No. Why not? Because murder is worse than blackmail, that's why. Well, this isn't murder. We're going to erase a human mistake. Forget it. Look, I'll make believe I never heard you say it. Come on. Come on, Lockjaw. Come on, girl. Let's get our business over with. There wasn't one person on the list I didn't have to convince. But when I told them that there was no chance of any of us being caught, that's when they dropped their objections. All right. What foolproof scheme for murder do you have? It's foolproof because it won't be murder. It'll be an accident. If anyone gets into trouble, it'll be me. Just me. I'm going to kill Kellerman with my car when he's making the rounds one night. I have the time and place all figured out just before midnight on Carroll Street. An accident? Right. So now you know the favor I'm doing you. I'm taking the risk all by myself. You think the police are that stupid? Murderers get caught even when they frame accidents. Oh, this is different. Why? Because of the witnesses. What? I'm going to have witnesses. A lot of them. All disinterested parties. Nothing to connect them with each other. And they'll all tell exactly the same story. What they saw, 
how it was all Kellerman's fault, getting hit by my car. All right, all right, all right, stop. Don't tell me any more. You've already told me too much. No, you've got to hear the rest of it. You're a part of this like everyone else. Don't you see the beauty of it? Safety in numbers? If you ask me, you'll all get caught. No, no. Don't you understand? When a group of citizens all testify exactly the same way, I mean, reliable citizens from every walk of life, <laughs> you ought to meet some of Kellerman's victims. One is a college professor, two are doctors, there are four housewives, a bartender who owns his own joint, one working stiff, one person in city government. Uh, you might as well know, that's me. Bliss. Wait a minute, I've seen your name. Something about the Transportation Authority? One of them is in the insurance business. Uh. They're all with me, Mr. Bailey. Every one of them has agreed. So many witnesses to one accident? Well, we won't need everyone. Some of them won't be asked any questions by the police, but they'll all be there just the same. Uh, we'd like you there, too. You're nuts. Do you know that? You and, and, and the rest of... I won't have any part of this. Don't you see? It can't miss. It doesn't matter. I don't want to have any part in killing a man. <laughs> How come, Mr. Bailey? Have you got religious scruples or something? Maybe. You've got scruples, but you did something rotten enough to make you a blackmailer's victim. I didn't commit murder. Look, you got a good idea about getting everyone together. Maybe, maybe if we all went to the police. Oh, no way. Whatever it is you don't want known about yourself, my friend, it'll come out the minute Kellerman gets arrested. Now, now my way is better. I can't buy it. Look, I'm sorry, my dog is getting tired and so am I. Come on, come on, Lancho. Now, wait a minute now. You want my advice, Bliss? Don't go through with this. Find some other way. There has to be one. Goodbye. Bailey. Yeah? What if we do it? You'll be sorry, that's what. Sorry? Why? Because you'll tell the police the truth? I didn't say that. Goodbye, Mr. Bliss. Hello. Evening, Mr. Bailey. How are you? I'm all right, Bliss. What do you want? You going to be busy tomorrow night? What do you mean, busy? Well, some of the gang are getting together tomorrow night. At the corner of Carroll Street and 9th Avenue, about 9.30. How about coming down? You might see something interesting. Look, you can't go through with this. We're all in it together, remember? You might not have to do a thing. Just stand there and see it happen. That ought to be satisfying all by itself. I won't be there. Well, we'd sure like to have you, Bailey. You won't get away with this. Nobody ever does. Oh, shut up, Lockjaw. What's the matter with you tonight? Gordon? Yeah? Do you think Lockjaw's all right? She keeps staring at the door and growling. I don't know. Must hear the neighbors or something. Oh, maybe she's waiting to bark at that man, the collector, you know? Kellerman? Uh-huh. Isn't he coming tonight? He usually comes on the last Sunday of the month, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, yeah, usually. Well, I doubt if he'll be here tonight. It's almost 11 now. Oh, <laughs> I didn't realize it was that late. You haven't done much this evening. Don't you feel all right? Yeah, sure, sure, I, I'm all right. Well, you... You just seem to be, well, waiting. Was it for that man? Because if it was, well, I'm, I'm sure he's not coming, honey. I think we ought to go to bed, listen yeah. to the news or something. Oh, the news. Yeah, I guess it's on right now, isn't it? Just about. You want me to turn it on here? Yeah, sure, would you? Okay. The conference, now postponed until February, will include top officials from both nations. <laughs> on the local front. A man who has been identified as Edward Kellerman of 1811 Sudworth Avenue. Shh, Gordon, do you suppose he's the same man? automobile tonight on the corner of Carroll Street and 9th Avenue. The driver of the car, city administration official David Bliss, was released after questioning. Five witnesses on the scene of the accident testified that Kellerman had stepped into the automobile's path For as it rounded the corner. Sake. In sports, the Golden Warriors Shut it bounced our home. Uh, Gordon... Do you suppose it's that man, the collector? You think that's the reason he didn't come around tonight? That would be a good enough reason, wouldn't it? If he was dead, 
lying in the middle of the street, dead. You look so strange. Gordon, did you like that man? If you want to know the truth, Pam, I hated him. You did? Why? Just on general principles. Oh, I really don't understand you sometimes, Gordon. Uh, hand, me, hand me the phone book, huh? Okay. Thanks. Here. Right. You gonna call somebody? Uh, honey, uh, why don't you go to bed? I, I'll be in in a few minutes. Yeah, but, but who are you calling? Just someone I know. Uh, someone who knew Kellerman. Oh, I see. To find out if they know about what happened to him, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. Okay, honey, I'll go in then. I'm feeling a little tired. Yeah, so am I. I'll be right. Good night, sweetheart. Uh -huh. Good night. David Bliss? Yes, who's this? Gordon Bailey. What do you want? I heard the news tonight. About Kellerman. Well, you don't have to thank me. I did it for myself. And you did go through with it, eh? You can relax now, friend. You've just saved yourself 55 bucks a month, maybe a lot more. Your remittance man won't be coming around again. You ought to go out and celebrate. I know what I ought to do. What's that? So long, Bliss. I just wanted to make sure. Hey, Bailey. Obviously, there's one thing you can say for David Bliss. He's a man of his word. And because Mr. Bliss kept his word, two indifferent interns are now lifting the mortal remains of Mr. Edward Kellerman and depositing them in the efficient cold filing cabinet of the city morgue awaiting for someone to claim the body. But who cares about a dead blackmailer? Possibly Mr. Gordon Bailey. We'll find out shortly when I return with Act Three. David Bliss and company managed to commit the perfect crime. So it seems, since the death certificate for Edward Kellerman simply states the cause of death as accidental, at least a dozen people know otherwise, but they remain silent, feeling not grief, but relief. The only one who finds it difficult to maintain that silence is the one victim of Ed Kellerman who was not on the corner of Carroll Street and Ninth Avenue that fateful night. Honey, do you know it's almost two o'clock in the morning? Oh, is it? Really? Yeah, you know, I honestly think you are coming down with something. A virus, maybe. Pam, will you please stop fussing? You're beginning to sound like my mother. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to do that. I'm just trying to get you to go to sleep. You've got a job to go to tomorrow. You know, it's funny about my mother. When I was growing up, she made me feel that there was something... I don't know, something so profound about religion. Well, if you ask me, she just likes the bingo games. My father was that way, too. But ne neither one of them really seemed to live their religion. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, they talked about loving their neighbors and so forth, but they didn't love them at all. They were always saying the nastiest things about them. Well, that's how people are. When I was in my teens, I used to call them hypocrites. Now, I just wonder if I'm any different than they were. I really don't think I am. Different how? Well, about things like the Ten Commandments, for instance. I wonder if there's one I haven't broken. I hope you haven't coveted your neighbor's wife. That's about the only one I can remember. I remember them all. You do? Yeah, I won a prize in Bible class when I was only eight for reciting all of them. Thou shalt not this... Thou shalt not that? There are only eight shalt nots. Thou shalt have no other gods beside me. Thou shalt not worship any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not kill. Yeah, sure. I'll have that file completed in time for the meeting. Right, oh, Phil. Bye. Oh, Sylvia, did you reach that number yet? 
No. Okay, well, buzz me if you do. All right, now, let's see about that actuarial table. Hello. All right, Bailey. What is it now? Hello, Mr. Bliss. I've been having a lot of trouble reaching you this morning. Well, I haven't been at my desk. I was wondering if you might be free for lunch. Sorry. I'd really like a chance to talk to you. About what? About some mutual friends of ours. If we're talking about the same thing, Bailey, they're not mutual friends. They're all strangers, complete strangers, just like you and me. Well, that's something I'd like to rectify. Would you have lunch with me, all right? All right. Where? I suppose we meet somewhere halfway. Uh, I know you're in the City Hall area. I'm on Wall Street. How about uh, Mercury's? Do you know it? I'll see you there at 12.30. That's fine. All right, Bailey, let's have it. You don't want a social lunch. You have something on your mind. You're right. Something I can't get off my mind. How about our old friend Kellerman, I suppose? You remember what you said about him? How he was a sword hanging over your head? So? He's still that for me, Mr. Bliss. He is exactly that. Kellerman is dead. He won't be ringing your doorbell anymore. How come you're not grateful for that? If Kellerman had really been hit by a car, if he had a heart attack or something, yes, I admit I would be glad about it. I would have gone out and celebrated. I would have slept very well at night. But the way things are, I'm not sleeping at all. Try pills. I'm just sorry you ever came up to me in that park. If I didn't... If I didn't know it was going to happen the way it happened, it never would have bothered me. But I do know. And it bothers me too much. So? The thing is, I don't know if I can live with it. You want to be more specific? I don't know if I can spend the rest of my life with this thing on my conscience. Your conscience? <laughs> Look... You had nothing to do with Kellerman's death. I don't know what you think Kellerman had on me, Bliss, but it wasn't anything illegal. Just immoral, right? It was something stupid I did. Well, there was nothing stupid about what we did. Wasn't it? Are you really so sure you've committed the perfect murder? Shut up! Don't you ever use that word in front of me. You're still afraid, aren't you? Afraid of being found out. It can't happen. Not as long as we all stick together. Oh, safety in numbers, right? When the police came, they only questioned four of them. Every single one told the same story. There was no reason to doubt their word. Why should there be? Because there was no connection between them. Right. They were all strangers. Nothing to tie them to each other. Except Kellerman. What about the records he might have kept? His, his little black notebook, for instance. Oh, we thought of that, too. First thing we did when we went to his body was lift that book right out of his pocket. Oh, what about the apartment? What about all the stuff he had there? The second thing we lifted was the key to his apartment. One of our guys, a Joe, the bartender, went straight there. He cleaned out every scrap of paper in the place, every single one of his rotten photographs. You were very thorough, weren't you? Yeah. We were thorough, Bailey. And you ought to be grateful, not worried. But I am worried. I'm worrying about whether or not I should... Go on. Whether or not you should what? Bailey, are you thinking about going to the police? It occurred to me. You mean you'd turn me in? I don't know. I just don't know. Did it ever occur to you to turn Kellerman in? Yes, often. But did you? No. Why not? Wasn't he committing a crime? Wasn't he disturbing your precious sleep, too? Yes, yes, he but was. But you didn't turn him in because you were afraid for yourself. Isn't that the truth? Yes. I suppose so. So all this morality of yours, this conscience you talk about, you didn't discover you had any until Kellerman was gone, until he was no longer a threat to you. Isn't that true? I still say blackmail isn't murder. Bailey... I've got news for you. 
I wasn't going to tell you this unless it was absolutely necessary. Tell me what? Kellerman may be gone, but his photographs are still around. What? You heard me. We have all of Kellerman's negatives, all the dirty pictures he ever took. Most of them have been returned to his victims. Everyone who cooperated with us. I see. That means we have your pictures, too, my friend. You understand? And if I don't cooperate, I get a new blackmailer. Is no, that it? No, no, that isn't the way it is at all. Kellerman bled you, Bailey. Every month he came whistling up to your front door asking for money. More and more money all the time. But that's over now. Done and finished. So what you're saying is, if I go to the police, the photographs go where I don't want them to go. I'm sorry to use Kellerman's own tactics, but you're forcing my hand. Bailey, please use your head. You've got nothing to gain and everything to lose. Somebody's done you a favor. The only way to show your gratitude is to forget it. What do you say? Well, I'll think about it. That's all I can tell you. Want any more coffee, honey? No, thanks. You look so... so tense, Gordon. Yeah, I guess I have been acting pretty jumpy tonight. Well, you've hardly said two words to me since you came home. The thing is... I've been thinking a lot, Pam. About what? About... whether I had the nerve to tell you something. Something that happened about... well, seven months ago. What do you mean? Pam... you remember that insurance convention I went to? Back in July, in Atlantic City? Of course I remember. I, I couldn't go with you because of Mother being in the hospital. I wish you had been with me. Then nothing would have happened. Ha what what did happen? Did, did you get into some kind of trouble? Yeah. Yeah, I got myself into trouble by, by being stupid, by drinking too much and letting Hal Emmons drink too much. Emmons? You mean your supervisor? I, I was still new on the job. You remember, Pam, I wanted to make good. Yeah? I was afraid of Emmons taking a dislike to me, afraid of crossing him. And we both got drunk that second night. Emmons insisted that we pick up these girls oh, at the bar. Gordon! Park. Honey, I swear, I, I didn't want anything to do with it. I, <laughs> I wasn't the least bit interested, but, you know, Emmons is the kind of guy who uses conventions to swing a little, you know, I... I told him I was crazy about my wife, that home cooking was good enough for me, but he just pressured me, Pam. Oh, Pam, can I make you understand? Well, go on. What happened? Well, we brought the girls upstairs. Oops. They had adjoining rooms. They were professionals, you see. Gordon. Oh, honey. Gordon, why do you have to tell me about this? Please don't cry. I wouldn't have known if you hadn't told me. It's on my conscience, Pam. Your conscience? Oh, sure, I could have kept my mouth shut, but... Well, I guess I, I needed to tell you. I guess I wanted you to know so that you could forgive me. Gordon. I've been tortured about it for months. Honey, you have no idea what torture it's been for me. But that's the dumbest thing of all. Don't you think I would have forgiven you a long time ago? Yeah. Oh, please. Hold me, Gordon. Honey, please. please. It'll never happen again, honey. I swear. <laughs> Oh, dear. darn it. Yeah, I was just getting cozy. Okay, I'll, I'll get it. Hello. Mr. Bailey, Dave Bliss here. What do you want? I have something for you, a present. What is it? About half a dozen photographs and the original negatives. I decided they really belong to you. Uh, that if you knew you were really out of danger, you'd sleep a great deal better. Do you want them? All right. Uh, put them in my mail, uh, to my office. And have some secretary open them by mistake? No, I don't think you'd care for that. Well, you could mark it personal. Supposing I hand them over in person, tonight. Whereabouts? Well, right now I'm in a bar called Adam and Eve's on 12th and Walnut. I'll be here for another hour if you can make it. Otherwise... Well, it'll have to be some other time, that's all. Oh, well. All right. All right, I'll be there in half an hour. Gordon, you're not going out. Just for a little while, honey. I got some client business. 
Besides, I can use a little fresh air. You're not still feeling bad, are you? No, no. I, I, I feel just fine. I never felt better. Maybe I'm crazy to do this, Bailey. Maybe I'm putting my neck into a noose, giving you back these photographs. And why are you doing it? Because of what you said to me. You said I was just becoming another blackmailer, another Kellerman. And I guess you were right. If I held on to these, I'd have become the very thing I despised. Well, I give you credit for honesty, Bliss. I hope that having these will change your mind about going to the police. I hope you'll realize that I did the right thing, that we all did the right thing. I can't answer that. Then you're still thinking about it? You want to know something? I told my wife tonight about these. What? I told her all about the girl in Atlantic City. She knows exactly what happened. Oh, that doesn't mean to say she wouldn't be horrified to see it in black and white. That's why I'm glad to have these pictures. What else can I say but thanks? You could say that you won't go to the police, ever. Sorry. I can't make any promises. Ah, uh, yeah. I was afraid you felt that way. Well, let's have another drink, okay? No, no, not for me. Just one more. Hey, Joey. Coming. Really, I, I, I have to be going. My wife's waiting at home for me. What'll it be, Mr. Bliss? It's trouble, Joey. All the trouble we can handle. Yeah. I figured it had to be. Hey. Hey, what is this? Sit right there, mister. Put that gun away. Oh, my God, Bliss, what are you doing? Go on, Joey. All right, all right, all right. Let's get the story straight now. What happened here, Joey? Well, look, Sergeant, you know me. You know I don't like trouble in my joint. Well, what did the guy do? Try to hold you up? That's right. He'd come in, he sat down at the bar, he pulled out a forty-five and stuck it in my gut. Boy, that's a strange one, all right. I mean, the guy was some kind of insurance executive. Is that so right here on his business Well, he card. must have gone off his nuts, Sergeant. Look, you can ask anybody, all of my customers. This gentleman right here was at the bar. Yes, officer. My name is David Bliss. I'm with the city, officer, and the bartender's right. The guy just sat down and pulled out the gun. Yeah, that's true. And when the bartender tried to grab it away from him, it went off. What's your name, lady? Mrs. Edith Chester. It was a pure case of self-defense, Sergeant. I'm just glad nobody else got hurt, you know. Yeah, yeah, you were lucky, Joey. You were all lucky. Okay, I'll need some statements now from some of you other witnesses. <laughs> And so, for poor Gordon Bailey, there was no safety in numbers, only extinction. We admit that this is a grim demonstration of the old saying that, in union, there is strength. But we sincerely trust that justice finally prevailed. I'll be back shortly. If there's a moral to this story, it might be that eyewitnesses can't always be trusted, even when they're being honest. Of course, we don't worry about your eyes on this program. We're interested in your ears, and we have good news for you. Many thousands of ears are now listening to these exercises in imagination. We hope you'll continue to be and ear witness. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Evie Juster, Ralph Bell, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. And, as you may suspect, I have a tale to tell. A tale full of sound and terror and uh, signifying... Well, I'll have to leave that to you. And I also ask your indulgence when I personalize this strange riddle... Because this story was brought directly to me. Ever since I've been your host on this series, I have the feeling that you expect me to be an expert on the macabre. But I must confess to a sense of surprise when I was buttonholed by a young man the other day who said, Excuse me, Mr. Marshall, but I have a coffin that I'm sure will interest you. You cannot frighten me. I am not leaving this graveyard until I get to the bottom of this. I warn you. Your persistence will be your destruction. I still trust in the Lord. Where... where is that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. Our mystery drama, A Coffin for the Devil, was especially adapted for the Mystery Theater by Murray Burnett and stars Keir DeLay. What do you do when a perfect stranger tells you he has a coffin which might interest you? My first instinct was to tell a young man that I wasn't in the market for coffins. But he quickly explained that he wasn't a salesman, but an avid listener to our series, and that he had a macabre story of a strange coffin that had been in his family for generations. I was intrigued. So the next night, I found myself in his old suburban house, drinking coffee with his wife, Cora, and his friend, Professor Gerald Barker, and looking at a large wooden box, which appeared to me to be a case for a bass fiddle. This box... Although you may not believe it, Mr. Marshall, is a coffin. And this letter, which my wife, Cora, found in the attic, explains how it came in our family and also how it happens that I'm not today a mortician. It was written by my great-grandfather, whose name was also William Spindles. And the letter begins... I, William Spindles, swear this to be a true and honest account of the strange happenings that befell me when I was employed by Edward Rogers, the undertaker, in the year 1851. The month was December, and Mr. Rogers and his good wife, paying pre-Christmas visits, had left me in charge of the shop. It was a cold night and blowing hard, but my good friend Richard Clay and I were snug enough with a big fire going in the stove. Only for you, William Spindles, would I spend a stormy night like this sitting in an undertaker's parlor. Ah, come on now, Dick. You've kept me company often enough to know that there's no harm in corpses. Well, it's not the corpses that worry me. It's it's their spirits that may be around. There's no such thing as spirits, Mr. Rogers says, that there's no harm in the dead. The harm is in people's minds. Oh, maybe. Maybe. Uh, What's that? Someone's at the door. Come in. Oh, I don't like this. I'll see who it is. sir. Come in. You'll catch your death of cold standing out there. I'm sorry to disturb you on a night like this, but my need is urgent. I require a coffin. Yes, sir. Did you have a particular type in mind? Very or... particular. I know exactly what I need. Well, we have a complete stock in the next room. Now, if you'll follow me... No I... need. You won't have it in stock. We carry the most complete line in the state. That's why I have come here. Well, thank you. Now, if you'll tell me who the coffin is for, I'll be able to help you better. For me. For for you? You mean it's for your own your own personal use? Exactly. Uh, I can see you're going to be busy, Bill, so I'll run along. Oh, no, 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 no need to leave, Dick. This gentleman will have to come back tomorrow and see Mr. Rogers, so I... I cannot return. Well, Mr. Rogers, the proprietor, and I honestly believe you'll be better served if you wait for him. I can draw you the way the coffin must be. Here. Here's fifty dollars. Will that cover it? But I... Uh, goodbye, Bill. I really must leave. Amy's expecting me. Is the fifty dollars enough? It's not the money I was thinking of. It's the special requirements you mentioned. I'm not sure I can handle them. I said I'd draw it. Do you have paper? I guess so. I... 
Uh, here's a pencil. I have my own. Now, the shape must be exactly like this. Just so. But that doesn't look like a coffin at all. It's, it's more like the case for a musical instrument. I know my needs. Oh, never in my life have I seen or heard of a coffin such as you ask for. It but... must be exactly the way I've drawn it. Very well. Now, it must also have lids and hinges. Hinges? Right. Hinges. You see them. Here, on the drawing. Yes, but you... And a lock on the inside. The... The inside? And a good quality lock. Secure. Nothing shoddy, you understand? I believe I do. Good. Now, if you have a tape measure, I want you to measure me around. But... But why? I mean, the drawing is... It's unusual. It's very clear. I want to make sure that you leave enough room for my arms. I really don't know how I'm going to explain this to Mr. Rogers. Show him the drawing. Now, take my measurements. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, now leave enough room for y your arms. Now, make sure that this is ready by Friday. But that's the day after tomorrow. I must have it. I'm sorry to be so particular, but I've been buried before. And this time, I want to have it my own way. Bill! Bill! Are you in there? Just a minute. I'm opening the door. Lucy! What are you doing here? Are you all right? Is he still here? What are you talking about? Dick told me about that strange man who came here. Dick was really scared. He said the man wanted to order his own coffin. That's right, but I'm sure it was some kind of practical joke. Well, I don't care what it was. I want you to find another job. I hate the idea of your being an undertaker. Lucy, we've been through this before, and this job is no different than any other except in people's minds. I'm sorry, Bill. I'm sorry. I was just so frightened. And all the way over here, I was just worried about you and, and, and scared, but, but I came anyway, and now... Oh, Bill... I don't think it's going to work. Oh, I'd like to punch Dick Clay right in the nose for frightening you like that. Oh, I... Don't blame Dick. It's not his fault. If he hadn't scared you, you wouldn't have... Yes, I would. Maybe I wouldn't have come here tonight, but I hate what you're doing. I hate it. I know, honey. What do you want me to do? Quit. And do what? Oh, I don't care. What will you live on? Well, you'll find another job. Nowhere near as much money. I don't care about the money. Bill, can't you understand... I don't want hands touching me that have been touching death all day. All right, Lucy. Uh, I'll speak to Mr. Rogers about leaving. Good morning, Bill. Good morning. Now, what's all this about some excitement you had here last night? Well, good morning, Mr. Rogers. I guess Dick Clay has been busy gossiping again. Well, I don't know whether it came from Dick or not. But I heard it from the barber, some ridiculous claptrap about a walking cadaver ordering its own coffin. Well, sir, what happened was unusual. How so? Take a look at this. Hmm? This is a drawing made by the gentleman who ordered this coffin. Hmm. Remarkable. Looks something like a carrying case for a, a, a bass fiddle. Yes, sir, it looks that way to me also. It must be ready tomorrow evening. You're worried about something, aren't you, Bill? Yes, sir. Something to do with this special order? I suppose so, in a way. Mr. Rogers, I'm sorry to tell you that I'm going to have to leave here. What? You mean because of last night? Only partially. It's really because of Lucy. Oh. I suppose she's upset about the idea of marrying a mortician. Hmm? Uh, more than upset. She's... Well, she practically gave me a choice. Either this job or her. I wouldn't worry about that if I were you, Bill. Now, you're not me and you're not engaged to Lucy. I'm sorry, Bill. It's just that I've been there before. I had the same problem with Mrs. Rogers before we got married. Well, what did you do? Before I answer that, how do you feel about the business? I mean, would you stay on if Lucy would marry you? I think so. Bill, you know I have no son. No one to carry on. I've never said it, but I think you know how I feel about you and what hopes I have that you might be the one to carry on. Until today, I thought you felt the same way. 
I don't think I can change Lucy's mind. Of course you can't. But you just said that... You can't. But Mrs. Rogers can. Now, ask Lucy to talk with her, woman to woman. That's your best bet. My wife knows all the problems and she has all the answers. I never thought of that. All the same, I... I wish you'd been here last night. It was... Well, the only word I can use to describe what happened is weird. Because he ordered a coffin for himself? That, plus the way he came in and... And then the strange shape he insisted on. But most of all, because he appeared to be driven. Almost as if he were compelled to do what he was doing. What he felt or didn't feel isn't important, Bill. What matters is whether you've changed the way you think about death. I don't follow you. You have to see dying for what it is, Bill. Life's ultimate destination. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's just an inescapable fact. In the course of my life, I've met a lot of people. And I'm good at judging them. And up until now, I thought of you as a no-nonsense, feet-on-the-ground, level-headed young man. But, sir, you didn't see this man. You, you didn't hear the terrible desperation he had I've in I've seen and heard almost everything since I started some 18 years ago. This poor fellow who ordered his coffin from you last night was obviously deranged. No question about it. Deranged. I hope you're right, sir. Of course I'm right. What other conclusion can there be? The one I can't get out of my head. He told me he'd been buried once before. And this time, he means to have it his own way. Oh, very good. Very good indeed. You find that amusing? Now I understand everything. <laughs> that coffin he ordered is nothing but a big fiddle case. Uh, a double bass box. And he must be a musician. They're the very devil for playing practical jokes. Don't you see? This is nothing but a practical joke. A joke on whom, sir? How should I know? Some fellow musician. No, I'm sorry, sir. I just can't believe that. Why not? Why wouldn't he have told me so? Why would he try to scare the daylights out of me and then pay fifty dollars? Fifty whole dollars, besides. Ah, well. I expect we'll have the answer to that tomorrow evening when he comes to get his coffin. That is, if he comes at all. Oh, he'll be here, I'm sure of that. I just pray that we won't be sorry when he comes. <laughs> When the reading stopped, I looked at the faces in that sane and sensible 20th century living room. Spindle's wife, Cora, was wide-eyed. Professor Barker's lips were pursed and his eyes were skeptical. My eyes were drawn automatically to the subject of the letter. The large, strangely shaped coffin that stood in the corner of the living room. And I could understand the fear that had gripped that 19th century William Spindle's. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. I suppose to the three inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, one could add the right of a man to order his own handmade coffin. Most of us, I believe, would find the thought distasteful but the feeling that prevailed among us in the living room of William Spindles was one of curiosity. We were all anxious for him to continue reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather. I must confess that my work suffered during that day. My thoughts were not on what I was doing, but on what the evening would bring and what Mr. Rogers would make of the stranger when he came to call for his coffin. The day passed somehow. Bill, when did this customer of yours say he'd be back? Early in the evening. Now, nah, we'll give him another half hour and then we'll lock up. Uh, that won't help if he wants to pick it up. What does that mean, young man? Someone tampered with the coffin and we don't know who. We only have Sam's word that the coffin was tampered with. But he's our best workman. Well, like everyone else around here, I'm sure he's been infected with the idea that there's something strange about this order for a coffin in the shape of a bass fiddle. At last, he's arrived. Those wraps didn't come from the door. Nonsense. Of course they did. It's cold out there. He wants to come in. I'll prove it to you. I'll open the door. No need. He's letting himself in. Sir? Sir, there... There's no one at the door. Get hold of yourself, Bill. Must have been a draft that blew the door open. I'll close it myself. Good evening, uh, Mr. Rogers. Is my order ready? Well, good evening, sir. Come in, come in. The box you ordered is ready. Thank you. My dear sir, you really should wear a greatcoat and a muffler in this bitter weather. 
Do you catch cold? Where is my coffin? Ah, that's it in the corner. Mm-hmm. Satisfactory? Very satisfactory. Is there a good secure lock on the inside? You may open the lid and see for yourself. That way you can also test the hinges. Hmm. Well, the make of the lock is unknown to me. Is it a good one? We never have had a single complaint about any of our coffins. So I'd heard. Now then, where would you like it sent? I'll take it with me. My dear sir, it's much too heavy for one man to carry. I'll manage. Perhaps you have a horse and cart outside. We can help you get it off. That won't be necessary. May I have your name? My name is of no importance. Sir, I'm a reputable undertaker. I must keep my records in order. Any name you choose will do. Come now, sir. I see through your little joke, and I don't disapprove, but you must... Joke? Mr. Rogers, if there's any joke being played here, it's on me. So, I'll take my coffin and be on my way. But, sir, you can't just walk out of here with a... Thanks to you for your efforts, and I wish you gentlemen good night's sleep. Sir, come back. Let him go. For the love of heaven, let him go, Mr. Rogers. He he lifted that box as if it were as light as a feather. Get your coat. What for? To follow him, Bill. Couldn't you see the man is ill? We're the ones who are going to be ill if we follow him. Stop babbling and get into your coat. All right, I'll, all right, I'll go with you. I don't want you following that, that spirit alone, but I tell you, he's not mortal. He is, he is, and he's sick, mentally ill. Hurry. How far do we follow him? As far as he goes. No, sir, I... I won't, because I believe his destination is hell. There he goes. Around the corner, down Green Tree Lane. Uh, oh, yeah, I see him. Where can he be heading? There are no houses after a block of Green Tree Lane. But there's the cemetery. Didn't I tell you he was deranged? The cemetery gate's locked. The locks never bothered spirits. Then he's no spirit. Didn't he ask for a lock on the coffin? Oh, let him go, Mr. Rogers, please. Hurry up, hurry up before we lose him. Mr. Rogers, if we do catch up to him, what in heaven's name do you want of him? Find out who he is, where he lives, and get him safely home. Then I shall call a doctor to attend him. There he goes, heading directly for the cemetery gate. Confound it. What's happened to the moon? A cloud just passed in front of it. No matter. Even if we can't see him, we shall catch up when he finds the gate locked. Here comes the moonlight, and here's the gate. Where did he go? Well, he must have gone in. <clears throat> Gate's locked. Uh, well, I have my key. You, you don't intend to go in, do you? Of course. Come on, come on. Uh, no, sir. There. There. Isn't that our man? Moving among the trees over there near the Addison Mausoleum? Mr. Rogers, I've had enough of this. I'm going home. And allow that poor soul to do himself some kind of mischief? Sir, that poor soul, as you call him, is a person I I want nothing to do with. I don't know whether he's man, ghost, or devil, but whatever he is, and whatever his business is in the cemetery, I want no part of it. Bill, when a man's dead, he's dead. I've never seen a man or woman come to life again. I'm a God-fearing man, and I go by the Bible. Doesn't the good book say dust to dust? The Bible says a lot of things, but I remember no mention of men who could lift a heavy coffin as if it were a pillow and pass through locked gates without leaving a sound to say nothing of a man ordering his own coffin. Very well. Very well, Bill. You can stay or leave. I'm going after him. I beg of you. Close the gate. I beg you, Mr. Rogers, leave this be and come home with me. Close the gate and make sure it's locked. At this point, Bill Spindle stopped reading and put down the letter. My reaction was shared by his wife, Cora, who almost screamed at him. Don't tell me the letter stops there, and we're not going to find out what happened. The the reason I stopped is because the story my great-grandfather was telling up to now was his. But it now changes. At this point, he is writing not what he saw, but what he heard, as he puts it in the letter. Perhaps I was a coward, but I allowed Mr. Rogers to go on into the graveyard alone while I hurried home. So I warn the reader of this letter. This portion of my tale is written here as it was told to me by Mr. Rogers. The moon again had gone behind the clouds when young Spindles went hurrying off. 
But I thought I saw some light in or around the big Addison tomb. I started that way, and then I heard what seemed to be the voice of the man I was following. But it seemed to come from far off. Too far. You have come too far. On a useless journey, Edward Rogers. Turn back before it's too late. Where are you, sir? Listen to me. Thrice they tried, and thrice they died. Where are you? What are you doing with your coffin? Leave here, Edward Rogers. Your business with the dead is finished. You don't belong here. And what do you do here? I keep an age-old bargain. With whom? You must leave here. This place is dangerous for you. But not for you? Leave before it's too late. The Lord will protect me. Now let me help you. (laughs) Don't you understand? You're ill. You need help. So be it, Edward Rogers. You want to join in a dance of death. The consequences will be on your head. Here. I show myself to you. Here I am. See if you can catch me. It was then that I started after him. I could see him almost clearly. He seemed to be heading for the Addison tomb. He was carrying the coffin, and I was certain I could overtake him. But he kept dodging behind headstones. I turned and twisted after him. And then my foot caught. I lost my balance and fell, hitting my head against the tombstone. Dick, wake up, wake Uh, up, man. uh, 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 Bill, Bill, what do you want? Get dressed. You've got to come to the cemetery with me. What? The cemetery? Are you out of your mind? Mr. Rogers went in there after the man who ordered the coffin. He isn't home yet, and Mrs. Rogers is worried. Then take her. Come on, Dick. I'll be with you. I wouldn't care if the whole town was with us. What time is it? Four o'clock. It will soon be light. Please, Dick, you must. All right, all right. I'll get dressed and I'll go with you, but we'll wait for the dawn. But Mr. Rogers may be in trouble. Bill, whatever has happened has happened. I'll go with you, but not until it's light. Oh, my head. It hurts. Where... Where am I? Where you do not belong. Oh. It's you. Where's your coffin? Where it belongs. Good, good. Come, come. I'll take you home. You need more help than I do. I'll be all right. I was fortunate. It was just a glancing blow. I'll take you to the gate. See that you get there safely. You've changed. Why are you now worried about me? I admire your courage. You were concerned about me. Now I return the favor. No, no, no. You tried to frighten me before. For your own good. You're still in danger. From whom? From the damned. Sir, I don't know who you are or where you're from. But I'll swear you're of this world. There are no such things as ghosts. I know that's what you believe. I wish with all my heart that you were right. What's that music? Do you hear it? I do. What is it? It doesn't belong here in a graveyard. You're wrong. It's the only place it can be heard. And not by everyone. Come. Come, the gate is this way. No, no, I am not leaving until I get to the bottom of I this. I warn you, your persistence will be your destruction. I still put my trust in the Lord. Where's that music coming from? From beyond the grave. Is it Judgment Day? No. Then you talk nonsense. The dead will rise. The Lord will summon his elect to meet him in the clouds. But until that day, the dead remain buried. And quiet? And quiet. Oh, foolish man. I will not be able to protect you much longer. Go home now, while you can. I will, if you'll first allow me to take you to your home. Can't you understand? My home is here. Tommy Rot. I must go. I have work to do. You've been warned. My conscience is clear. As I turned my head to see where he went, I felt dizzy. The blow had evidently been more serious than I thought. When my head cleared, I could still hear the music. And I thought I saw a light... I walked toward the light. It seemed to come from the Addison tomb. As I approached, I could see that the door to the mausoleum was open. I was convinced that inside was the source of the music. It grew louder with every step I took. And then I found myself at the door to the tomb. And there, just inside, I saw the large coffin the stranger had ordered. The lid was wide open. But the moment I took one step inside... The lid slammed shut, and the music stopped. I thought the coffin had been empty, but I couldn't be sure. I walked over to it and bent down and listened. 
I heard the key turn in the lock, and I called out, You mustn't lock yourself in. You mustn't. Please, open the coffin. He wouldn't listen, so I determined to get the coffin open. When suddenly, there was a flash of light and a loud explosion. Bill, I can't see anyone in there. Mr. Rogers must have gone home. I can't see the whole cemetery from outside. We'll have to go in. The gate's locked. I have a key. Oh, look, we really have to go on. It's practically daylight. There's nothing to be afraid of. Well, I hear you, but I'm still shivering. Yeah, it's the cold. Come on. Hey, you seem to know where you're going. Oh, I shouldn't have left him. If any harm has befallen him, I'll never forgive myself. Well, he shouldn't have been here at all. The last I saw of Mr. Rogers, he was heading for the Addison tomb. I have a feeling that if we find him at all, that's where he'll be. There's the tomb now. Oh, the door's open. Should it be? Uh, we'll find out. Wait. Wait. Suppose suppose there's something in that tomb that waited for Mr. Rogers, and now it's waiting for us. If you don't want to come in, you can wait here, but I'm going into that tomb. All right. All right. I'll come with you. Good Lord. There he is, lying across that coffin. And, and so still. Is he... Is he dead? I don't know. But there's only one way to find out. I can offer no explanation, but I can tell you that the words of a letter written more than 100 years ago had cast a spell over all of us. A spell that had transported us back to a small 19th century graveyard. I'll be back in a moment with the strange end to this strange tale. Like many time-worn sayings, the old adage, curiosity killed the cat, but satisfaction brought it back, still contains more than a few grains of truth. Certainly all of us sitting in the William Spindle's living room that night were anxiously waiting for him to resume reading the letter from his great-great-grandfather, but he further whetted our curiosity by prefacing his reading with this explanation. I think it's important to tell you that this next portion of the letter is an eyewitness account not what was told to my ancestor, but what he experienced himself. So, uh, if you're all ready, I'll continue. After Mr. Rogers told me what had happened to him that night in the cemetery, I was still undecided about leaving the undertaking business, although my dear Lucy was at me every day to give my notice. And then, one morning, Mr. Rogers called me to his office. Sit down, Bill. I think we should have a talk. Yes, Mr. Rogers. My wife tells me that Lucy hasn't been to see her. Have you spoken again to Lucy about discussing your future here with Emily? No, sir. You still believe that our strange customer was a ghost? Let's say I'm still undecided. What's that? Probably someone who wants to see me. Come in. Should I get the door? Don't bother. I'll go. Good morning, gentlemen. It's you. It is indeed I. And I'm not sure how long I'll be permitted to stay. Long enough, I hope, to give me an explanation of your actions the other night. That is why I'm here. Good. Perhaps you'll start by telling I me... I come here, sir, at great personal risk. I ask you to believe me. I beg you to listen and keep an open mind. I believe I'm a fair man. Since you're a native of this town, you must know of the Addison family. Of course. Old Thaddeus Addison owned the leather and dye plant. He did. And do you remember a young man named Tom Addison, one of Thaddeus's three sons? Mm, I never knew the young rascal. Everyone heard about him, of course. He was a ne'er-do-well who finally ran away. That's what my father wanted everyone to believe. Hold on. Are you trying to tell me you're Tom Addison? My father wanted me to go into the factory. I couldn't abide the thought. In all modesty, I had a great talent for music, particularly the bass. A talent which my father felt was foolishness. All of our quarrels came because I wanted to practice my music and my father thought it was a waste of time and money. Then you are young Addison. I am. And I am not. Not in the sense that you mean. I suppose you can explain that. The situation between my father and me became unbearable. He finally gave me an ultimatum. 
Either I go into the business, abandon my music, or he'd turn me out of the house. I really had no choice. I left. Mm -hmm. And what brought you back? The very same thing that took me away. Music. When my father disowned me, I wandered around the country trying to earn my living as a musician. It wasn't easy. One day, I found someone who valued my musicianship. I made a bargain with him. Who was he? He goes by many names. Take your choice. Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, or the prince of darkness. Rubbish. You believe in the Lord. Why do you find it so difficult to believe in the devil? I'm a God-fearing man. The devil has no power over me. Not unless you invade his realm, as you did the other night. All I did the other night was my duty, as an undertaker and as a man. How can I make you see the horrors that lie ahead of you if you will not listen? What will change your foolish obstinacy so that you can save yourself? Are you so insensible that if I tell you what I have suffered and am suffering... You'll still close your mind to what I say? I promise to listen, and I will. Ten years ago, I was in Chicago, living in a cold and miserable garret, hungry, alone, and with no hope of employment. In order to get something to eat, I knew I'd have to pawn my fiddle. Just before venturing out, I wanted to play it one last time, when suddenly, I thought I'd lost my mind because... Not only was I hearing my own instrument, but it was joined. Joined by a full symphony. And he was there. Satan? And he offered me the fulfillment of a dream. I would never have to worry about money again. And I could concentrate on my music. It dazzled me. The prospect of a life I'd always hoped for. And what did he ask in return? Your soul? Nothing so dramatic. What seemed a simple, harmless request. All he asked is that I play for him whenever and wherever he should ask. I hesitated, but only for a moment. How I wish I had thought longer on it, but I didn't. I agreed. And now I'm his forever. A member of his Orchestra of the Damned. And the letter closes as follows. That was the day I left the undertaking establishment of Edward Rogers. I have no way of knowing whether Mr. Rogers believed the story told by the man who claimed to be Tom Addison. I never saw nor heard from the stranger again. Nor do I know whether Mr. Rogers did. Signed, William Spindles. Now, what do you make of that? I'll take the ladies first. Cora, as my wife, what do you think? <laughs> There's one thing I know, darling. I'm glad you're not an undertaker, because if you were, I wouldn't be your wife. Ah, you feel the same way as my ancestors, girl. Lucy. Emphatically. Jerry, you're the scientist here. Well, history isn't a science, thank heaven, but I do have some questions. First, how did the coffin come into your possession? Well, that's simple. When Mr. Rogers died at the ripe old age of 89, he left a sizable bequest in his will to my great-grandfather with the proviso that we keep the coffin as a memento. But why would he do that? Now, that, Cora, is an excellent question. If he insisted that the coffin remain in your family as part of his bequest, I think he must have had a reason. In other words, you don't believe that the stranger was a ghost. Let's say I'm dead set against the idea of ghosts playing symphonic music in a graveyard at night. Well, I believe he was the ghost of Tom Addison. Well, how do you explain Rogers leaving the coffin to the Spindles family? Simple. Rogers was probably hurt by Bill's refusal to stay in the business. And he wanted the coffin to remind him. Sorry, darling, that won't work. If he was hurt, why also leave my ancestor a bundle? And believe me, it was a considerable sum. Well, then why did he, Bill? Mm, I'm stumped. <laughs> it's too much for me. I still don't believe in ghosts, and I think I can prove to you that this man who ordered the coffin was flesh and blood. How? Well, I'm going to have to do a little research. When did you say all these things happened? Uh, the date, I mean. December 1851, why? Well, give me two days, and I'll let you know. I have solved the mystery of our peculiarly shaped coffin. Good. How? I kept asking myself, why did this man go to all the trouble of ordering a coffin, which, to say the least, was strange, and also behave as if he wanted everyone to believe he was a ghost? But if he forgotten Mr. Rogers' belief that he was crazy, 
I mean, wouldn't that account for all his behavior? Yes, that would, but I preferred to think of this fellow as a con man. You see? A really great con man who successfully conned your grandfather but had more difficulty with the undertaker. Why? Precisely. Why? Now, that's where this newspaper article comes in. Here, I made a copy at the library. Let me read it to you. The headline, Wells Fargo Payroll Stolen. Ah, uh-huh. then it goes on. Yesterday, the largest robbery in the history of the Wells Fargo Company was successfully perpetrated by three masked men who boarded the westbound Lackawanna Limited, entered the baggage car, and made off with more than $40,000 in $10, $20, and $50 bills. So, it goes into more detail, but there you have it. There you have it. You've lost me. Now, don't you see? The robbers needed a safe place to hide the money. And you think that they decided to use a coffin as a hiding place. Remember, our man insisted on a strong lock on the inside. That's true, but that would be one way of making sure that no one opened this peculiar coffin by mistake and found a wad of tens, twenties, and fifties that had been stolen from Wells Fargo. But according to the letter, Mr. Rogers found the coffin in the cemetery. And it was open, and, and, and there was nothing in there. That's right, that's right. Rogers followed the stranger right from the funeral parlor to the cemetery. He wouldn't have had time to stash the loot in there. Uh, I think it's interesting, but rather far-fetched. Is it? Look how everything fits. All that uproar in the cemetery. All the warnings to Rogers telling him to keep away. Why? I'm sorry. You're so convinced your theory is right, you're not thinking straight. Once your man knows Rogers was going to interfere, he'd never have taken the chance of hiding anything there. Well, he may have had no choice. What do you mean? The money may have already been there. Look, have you forgotten that your grandfather's letter said that the workmen believed the coffin had been tampered with? Oh, Jerry, you're riding a hobby horse. Oh. You have a theory, and you're just going to see that everything fits. And you're not going to look at anything that doesn't. Now, wait a minute. What have I left out? Well, lots of things. Now, one... How in the world did our stranger lift this coffin and carry it off under his arm? Perhaps he didn't. (laughs) You mean you think Bill's grandfather made that part up? Well, let's leave that. Uh, Anything else? Well, lots. What about everything that happened to Mr. Rogers in the cemetery? The music, the open coffin... What's your explanation for that? Well, we know that Rogers fell down and hit his head. Oh, come off it, Jer. You're not going to try and tell us that he imagined those things as a result of hitting his head. Well, it's it's possible. Maybe, I don't but... believe it. The other explanation, which you refuse even to think about, Jerry, is that he was a ghost and that Mr. Rogers reported everything faithfully. That's the one I believe. Even if I prove to you that this strange-looking coffin has plenty of room for some kind of secret compartment and there may be money in it? Why don't we stop talking and see if you can prove what you think? All right, good idea. Come on. How do we go about finding a secret compartment? Well, we'll try tapping and listen for a hollow sound. Okay. Who wants to do the tapping? Me, let me. All right, go right ahead. Ah, it all sounds the same. You're too impatient. If there's a secret compartment, he'd make it hard to find. Right. Ah, dear. (laughs) It's a great theory, Jer. I'm afraid it's just a theory. Why don't you try down at the bottom, where it's widest? Okay. There. (gasps) Right there. Does that sound different? I think so. Go back there again, Cora. That's it. Uh, Let's turn it upside down. Here. You have to... Let us do that, Cora. That's got it now. Now what? Well, I think we should have opened the lid first. Okay, let's open it. All right, now, put your hand down in there, Bill. Feel around carefully. I mean, um, around the joint in the wood. Yes. Do you feel anything? Nothing. I I can't. (gasps) You got it! You got it! (laughs) Jerry was right. It's a compartment. Well, is there anything in there? This. Money? A $20 bill? Well, there must be more. No, the, just the one bill. But wait, wait. Here's a note. <gasps> well, what does it say? Wait a second. It's hard to read. Dear Bill, or descendants of William Spindles, you having found the secret hiding place should know by now that I was right when I insisted that there were no such things as ghosts. I was also right when I told you, Bill, that there was a fortune to be made in the undertaking business, as is proven by my bequest. God bless you and your family 
Signed, Edward Rogers. What do you do when you discover that the fortune you expected turns out to be a single $20 bill? Well, if you're William Spindles, you advance the idea that Edward Rogers had indeed found the Wells Fargo loot in the coffin and taken all of it except the one bill. Is there another explanation? I think so. And I'll be back with it in just a moment. For what it is worth, I present you with this thought. There never was any Wells Fargo money in the coffin to begin with. Edward Rogers had obviously been a man of strong beliefs... And he took this way of proving to Bill Spindles or his children that there are no such things as ghosts and that there was money to be made in the undertaking business. Did the Spindles accept my explanation? I really don't know. How about you? Our cast included Keir DeLay, Marion Seldes, William Redfield, Peter Collins, and Nat Pullen. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. It's the time of Halloween... When evil spirits abound, ghouls and ghosts, pariahs and phenomena, witches and warlocks, vampires, werewolves, poltergeists, emanations, phantasmagoria, and crawling things too awful to imagine. All the outcasts from the natural world, not only the supernatural and the dead, but the half-dead, the haunting army of the lost. Between two worlds. Our mystery drama, Absolute Zero, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jada Rowland. we are to believe St. Peter that God is no respecter of persons, then it is one thing the Almighty has in common with death. No money, no power, no wisdom or guile can circumvent those dread wings once they fold about you. Or can you escape the shadow of finality? Long before the dawn of this 20th century, men had wondered and tried and failed. But with the turn of the century and the giant leaps forward in medical knowledge, did it become a possibility? Or was it still only an illusion? Come away, Miles. In a moment, George. Of course you must weep for Emily, but not sorrow. She's gone home, you know. What? To her eternal rest. Oh, my dear old friend, how can I comfort a man who's just lost the wife he adored? I need no comfort. In this case, I believe my kind of doctorate to be more capable of prescription than yours. Oh, Reverend Dr. Arbister, I cannot agree with your diagnosis. I've lost my wife, not myself. And the last thing I need in this world or the next is divine guidance. <laughs> I'd have been hard put to describe my emotional state. Grief. Terrible, drenching, stifling grief. The death of my mother. Even though it had been expected. Killed. That I hadn't been with her during the last agonizing months. That I had been coward enough to accept my stepfather's offer to run away to school in Europe. 
and pity for him. Because Dr. Miles Hendon had been a loving husband my mother always deserved. And a good father to me ever since my own papa had died. And perhaps to my shame, frustration. Because I was going to be too late for my own mother's funeral. Excuse me, miss. Uh, are you all right? Can I get you a glass of water? You cannot. Why? Oh, you looked a little pale, as if you were faint. Are you a doctor? <laughs> no, miss. Donald Anson Caton, attorney at law, and at your service. Did you think I looked as if I needed a lawyer? No, I thought you looked as if you needed a friend. I'd rather be left alone. Well, I can do that on the train. I must apologize that we will be at much closer quarters on the coach. What coach? The coach from Hyannis to Orleans. You're going to Orleans? As far as the coach does. You're going to Wellfleet. How do you know? Oh, come, Miss Hendon. You are from a well-known family, particularly in the Cape Cod area. But forgive me, I had no wish to intrude on your privacy. Only a desire to help if I could ease your troubles. I think you could best satisfy both by leaving me alone. I could see him hesitate for a moment at my blunt answer. And in that instant, I had the irrational urge to take back my dismissal. But in the moment of decision, I had waited too late. And with a deep bow, he withdrew. <laughs> And then suddenly the train ride was over. And I was seated next to him in the coach from Hyannis to Orleans. The other four men in the coach seemed to know each other well. And in the intimacy of their conversation, we were locked out and the force thrown together. You all right, Miss Linda? Miss Linda? Uh, I mean, Miss Hendon. My name actually is Russell. I... I didn't mean to be abrupt on the train... It's just... Me. Oh, it's, it's all right. I quite understand. I'm sure you mean well. I hope I did. You, um... You want to talk about your mother? What does that mean? Well, you seem so terribly upset. I thought perhaps talking about it might help. What is there to talk about? She had a... A cancer of the blood. There's a new medical name for it. I don't know. Leukemia? I honestly don't know the name, but it's a... Well, in modern terms, they call it progressive and terminal. How could it have been so quick? Well, so many cancers become wild and untamed, it's hard to anticipate how fatal they can become overnight. And yet... And yet what? Oh, uh... Nothing. Let's just say that I'm an interested bystander and that I'll be staying at the Orleans 1776 house. If you should need any help, you can always reach me there. Ah, uh, Linda, my dear. How nice to see you again. Oh, Reverend Armbruster. Where is Miles? Uh, uh, Dr. Hendon? Uh, your father sends his deep regrets, but... Uh, but what? Uh, well, he... Uh, quite frankly, my dear, ever since... Since your mother's demise, he's become... What shall I say? He's gone into a kind of seclusion. He is expecting me back. Oh, yes, yes. After all, he sent for you. Digger Wells is here with a trap, but the horse threw a shoe. He'll be along any minute. I am too late for my mother's funeral. I'm afraid so, my dear. For the funeral. But not for what else? Well, I would hope there might be a, a sort of memorial service. Why? Well, I... Well, it, it was a somewhat, how should I say, hasty affair. Not altogether satisfying from... Well, in a religious sense, shall we say. No, no, don't let me put it that way. In a ritual fashion is perhaps more precise. But Mama is buried. Oh, yes, yes. I saw her casket into the grave. And my stepfather was there. Beside me, 
Where is he now? Hold up on Slate Island. He's expecting me out there. If you want to go. After coming all the way back from Europe, I haven't much choice. I don't know. It's no place for a young girl under the best of circumstances. That menacing pile of rock. And with your mother gone, the house is a sad and lonely place. I've tried to persuade Miles to leave it and, and come back to the house in Boston. Money should be no problem. Then what is? Uh, ghosts of the past. I, I suppose that's why Miles has chased himself back to the miserable island. And because there he does have something to grasp at. A picture of Emily by the sea. A feeling of her footsteps in the house and the linens of the bedroom. Preoccupation with the dead is a sterile emotion. And he has so much to offer the living. A brilliant doctor. And I don't think it's a healthy place for a young girl to be. He needs me, Reverend Armbruster. And she was my mother. I don't know why, but... I have this uneasy feeling that you should have more company on your trip. You're a perfect old darling. But I don't want you to worry. Mm -hmm. I won't pretend it will be a very happy trip. But what on earth would I have to fear? I was to think a great deal over that exact choice of words during the days to come. But of course... I didn't know, or even suspect that then. My head was much too full with memories of my mother anyway. We're most all the ways to home about now. I know. Master should have met you. Why didn't he? Uh, doctor's mighty busy ever since he... Uh, <clears throat> don't see much of him. Busy doing what? I don't rightly know. Turned the turret room and the rest of the top floor into a laboratory after you... Oh, I don't mean to keep bringing it up, Miss Linda. It's all right, Digger. It isn't something any of us can dodge. Where did they... Where is Mama buried? Well, in that uh, fancy marble house your grandfather built in the eastern churchyard. Could we stop there just a moment before we go over to the island? Well, uh, if you want to. I think I would. Ain't nothing to see. She's closed up tight in the coffin. I don't want to see anything. Just feel. I had a cold, shivery feeling. To think of going into that dim, echoey mausoleum my grandfather Russell had built for the family. But I also knew I loved my mother. And I had this overpowering desire to be near where she lay. And just to whisper, Mama, I'm sorry. I didn't want you to die. And I should have had the courage to see you all the way. I was almost ready to say to Digger, forget it. I'll come some other time in the full light of day. Then I reproached myself. What did I expect to see? A ghostly shape? My mother sneaking up in some strange ectoplasmic form from the sealed coffin. I'll come with you, miss, and bring one of the carriage lamps. No, I'll be all right. Still just twilight. Yeah, pretty dark. Right spooky here in the graveyard. Oh, I have nothing to be... Uh, what is it, miss? Look! There, by the sepulcher. Oh, hey, hey, you! Get away from there! What do you want? No, no, Digger, no, leave him. He, he's running away. Yeah, but he, he was trying to break in. I can't believe it. I would not... I, I mean, why would anyone want to break into my mother's tomb? What? I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't guess. Now he's gone, we are going to find out. Listen. Uh, I got the notion you seem to recognize him, Miss Linda. Hmm? Why would I recognize a complete stranger? Come, let's go see if any damage has been done. As they approached the dark tomb, 
Linda knows that she's not being honest with Digger, and certainly not with herself. There's no doubt that it is Don Caton, the young man who introduced himself on the train. Why has Linda's first impulse been to protect him? Has she been right to trust her heart rather than her head? I shall return shortly to pursue that question in Act Two. You are Linda Russell Hendon, back from school in Paris, hastening in a race back to Cape Cod, a race against death, which has claimed your mother. At this moment, of all times in your life, you have met the young man who might be the one you have dreamed of. But it's the wrong time. And worse than that, there is something mysterious about this Don Caton and his seeming familiarity with your family. Who is he? What brings him to the Cape? And most troubling of all, what brought him to the tomb where your mother lies buried? Who was it, Miss Linda? I tell you, Digger, I don't know. I only caught a glimpse of him. Mm, appeared to me you thought you knew him. I thought for a moment I did. But in this half-light... Never mind that now. The important thing is not who it was, but what he wanted. Let's go. Couldn't get much. Tomb sealed up so tight you couldn't get inside without a load of dynamite. <laughs> or a key. Of course, I have a key. Only reason I brought you here. Wouldn't let no one else in but you, Miss Linda. But uh, there's nothing to see. I told you I don't expect to see anything. Just to feel. Oh, but that was before. Let's get the door open. Uh, give me a moment. Yeah. There. Now, there she goes. Yeah. Uh, you, you you take the lantern, uh, give you a bit of light, and I'll stay by the door. What have you got there? A pistol. Ooh, with a prowler around, right smart thing to have handy. Oh, but I'm sure he... Well, perhaps you're right. But if he comes back, don't shoot till we talk to him first. Oh, why would I, Missy? Sheer matter of self-defense. And uh, yours. Thank you, Digger. My mother's coffin was rich mahogany, ornamented in heavy brass, which shone no less brightly than the other sarcophagi on the ledges within the mausoleum. It only had a newer, more recent patina. It was sealed tightly. In the guttering light of the lantern, I could see it was undisturbed. The final proof? a gossamer web of some spider who had already fabricated his own seal to protect my mother's rest. I thanked him silently in my heart and wondered vaguely for a moment what Don Caton, if indeed it was he I had seen, wanted in this place of private sorrow. Beneath my breath, I asked my mother to forgive me for coming home too late. And then I asked Digger to take me home. Bad weather making up. Real nor'easter. Why does father insist on living here now, Digger? Well, uh, reckon you have to ask him that, Miss Hendon. Oh, oh Bertie, <laughs> you see her waiting for you on the dock? Where's Papa? I uh, don't likely know. But he is here on the island. Oh, sure. Only, uh, he keeps himself... To yourself, as fella says. What's that? Oh, uh, them's geese. Better watch dogs and hounds, the master says. It used to use them back in ancient times, he says. Won't no stranger set foot on the island here without they give us warning. Warning against what, Digger? But it's, uh, uh, well, just warning. Uh, person wants his privacy. Oh, now there. Uh, maybe that's what they were trying to tell us. Coming down of a sudden like the fourth of days and nights. Uh, why don't you go below, Miss Linda, till I make fast at the dock? Oh, and thanks, child. 
Uh, let's get you out of that rain and have fine welcome home. I've got to say, Bertie, I don't exactly feel like the prodigal son. Where's Papa? Oh, upstairs, I reckon. Is he expecting me home? Oh, why, sure. But he's not here, not anywhere to meet me. What's wrong with him, Bertie? Is he ill? Now, Lamb, let's get settled first. Here, I'll take your wet things. Oh, Nana, where were we? Oh, your father. No, love, he's hale and hearty enough. Outside. But inside? Well, he took the missus going awful hard, even though everyone knew it had to be sooner or later. But wasn't he looking forward to, to having me home? Oh, well, I don't know how to give that a straight answer. Sometimes I think... I don't know if I just blame him in a way. I think he was scared to look on you again. Why? Why on earth? Well, because your mother has gone to the beyond. There's you, full of health. And anyone looked at the two of you in the bright heat of noonday sunlight, a person would be hard put to know you apart. And that's why Papa isn't here to meet me. Oh, no. Not that alone. Uh, ever since we laid her in the grave, he's took to the turret room and shut off the whole top floor. And he just hides away up there? Oh, Lord knows what he does, but it sure isn't much sleeping. <laughs> My dear sir, in deference to your credentials, I have submitted to this interview and swallowed my impatience at the implications of it. I accept you as a young man eager to do a good job in your chosen profession, Mr. Caton, but I don't like your implication that I am trying to corrupt something. But, uh, Dr. Ferguson, you did sign the death certificate for Mrs. Miles Hendon. Yes, yes, I did, I did. And Dr. Hendon is a close friend of yours. That is beside the point. I signed the death certificate because I was called in to examine a woman who had been my patient for over three months. She was suffering from a cancer of the blood, which was gradually vitiating it to useless water. I will admit that neither I nor my esteemed colleague, Dr. Miles Hendon, her husband, had uh, anticipated the speed and deterioration of the blood in that last week. But you both concur that once this terminal stage uh, set in, death was inevitable. It is the common pattern of the symptomatology. Mm -hmm. And on the last day, the day you signed the death certificate... I examined a woman who had no pulse, who had ceased to aspirate, who reacted to no reflex tests, and who, on thorough oscillation, had not the slightest sign of a heartbeat. I was examining, if you will, a corpse. Naturally, I pronounced her dead. And there was no possibility of any mistake. Sir, by any criterion we have to judge by. No possibility whatsoever. <laughs> Oh, Linda, my dearest daughter. Uh, forgive me for welcoming you so tardily. Oh, it's all right. I don't mind. I just... I just don't understand. Please, Linda, let me mourn your mother in my own way. I offer no excuses. I, I only beg you to allow me to control the conduct of my temporary bereavement. Temporary? Well, death is a bridge between the known and the unknown. Why do we accept without cavil that the traffic must be only one way? What are you talking about? Well, certainly not a subject for your homecoming. Not exactly the term I'd have picked for this return. Oh, why? Surely this is your home. With mother gone? Well, it was and still is hers, too, I hope. Only because she was so ill and wanted to hide from the world. But she never loved this grim old island. Oh, she'll find cause to before I'm done. Miles, father, I know how much you are hurt. The last thing Mama would have asked of you was to become a martyr. To bury yourself here. Uh, you don't understand what you're talking about, child. Better than you, maybe. It was nothing Mother would have wanted, except for her illness, and nothing she would have wanted from or expected of you. Or me. I tell you frankly, I won't stay here. No, but you must. I did come back to try to give you support. I did intend to stay with you a while till the wound had healed. 
I was ashamed of myself for ever allowing Mother and you to talk me into leaving when her time was so short. Linda, she didn't expect. I, the, the doctors, no one expected that it might be so sudden. No excuse. I should have been here to help her. Entertain her. Well, then promise me you'll stay and do the same for me. No. Mother had a reason for running away from life. It was being taken from her. You don't. Staying here is a sickness and I won't baby you. If you won't fight it, I won't stand by you. Oh, if you only knew. Why, Linda, I've just begun to fight and I'm going to win. Win what? Uh, when, when I'm ready to tell you, I'll, I'll show you. And then you'll, you'll thank me for it for the rest of your days. You and my beloved Emily, your mother. You'll stay and you'll see. You'll stay because you must stay. Well, perhaps tonight. That's all I ask, my darling. All I need. Must. We have that music, Mr. Downer. My apologies, Mr. Caton. Reggae from Jamaica. Such a strong beat, so full of life. I find it such a welcome contrast for the necessary preoccupation of an undertaker with death. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to make certain. Now, there was no question of Mrs. Hendon's death. Heavens, no. I mean, we drained the blood. Uh, beg pardon? To prepare for embalming. She was all ready for perfusion. And that is... A preservatory chemical recirculated to guard against, well, any deterioration during the viewing. But there was no viewing. There was not such a pity. A lovely woman, lovely woman. Uh, why? It was the wish of the husband of the deceased. But you did place her in the coffin. That was your responsibility. Well, now, I don't know if I like your tone. But since you pressure me, not exactly. No. Oh, what are you suggesting, Mr. Caton? It is, is unconscionable. I, I will be no part of it. I don't see how you can avoid it, Reverend Armbruster. You were the officiating minister at the burial. But I, I, I mean it. It's preposterous. You've seen my credentials, Reverend Armbruster. You've double-checked on me. And where a large enough sum of money is involved, nothing is preposterous. Or even impossible. But what about the police? Oh, I haven't enough evidence. Even if I had, it would take time to get an authorization from the courts. In the meantime, I am concerned that another life is at stake. I'm asking you, sir. Can you... And will you open Mrs. Hendon's coffin? <sighs> what do you expect to find? Nothing, Reverend Armbruster. Neither her body nor her soul. I expect to find that coffin empty. <laughs> The Reverend George Armbruster gazes at this intense, determined, and completely sure young man. And of all the questions buzzing in his startled mind, surely, as with us, the main question must be, why? Why would he expect to find the coffin empty? I shall return shortly with Act Three. For the moment, the storm, a typical sou'wester, has passed over the Cape, although the rain is still coming down in a steady drizzle. Approaching the mausoleum by total dark, with the damp cedars dripping and the elms and maples rustling in ghost voices to each other, the building looms even more eerily than earlier in the day. And while the Reverend George Armbruster hesitates, thinking about changing his agreement through this strange young man's request on Snake Island, Linda also is regretting her agreement with her stepfather. Who's there? It's me, Digger. Oh, Miss Linda. What are you doing out in this storm? I'll come in the barn, quickly. Oh, thanks. Oh, it's cozy in here. 
Oh, I love the smell of horses. Oh, <laughs> seems like you've got a friend who returns the favor. But not those geese. Well, they, they quiet down once they know you. But they're hell on wheels with strangers. Uh, here, uh, let, let me close the door. I don't want to stay on the island tonight, Digger. I want you to run me over to the mainland. Oh, in this weather? In any weather. I don't want to stay here. Mm -hmm. You uh, told your father... He doesn't want me to go. Oh, then I'm afraid I couldn't take you. Tigger, I don't know why it is. But I'm scared. Huh? You're, uh, you're not afraid of ghosts, are you? Not my mother's. The last person she would harm is me. And she's not here anyway. She lies in the family tomb at Easton. Brave words. Because I was afraid. Of what all of us are most afraid of. The unknown. Ever since I'd come back to the Cape, I had sensed it. Known that something was desperately wrong. I had to fight this unimagined terror rising in my throat. And the feeling that something evil was about to engulf me. No, 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 no. Don't force it. Just... This one last nail and... <coughs> well... Mm. See for yourself. Oh, dear Lord. You were right. Empty. What does it mean? I'm not quite sure, Reverend Armbruster. But you're the detective. You're the only one who suspected... No, no, I'm not a detective, just an insurance adjuster. Anytime a policy is written for a million dollars and death occurs within an unexpectedly short period, the company has to investigate. Dr. Hinden insured his wife for that amount? Yes. When? Oh, just about one year ago. Oh, at that time she was in perfect health. Was she? Well, I... Yes, it, it seems so to me. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a doctor could have known better. I want to know why Mrs. Hendon's remains aren't buried in their own casket. What difference does it make? She's dead. Are you sure? Of course. I saw her so. I ought to bow out, but I'm a stubborn guy. I met her daughter. And I'm just perverse enough to have this big bump of, uh, I don't know what you want to call it, extrasensory perception, maybe, that she's in danger. Of, of what? It's nutty. I, I can't justify it in any way, but I have this insane notion that Mrs. Hendon is somehow still alive. And that it's her daughter, Linda, who is in danger of ending up dead. <laughs> It's Birdie, dear. Oh, come in. I just brought you up one of my old toddies to help put you to sleep. I don't feel much like sleeping. Where's my stepfather? Oh, still locked up above there in his chemistry laboratory or whatever it is. Does he know I want to see him? Oh, well, Digger must have told him. I don't want to stay here tonight, Birdie. I want to get off this island. Oh, now, darling. It's a terrible night out. No time to make the crossing. Where would you go? I just have this terrible feeling I shouldn't stay here tonight. Look, what you need is a good night's rest. At your age, that makes a world of difference. Now, come on. Drink the old drink I used to brew for you. Chocolate, my secret ingredient. All those years you were growing up, it always made you sleep like a top. All right, Bertie. No sense in trying to run tonight. I'll wait for tomorrow. Want me to help you into bed? I think maybe I'm a little too old to tuck in anymore, Bertie. Oh. But I promise to drink my drink. Oh, well, good night, then, dear. And sweet dreams. Sweet dreams. In hindsight, that was the most cynical statement since the serpent said to Eve in the Bible that she and Adam should eat the apple because then they would be as gods. But I can't blame Bertie or even Digger. 
because I truly believe they did not know my drink was drugged. I might, as it happened, have slept through all that dreadful night. And what was to happen to me if it hadn't been for the geese and their warning cries? What's that? The geese, sir. Now, what's disturbing them? Uh, I don't know. A stranger on the island? Uh, not in this weather. Uh, something disturbed them. Well, it's a night for all of us to be disturbed, sir. All right, you can ease your conscience. You may leave us now. I don't know as I ought. I suggest you do as you're told. I serve the Russell family, not you, Dr. Hendon, who only married into it. And it's Miss Lind I offer my services to. Yes. And protection when I speculate what you have in mind. You can't fly in the face of the Almighty, Dr. Hendon. You... Oh, you fool. You can't stop me. No one can. Till I bring Emily back to life again. It was like a dream. Faces and figures elongated, out of focus. The sound of words, far away and echoey, and not quite clear. Now what was happening? Too bizarre and ghastly to be anything but a nightmare. I saw Miles pick up Digger's limp body and literally toss it into a corner. Miles? Yes. What is it, Linda? Oh, I feel so, so weak. Everything so, so far away. Now, now, that's as it should be. It's the sedative I put in the drink Bertie brought you. Bertie? drugged me. No, 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 no. She had no idea what it contained. The anesthetic was mine. I'm sorry all this commotion has brought you out of it. An anesthetic? What for? Well, what are you doing? What, what's happening? It hasn't happened yet. But it's just about to. The miracle of the 20th century. What? What are you planning to do? I am about to reverse the whole human process. I'm about to bring the dead back to life. He moved away from me. I tried to sit up, but I found that I was bound by heavy straps to a medical table on which I was lying. I was conscious now of some sort of a machine throbbing in a steady rhythm. Turning my head in the direction of the sound. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see that Miles had gone in that direction and was pulling aside a heavy drape on traveling rings. As he pulled it aside in one impatient movement, I saw... Oh, God, help me. In a kind of blinding flash, resting on a huge base, what looked like an enormous fish tank. The frame was heavily leaded. And the glass panels narrow and heavily frosted. Through the tiny particles of ice and snow that churned and swirled about beyond the glass. Inside the tank. In that one blinding flash I could see a figure lying. My mother! What's mother doing in that thing? She's dead. Oh no, not dead. Merely in suspended animation. The diseased blood has been taken away, her body purified. The flesh and organs and all the intricate convolution of brain and web of nerves and artery preserved by being frozen with liquid hydrogen at almost absolute zero. The body, waiting only for new blood to feed the heart and lungs and all the rest. Fresh wholesome blood from you. From me? You will feel nothing, my dear, I promise you. And have no fears. It will be only temporary. But why me? The blood must be harmonious, consanguineous, so that the organs do not reject it. No. No. My dear, you will only be taking your mother's place for a little while. And when the time is right, I shall bring you back to life. No. Too. No. 
Oh, you can't. You can't. I can do anything I want. And no one can stop me now. I'm going to struggle. No. Oh, no, no. Take that needle away. I can't. Let her go, Dr. Hendon. Bigger. Should have stayed decently at rest. Very well, the first needle will be for you. I warn you. Don't come near me. I have a pistol. You wouldn't dare uh, use that on me, old man. You're so weak you can't even aim it. Give it to me. I warn you. Stay back. You wouldn't harm me, Digger. I'm your master. No. Digger has always served the Russell family. Not you. I know where my loyalties lie. With you, Miss Linda. I damn you. Oh. The floor, you hit the compression chamber. My man. I never thought I'd be so glad to see a man I'd seen only three times in my life. It was Don Caton who unstrapped me and carried me down and outside the house. And just in time. For suddenly the flame from one of the lamps must have ignited the hydrogen in the laboratory. And with one terrible roar, the house on Snake Island was gone forever. Did everyone get out? Everyone... Except Miles and... If you mean my mother. She was dead already. Of course. And Miles... Miles was quite mad. If it hadn't been for this young man here, we would all have been innocently involved in a terrible and tragically unjustified death. Mine. Well, not while I was around. Once I found you, I wasn't going to let you go. But I don't understand how... Well, I'm an insurance adjuster, Linda. A year ago, your stepfather took out an enormous policy on your mother. Our doctors didn't realize she had an incurable disease. It's not very common. But apparently, Dr. Hendon did. He spent every cent of his own and your mother's trying to find a cure for her. But in the back of the mind, he must always have had this... This incredible scheme. And knowing how much money he would need to, to even attempt what he dreamed, the insurance was taken out. We, uh, I mean my company, were alerted by some strange things about your mother's funeral. And with the help of the reverend here, I found that her coffin was empty. So that's what you were doing last night at the mausoleum. Mm -hmm. uh, insurance business. I'd like to write a policy with you. Oh, no thanks. I have no intention of dying. <laughs> I have even less notion to allow you to. The policy I had in mind was between you and me. For life. Linda and Don Caton were married by the Reverend George Ombuster two months later. The bride was given away by Digger Wells. Dr. Ferguson retired from practice convinced both in his heart and by the state medical board that he had gotten too old to practice. As for Mr. Downer, faced with false statements and the prospect of jail, he gave up undertaking very suddenly, and the police are still trying to overtake him. I'll be back shortly. know, in the period of this story, cryobiology and cryogenics, the study of living matter's reaction to intensely low and freezing temperatures, was a gleam only in the science fiction writer's fertile mind. Today, they are recognized and viable sciences. And there exist across the country many deceased who have elected, instead of burial, to be frozen and preserved until someday human science might be able to reverse divine will. I choose no side, but only comment that once again it reminds us that truth can be stranger than fiction. Our cast included Jada Rowland, Russell Horton, Ian Martin, Bryna Rayburn, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. G. Marshall.
special inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. E.G. Marshall. It is said, and truly said, that who plays with fire is sure to get burned. It is also said, and truly said, that as ye sow, so shall ye reap. Seems to me there's another one, too. Oh, yes, the mills of the gods grind slow, but grind exceeding fine. Those of us who, through living, learn the underlying truth in these proverbs, take care not to play with fire, to sow carefully, and to give as little grist as possible to those grinding mills. Not so K. Wiley, devil may care, fun-loving K. Wiley. mystery drama, Death on Skis, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Rosemary Murphy and Larry Haynes. There are certain immutable laws in this world of ours, and one of them is that we, all of us, must sooner or later pay the piper. A simple law, easy to understand, not too difficult to obey, really. And yet there are a good many who never seem to understand it, and rarely, if ever, obey it, until too late. Kay Wiley, wife of Dan Wiley, the novelist, was one of these. Gay, irresponsible, fun gal Kay, who let the piper play on and on, till the day he presented his bill... Well, what do you say, you two? Shall we ski back down to the inn? The murder scene getting on your nerves, Dan. Yeah. And you a mystery writer? A writer who has to give his latest manuscript off to his publisher in New York by tomorrow. Now, look. I said I'd take the time to show you both the scene of the murder, and I have. I've gone out of my way to ski way the hell and gone up to the top of the mountain to this hut where the two murders took place. Now, the least you can do... The least you can do is stop acting like a husband and let me enjoy myself. Well, for Pete's sake, what's to enjoy? A lonely, isolated hut on top of a mountain. Where two women, not one, but two, and both of them blondes, like me, were slashed to death. One last year, one the year before last. Gives me goosebumps just being here. Delicious goosebumps. More thrill-making than even one of your novels, darling. Well, now that you've had your thrill... Well, let her finish it, Toddy, then. Do me a favor, Tony. Stop interfering between Kay and me. After all, she is my wife, you know, though you seem to forget that often enough. Meaning what, Dan? Now, you know what I mean. Well, I'm afraid I don't. You better explain that crack. Oh, come on now. Let's not spoil it. Dan, let's you and me get something straight. I've enjoyed being with Kay ever since I met you two last week. Now, like you say, it's a working vacation for you, and you've been holed up in your room with that typewriter of yours most of the time. While you and Kay have palled around together and had a few laughs together. And that's all. Not that there couldn't have been more. Kay's very attractive and just the kind that turns me on, but uh, we've just had one big laugh together, Dan, and that is all. You know it is, darling. Yes. Yes, of course I do, Kay. I, uh... 
Well, I... I... Keeps it. Let's get back down to the inn. Ooh, hey, it's turned real cold all of a sudden. The sun's going down. Better take the south slope. It's shorter. Uh-uh. We'll go down the way we came up. It's safer. Dan, I'm getting cold already. Oh, blast this book. Yes, will you let me talk to it? Sure, sure. Dan, the south slope, it isn't really dangerous. It's risky. It's too risky for you, darling. Even Hornbach warned you about it. Stuffy, old Norwegian. Hornbach isn't stuffy and he isn't old. Unless you call 42 old, he knows these mountains better than anyone, and he's one of the best pros around. So you listen to what he tells you. There you are. All set. Last one back at the inn. Buys the hot toddy. Okay, I said not the south slope. Stop worrying, darling. I'll be okay. I'm out of the lawn. Tell her not to do something, and you can bet on her doing it. <laughs> There's no harm in it, Dan. She just likes to do her own thing. Yes. And one day... One day what? She may do it once too often. Dan? Dan? Okay, please. I'm trying to finish this last chapter. Last two pages, in fact. We're nearly an hour late for dinner already. Well, you go on. Well, go ahead. No, not after this afternoon. What this afternoon? Tony will see me alone at our table and he'll come over well, what if and... He do... Oh, oh, I get it. Kay, I'm sorry. I know, I know there's nothing between you and Tony. You didn't sound that way up at the hut. Yes, I know, but... But what? Dan, we've been married nearly three years. I was 23, you were 38. I didn't think the difference in age mattered. You didn't either then. Now, is it beginning to? I don't know, dear. Somehow I seem to get older while you get younger. I'm not getting any younger. Well, you certainly don't act any older. You're as reckless and as irresponsible as, uh, as, uh, what's the word I want? Spoiled? Childish? Will that do? Yes, I guess so. Uh, taking the south slope this afternoon, for instance. Kay, you could have been killed. But I wasn't. I was never more alive coming down that slope. To me, life is a dare, a risk. Unless you take the risks, you'll never really live. Hmm. Well, there's something in that. But you can't go too far, Kay. You did this afternoon. You did a year ago when I came here to finish my last Minerva Twine mystery and left you in New York. So the horse didn't clear the jump. Well, you didn't have to take that high a jump. You could have broken your neck instead of your collarbone. And what about the year before that? I came out here to finish another novel, and you... I know, and I'd never parachuted before, and it is a new sport, Dan. Yes, and when Sandy Dowling dared you to try it, you had to take the dare. Busted an ankle that time. <laughs> I guess from here on, you're saddled with bringing me along when you come here to finish a book. Well, why do you think I brought you this time? Oh, Dan, darling, am I more trouble than I'm worth? <sighs> well, you're trouble, all right. But you're worth it. Now, be serious now. You've been coming here the last two years alone. So you could be alone and finish a book without any interruptions. Have I ruined that for you? Because if I have... Don't be silly. It's been wonderful having you with me, Kay. And say less than two pages to the end. I'll mail the finished manuscript off tomorrow, right on schedule. And then, sweetheart, the handsome Tony Shaw will have to find another playmate. Because I'll be your playmate from then on. Oh, Dan, I love you so. We'll just build that up into adoration. And we'll start even. Now, come on, dinner. Indian Wells, Dan, all the way to Indian Wells just to mail a manuscript? What do you mean, just? To mail a manuscript. It's Dan Wiley's latest Minerva Twine mystery. Yes, but the round trip to Indian Wells, it takes at least half a day. Why not mail it from the inn here? Well, that's too chancy, Tony. Indian Wells is a good-sized town with a good-sized post office. And they... Oh, Otto, Otto Hornbach, come and join us for coffee. No, I thank you. Oh, come on, sit down. I said no. Well, what's happened to our jovial ski pro? Something soured you, Otto? 
I know what soured him. You heard about me taking the south slope this afternoon, didn't you, Otto? After I warned you, you weren't ready for anything that steep yet? I suppose he put you up to it. Tony? Him and his practical jokes. Oh, ye gods, Otto. That was two years ago. You still holding that against me? It wasn't funny, and I don't forget easy, Tony. Tony, what did you do to Otto? Oh, he was giving me a lesson. I fell. Well, I pretended I busted my leg. How do you act as if I'd broken my spine? Accidents are no joke, not to me. I, I see too many. I do not like practical jokes, and Mrs. Wiley, I do not like people to ignore my warnings. Otto, I'm sorry. Sorry is not enough. I warned you, but you went ahead anyway, and you could have killed yourself, like Mrs. Horner killed herself last year, and Miss Yates the year before that. Killed themselves? They were killed, Otto. They were murdered. I say they killed themselves. I warned them. When you ski alone, I said to each of them, I said it. More than once I said it. When you ski alone by yourself, stay close to the inn. Do not go far off. So if you have an accident, no one will know till maybe too late. The hut is far at the top of a mountain. Yes, and if we have a sudden blizzard, almost impossible to reach. But they did not heed any warning. Like you, Mrs. Wiley. Ah, sometimes I think all you young women are the same, heedless, reckless, spoiled, know-it-all. Hey, 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 Otto, take it easy. You're, you're talking to my wife. Mm, the way you should talk to her, maybe. Now, look, Otto. All right, all right, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. But I, well, I get upset when people ignore my warnings. Excuse me now. Well, he's really ticked off at you, Kay. At me, too. Oh, well, maybe I can't blame him. That practical joke of mine, I guess I went too far. Listen, you two, if you'll excuse me, I think I'll go and buy him a drink. Bury the hatchet. Yeah, sure, go ahead. I'll see you. Otto's right, you know, Kay. So do me a favor, will you? You have but to command me, Matt. No, seriously. I'll be gone all afternoon tomorrow, and I want you to stay close to the inn. Above all, don't go near that hut. The scene of the crime, or should I say crimes, why not? Just... Don't, that's all. Danny, you do sound serious. I am, very serious. But why? But, oh, I know. The murders, those two gals hacked and slashed to death. They happened just about this time of year, didn't they? Yes. And you think another murder? It's possible. They never caught the murderer, you know. He's still on the loose. If you oh, listen, but... listen to me for once, I have a theory about these murders. I'm probably wrong, but if I just happen to be right... Another murder could take place up there in that hut. And it could take place tomorrow. Tomorrow? What gives you that idea? Never mind. Just do as I ask you, will you? Just stay close to the inn. And above all, stay away from that hut. Oh, you sort of made me want to go up there now. What? Oh. Yes, of course. Warn you not to do something and you're almost compelled to do it, aren't you? Ah. Uh -huh. Maybe that's why you warned me. What? So I will go. And who will be waiting for me there with a big, sharp knife? But you... Jay. Well, didn't something like that happen in one of your mysteries? The one where the loving husband lured his wife into a trap and murdered her? <laughs> you know, Kay, you're something else. There's only one place I've ever wanted to lure you. Where? Well, you know where. Oh, come on, finish your coffee. And fast. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, I hope Otto wasn't right last night. Otto? Right about what? Oh, about skiers getting caught up here on top of the mountain in a sudden blizzard. I say there's one coming for me. Look at those clouds out there and the force of the wind. Not to worry. If it starts snowing, we'll start right back down. On the south slope, no doubt. No doubt. How about opening the thermos and letting me have a hot toddy? I can use it. Oh, me too. Just being in this hut is enough to chill you. Because a couple of murders were done here? That scares you? Oh, I didn't say me. I said you. It doesn't scare me. Oh, maybe it ought to. Here, hot toddy. Thanks. Why? Hmm? Why ought it to scare me? Well, you told me uh, Dan warned you not to come up here to the hut while he was away. Right? Right. Because he thought another murder, murder number three, could take place today? Right? Right. Well, could be Dan knows something we don't know. Could be another woman, 
Another blonde? Who's going to be slashed to death today? <laughs> Me? You. Oh, what have I got to worry about? I'm with you. Precisely. What? I said precisely. You're here alone, far from the end, in a hut that's been the scene of two murders, each at this time of the year. And you're here because it's a man you scarcely know, me, dared you to come. As I said earlier, the piper must always be paid. I can't help wondering if Kay's piper isn't asking for payment now. Payment in full. I'll return shortly for Act Two. Kay Wiley finds herself in what well may be a murderous situation, which is to say, she may be murdered in a matter of minutes or less. Ignoring the warning of her husband, mystery novelist Dan Wiley, she has blithely gone off with Tony Shaw, a man she scarcely knows, to an isolated mountain hut where two murders have already taken place. To judge from the look on Kay's face, Tony is speaking the truth when he says... Let me give you a refill on that. Sorry, Kay. You look as if you could use it. You're not the murderer. How do you know? Oh, come on now, Tony. No, 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 seriously. How do you know? <laughs> really, Tony. Do you expect me to fall for one of your silly practical jokes? I'm not joking, Kay. This is for real. But Tony, you're going too far. A joke is a joke, but pulling a knife on me... Pulling a knife? Me? Oh, no, no, no. Just showing it to you, Kay. You've seen it before. Always carry it with me. Comes in handy now and then. Like, uh, well, when I used it to repair that strap on your ski boot the other day. I remember, yes. So, uh, don't jump to conclusions about me pulling a knife on you. Oh, I could be, couldn't I? Tony, if you don't stop this nonsense... I could. Couldn't I? Yes. I guess you could, except... Except what? You'd be crazy. Kill me and you'd never get away with it. No? Why not? Well, they know. Back at the inn, they know I came up here with you. They do? Well, anyhow, that we went skiing together. How do they know that? <laughs> it's coming back to you now, isn't it? You told me to go on ahead. That you'd meet me at the bottom of the trail. They don't know I'm up here with you. They, they don't even know we're together. Exactly. So now you see the spot you could have put yourself in. You could be dead right now. Murdered. Slashed to ribbons. The way the other two were. What? I, I don't understand. I'm no murderer, Kay. Then why have you pretended... I haven't pretended anything. No practical joke either, if that's what you're thinking. All I've done is open your eyes to the spot you might have got yourself into through foolishness. Foolishness? All right, childishness. Indifference to what serious consequences could result from your anything for a thrill attitude. Now you sound like Dan. Oh? Well, you know, he's forever warning me that sooner or later I'll take one day or too many. And you could have this time. Well, I didn't. You may yet. Look, Tony, enough is enough. Now, let me tell you who I really am. I'm not the practical, joking ski bum I pretend to be. I'm a security officer. Security officer? I'm a kind of detective. In fact, I have my own agency back in San Francisco. I don't understand. Well, just listen to me and you will. Back two years ago, after the first murder took place, the inn management hired me to find the killer. You? Why you? What about the local police? Oh, the local cops are a laugh. Just the sheriff and his deputy. The Indian Wells police came up with nothing. So they called me in. The management of the inn, I mean. And I'm afraid I blew it last season. The second murder was done right under my nose. But not this season. No, no. This time I'm just a few steps ahead of the killer. And that's where you come in. And where exactly is that, Sherlock? You're the bait. 
Oh, no. Not little Kay Wiley. Oh, yes. You're marked for death no matter where you are. Sooner or later, the man who murdered those two blondes in this hut is going to murder you. You... you sound as if you know who he is. I'm pretty sure I do. Who? Your husband, Dan Wiley. Tony, you're crazy. I wish I were. Dan's in Indian Wells, right now in Indian Wells, mailing a... No? No. I could be wrong. But if I'm right, he never went to Indian Wells. Dan. Dan Wiley. What are you doing out here on the sea? I thought you had gone to Indian Wells. Uh, no. No, Otto, I... But uh, I saw you leave an hour ago. Drive off in your car. I changed my mind. I was going to mail a manuscript to my publisher, but... Halfway to Indian Wells, would you believe it, Otto? I suddenly thought of a different ending and a better one. Ah, this means you have to sit and write a whole new end? Yes, I'm afraid so. Oh, me, I would never be a writer. They work too hard. Ah, you better believe it. <laughs> See my wife, Otto? Uh, she went off skiing not long after you left. Oh, anybody with her? No, she went by herself. And I tell you this, I warned her again to stay off the south slope. Now, well, you can save your breath, Otto. I know, I know. I'm telling you, lay down the law before it is too late. Show her who is boss, who wears the pants. Oh, it's nothing like that. Kay isn't bossy. She doesn't try to wear the pants or anything like that. She's just... Well, she's just young and exuberant. You can tell Kay not to do something and you bet she'll do it. Huh? Obstinate. No, just... I don't know, more like, uh, more like a child. Do you, uh, know where she is right now? I told you I don't know. Oh. Well, I'd be willing to bet she's up at the hut, the murder hut. Why would you bet on that? Because I told her not to go there while I was away in Indian Wells. Ah, so you think she went? So I'm practically sure she did. Uh, I will never understand women, never. No, me neither. Well, I'll see you, Otto. Uh, you going to meet your wife up at the hut? Uh-uh. No, I'm going to meet a typewriter in my room. So long. So long. No, no, wait. Dan. Ah, ah. Glad he didn't hear me this wind. It's funny, though. If he knew she would go to the hut when he told her to stay away from it. Huh. It's funny. Which is why he deliberately warned you to stay away from here. So I'd come here? What kind of sense does that make? Okay, you all right? Yes. You've kind of knocked the breath out of me, Tony. I, I still can't believe... But you're right. Everything you've said is so true. In the few years we've been married, I... I never have got to know him, not really know him. He's married to that typewriter of his more than to me. And yes, he did come here last year and the year before without me. Said he had to be alone to finish a novel. But this time he brought you along. Why? Did you insist? No, I'd never think of interfering with his work. No, he, he asked me to come. And when I said maybe it would be better if I didn't, he insisted. Figures. But oh, I just can't believe. If I'm right, if Dan is a murderer, he'll show up here in a few minutes. And I don't want to be here when he does. All right, then, let's go. But, uh, Tony, I just can't believe this of Dan. And I'm not going to. As I said, I, I haven't got to know him as well as I'd like, but good Lord, you can't be married to a man for nearly three years without knowing that he isn't a killer. And that's one thing Dan is not. I'd stake my life on it. That's exactly what you're going to do. What do you mean? I'm leaving. But you're staying here. Tony! He didn't go to Indian Wells. I'm positive he didn't. He knows you're here because he made a point of warning you not to come here. Now, look. You've got nothing to worry about. I won't be far. Just up in that stand of cottonwoods. He won't see me. But I'll see him when he arrives. And then what? When he makes his move, I'll make mine. I'll be right outside that door when he makes it. What you're saying is when he attacks me with a knife. Exactly. Tony, I can't go through with this. You've I... got to if you want to help me catch him. I don't want to help you catch him. I, I mean, oh, I don't know what I mean. He's my husband. I love him. I can't believe he's a murderer. Well, then you've got nothing to fear, have you? 
If I'm wrong and you're right, nothing will happen. Not a thing. But if it's the other way around... Well, then I think this time you'll get a thrill to end all thrills. I can't believe this is happening. Believe me, it is. Okay, I'm off. No, Tony, please, no. Come on now, Kay. I can't do this. I'm scared to death, Tony. If you don't believe Dan's the killer... I'd be a fool not to realize the things you've said are true. Tony, don't leave me. Please, please. Well, I guess I had you taped all wrong. What do you mean? Kay Wiley, who dare anything. Kay Wiley, who parachuted from a plane on a dare, jumped a horse over the highest hurdle. Oh, yes, I heard all about that. I saw you make the south slope on skis yesterday. Yes, I've taken some dares again and again because... Because... Yes, because what? Because I was afraid. Afraid? Petrified. Tony, I'm the worst coward in the world. The daring Kay Wiley is a mask, a front. I forced myself to take dares just so I, I could prove to myself that I'm not a coward. But underneath, I am. And Tony, this is one dare I can't take. I promise you, I'll be right outside waiting. If you don't take the dare, if you refuse to stay here and face him, you'll never know, will you? No. Whether he's a murderer or isn't. Oh, Dan. What is it? There's somebody coming up the trail. Dan? I can't tell. Snow blurs everything. But it's got to be him. Now, look, will you stay? I, uh, I... You've got no choice. You've got to find out. You've got to have the nerve to find out. All right, I'll see you. Tony! Oh, no... Dan. Hello, Kay. We can well imagine Kay's feelings as Dan Wiley enters the hut, proving Tony right. A curious situation. A woman facing the man she loves, her husband, not sure if he's a murderer. Certainly looks as if he is. And yet... Well... We'll learn more when I return for Act Three. What would you do? How would you feel? Your husband, the man you love, stands before you and for all you know has come to kill you. Indeed, cleverly lured you into a trap Surely you'd be torn with uncertainty, caught between love and fear, and underneath these emotions would writhe despair. For if he is your killer, this man you love, you'd just as soon be dead anyway. I thought I'd find you here, Kay. I know. You know? I'm not totally naive, Dan. You knew when you warned me not to come that I would. Well, why the devil would I figure you would come when I begged you not to? Because I'm like the victim in your last novel, Death is a Blonde. You based that character on me, didn't you? I was the model for her. Okay. Okay, so what of it? Her husband knew she had a contradictory streak in her. I even remember the words you used to describe her. Contrary, as wayward as a child... And he used it to lure her to her death. Okay, things like that happen in novels, not real life. So you're not implying that I lured you here to kill you. Is that what you're saying? You said you were going to Indian Wells. What are you doing here? Well, to be honest about it, I had no intention of going to Indian Wells. I told you that, and I spread the story around the inn to throw the murderer off my track. Throw the... Yes. I have a feeling he knows I suspect him. But I also know he strikes when the moon turns full. Okay, I'm all but sure he's a homicidal maniac who has to kill. He can't help himself, you see, when the moon turns full this month of the year. You've got to be out of your mind. Maniacs who have to kill because of a full moon? That only happens in novels. Oh, no, no, no. In real life, Kay... You see, the full moon has a powerful effect on people, on the world, if it comes to that. 
Right now it's only three in the afternoon. There isn't any moon at all. Hey, hey, sweetheart, you can't see it, but it's there. And according to the lunar tables, it turned full about five minutes ago. That's why I didn't want you to come here this afternoon. Now, coming here, you set yourself up for the kill played right into the murderer's hands. What if I hadn't ignored your warning, hadn't come here? Well, he'd have tried to lure you here. You were some other blonde at the inn. Blonde? Yes, both previous victims have been blondes. And I'm sure the third will be, too. You seem awfully sure. Yes, I am. I'm very sure. And when you're looking at me... Okay, you do think I'm the killer, don't you? No, I... Yes, you not. do. You, I can see it in your eyes. You're afraid of me. Good Lord, Kay, how can you be after nearly three years of marriage, three years of living with me? How can you be? And don't pull away. I don't know you. That's the trouble. I, I don't know you at all. What in places are you saying? Don't. Please, don't come near me. I, I am afraid of you. I don't want to be. It, it almost makes me ashamed because I love you and I want to trust you and should trust you, but... But you don't. Why not? Have I ever given you reason to distrust me? Why did you come here alone last year and the year before? Well, you know why. I know what you told me. That it was always a habit of yours before we were married. A habit to go off by yourself to finish a novel. Well, it is. Then why did you bring me along this time? Because you begged me to let you come along and I finally gave in. What other reason would... Oh, wait a minute. Now I begin to see why you think... Yes, of course, that's it. I was here last year when the second murder took place and the year before that when the first blonde got it. It isn't that, not that alone. Then what? I just don't know you. All day long, for three years, all day long, you've been in your office. Working. And half the night. I can't stop when it's going good. I know that, but it's kept us apart, keeps us apart, and that's why I don't know you. And don't know what I've been told is true or not. Whether you didn't go to Indian Wells for the reason you said, or, or another reason. What is it? You said, I don't know if what I've been told is true or not. Told what? By whom? I, Did uh, you ever come here with someone? Otto? Otto Hornbach. Yes, I talked to him half an hour ago. He said, he said you'd gone off on your own. Yes. Yes, I did. What, did you meet anyone on your way up here? Oh, I know. I... Hey, this is serious. Stan, you're hurting me. Then answer me. Did you meet someone? Did you come here with someone else? Yes. Tony Shaw. Damn it, was it Tony? Yes. Where is he now? I, I, you've got a gun. I'd be a fool to go hunting a killer without one. Now, where is he? Right behind what? you. Don't move. There's a gun in your back. Drop yours now. All right, pick it up, Kay. Yeah, don't do it, Dad. Don't turn. All right, let me have it, Kay. Thank you. Now you can turn around, Dan. A knife. The end of the handle stuck in your back. You fell for one of the oldest tricks in the book, and you a mystery story writer. Well, at least I was right about you. Right about me? Look, I'll make a deal with you, Tony. Let Kay go. Kill me instead. Tony? Tony's the murderer? Oh, he's trying to pull the wool over your eyes, sweetie. You're no ski bum, Tony. You've been acting a part, and you're a lousy actor. He's the security officer at the inn, he says. Yes, a security officer who carries a knife, huh? Now I'll tell one. Slashed to death. Those women both slashed. Now don't get all psyched up. The knife's a tool, not a weapon. I've never needed a gun. Well, you seem to need one now. Precaution, that's all. I can handle you with both hands tied behind my back. You know black belt. Oh, really? Then suppose we just find out about it. Drop it. Drop it. I'll break your arm. I got it. I... Get it, Kay. I got it. All right. I'm sorry, Tony. I'll take the gun now, Kay. Kay. No. What? I... I don't know which of you to trust now. I'm sorry, Dan. So am I, honey. I don't blame you. Everything you said, you were right. Maybe you just should have said it sooner. You were always too busy. Yes, I guess I was, I guess. Hello! Hello, the heart! Otto! 
Otto Hornbach. Oh, thank God. Otto. What, what is this? Take this. Take it. What? A gun? Just holding it scares me. Take it. Take it. All right. All right. Come. Come inside. What? What is going on here? I, I don't know. I'm so confused. Tony. Stop. Dan. What has happened? Well, to give it to you straight, Otto, I've got reason to think Tony Shaw is the man who murdered two women in this hut and was bent on murdering a third. Okay. Now, he's a liar, Otto. He's the killer, not me. Oh, how could that be? For one thing, he pretended he was going to Indian Wells today. Oh, I know. I know that. Like, I also know you are not a guest here. You are a detective. You know that? How? Why, look at the files in the office. I see you on the payroll. And why? And as for you, Dan... Last year and the year before, you mailed your manuscript from the inn. But this year, for no good reason, you have to go to Indian Wells. <laughs> that story you told me about another ending to your novel. Oh, I'm not a fool, Dan. I wasn't born yesterday. As for either one of you being the murderer, you can't be. I am. You? Me. And you, my next victim. Almost from the first day you came, my next victim. Why? Because you are like she was, my Helga. <laughs> oh, she put me through a hell on earth. She must have her way, not mine. Do always what she wanted, not what I wanted. She, she came first, me second. I didn't matter. Are okay isn't like they that. all are. Her kind, they're always... You know, they are always small and blonde, eh? helpless, dependent, in need of your strength. <laughs> At first, you're, you're taken in, poor little thing, so helpless, so dependent on you, so in need of your strength, your masculine strength, so you, you give it a little here, a little there, and gradually, so gradually, you don't know it is happening, you, you give her all your strength and there's none left for you. You are caught. You are trapped in a web you thought was made of love but is, is really made of, 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 of what? Of, of, of ego. That's what they call it. Ego. The, the I. The I of I am this and I want that and nobody matters but me. Oh, oh, no. Leave him alone. Let him talk it out. You. You are Helga. Me? Oh, not just you. At the end, they are Helgas all the time. At least three or four each season. Spoiled, determined, pampered, coddled by fools. The husbands they are destroying as Helga destroyed me. Me. Or, or nearly did. I I woke up in time and, and destroyed her. With a knife, Otto? It was handy. In the kitchen it happened. And I... I loved her, even, even when I was killing her and driving the knife home again and again. I, I loved her. Isn't, isn't that strange? You see, so now, now I, I, I must kill you like Mrs. Horner last year and Miss Yates the year before that. Kill you, you see, to save him. Otto, Otto, I don't need saving. Dan, you can't handle this. Neither can Tony. Only a woman can handle this, if it can be handled. You see, you hear what she says. Only a woman can handle it. Oh, spoiled, spoiled, rotten. No, Otto, scared. Scared, rotten. The way Helga was, and Mrs. Horner, and Miss Yates. Scared? Mrs. Horner, Miss Yates? You? And Helga. Oh, no. No, that is not so. She had me trapped. Because she was afraid of what would happen if she didn't trap you. Otto, she trapped you because she loved you and was afraid. Afraid she might lose you. Lose me? To... To who lose me? Another woman. Another... But... Oh, there... There were no other women. There are always other women. Which... Of you first. No, I don't I'm sorry, it. but you must die before I kill her. Not witnesses. I cannot have witnesses. For God's sake, Otto, didn't you hear what Kay said? She just told you a simple truth. A simple, womanly truth. 
A woman traps a man because she loves him, and she's scared to death of losing. Oh, she lies. Like all women, she lies. All right, which, which one first, huh? Tony? Dan? Me. Hey, what is Lacey? I'm between you now. Between him and you. He'll have to shoot me first. When he does, jump him. And I thought you said you had no nerve. Get out of the way. Hey, please. Jump him when he fires. Well, go on, Otto. Shoot. Get out of the way. You. You. I must kill with the knife. Sorry. Change of plan. A gun this time, Otto. A gun or nothing. Give it to me. Or shoot. Another step. One more and I kill you. You're going to kill me anyhow, so what have I got to lose? Give me that gun. No, wait, wait. What? Kay. Kay, it works both ways. Now get out of his way. Let him shoot us first. That'll give you a second or two to get out that door. And leave you here, dead? Do you think I'd want to go on living? Out of the gun. You... You... You mean it? You mean what you say? Of course I mean it. Why else could I... But I... I don't understand. You... You would give your life to... To save his? No. Oh, no. This is not possible. Women are... Oh, no, they are selfish. They come first. Always they come first. All of them. Not all, Otto. Not every woman is like... Your Helga must have been. I... I was wrong about Miss... Miss Yates? Mrs. Horner? I don't know about them, but you're certainly wrong about me. Wrong? Wrong? Oh, no! Helga! Oh, no! Oh, my God. Kay. Kay? I, I'm all right. Better see to him. Oh, crazy, crazy. He shot himself. Dan is No, no, he's breathing. And we've got to get him down to the end fast. I'll give you a hand. Okay, okay, sweetheart. You saved our lives. Believe me, from here on, you can take all the dares you want, and I won't say a word. You won't have to, Dan. There aren't going to be any more. I just took my last. <laughs> Luckily, though, Kay Wiley paid the piper, as must we all. The price was not exorbitant. Her life. You ask me, she got off easily. How about you? You building up a debt you'll have to settle one day with your piper? Better do a little thinking about that. Better do a little thinking myself. I'll be back shortly. back, you'll want to know, lives comfortably today in a rest home. Tony Shaw is back in San Francisco. As for Dan and Kay Wiley, well, Kay doesn't take any dares anymore. She's much too busy bringing up the twins. Dan continues to be a very successful writer of mysteries. Incidentally, you needn't bother to buy his latest Minerva Twine mystery. You just heard it dramatized. Our cast included Rosemary Harris, Larry Haynes, Ralph Bell, and Norman Rose. production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Scorpio, this is a bad day for you. Your sudden death is imminent? Be sure to put all your affairs in order. You cannot escape the inevitability of the stars. It is a hard prediction to face, but it can only be justified out of what you've done to deserve it. 
Damn it, are they out of their minds? That shaky little mouse, Ethel, writing a bomb like this, she'll have scared 25,000 people out of their wits. Uh, this is Amanda Amherst. Put me through to the managing editor. Oh, come on, come on. Adam, it's Amanda. I want the presses stopped. Hold all deliveries and do everything you can to get our first run off the stands. Why? Just read Ethel Nixon's column for today and you'll see. I'm on my way down there now and when I find out what's going on, heads are going to roll and brother, none of them will be mine. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to a world of terror. To those of you who have never experienced terror, it is but a word, quite meaningless really, altogether without substance. But to those who have felt its icy touch, it has the same mind-shattering meaning it had for Jane Prentice when Iris Patterson told her... mystery drama, Journey into Terror, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Roy Thinnes and Lynn Loring. We never know what the morrow may bring, do we? Indeed, what unexpected turn of fate may change our lives within the next hour? The truth is, we may well see but ignore telltale signs which warn us of danger ahead. And when the blow falls, wonder how in the world we could have failed to take heed. Jane Stoddard took no notice of the telltale signs and as a result, faced death in a horrible form. I certainly admire the way you're taking the sudden change in our honeymoon plans, Jane. You're a real sport. Nonsense, Tom. <laughs> Whither thou goest, I will go. To Detroit instead of the Bahamas on your honeymoon? It's not your fault your wealthy client lives here instead of Nassau. <laughs> patient, Jane. Patient, not client. A very handsome and talented one. Do you have client... Uh, patients all over the country? All over the world. You mean... We're going to be traveling constantly? Oh, no. My practice is mainly in New York, but now and again I'm called into consultation. Well, have fun, sweetheart. You'll see. And now I'd better get a move on, or my patient will find himself another doctor. Will you be long? No, a few hours. Why don't you get out of this hotel and do some shopping? <sighs> Maybe. But right now I think I'll just stretch out and rest a bit. Good. And you'll be in great shape for the theater tonight and some dancing later. See you in a few hours, sweetheart. Uh, darling. Bye now. Bye, 
dearest. To think I could be sunning myself on Paradise Beach right this minute. Nice hard bed. Oh, it feels good to stretch out. Turn on the radio. Get some music. interrupt for a special bulletin. The body of a woman, a newly married bride, was found less than an hour ago in her palatial Shaker Heights home. According to the police, she had been tortured, then strangled with one of her own stockings. The coroner has established the time of death as having occurred about 48 hours ago. <sighs> Fine honeymoon. I'm in a hotel room listening to the latest murder report. <laughs> yes? M Mrs. Stoddard, Mrs. Thomas Stoddard? Yes. I'm calling from the lobby, Mrs. Stoddard. You don't know me, but my name is Iris Patterson. I know you're alone at the moment. I saw your husband leave the hotel just a few minutes ago. What is it you want? I want to come up and talk with you. About what? It's an urgent matter, Mrs. Stoddard. In fact, and please don't be upset now, it's a matter of life and death. Life and death? Whose? Yours, I'm afraid. Come in, Miss Patterson. Yes, but Iris will do. My credentials. New York City Police. Special Branch Detective Division. You're a detective? Yes. Well, what in the world do you want with me? Mrs. Stoddard, what I'm about to tell you is going to shock you. But please keep in mind that, at the moment at least, you're in no danger. Danger? At the moment? What are you talking oh, let about? Let me explain. About an hour ago, the body of a young woman, a bride, was found in her home in Shaker Heights. I just heard the bulletin on the radio. Did you? What well, has that murder got to do with me? She was murdered by your husband. Uh, here, please, here, let me... Uh, no. No, I, I'm all right. Oh, I, I thought for a moment you were going to faint. Uh, so did I, frankly, but... I'm all right. Surely you've made some sort of mistake. No, I'm afraid not. But you must have. Tom, my husband can't possibly be a murderer. No matter what you say, I can't and I won't believe it. I don't blame you for feeling as you do, of course, but perhaps you'll believe me if... Well, if I tell you a few things about yourself that will surprise you. Such as what? Your first meeting with Tom Stoddard was accidental, or rather appeared accidental. What? Why, yes. I, I mean, it was. It, it was in New York City. It... It was raining. We both hailed the same cab at the same time. We... And at his suggestion, you shared it? Yes. It happened uh, roughly ten days, two weeks ago? Yes, but... But how do you know? It's his M.O., his modus operandi, the way he operates. Now, I'm quite sure, for example, that you have no family to speak of, no... Mother, father, they're dead, no brothers and sisters. That's true. And few close friends. You lived alone. Oh, no roommates. You, you're absolutely right, but I still His don't... victims are always young women who are alone in the world. You see, this helps to make them easy prey. I mean, they're lonely, they yearn for companionship and are perfect setups for a whirlwind courtship. He swept you off your feet, of course. Oh, he did. Flowers, candy, dinner dates, theater. It was... Uh, I was ecstatic, but... No. No, you can't be right. You have made a mistake. A terrible mistake. Mrs. Stoddard. Jane, if I may. Yes. We have made no mistake. For example, what about the insurance policy? What insurance policy? 
Hasn't he mentioned insurance to you? No. He will. Hasn't gotten around to it yet, that's all, but sooner or later, probably sooner, he's going to want you to take out an insurance policy for a large sum, naming him beneficiary. This, it, it's unbelievable, incredible. It is true, nevertheless. If it is, if Tom is a murderer, if he did kill that bride in Shaker Heights... And a few others. Then why don't you simply arrest him? Because we don't have enough evidence. He's extremely clever. And so far, we've been totally unable to nail him with the goods. That, Jane, is where you come in. <sighs> what do you mean? We want you to help us nail him with the goods. Me? You could be... The chances you are his next victim. <gasps> now, if you consent to work with us, follow our instructions, we can set a trap for him. With me as the bait? Yes. No. I, I couldn't do that. I haven't the nerve for anything like that. I think you have. And just remember, you're in no danger at the moment. You won't be until you sign your name to an insurance policy. But... <laughs> Look, wait a minute. There's one thing I don't understand. What? Tom wasn't married to that young bride in Shaker Heights, was he? No. Well? He marries his brides for money. He kills others for kids. <gasps> oh, good Lord. Well, if you'll help us, just work along with us. Follow our instructions. You will have a better chance of saving yourself than if you don't. What? What do you want me to do? For the time being, nothing. Except to, well, just act like a bride. In other words, do nothing to arouse his suspicions. I can't do it. I just can't. It's up to you, Jane. Of course. Now, if you feel you can't, well, you can't. But as I said, you're in no real danger now, and you won't be. Until he brings up that little matter of insurance. <gasps> Jane, you can do it. You must. I... <sighs> All right. Good girl. Now, one thing more. Yes? He doesn't remain long in one place. He kills and runs, you might say. Now, he'll probably suggest leaving Detroit and going somewhere else. If he does, and we're positive he will... Go along with him. Don't cross him. Don't ever cross him. One false move could mean sudden death, Jane. Sudden and agonizing death. <laughs> uh, I thought the third act was a riot, didn't you, Jane? Yes. Yes, it was, Tom. I noticed you didn't laugh much, though. Of course I did. It seemed to me the only times you laughed were when you caught me watching you. To tell you the truth, honey, you've been kind of depressed all evening and trying awfully hard to act as if you weren't. Well, to be honest, Tom, I'm... I'm just not feeling well. Well, maybe you are yearning for NASA in the Bahamas. Wishing you were there instead of here. I... I'm with you, Tom, and... That's all that matters. Sure. Couldn't be sure. And anyhow, I... I like Detroit. I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear about that. Why? I don't know. We're leaving for Los Angeles in the morning. Oh? Well, what do you mean, oh? Just... Oh. <laughs> Tom, why are we going to Los Angeles? Another patient? No, I had a call from Greg Benson, a colleague, a friend of mine. He's managing the National Conference for Psychiatrists in Los Angeles. The head speaker was taken ill and he can't appear tomorrow evening, and Greg asked if I'd fill in. Oh, well, that's fine, just fine. You're not upset. I said it before and I'll say it again. Whither thou goest, there go I. Mm -hmm. And what say we had for bed? Bed? <laughs> bed. You know, that thing you lie on, close your eyes and go to sleep? I, I'm not really sleepy. If, if I go to bed now, I'll just 
toss and turn all night long. Okay, then. Suppose we uh, sit and talk about our future together. What? What's to talk about? Uh, re redecorating our new apartment. You said you wanted to. How much money you'll need for the household expenses. Oh, and uh, insurance. Insurance? Naturally, I'm going to make you beneficiary of all my life policies. In fact, that's already in the works. Ed Kearns, my agent, is handling it. And he suggested, and I agree, that we ought to take care of, uh, you know, a policy in your name, making me beneficiary. $100,000, say. Seems a, a lot of money. Well, I suppose it is. <laughs> but let's say you're worth it. Honey, <laughs> I mean, what is it? What? You went white as a ghost. So you are off your feed. Come on over here. Let me put my arms around you and hold you. Yeah, that's better, isn't it? Yes. Happy? Yes. You better be. Because you're in real trouble if you're not. Trouble? I'm sure. Happy or not, you're stuck with me. Till death do us part. <laughs> It would appear that Tom Stoddard is not only a murderer, but a murderer with a sardonic sense of humor. The full import of those words from the marriage ceremony, the import of Tom's use of them, is by no means lost on Jane. And for the first time in her young life, terror becomes more than a word. It becomes an actuality. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. and pretty Jane Stoddard has taken the first steps on a journey of terror as she realizes she has married a murderer, a man who tortures and strangles brides for money and for thrills. Detective Iris Patterson of the New York Police Department has warned Jane that Tom Stoddard kills and runs. And now... As Jane finds herself with him in a Los Angeles hotel suite... So, once again, my darling, I'm off. A fine honeymoon I'm giving you. W where's the conference being held, Tom? Belmonte Hotel. Why? I, I just wondered. You didn't say, and if I wanted to get hold of you for any reason... Don't. Don't? Don't even want to get a hold of me. I'm going to be up to my ears and work. Oh. Well, all right. I'll see you later. Belmonte Hotel. I wonder if you would tell me, please, in what room the National Conference of Psychiatrists is being held. What? Would you repeat that? There is no conference of psychiatrists being held at the Belmonte? Yes. Thank you. That's what I thought you said. Oh. Jane, girl. Police or no police... You're getting out of this hotel and out of Tom Stoddard's life right now. Start pa Yes? Jane. Iris. Detective Iris Patterson? Yes? Jane, I'd like you to get a taxi and meet me at the Santa Monica Pier. Santa Monica Pier? We think Stoddard may be getting suspicious. I've got to talk to you. And I'd like to do it where there's no chance of his discovering us. So if you could meet me... Iris, I'm sorry, but I'm not meeting you at Santa Monica Pier or anywhere else. That means you've changed your mind. I, I was packing when you phoned. I'm getting out of here. And going where? Back to New York. Don't do that, Jane. Why not? Because he'll follow you. Wherever you go. From here on, he's going to follow you because... Listen, Jane, there's a lot you don't understand, and I ought to explain. You can't run away from Stoddard. If you try, 
You'll be sealing your own death warrant. But I Jane, please. please, for your own safety, meet me at Santa Monica Pier. If you still want out after that, okay. All right. I'll meet you. When? Half an hour. I'll be watching for you. Keep the change, driver. Jane! Jane, over here! Here, Jane! Hello, Iris. Well, we're safe enough here, I think. Would you like something to drink to eat? Iris, I've been followed. Someone has been shadowing me since I left the hotel. Of course. That man in the car over there... What do you mean, of course? You're under strict guard. The man in that car is a Los Angeles detective. Oh, I, I'd forgotten I was being held under surveillance. Oh, well, you feel safer. Much. Well, you're half an hour late, though. What happened? Iris, I'm, I'm sorry, but... Well, you, you won't believe this. I, I couldn't find the pantyhose that go with this dress. I, I hunted high and low, and I... What's the matter? Nothing. And n nothing. Uh... Iris, there is something. The second I mentioned pantyhose, you got a funny look on your face. Okay. I wanted to keep it from you. No sense alarming you unnecessarily. Jane, there's been another murder. Here in L.A. A bride strangled with a pair of pantyhose <gasps> after being tortured. No! Iris, that does it. I'm getting as far from Tom Stoddard as I can. Jane... Another girl who married Tom Stoddard became afraid of him, left him, and tried to hide from him, and, well, it took him two years to find her and kill her. Oh. But he found her and he killed her. No! The simple truth is your safety lies in our arresting Stoddard with enough evidence to put him behind bars for life. Now tell me, Jane... Has he mentioned that uh, insurance policy yet? Yes. Last night in Detroit. He wants to take out a $100,000 policy on my life with him as beneficiary. You didn't sign anything, an application for the insurance? No. Well, then you have nothing to worry about until he asks you to sign. You're relatively safe. Relatively. <laughs> Don't worry. Safe enough. Iris, what did you want to talk about? Well, the next step is getting started with the goods. By this time tomorrow, unless we miss our guess, you'll be in Miami, Florida. What? Where... Now, look, I, I, I'm going to lay this on the line, Jane, and I want you to understand clearly what you're in for. Where we want to catch started in the act. The act of murder. Of murdering you. To be precise, the act of attempting to murder you. He won't succeed, of course, because you'll be surrounded by police. Of course. I mean it. Now, the reason we feel sure he'll be heading for Miami, probably tomorrow, is because that's where the original murder took place. The original murder? Yes, here's the story. You see, nearly five years ago, Stoddard fell in love with a gorgeous... <laughs> well, sex pot, madly in love. They met and they married in Detroit, came here to L.A. on their honeymoon, and then went on to a beach cottage a few miles north of Miami Beach. Why did he murder her? All right, I'm coming to that. Stoddard had to be away for 24 hours or so on business, and he left his bride in the cottage. But then he changed his plans, you see, unexpectedly, and came back to find her with another man. He killed the man first. Oh. Then he spent hours torturing his bride before he killed oh. her. I don't get this. If he killed this woman in Miami, and you know he did... How come he's still free? How come he's not in prison? He was, for more than three years. He got off with a reduced sentence on 
on a plea of temporary insanity. I see. Only as we see it and have every reason to believe, he's still insane. You really mean it when you say if I try to go somewhere he can't find me, he'd still he'd find He'd still me. hound you until he does find you, yes. Then I... I have no choice, have I? I don't think so. <sighs> All right, Iris. I'll go along. What else can I do? Honey, I'm back. Coming. I was just fixing my hair. Oh, now you can fix me up with a welcome home kiss. Mm. Mm. Well, what did you do with yourself while I was at the conference today? Oh, this and that. I went for a walk, some shopping, sat by the pool. You didn't swim? Too chilly. Tom, yeah. how did things go at the conference? Oh, fine. Just fine. <sighs> Don't you believe me? Of course. Well, why the funny look? Funny look? No funny look. Oh, yes. You look... Uh, well, I don't know. Funny. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, to be plain about it, honey, I... I kind of get the feeling you don't trust me or something. Tom, you're being perfectly ridiculous. No, I don't think so, Jane. Whether you're hiding something from me or you're very upset about something, now, which is it? Come on, what is it? Nothing. Honestly, Tom, nothing. Jane, there is something. Now, what is it? Let's have it. Tom, really... Jane, I'm no fool. I know when something's wrong and something is wrong. Now, what is it? I, I, you what? I did want to get in touch with you today. I felt just so awfully lonely, Tom, and I... I phoned you at the Belmonte Hotel. Well, what'd you phone me there for? To get in touch with you. What else? Well, I wasn't there. What would I have been doing there? You said you were going to the National Conference of Psychiatrists, didn't you? I did. And you said it was being held at the Belmonte, didn't you? No, I didn't. How could I when it was being held at the Beverly Towers? You said the Belmonte. I said the Beverly Towers. Did you try there? Of course not. No, of course not. Well, why should you if you misunderstood what I said this morning? You know what? I, th I think you're fed up with this whole so-called honeymoon which so far hasn't been any kind of a honeymoon at all. No, I... Yes, I think so. And now I've got another surprise for you, and this time a pleasant one. You want to hear it? Of course. Well, for the next week, or the next three or four days, anyhow, I'm declaring a holiday. A patient of mine owns one of the prettiest beach houses you've ever seen, and he's offered it to me any time I want it. Well, he isn't there, of course, and he isn't. And that's where I'm taking you tomorrow, for the duration of our honeymoon. Where... where is it? It's just north of Miami Beach. And this time tomorrow, you're going to be there. Oh, we haven't been here even a full day. And I've never seen Los Angeles before. We'll come back another time. But we're here now. Oh, Tom, there's so many things I want to do. Visit the movie studios, Disneyland. We we could run down to Capistrano. Jane, please. I don't want to argue about this. I mean, frankly, I don't understand your attitude. Here, finally, I can take you to a really beautiful honeymoon spot, and you don't want to go. I don't get it. It's just that... Oh, it doesn't matter. We'll go. Of course we will. Unless... You haven't some other reason for not wanting to go, have you? Other reason? Other than wanting to stay in Los Angeles. Why, no. What other reason could I have? That's what I asked you. There's nothing wrong, is there? No, no, Tom, of course not. You sure? Uh, Tom, you're hurting my arm. Well, I'm sorry, honey, I'm sorry. I, I wouldn't hurt you for the world. <laughs> Kill you, maybe, but not hurt you. Kill me? Oscar Wilde. I think said, each man kills the thing he loves. And if that's so, considering how much I love you, sweetheart, you haven't long to live.
So Jane Stoddard moves along step by step on her journey into terror. And obviously the end of that journey will be the beach house just outside Miami Beach, Florida. Trapped, caught, and helpless in a web of circumstances beyond her control, Jane has no choice but to continue the journey to certain death. I'll return shortly with Act Three. How strange, how inexplicable are the workings of fate. How curious, too, that the fearful things that happen to others we never consider may happen to us. Could we, any of us, ever find ourselves married to a murderer as Jane finds herself married to Tom Stoddard? Seems hardly likely. Might we one day realize we are headed for sudden death and powerless to prevent the inevitable? Scarcely possible. Well... Jane once thought so too, if she thought about it at all. But now, with a murderous husband at her side, she flies toward Miami Beach, Florida, and death. Jane? <sighs> Sweetheart, what's up? What is it? What, Tom? I, I, I don't... You seem so tense. No. No, nervous, maybe. Flying always scares me a little. Well, soon landing in Miami, so relax. I'll try. Oh, uh... Kearns, my insurance man, sent me that application in L.A. I got it right here. Application? You know, the insurance policy I'm taking out on your life. Now, here's a pen. You can sign it now. And I'll shoot it back to Kearns from Miami Beach. Oh. Well, sign it, honey. Yes, of course. Good. That takes care of that. Oh, mind if I settle back and catch 40 winks? Of course not. I I'm going up to the ladies' room. Okay. Iris, think. You mustn't see you talking to me. He's taking a nap. I saw you come on board. Iris, I just signed for that insurance policy. A hundred thousand dollars in naming him as beneficiary. Did you have to? No choice. That's too bad. I hoped he'd hold off on that till I got things squared away with the Miami police. I signed my own death warrant, you're saying? No, no, no. It's not as bad as that. Now, the second we land, you'll be under close surveillance, and so will he. Follow instructions and you won't have a thing to worry about. Well, I wish I could be as sure of that as you seem to you be. You can be. Just trust me. Now, go back to your seat before he wakes up. The last thing we want is for him to see us together. Jane? I can hardly bear to sit next to him. Hang on to your nerve, Jane. We're close to the end now. I just hope it's not the end for me. Well, what did I tell you? Hmm? Beautiful, isn't it? Yes, only... Only it, it does seem rather isolated, don't mm, it? It is. That's one of the things that make it perfect for a honeymoon. That and the beach and the water out there. What more could a bride want? Except, of course, her husband. Tom, please. Jane, what? I'm just not in the mood at the moment, that's all. Well, I was feeling guilty about going off in the boat to fish for a few hours. But since you obviously don't love me anymore... Of course I love you. Of course you do. And I can't blame you for being a bit out of sorts, all this traveling. I've hardly given you a chance to settle down. Well, okay. I'm off to do some fishing. You can be alone for a few hours. Give you a chance to relax. Let's have a kiss for good luck. Okay, be back for dinner. Fish dinner, I hope. <laughs> Iris, thank heaven you're here. Tom's gone fishing. Yes, we know. We watched him leave in the boat half an hour ago. We? Myself and two detectives assigned to the case. Now look, Jane, I've got something to tell you you're not going to like. Just 
try to keep calm, will you? Yes. All right, here it is. We're quite sure, Detectives Allen and Barney and I, that Stoddard will attempt to kill you tonight. Why tonight? It's the anniversary of the night he murdered his first wife and her lover oh, in this cottage. No. Don't look so frightened, Jane. In a way, you ought to feel relieved. After tonight, it'll all be over. For me, maybe. Not a chance. I said we're sure he'll attempt to murder you. But we're also sure he'll fail. How can you be so sure? Oh, well, we just are. You're evading me, Iris. What makes you sure? I... I didn't want to make things harder for you, Jane, but... Well, there's the... the torture. Torture? Yes. Are you telling me you're going to let him torture me before you move in? I'm not telling you anything of the sort. What I'm saying is that we've got to let him make the first move. We've got to have the evidence to convict him. And that brings me to the... to the next step. Yes. Now, we're going to have to bug this cottage. Set up a tape recorder with concealed microphones in each room. Why? Because once he has you, that is... Once he thinks he has you where he wants no, you... No, I can't go through Jane, with this. Jane, Jane, you can. Now, please. Please trust me. As I say, once he thinks he's got you where he wants you, he'll do a lot of talking. He'll get pleasure out of telling you who he really is and how he tricked you into marrying you <gasps> and what he intends to do before he murders you. Now, Detectives Allen and Barney and myself will be here in the house recording every word. And Jane, dear... I give you my solemn word. Once we have the evidence, we'll move in on him so fast, he won't have a chance to lay a finger on you. I hope you're right. Now, one more thing before I go. Here's a sleeping powder. You always have cocktails before dinner. I slip this powder into his cocktail tonight. Put him to sleep? What on earth for? So we can bug the place. He'll only sleep for an hour or so. It's a light dose. But he's out fishing. Can't you do what you have to do now? No, no, it's too risky. Everything has to be concealed carefully. And we can't chance him coming back unexpectedly. Home is a sailor, home from the sea. Without a single fish to show for it. Oh, Tom, no luck? Oh, lots of it. All bad. But you should have seen the one that got away. <laughs> well, at least I can drown my sorrow in a couple of dry martinis. You? Yes, I I'll mix them. No, I'll do it. You relax now. I've been doing it all afternoon. I, I may not be much of a cook, as I'm afraid you're going to discover at dinner. But I do know how to mix a dry martini. Well, dinner is only a dinner, but a good dry martini is a drink. Whatever that means. Well, it must mean something. I'll think about it. Well, what'll we do tonight after dinner? Get a drive to Miami Beach? Why don't we just stay here? Well, that's okay with you. Perfectly. It's going to be a full moon. We can sit on the beach and watch it come up over the horizon. A perfect moon for a perfect honeymoon. Here. Ah, thank you. Looks good. Mmm, tastes good, too. You make a fine dry martini. Thank you, sir. Well, let's have these out on the porch so we can watch the sunset, huh? Good idea. Oh, this deck chair feels good. I'm more worn out from fishing than I thought. Well, you've had a lot of air and sun. Mm, that sun was hot and bright. Even the sunglasses, the glare was hard in my eyes. Yeah. You didn't put anything in this martini, did you? No. I feel sleepy. So suddenly. As you said, the glare of the sun on the water. Mm. Worse than I thought. Oh, boy. I just can't keep my eyes open. Can't stay awake. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't mind me. Close your eyes. Rest them. Mm, yes. I never felt so sleep. 
Oh. What was that? <sighs> Nothing. The glass slipped from your fingers. Don't worry about it. I'll clean it up. You sleep. Mm. Tom? Mm. Tom? Good. Iris! Iris, dear! He's asleep. It's fine, Jane. That's just fine. You handled everything exactly as I wanted you to. All right, now what? Let's go in so I can decide where to place the mics and the tape recorder. You didn't bring them with you. What? The microphones and all that. No. Uh, those detectives will bring it. No. Well, if you haven't got it and they're not bringing it... Glass doors, why are you locking them? They have to be. Whatever for? Because. That's the way it was. These glass doors were locked when I came back that night. What? Came back unexpectedly and found Jim with her. Iris, what... What are you saying? I told you. That day on Santa Monica Pier, I was supposed to be away for a day or so, but then changed my mind and came back that night and found them together. In bed, together. I killed him. Uh, but I tortured her. Iris! Put her through the hell I would go through later, thanks to her. You! Yes! And now you. Uh, You'll go through the tortures of the damned. Uh, like the bride in Detroit, in Los Angeles, and finally here. You, you tricked me from the first. I tricked you. <laughs> Why, you little naive fool. It was no trick at all. Oh. My only problem was that husband of yours asleep out there. Trying, always trying to be one jump ahead of me. And sooner or later, he'd have succeeded. Tom. Tom was after you. Has been. Since I escaped from the asylum. No! You don't know who your husband is? <laughs> well, of course you wouldn't. You hardly know him at all. He's not just a psychiatrist, my dear. He's a psychiatrist with the New York Police Department. Oh, <laughs> oh poor fellow. I escaped on the very day he married you. The police needed him. They needed him badly to figure out where I'd go, what I'd do. And he did figure it out. Only he was always just one step behind me, not one step ahead. But, oh, this makes no sense. The day I met you on the Santa Monica Pier, I was followed. I was. The man in the car following me, you said he was a detective working with you. With your husband, silly. No. Not me. Yes, you were being guarded, tailed every way you went. But not by me, by your husband. Oh, why didn't they catch you? You and I sat there on the pier. That man in the car couldn't do a thing without endangering your life because I had this. <gasps> and could have plunged it into you the minute he made a move. Oh, a knife! A knife! Long enough to reach your heart. Oh. Sharp enough to do to you what I did to her. No! Before I strangled her. Oh. Slowly strangled no. her. No! Oh, please! Stand still! Oh, don't back away. Oh. Yeah, that's all right. Move, move back. Oh. Just keep moving back into that corner. Where I can get at you with this knife. Where I can start working on you. A little cut here, a nick there, a stab in just the right place. Making it last. The torture. Making it last as long as... Oh, Iris, don't move. Just don't move. Now drop the knife. Oh, Tom, I... I put a sleeping powder in your drink. A drink I threw away when I said I'd join you on the porch. Yes, Iris, I have been one step behind you. But this time, thank God, I've been one step ahead of you. I seem to remember saying that our lives are fraught with the unexpected. Also seems to me that Wrong as I can be at times, this time I was right. Glad I was. Jane Stoddard was only a pawn in the game the fates play. But thank heaven, she remains a living pawn. I'll return in a moment. Iris. 
Congress is once again safe behind institutional walls. You'll be happy to know. As for Jane and Tom Stoddard, they're on a second honeymoon. Or maybe I ought to say the first. The other one doesn't count. Our cast included Lynn Loring, Roy Thinnes, and Carol Titel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. All the world loves a love story. Adventure is absorbing, mystery is marvelous, and suspense is superb. But of all the categories, give me first the tale of the old house, the creaking stairs, the wind that moans about the eaves like a human voice, and the jagged flashes of lightning that tantalizingly reveal only the suggestion of the shapeless white figure gliding through the driving rain. The ghost story. Such a one as I bring you now. Our mystery drama, Legacy of Guilt, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Roberta Maxwell. The house is some 40 miles outside New York, perched on a bluff over the Hudson. An easy hour's commute. It is a perfect example of American Victorian, with fancy gingerbread moldings surrounded by a wide porch, the steep roof crowned by a useless tower room. It is rambling without being large, and stands in considerable disrepair. A situation that Tom and Angie Barr, two young New York actors who have just become parents as well as new householders, intend to repair. Tom, what are you doing? Oh, I, uh... Overcut one of the shelves a smidge, so I'm backing it off with a wood rasp. I don't mean that. It's after dinner, and this is supposed to be your day of rest. Angie, Sunday's the only night off I get from the play. Exactly. So you ought to spend it with me, to say nothing of your son. Honey, I spent all day with you and the baby. That was a hardship? Oh, come on. You know it wasn't. Hey, what's the matter with you? Is something wrong with uh, his nibs? No, he's fine. Sleeping like a... A uh, baby. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Oh, darling. <sighs> Angie. <sighs> Tom, darling, I don't care what you do with your spare time. You just have so little of it. But I do want you to relax. Mm, look at who's talking. You can't kid me anymore since I had the baby. It took Christopher to teach me how to slow down. This time off from the soap opera has been invaluable to me. Mm, this building and remodeling is good for me. It's a uh, sort of therapy. It looks like hard, tiring work to me. But it isn't. It's a joy. It's a real challenge. Like uh, these shelves I'm building into these two alcoves. They're going to be wonderful. We've got crates of books, and the shelves balance the ones around the fireplace on the opposite wall. Now, that's just the point. Why does the wall stick out in the middle here a couple of feet? I thought we knew all about that. 
It's because the big kitchen fireplace backs up on this, and the stick-out part here is the chimney and the flue. That's what I thought at first, but look, what if it was a double flue, and behind this is a second living room fireplace? So? What if it is? Angie, can't you see? If the living room here had opposing fireplaces, how how it'd make the room uh, stunning instead of just plain marvelous. <laughs> I see what you mean. Hmm, but wouldn't it be a terrible amount of work? <laughs> I'm not suggesting we start tonight. Good, because I want you to come up to the attic with me. I've been finding all sorts of interesting stuff up there. Hmm, like what? Something that would please me and make me happy if it could be salvaged. An old mirror and vanity. I thought they might be just right in the bedroom. Mm, if there's anything connected with the bedroom, I haven't provided so far, by all means. <laughs> you <let's>, uh, idiot. <laughs> come on, darling. <laughs> let's have a look at your vanity <laughs> in the attic. I suppose what I found is ours. Didn't the house come as is? Mm, as far as I know. Well, it isn't all that great. I'll show you. Uh, see, there's a light somewhere. It's overhead, right in the middle. Half a sec. Uh, there. Oh, oh gesundheit. <laughs> Why, there's enough dust. I don't think anyone's been up here except me in the last 50 years. Mm, more like the last century. There's a sort of a little lost alcove over here between the eaves and the chimney wall. The stuff's in here. Uh, uh, shall I drag it out? Would you mind? Uh, 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 here's your vanity thing. Ooh, <laughs> heavier than it looks. <laughs> Gesundheit! <Ooh. laughs> Turn about is fair play. Still, maybe uh, some tortured spirit from the past is trying to tell us something. What? <laughs> Amidst the dust of ages, from out the grave I cry... Open not the pages, let sleeping vanities lie. What's that from? <laughs> I made it up myself. <laughs> okay, I lugged out your dressing mm -hmm. table. Does it still grab you? You know what it is? That's mahogany inlaid with rosewood. And look at that marvelous three-quarter length oval mirror. Uh, what about the rest of the junk in here? I don't think it's anything we'd want. Except maybe the trunk. Hmm? What's in there? I don't know. I didn't know if I should open it. Or could. Oh, let's have a look. <gasps> oh, my. What is it? Faded old baby clothes. Oh, aren't they sweet? All handmade. <gasps> and? Well, they've never been used. Any of them. At least, I'm pretty sure not. <laughs> Anything we can use for Christopher? No. They're practically disintegrating. They must be a hundred years old. Anyway, I, I don't want Christopher in any hand-me-downs. Oh, honey, I was only kidding. Oh, look at this. What? An old photograph. Isn't she beautiful? Let me see. Yeah, she is. <laughs> you know why? What do you mean? She looks a lot like you. You see it? She does. Sort of. Only I'm not that pretty. Oh, don't you ever believe it. She looks awful sad, though. Her eyes are kind of... haunted. Mm hmm. Gives you a shivery feeling. <laughs> I wonder what got her so uptight. Maybe these clothes were for her baby... And she lost it or something. So, uh, what do I do about this dressing table? Oh, just leave it till we know if it's ours to use. Yeah, check into it first thing tomorrow morning. What a racket! It's a wonder I ever got the little king off for his nap. <laughs> I'm sorry, Angie. I just wanted to get this last shelf up before I get back to my, uh, other profession. <laughs> I came down to remind you it's time to get showered, shaved, fed, and off for the theater. Okay. Uh, just one last thing before I go. What? Uh, stand back. I can't resist this. 
Are you crazy? What are you doing? Just uh, proving I'm right. Ah, there. You see, there is a fireplace behind here. Okay, you convinced me. But did you have to make all this mess? I just had to convince myself. Leaving me to clean up. Well, I'll do it. You haven't time. Oh, darling, I'm sorry. Don't be. I'd work my fingers to the bone for this house. I love it. Are you sure? You know, it's going to be a tough commute once you're back on the TV series again. You working days, me nights at the theater. We'll be lucky to meet each other coming and going. It won't always be like that. And it's worth it. This is all I ever wanted. Oh, by the way, who was on the phone? Huh? Oh, 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 uh, that was uh, Marge from Copley Realty. She got in touch with Mr. Kiever. Who? McChesney Kiever, the old boy who owned this house before we bought it. Says he doesn't know anything about the things we found in the attic, and we're welcome to him. That's wonderful. Mm. Now, you want to uh, lug your famous vanity down to the bedroom before I go clean up? Doesn't it look magnificent? There's no question. It's a handsome piece of furniture. In its way. I know it's old-fashioned and Victorian, Tom. But that's its charm. It fits the room. It just sits there by the wall as though it belonged there. If you like it, I like it. Well, I really do, anyway. It's uh, an unexpected bonanza. Hey, I can't hang around here admiring it. I'm going to miss half hour tonight. Go on and have your shower. What are you going to do? Oh, just take a sponge and clean up the mirror a bit. Well, why don't you do it tomorrow instead? You look tired. Oh, I am in a way. Don't know what it is. Although your son and heir did keep me up quite a bit last night. Maybe he's uh, having a tooth? Oh, <laughs> Four and a half weeks? Idiot. <laughs> Go shave. Okay, okay. <sighs> okay, old mirror. Let's see what a little elbow grease and soap can do. <laughs> Come on. We've got to do better than that. It's like looking at someone underwater. Come clean. <sighs> That's better. That... <gasps> oh, no. That's not me. That's... Uh... Who are you? Who do you want? Who... What? Can't you see? Well, yes, a, a reflection. It's, it's not very good, sort of wavy, but... Well, but who is it? Who is it? Well, you, darling, of course. Well, no, no, it's not me. Can't you see? It's her. Her? Who, who's her? The girl. The girl in the old faded photograph. The one in the trunk. What's the matter with you? Can't you recognize her? Angie, Angie, here, here. Uh, come away from that for a minute. No, I can't. Don't you see? She's trying to say something to uh, me. Lie down for a while. Here, l let me hold you. Don't make me leave here. She's counting on me. Uh, just rest for a moment. You've got nothing to worry about. All right. If you'll... Just... Just do one thing. What? Look in the mirror again. What? Well, sure. If it'll make you feel better. What do you see? Well, nothing but my own reflection, half shaved, with uh, soap sticking to my face. I don't believe you. Let me look. All right. What do you see? <laughs> Angie, what do you see? Nothing. But... But my own reflection... But a moment ago, I... Oh, Tom, what's the matter with me? Am I going out of my mind? What is the answer to Angie's question? The only thing one can see in a mirror is a reflection. But 
supposing, just supposing, you looked in a mirror and found a totally different person staring back at you. Someone who must have been dead long ago. Would your reaction have been so different from Angie Barr's? I shall return shortly with Act Two. In the quiet bedroom, Tom sits holding Angie's hand. She lies in the bed, immobile, perhaps asleep. Tom's eyes are gloomy and brooding. His gaze fixed on the mirror on the vanity. His brow crinkled with concern. Now Angie opens her eyes. Tom. Yes, Angie. Forgive me. I don't know what got into me. Neither do I. That's what worries me. It is crazy, isn't it? I guess it was the trunk full of the baby clothes. Stored away and never used. That kind of hit me. I mean, supposing anything had happened to Christopher, I'd... I'd have had the same collection in my... Oh, Angie, stop it. Don't think that way. Thank the Lord we don't have to. But I do understand the way that poor girl must have felt. Honey, we don't even know if it was her baby. Or even if she had one in the first place. <laughs> hey, look at the time. I've got to get you some dinner and get you on the train for New York. No, uh, no, I'm not going to the theater tonight. What do you mean you're not going? You've got to. It's in your contract. Well, the standby can go on. I'm calling in sick. I can't leave you alone up here, Angie. Not... Not after what happened. I'll be all right. Honest, Tom. Look, I I'll prove it. I'm looking in the mirror, and what do I see? Me. That's all. And I look like something the cat dragged in. Mm, one good reason I'm not leaving you. You can't be alone. I'm not alone. I've got Christopher. I suppose you had another wing ding who'll take care of him. All right. I'll get someone over here to be with me. Marge or someone. But I can't let you miss a performance because of me. Please, Tom. I'd never forgive myself. Okay. Just so long as there's someone here with you. Oh, isn't he a killer? Hey there, Tiger. Say hello to your Andy Marge. What does this kid weigh? Eight pounds, twelve and three quarter ounces. Oh, you better call the Giants. They could draft him for defensive tackle. <laughs> He's not going to be a football player. Come on, Marge. Give him to me. It's his bedtime. Oh, this man is raring to go. He's not going to sleep. He will once we leave. <laughs> I, uh, want to take a gander at this famous mirror and the vanity. I, um, think maybe I don't want to be around it anymore tonight. Oh, okay, skip it. But, uh, you know, as the realtor who sold you this house, I feel responsible. Well, just because I had a sudden attack of the crazies? I don't know what got into me. Oh, neither do I. Oh, that is a beauty. Any idea of what this thing's worth? I didn't think about that. I just had an urge to bring it down here into the bedroom. Mm. Of course, the mirror's pretty well shot, but... You can have that replaced. <laughs> I don't wonder you saw visions in it. It's like looking down a well. <laughs> it's not that bad. Just a couple of spots where the backing is worn off. Oh, and the ripple effect. Phew. I know I'm no beauty, but I get a load of that rattled old bag that's staring back at me. Let's see what it does for you. Go on, go ahead. Sit down. I'm uh, not so anxious to look in it. You might as well. It used to the fact that it makes everybody look like someone else, more or less. Oh, that that isn't pretty one. my face I'm, I'm looking at. Just as good as you What's she trying to say to me? And that it wouldn't Why does she reach out her arm? In. A Angie? Angie, what happened to you? Where'd you go? Mm. Uh, nothing. I, uh... I'm right here. You... You saw her again. Saw who? The woman in the mirror. Yes, Marge. I... I saw her... Now listen to me. 
You just thought you saw her. You couldn't have. I was right here looking into the mirror and I didn't see anything but you. Just the same. She was there. But she couldn't be. I didn't see her. You say Tom didn't. But I saw her. If she is a real person... I never said she was real. You mean she... She's a ghost? Oh, come off it, Angie. There's no such thing. If there isn't, it means I'm hallucinating. Either there's a ghost that lives in that mirror and is trying to tell me something, or... I'm just plain crazy. Oh, of course you aren't. But maybe... Well, you know, having the kid moving, worried about your career, you just got uh, nervous. I wish there was some way I could help, but you've got to see your doctor for this, Angie. I have an appointment with him tomorrow. Good. I, I wish there was something I could do. You can help me, March. How? You sold us this house. Well, if I'd had any idea that... I'm not the... blaming you. I just want to... Do you think you could arrange for me to meet the old gentleman who owned it? Oh, Honey, I never even met him myself. It was all done through lawyers. Can I meet the lawyer so I can get around to seeing him? Well, what do you want to see him for? I want to ask him about this vanity and the mirror and a trunk with some baby clothes and who it is in the picture I have. Angie, you didn't have to wait up for... Oh, well... I'm sorry, Marge. I uh, saw the light here in the living room. I thought it was Angie. Oh, she just went upstairs a minute. Your son and heir was kicking up a storm. Well, I didn't mean for you to stay so late with Angie. Oh, I would not have left that beautiful wife of yours for anything till you got home. Why? D uh, did something happen? Oh, it sure did. She thought she saw something in that mirror again. How do you know? Well, I was in the room as she was putting Chris down for the night, and like a fool, I wanted to have a close look at the piece of furniture. I said something about the mirror being so decrepit. Anyone would look a fright in it. But you know me, that wasn't enough hangnail psychology. I conned her into sitting down and looking at herself in it, just to show it was a plain, ordinary mirror. And before you knew it, she was off on some kind of a trip. You said she saw something in it? Yeah, the, the same woman. Tom, you got to make sure that that girl of yours gets to the doctor. Uh, she has an appointment with him in the morning, huh? I was going to babysit while she went. No, look, I'll be glad to babysit for you, Tom. You just make sure she tells the doctor about this fantasy of hers or whatever it is. And this reflection in the mirror or this woman who seems to appear isn't anyone you know. No, doctor. Well, that is, in a way... I mean, she looks like me, sort of. And also like the picture of the woman Angie found in an old trunk in the attic. Uh, the one with all the unused baby clothes. Yes. What do you think it could be, Doctor? Well, instead of that, let me tell you what I think it isn't. What's that? You're a relatively new patient for me, Mrs. Barr, but all the records I've received on you from Dr. Frazier, they indicate that you're a healthy, well-balanced young woman. But you are an actress. And you have just had a baby. I don't see what that's got to do with it. I think I do. This mysterious visitor has appeared twice. Once right after you'd found the old trunk full of baby clothes and the picture of a woman who, I must say, does look remarkably like you. Very beautiful woman, I might add. Mm, has to be if she looks like Angie. I agree. Now, Mrs. Barr. You say yourself that you immediately leap to the conclusion that the woman in the picture was a mother who'd lost her baby. Doesn't it seem logical? It could also be logical that this was a woman who couldn't have the baby she wanted, or who had lost her husband before she could, or who lost her life before she could give birth, or... Well, there are many possibilities. The only important thing is that, as an actress... You were sensitive enough to fantasize immediately. You dreamed you saw her. You said you were tired and sleepy at the time. I wasn't tired when I saw her the second time. But you just put your baby to sleep. And unconsciously, this woman was again strongly in the back of your mind. But I'm not going to speculate anymore. All I can tell you is that, in my opinion, you're in the pink of good health. And I'd make one simple recommendation. What's that, Doctor? Get rid of the old vanity, Mr. Barr. 
And with that, I'm sure you'll get rid of your wife's hallucinations also. Hello? It's uh, Tom, Angie. Are you all right? Tom? Where are you? Aren't you at the theater? Yeah, yeah, it's intermission. I was worrying about you, so I just thought I'd call. Uh, what are you doing? I just finished feeding the baby, and I was putting him to bed. Uh, everything okay? Uh, I mean... Tom, about... we took the vanity back up to the attic, even though I felt kind of silly about it. So what could be wrong? Well, I don't know. I'm perfectly all right. I hope. Just wish I'd gotten a nurse for the baby so there'd be someone with you. Cheer up. She comes next Monday. I promise you I'll make out till then. Yeah, well, oh, hang, they're calling places. Uh, Angie, uh, don't stay up for me. <sighs> I won't. As soon as I get Chris off, I'm going to bed myself. And stop worrying about me. I'll try. Angie? Yes? I love you. And I love you. This little darling. Were you jealous because I said I loved another man? Hmm? <laughs> you know mommy loves you just as much. She knows just how wonderful you are and how much you mean to her. Oh, don't cry, honey. Mommy has you safe in her arms. <gasps> What's that? Well, it sounded as though someone cried out. The woman in the mirror. Oh, oh, the poor thing. We've got to help her. We will help her, won't we? My big, big man. We shouldn't have locked her away, Christopher. We shouldn't. She's trying to tell us something. I can't. I can't turn away. She's asking for help. I've got to try. Where's the light? Oh. oh, you can see her in the mirror. Her back is turned. She's searching. Searching for... Wait. She turned around. Whatever she has seen in the mirror, Angie, clutching her child to her with one hand, has lunged forward and spun the glass towards the wall so violently that the mirror shatters into a thousand shimmering pieces. Like a wild animal, Angie rushes headlong down the stairs from the attic to lock herself and her baby in her bedroom. I shall return shortly with Act Three. All the way home in the train, Tom Barr has had this twisting of unease below his stomach. Most of us have felt this premonition at one time or another about someone we love, this kinetic feeling that can only be explained by ESP, or simple hunch. From the train, he has hurried to his car, driven to the house recklessly, calmed at the last moment by its quiet exterior as he turns into the drive, with only one light shining from the bedroom. Reassured, he parks the car and walks upstairs to the bedroom door. Oh, Tom, I'm so glad to see you home, darling. Oh, it's all right, Angie. Hey, you're trembling all over. What is it? Oh, it's my fault. What? What is? It happened... It happened just after you called me. I just... I just hung up when... Okay. Okay, darling. <laughs> oh, Tom, I'm so sorry. I didn't want this to happen. What to happen? After I hung up, I went to talk to Christopher a moment. And suddenly I heard someone. Kind of far off, calling for help. I picked up the baby and went to the attic door. To listen. 
because it didn't seem like it was coming from outside. When I opened the attic door, it was louder. Are you crazy? You, you thought someone was inside the house and you... Who did you think it was? I didn't have to think. I knew it was her. Oh, no. I wasn't afraid then. I was only sorry for her. I mean, her voice was so sad and desperate. So I... I went up to the attic. For heaven's sake, why? I don't know, darling. I can't explain it. I could hear the voice, and it was echoey and, and strange. And sometimes I felt as if it was even coming from inside me. But I had to go. I had to respond to her call for help. You must have been out of your mind carrying the baby. I couldn't leave him alone. And I never thought. I, I never dreamed what could happen. Even after I... I saw her. I... You saw her? Where? In the mirror. When I turned on the attic light. It was... It was like looking through a window into someone else's house. Only it wasn't. It was this house. Our bedrooms. As though I was the one in the mirror and looking through from where the vanity was. Darling Angie, don't try to go through she it was, now. She was coming through the door... Just as you did now. And as if she'd been searching the house. She was crying. Crying out for someone to help her find her child. I wanted to help, only suddenly... Suddenly what? She saw me with the baby in my arms. And she rushed towards me, getting bigger and bigger, till I knew she was going to burst right through the frame. And I thought, she's going to take my baby. And I took the mirror, and I turned it swivel to make the glass face the wall, and I i guess there wasn't room, so it it smashed, and the mirror flew everywhere. Hush, hush, Angie. It's all right. I'm here now. What are we going to do? Well, well, we'll talk about that tomorrow. One thing for sure, we are going to get out of this house. I don't think I'll ever feel safe again, Tom, unless whoever she is... Finds her lost baby. Tom. Oh. oh, Angie. What are you doing? Oh, indulging in some emotional therapy, I guess. Anyway, since we'll have to sell a house, I've got to fix up this wall I broke through to the fireplace. I don't want to move, Tom. This is our house. Why should we be chased out of it? Well, I should think you could answer that easier than me, Angie. I can't help what I saw last night. What I heard. I didn't say you could. I'm not going to be driven out of my house. I won't let it happen. This is a problem that's got to be solved right here. Oh, uh, by the way, Marge called. What does she want? Oh, something about McChesney Kiever. You know, the old boy who owned the house before we bought it. She said he was anxious to talk to us. Well, to... You? Did you uh, ask her to contact him? Yes, I did. Why? Because he's my only hope to establish that there really is a ghost in this house. And perhaps give us a clue how she can be exorcised. Angie, Tom, uh, this is Mr. Kiever. How kind of you to come. Mr. Kiever? Under the circumstances, there was little else I could... Ooh. Look, uh, why don't I leave you three together, huh? And go up and spend some time with Christopher. Would you, Marge? You're a lifesaver. <laughs> don't ask to see my badge. I failed Girl Scouts. Won't you sit down, Mr. Kiever? No, I think perhaps I'd rather stand. Ah, see, so you're breaking through that wall there. Yeah, yeah, I, um, thought there had to be a fireplace behind there. Oh, no. Please don't apologize. Any apologies in this room must come from me. You're perfectly right, of course. There is a fireplace. But you haven't opened it all the way yet. Well, matter of fact, having uh, satisfied myself my guess was right, I've been considering closing it up again. Ah, I see. Well, we shall leave that decision until I finish my confession. Confession? Whether the facts are proven true or not, 
From what Mrs. James has told me, since the discovery of the old vanity, you've been plagued by a series of inexplicable events. I'm ashamed to say I realize that I have visited upon you a legacy of guilt. I do wish you would sit down, Mr. Keever. In due time, my dear. I'll try to make this as brief as possible. It's painful to me. My father was H. Haverford Keever, a moving spirit in these parts. I was born, I always thought, in this house in 1895. I'm 84. Can I get you something to drink, sir? Um, some tea, some water? No, 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 let me finish. Uh, my father was something of a philanderer. Oh, dear me, that, that sounds impossibly old-fashioned. But all those years ago, it was neither simple nor funny. Fortunately, he was rich. So, having got a certain young woman in trouble, when it became no longer possible to conceal her problem, he arranged to have her, what shall I say, um, domiciled nearby in his summer house. This house. That was the lovely young woman in the picture I found? By no means. That picture was of the woman I grew up believing was my mother. But she wasn't? Uh, bear with me. Alexandra, for that was my father's wife's name, was pregnant at the same time as my father's mistress. But when the moment came for both of them to deliver, the mistress delivered first, the wife second, with only one difference. The first baby was alive and healthy. The second lost not only its own life, but the mother's as well. I don't understand which was which. That was the legacy of guilt. You see, I grew up believing that my mother died in childbirth and that the woman my father married after a decent interval was my foster mother. But she was actually your real mother? Yes. But how? What happened to the baby who was stillborn? I have only my father's word for that. I've never wanted to test if it really was the truth. It didn't seem to matter anymore. What do you mean, your father's word? After his death, when the estate was finally settled, I was handed a letter that my father had left for me. I destroyed it after I read it, but I remember very clearly how it began. My dear and only son, I have lived with a lie all my life. And even now, confession comes hard to me. I bear a terrible guilt that I was responsible for destroying your relationship with your mother. There is no way I can make amends. This is only a selfish attempt to clear my own soul. I don't understand. I grew up believing that I had been responsible for my mother's death. And I resented my father's wife for pretending to be my mother, not knowing that she really was. Do you understand now? You were substituted for the child that died. Correct. But what happened to the dead baby? It was too late for it to become a matter of record. It had to be disposed of. How? I must admit that after reading my father's letter, I put it out of my mind. You see, it didn't matter anymore. I wasn't even sure if I believed any of it. Because there was always an easy way to prove it. But somehow it didn't seem worth the effort. What was it, sir? Life is so frequently more bizarre and unreal than any story. You see, 
There's a problem in opposing fireplaces. If one flue draws better than the other, a room can quickly be filled by smoke. At the time I was born, my father was in the process of walling up one of the fireplaces in this room. There was a small and tiny corpse to be disposed of. Where better than a hearth that was about to cease to exist also? Oh, murder. No, 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 no. Not that. I, I just meant that... Now that it's all out in the open, why don't we make sure? Um, uh, no, uh, let me... It won't take a moment to knock out the rest of the bricks. So that's why she haunts this house. She's looking for her lost baby. I can't answer that, my dear. But it seemed to me imperative that you know the whole story. I would never have sold you the house if I'd known it was haunted. Then you believe with me it is? Yesterday I would have scoffed at that. Today I... Huh. Oh, my Lord. What is it? Look for yourselves. Huh? A skeleton? It's so tiny. But big enough to bring the truth to light at last. <laughs> Okay? Um, I have it. Put it down. All right. Now, you drop your end first. That, that's it. There. There. Back where it belongs. Oh, I don't know how you talk me into these things. <laughs> Why would you want the vanity back down here? I just said it. Because it's where it belongs. Without a mirror? We'll replace that. Oh, that poor old man. Huh? Mr. Kiever. Oh, yeah. I'll never forget his face when he went to touch that little skeleton. And it just powdered to dust. Hmm. It was almost as if his whole life ended in that moment. Hey, Angie, what are you doing? Looking in the one piece of the old mirror that's left. You know what it really shows? What? Me. Happy, fulfilled. With my own baby to hold in my arms any time I reach for him. Just as that poor ghost I saw, or dreamed I saw, has hers to comfort her in eternity. We can forget the past. All we have to look forward to is what life is all about. The future. So the ghost is laid to rest. A tiny ghost never even born, but one who has perhaps found immortality in the arms of a mother who gave her own life to bear him. The past is buried. The legacy of guilt wiped out. And Tom and Angie Barr can once again look ahead to their marriage promise with as much hope as anyone else can to live happily ever afterwards. We didn't have any flashes of lightning or driving rain, but it was a ghost story all the same. A true ghost story. Because if you don't believe in spirits and beasties and all those other things that are accused of haunting our waking dreams, how do you account for what Angie saw in that fateful mirror? One parting thought. How safe will you feel the next time you look in yours? Our cast included Roberta Maxwell, Russell Horton, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
Jimmy G. Marshall. Most of us have read or at least heard of The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. But by the time it appeared in 1850, its author, then 46 years old, had been writing and publishing since his graduation from college collections of short stories. It is one of these that we are about to bring you, written long before The Scarlet Letter and titled The Birthmark. Our mystery drama, The Birthmark was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Tony Roberts and Gordon Heath. In the latter part of the 18th century, when this country was being born and the recent discovery of electricity and kindred mysteries of nature seemed to open paths into the region of miracle, it was not uncommon for the love of science to rival the love of woman. This is the story of one such rivalry. <laughs> the great man is late again. Late yesterday, late today, and probably late tomorrow. The laboratory awaits him. The distiller bubbles and waits. The retorts, the tubes, the cylinders, the crucibles, all are immaculate and sparkling and waiting for him. Soon the glow of the furnace will be red as rubies. All, all attend upon the appearance of the great man. And where is he? Good morning, Aminadab. A fine morning to you, Master. I'm a trifle late. A new bridegroom is permitted a little tardiness. And how is the bride? Georgiana. Georgiana is... Do you know her, Aminadab? How should such a one as I know such a one as she? Have you ever seen her? From a distance only. Ah. I know what I hear. That she is adored by men. Envied by women. Mm, that's true. In short, perfection. That's not quite true. Oh? Did you not know that the beautiful, the exquisite Georgiana has a birthmark? I may have heard something. Mm, in the center of her cheek, her left cheek, a peculiar mark, woven deep, you might say, into the texture and substance of her face. The mark is shaped like a hand, a tiny hand. They say many an enamored swain would have risked his life to press his lips to that hand. Mm. I suppose that's true. But conversely, some ladies call it the bloody hand. They go so far as to say that it quite destroys the effect of her beauty, even renders her hideous. Of course, it is the ladies who say that. But the gentlemen, if their admiration is not actually heightened by the little flaw, they simply wish it would go away, so that this imperfect world might possess one living specimen of ideal loveliness. Uh, they say that is the feeling of some. Mm. It's beginning to be my own. Oh? Before we were married, I gave it no thought. So caught up was I with her incomparable loveliness. But now, your feeling has changed? In the usual state of her complexion, which is a healthy though delicate bloom, the birthmark wears only a tint of deeper crimson, imperfectly defining its pygmy hand shaped amid the surrounding rosiness. When Georgiana blushes, as she so often does, it becomes more and more indistinct and finally vanishes amid the triumphant rush of blood that bathes her whole cheek with its brilliant glow. Ah, then... But if any shifting motion causes her to turn pale, there is the mark again, a crimson stain upon the virgin snow. Ah, hmm. If only she were less beautiful, I could forgive it. She is otherwise so perfect. The birthmark disturbs you. I find it intolerable. Intolerable? And more so with each passing moment. The fatal flaw which nature stamps ineffaceably on all her productions. Why must it be so? I will not accept it. It sucks at the very heart of her beauty. It crushes my love for her. It poisons my marriage. I will not accept it. No. Never. What can you do, Master? 
but accept it. Remove it. Remove it? I'm convinced it can be done. That you can do it? Would I entrust my beloved to the coarse, indifferent hands of another? Have you suggested this possibility to your wife? Shortly after we were married, yes. And what was her response? At first she smiled. Then she saw that I was serious. She blushed and said that her birthmark had often been considered one of her charms. And that she herself had been simple enough to imagine it might well be. And so it might. On another face than hers, it might indeed. But not on yours, I told her. You came so nearly perfect from the hand of nature, I said, that the slightest possible defect shocks me as being the visible mark of earthly imperfection. That you should be shocked by her imperfection. Oh, my. Yes. Shocked. That was the word that did it. She burst into tears and said I could not possibly love what shocked me. Better we had never married, she said. But try as I might, I could not retract my words. God help me. God help us both. They were true. With that, the great man turns away from me. To hide tears, perhaps? Who knows? And he applies himself to a study of the notes for his current experiment. I dare not presume further upon our relationship by pursuing the topic. But the demeanor of the great man continues downcast through the next days. Nothing goes right. Nothing. Nothing. Master. Hmm? Consider resting from your efforts for a brief span. <sighs> Very well. And uh, you will rest from yours. Agreed. We'll um, smoke a pipe together and try to cleanse our minds. Hmm. Sit down. Thank you, Master. You, you remember what we talked of a few days back? Your wife, her birthmark, the possibility of removing it. Yes, I remember too well. It occurs to me that things may be going poorly for you here in the laboratory because your mind is still occupied with that problem. My mind is obsessed with it. Consumed by it. You cannot believe how it has taken over my thoughts. I am destroyed by my obsession with my beloved's birthmark and how to be rid of it. Have you spoken of it further? To her? I cannot help it. I mean not to speak of it. Wrench my thoughts and my words away from it. Firmly. Purposefully. But no matter what my intent, what my effort, I revert inevitably to the subject of the birthmark. Aminadabit has become the central point of my existence. With the morning light, I open my eyes to my wife's face and see immediately the sign of imperfection. When we sit together at the evening hearth, my eyes wander stealthily to her cheek and behold, flickering with the blaze of the wood fire, the spectral hand. And is your young wife aware of your furtive spying? Unhappily, she is. Now she shudders at my gaze. Ah. Uh, my poor master. The other night, I had a dream. You know, Aminadab, that I place great store by dreams and their meaning. Georgiana woke me and told me that I had cried out in my sleep, that I had shouted. It is in her heart now. We must have it out. She asked me, did I have any recollection of the dream that had caused me to utter those horrendous words? And did you? I told her no, and it was true. I had no remembrance whatsoever though I might understandably have had a dream about the birthmark since before I fell asleep it had taken a firm hold on my musings. And you cannot remember the dream? No. And yet... Yes? And yet? Speaking with you here, now, uh, relaxed, relaxed the way we are... Yes. There's a spark. There's a glimmer. Yes, master? You... You were in my dream, Aminadab. I, Master? Yes. You. You and I were together. We... We were attempting an operation for the removal of the crimson hand. Oh, Master. But the deeper went the knife. The deeper sank the little hand until, at length... Its tiny grasp caught hold upon her heart. Master, for the love of... God. But even then, even then, I was resolved, inexorably resolved, to cut it out or wrench it away. Oh, Master, what's to be done? 
I must tell Georgiana the dream. Must you? Truth finds its way to the mind close muffled in robes of sleep. Until now, I had not known of the absolute tyranny this one idea has had over my mind. Until now, I have not known the lengths I might go to to give myself peace. Then you are determined... I am a scientist, Aminadab. I cannot think of myself as anything else. And science demands that we follow every scrap of revealed truth, no matter where it leads. The great man sits by the stove. His notebooks have not been opened. The tubes and retorts have not been touched. The chemicals sit upon the shelf. I move quietly about the laboratory. He seems not to know I am here. Master. Oh. Oh, I mean it, Ab. You're not disposed to continue the experiment we started some weeks past? Oh, I cannot even remember. Oh, Master. I mean it, Ab. I have told Georgiana the dream. And what did she respond, if I may ask? She said... She said... Aylmer, I know not what may be the cost to rid me of this fatal birthmark. Perhaps its removal may cause cureless deformity. Or it may be that the stain goes deep as life itself. Besides, do we know that a possibility even exists of unclasping the grip of this little hand which was laid upon me before I came into the world? All through. What could you say? I said what I believe. That I am convinced of the perfect practicability of its removal. And then she said, Aylmer, let the attempt be made. Danger is nothing to me. Life is a burden while this hateful mark makes me the object of your horror and disgust. Aylmer, she said, remove this dreadful hand or take my wretched life. Brave woman. Spare me not, Aylmer, though you should find the birthmark in my heart. And so I kissed her on the cheek, her right cheek, not the cheek that bore the impress of the crimson hand. I tremble for my master. I tremble for his bride. I think I tremble for myself, for I am not of Aylmer's stature. I am but a poor clod, meant to serve, never to command, meant to assist, never to initiate. Yet, where he leads, I must follow. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Love is not love that alters when it alteration finds. Shakespeare wrote that in a sonnet. What would he say of a birthmark in the shape of a tiny hand and the alteration necessary to remove it and the insistent desire to do away with it? We'll return shortly with Act Two. No sooner had the great scientist married the most beautiful of women than his critical eye fastened upon a flaw in her beauty. A tiny birthmark in the shape of a hand which glowed fiery red against the pallor of one cheek. Haunted by the desire to erase the slight blemish, he has attained her consent to attempt the erasure himself, no matter what the consequence. All work on our current experiments has been suspended for a full two weeks. We are in a fever of remodeling and refurbishing. You must understand that before he married the lovely Georgiana, my master had occupied certain extensive inner chambers connected to his laboratory. Here he had lived during his toilsome youth while he made those discoveries that had roused the admiration of all the learned societies in Europe. Now he proposed to use these apartments for another purpose. It's a perfect plan, I mean, Adap. It will give me the opportunity for the intense thought and constant watchfulness the coming operation will require. And Georgiana will enjoy the perfect repose essential to its success. You will bring her here? We will live in the inner chambers together. Seclude ourselves there. She will not enter the working laboratory until the crucial day. But the adjacent rooms will be a sort of private paradise. 
I want the walls hung with the most gorgeous curtains. I shall select them myself since you are scarcely capable. Uh, quite so. It will be all grandeur and grace. The draperies will fall from ceiling to floor in rich and ponderous folds concealing all angles and straight lines. The sunshine will be excluded lest it interfere with my chemical processes. But there will be instead the most beautiful perfumed lamps emitting flames of various hues uniting all in a soft impurpled radiance you follow me yes master those smoky dingy somber rooms will change to an exquisite abode for the loveliest of women i can scarce contain my excitement my palms sweat my breath comes rapidly my eyes are glazed with anticipation, for soon the door will open and the fabled Georgiana will walk through it. I shall see her. Yes, I, I, the stunted, the ugly, the hairy, the grimy, the earthy, shall see her. I shall see her close. Enter, my love. What do you think of your new abode? Exquisite. My dear, you're trembling. It can't be helped. I... Noblest, dearest, tenderest wife. Do not doubt my power. I have given this matter the deepest thought. I know. Then why do you tremble? Why are you so cold? Why so pale? You're white as a ghost, my Am love. Am I? Let me reassure you, dear heart. Come into my arms. Oh... Elmer. There, now. No. Oh, do not turn away. Elmer. I'm in it, Ab. I'm right here, Master. Take her to the boudoir. As Elmer moved close to take her in his arms, the birthmark glowed scarlet on her white cheek. And even as he tried to embrace her, so intense was the glow that he could not hold back a strong, convulsive shudder. Seeing the revulsion on her husband's face, Georgiana had cried out and fainted. Now I pick up her still form, cradle it gently in my strong arms, and gently carry it to the boudoir. At last, I stare down into that ineffably lovely face. It is closer to mine than it will ever be again. And I drink in its beauty as I muse to myself. Were she my wife, I should never part with that birthmark. Never. I have hardly left her bedside. Elma has been working feverishly in the laboratory proper, only summoning me when he needed my brute strength or my delicate accuracy. His slender finger and pale intellectual face bend over his notes while I, bulky, ungainly, grimed with the vapors of the furnace, crouch in a corner of her boudoir. That is where I am when she wakes from her faint. Elma? Oh, Elma? Mistress? Well, I'll... Oh. Don't where? be frightened, mistress. Where is my husband? In his laboratory, hard at work. Oh, yes. The operation to remove this. Oh, mistress, fear not. Who are you? His servant, Aminadab. Privileged to be his assistant from time to time when he needs my mechanical readiness. But you must have more than that, Aminadab. I have a skill, an ability to execute the details of my master's experiments. But I assure you, mistress, I have not the wit to comprehend the slightest details of any of those experiments. What do you think of this, this uh, latest of his experiments? The removal of the little hand, you mean, that rests upon your cheek? And gives him no rest until he exorcises it. Well, tell me, I really want to know. Uh, mistress, there is a truth which all seekers stumble upon sooner or later. And what is that? Our great creative mother, while she amuses us by apparently working in the broadest sunshine, is yet severely careful to keep her own secrets. And despite her pretended openness, shows us nothing but results. 
She permits us to mar, but seldom to mend, and on no account to make. I cannot tell if my words have meaning for her. Indeed, I do not know myself the precise significance of what I say. The days drag on, and I am living in a fever of dread and anticipation. I am living within the hearts of both my master and my mistress. In the intervals of study and experiment, he comes to her flushed and exhausted and speaks glowingly of the resources of his art. This small vial contains a gentle but powerful fragrance which can impregnate all the breezes that blow across a kingdom. And this, this gold-colored liquid in the crystal vial? Oh, that, that is the most precious poison ever concocted. By its aid, I could apportion the lifetime of any mortal at whom you might point your finger. The strength of the dose would determine whether he were to linger out years or drop dead in the midst of a breath. Elmer, you chill me to the marrow of my bones. Why do you keep such a fearful drug? Trust me, my beloved, trust me. I do trust you, but why Look do here. You... Here is a powerful cosmetic. With a few drops in a vase of water, freckles may be washed away as easily as the hands are cleansed. A stronger infusion would take the blood out of the cheek and leave the rosiest beauty a pale ghost. Is it with this lotion that you intend to bathe my cheek? Oh, no, my darling. No, this is only superficial. Your case demands a remedy that shall go deeper. Far deeper, my sweet girl. Far, far deeper. He has been locked in his laboratory for a full week now, absorbed in his labors. I am crouched in the corner of her boudoir, as I always am when not actively assisting him. She is reading. Beside her bed are ponderous volumes. I recognize them as coming from his scientific library. I dare to approach her where she lies. Have you finished with these books, mistress? Those? Oh, yes. Shall I return them to the shelves? If you like. Uh, Albertus Magnus, Cornelius Agrippa. You have been reading the antique naturalists. Paracelsus and the rest. Paracelsus, the great Swiss physician and philosopher of the 16th century. He who speaks of the portals of man's deep within. When one is conquered or thrown off the thraldom of matter in his own body. You have studied him well, mistress. Yeah. But this, the value I am perusing now, this is my favorite. Why? Why, it is the master's own folio. He gave it to me to read. Oh, it is a rare privilege, mistress, to read in that folio. He has recorded there every experiment of his scientific career, its original aim, the methods for its development, and its final success or failure. It is the history and emblem of his life. She reads on. I return to my corner. She grows more and more absorbed in the folio. The color comes and goes in her face. The birthmark appears and disappears as her cheek alternately flushes into pales. Then, all at once... A minute up. Yes, mistress. You know that each time he has been with me here, he has inquired as to my sensations whether the confinement of the room and the temperature of the atmosphere agree with me. Yes, mistress. I've begun to think that I'm being subjected to certain influences that I have been for some time. What influences? I'm not sure. Nor am I sure how they are brought to bear, whether breathed in with the fragrant air or taken with my food. Merely your fancy, perhaps? Perhaps. But if so, then I have another fancy. And what is that? That there is a... Um... Stirring in my system a strange, indefinite sensation creeping through my veins, tingling half painfully, half pleasurably at my heart. Oh, mistress. Still, when I dare to look into the mirror, there I behold myself, pale as a white rose, still with the crimson birthmark stamped upon my cheek. 
I hate it. Not even my husband now hates it so much as I. Mistress, sweet mistress. And another thing, something I've told no one, not even Elmer. Yes, mistress. These past few hours, two or, or three perhaps, I've noticed a sensation in the awful birthmark itself. Is it painful? No, not painful. But it induces a certain restlessness throughout my system, a stirring craving, a desire to, to... I'm, in, I'm going in to venture into the laboratory where my husband works. Wait. Don't try to stop me. Don't interrupt him. I must, I must. Through the open door, I can see him. Pale as death, anxious and absorbed as he hangs over the distiller, as though it depended upon his utmost watchfulness whether or not the liquid within would be the draft of immortal happiness or eternal despair. The world of science is one I know little of. The reasoning and the deductions of great scientists are beyond my comprehension. But this I do know. All their arduous journeys to logical deductions, all their fevered experiments along the way, all these descend directly from the ancient, fervid belief in magic. We shall return to you presently with the concluding act. Aylmer has installed his young wife, Georgiana, in the inner chambers adjoining his laboratory. When, attempting to reassure her, he leaned to embrace her, he was struck afresh with horror at the sight of the little red birthmark that painted the perfection of her cheek. Seeing his revulsion, Georgiana fainted, and it was Aylmer's servant Aminadab who carried her to the sumptuous boudoir so lovingly prepared for her. Since that moment, Aminadab has spent every free moment with Georgiana, until at last... A minute, Abba, I'm venturing into the laboratory. Wait, mistress. Don't try to stop me. Don't interrupt I him. I must. I'm... Elm. What? Who dared? Georgiana. Why have you come here? It was necessary. Have you no trust in your husband? Oh, Elma. Will you throw the blight of that fateful birthmark over my labors? Elma, no, never. Go, woman, go. I implore you. Tell me all the risk we run. No, Georgiana. Fear not that I shall shrink. My share in it is far less than your own. I can conceal nothing from you, nor will I. I ask no more than that, nor ever did. Know then that this crimson hand upon your cheek, superficial as it seems, has clutched its grasp into your being with a strength of which I had no previous conception. I've already administered agents powerful enough to do everything but change your entire physical system. Only one thing remains to be tried. Only one? If that fails us, we are ruined. But why did you hesitate to tell me this? Because, Georgiana, there is danger. Danger? There is but one danger. That this horrible stigma shall be left upon my cheek. Remove it. Whatever the cost, remove it or we shall both go mad. Heaven knows your words are true. Now, my dear one, return to your boudoir. In a short while, all will be tested. All this I watch from the door of the boudoir. Now he conducts her to her bed. And I watch this too. He takes leave of her with a solemn tenderness which speaks far more than words. How much is now at stake? Aminadab. Aminadab, are you here? I am here, mistress. What is this that hangs over my head? A mirror, mistress. But it is a scant meter from my face. It is a mirror, mistress. The master bade me place it there. Oh. Oh, I see now. I see my face and I see the despicable birthmark as well. Do not dwell upon it. No. I shall muse upon more easeful things. My husband, for example. 
a great man. His character, his love for me. He does indeed love you. I never knew till now how much he loves me. My heart is exalted a minute up, even though it trembles. At the purity, the loftiness of his love, it will accept nothing less than perfection. Oh, mistress. With my whole soul, I pray that for a single moment I may satisfy his highest and deepest conception. Longer than a moment, I know it not possible to be. For his spirit is ever on the march, ever ascending, each instant requiring something that lies beyond the scope of the instant before. Georgiana. My dear. Elmer. The concoction of the draft has been perfect. Unless all my science has deceived me, it cannot fail. Were it not for you, my dearest husband, I might wish to put off my birthmark of mortality by relinquishing mortality itself. Life is a sad possession to those who have attained the degree of moral advancement at which I stand. Were I weaker and blinder, it might be happiness. Were I stronger, it might be endured. But being what I find myself to be, methinks I am of all mortals, the most fit to die. Why do we speak of dying? The draft cannot fail. Give me the goblet. Georgiana. I joyfully stake all upon your word. Drink, then. Drink. The liquid is like water from a heavenly fountain. Now, my dearest, let me sleep. My earthly senses are closing over my spirit like the leaves around the heart of a rose at sunset. A minute, Ab. Yes, Buster. Oh, there you are. Come here. Yes, Buster. Uh, fetch me my folio volume. It is right there, Master, by her bed. She was reading in it. Uh, you will inscribe in it what I dictate. I shall watch her for symptoms and relay them to you. Yes, Master. I am ready. Her cheeks are flushed. Cheeks flushed. Be sure to note down the precise time of each entry. Yes, Master. Breath is slightly irregular. Slightly irregular breath. Left eyelid quivers. Left eyelid. A tremor. A tremor. Barely perceptible, but a tremor through the frame. All the while, the great man fails not to gaze at the fatal crimson hand. And not without a shudder of disgust. You mean it, Ab? Do my eyes deceive me? Is the crimson hand more faintly outlined? It has faded a trifle, Master. Yet, yet she is pale as ever. But the birthmark is less distinct. I shall conquer. I shall conquer. I know it. I shall conquer. <laughs> The presence of the scarlet hand has been awful, God knows, but its departure is more awful still. Watch the stain of a rainbow fade out of the sky, and you will know of the passing of the birthmark. By heaven, it is well nigh gone. I can scarcely trace it now. Success! Success! Yes. Success. Now it is like the faintest rose color. The lightest flush of blood across her cheek would overcome it. But she is so pale. Draw the window curtain. Suffer the light of natural day to fall into the room and rest upon her cheek. Yes, master. A minute, Ab. You serve me well. You and I, matter and spirit, earth and heaven, both have done their part in this. <laughs> laugh, you thing of the senses. You have earned the right to laugh, and so have I. Success is ours, yours and mine. His wild exclamations break her sleep. Slowly she uncloses her eyes and gazes into the mirror above her face, which she has arranged for and I have set up. A faint smile flits over her lips when she recognizes how barely perceptible is now the crimson hand which had once blazed forth with such disastrous brilliance as to frighten away their happiness. But now... Her eyes seek his face with a look of trouble and anxiety. My 
poor Elmer? Poor? Nay, richest, happiest, most favored. Dear love. My peerless bride, it is successful. Dearest husband. You are perfect. You have aimed loftily. You have done nobly. Georgiana, my precious wife. Oh, Elmer. Dearest Elmer. I am dying. Alas, it is too true. The fatal hand has grappled with the mystery of life. Had been the bond by which an angelic spirit kept itself in union with a mortal frame. The last crimson tint of the birthmark. That sole token of human imperfection fades from her cheek. My master stares with eyes that seem to see nothing save the spot where it had been and is no more. He is still staring down into her face when something causes me to glance upward to a spot just above her recumbent form. A puff of smoke, a fragment of cloud vapor. What is it that seems to rise from her body, linger a moment near him, then take its flight toward heaven? She's dead. She's lost to me forever. Where did I fail? Where did I go astray? <laughs> How can you laugh? You lump of earth! You mass of clay! Oh, man of intellect. Oh, great man of science. Oh, eminent philosopher who seeks to penetrate every secret of our great mother. You see before you the last result of your impudence. Thus ever does the gross fatality of earth exult in its invariable triumph over the immortal essence. I only tried... Had you, oh great man, reached a profounder wisdom, you need not thus have flung away the happiness which would have woven your mortal life of the self-same texture with the celestial. I only wish... A momentary circumstance was too strong for you. You did not look beyond the shadowy scope of time and living once and for all in eternity. You failed to find the perfect future in the present. I pity you, great man, from the depths of my soul. You loved her. You loved her. You. I loved her. Yes. Just as she was, I loved her. Just as God sent her into this world, I loved her. And would have loved her all my days. What have I done? What have I done? What men of your stamp must inevitably do. You have pursued your dream, followed your star. That is what you have done, master. Given what you are, that is what you must always do. <laughs> The story of the birthmark was written over a hundred years ago, at a time when the worship of science was sweeping over the world. In the last century, this worship has grown to a frenzy. We bow before its power. We refuse to believe that it cannot resolve all our woes. When will we learn that science is not a god? That it was never meant to be worshipped? That it is our servant only? Never our master. I'll be back shortly. Though Nathaniel Hawthorne lived in relative obscurity until the Scarlet Letter made him famous, he was never ignored by his fellow writers. Longfellow admired him hugely 
and so did Herman Melville. And Edgar Allan Poe called him the example par excellence of the privately admired and publicly unappreciated man of genius. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Gordon Heath, and Marion Seldes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Death is a much maligned figure. An unwelcome visitor to most. But to some, he comes as a friend and a healer, much prayed for and sought. To them, he is Johann Sebastian Bach's Zisser Tote, Sweet Death, who comes to bind up unbearable wounds. But not to everyone who prays for his soothing touch is he allowed. Some crimes are too great to be forgiven by death. Our mystery drama, The Curse of Conscience, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Tony Roberts. The young, strong hands are clenched so tightly on the cell bars that all the blood is squeezed out of them and the veins stand out dark and distended against the chalk-white skin. His eyes are glassy, and his voice has the edge of hysteria. His name is Simon Berman, or once was before he changed it for a number. And he is not alone. He is never, never alone anymore. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not looking around. She's sitting there waiting for me, too, but I ain't fighting. She just start talking to me, and I don't want that. That's the way it all began. But now it's all over. It's got to be. She ain't there. She can't be. That's the way it is. She's just not there. Don't be ridiculous, Simon. Of course I'm here. No. You know it as well as I do. No. I'm never going to go away. So you might as well turn around. Well, I, I don't want to start anything again. Very well. Suit yourself. But I won't ever go away. One thing I got to say is she don't change. I mean, she's like that old crumb in ancient history or something who wanted to get across the river. And the fool who let him climb on his back uh, never could get him off again. It's crazy. I mean, you know, who could have figured the way it began? A couple of years ago, I'm I'm stuck in Cleveland. The town is dead. I mean, dead. You can't turn a buck doing nothing. So I pick up this girl, some Jane. I don't even remember her name now. She drags me into some church social. Hmm. That's where I meet Cousin Anne. Hello, my dears. You uh, want some tickets to dance? Yeah, sure, ma'am. Uh, how much are they? Well, that's our theme of the evening, all for the church. Ten cents a dance. Uh, well, I'll spring for a buck's work. You might want our special two dollars to dance all night. Oh, gee, that's romantic, huh, Si? 
dance all night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me, uh, give me two, a two dollar special. Then. You'd uh, like some refreshment? We have a nice punch. No, thanks. No, just the dancing. Maybe after you've danced, you'd like a cool, refreshing drink. Yeah, what is it? Lemonade? Well, that's what the church provides. <laughs> How much is it a shot? The church set a price of twenty-five cents a glass. Okay. Okay. Fine. Uh, we'll be back, ma'am. Okay, Candy. Oh, sure, sorry. Come on, let's dance. What do you say, Candy? Should we uh, cut out? Oh no, I'm having a good time. Aren't you? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. Uh, it's a two-bit church recreation hall and a jukebox. Uh, <laughs> The Stardust Ballroom, it ain't, you know. Well, if you want to take me somewhere better, like maybe the disco or one of the big hotel ballrooms. Well, I was figuring, like, uh, maybe I'd uh, take you home, you know. At nine o'clock in the evening? Oh, you promised me a big time. Yeah, 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 sure I did. But... I thought you were the big spender. What's your rush? You turn me on, Mama. Well, so that's all right, but, but a girl doesn't like to be rushed all that much, you know. Yeah, and if we hang around here for a while? Well, then maybe we could, like, you know, stop at your place. Ah, duh. no, I just had it painted. Look, uh, the place ain't fit to live in. I mean, how about your place? Well, uh, You got a roommate or something? Oh, no, but... Uh, yeah, but what? Well, like, I don't even hardly know you. Hey, what do you want? My life history? Uh, fingerprints? Uh, social security number? Oh, come on. I don't need anything like that. I, I I can tell you, you're a real nice guy. So, uh, so after another dance, uh, we go to your place. Huh? Oh, okay. Uh, but first, I, I gotta go to the, you know, and, like, when I get back, I could use some of that lemonade. You spring for some for us? Yeah, sure, so long as we got that deal, huh? Oh, well, you got it made, handsome. Time you get back, I'll be waiting for you over in the corner there. Go to my place. <laughs> That's a laugh. I'm down to my last double fin and a cardboard suitcase full of dirty laundry and a locker at the bus station. I gotta make some kind of score and I need a pad. That's where the doll comes in and I gotta play her along till I make some kind of connection. So I figure I can afford to invest four bits making her happy, and I, I mooch over to the old dame at the punch bowl. Well, young man, now would you like some punch? Yeah, a glass for my old lady, uh, anyways. Old lady? Yeah, the girl I was with, ma'am, you know. Oh. Well, now, maybe you ought to try some yourself first. No, no, that's all right. I uh, don't go in much for, uh, you know, uh, soft drinks. You might like this one. <laughs> Try it. We'll make it on the house. On the house, huh? <laughs> well, uh, I never refuse a lady. <coughs> That's lemonade. What kind of church dance is this? Oh, I have them once a month. Most of the customers are regular. Yeah, well, I can see why. Would you, um, would you like another? You wouldn't have to twist my arm. Hmm, thanks. Here's, uh, here's looking at you. And I'll take uh, one more and two for my girlfriend, huh? I thought I'd make a sale. <laughs> there. And there. Let's see now. That's um, one on the house. Two for you and two for the young lady. Mm -hmm. That'll be uh, $4, please. Yeah. Four dollars. Hey, uh, uh, look, I thought you said a quarter. Uh, there was there was a sign up. That was before the punch was uh, uh, spiked. Yeah, well, look, I, I ain't got that kind of dough. Oh, dear, I hope you're not going to... You're not going to welch. You, you've drunk two glasses, you know. I'd hate to have to turn you over to the boys. The, the boys? They're such nice boys to play at such a brutal game. And they have the church hall here Wednesdays. For their karate class. Uh, Cousin Ann, uh, look if I may call you that. Oh, yes, please do. Everybody does. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, from, uh, from one, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say, uh, you are something else. Well, thank you. Well, that's quite a compliment for an old lady in her 85th year. 
Is your 85? I said year 84. Please don't rush me as I must you. The four dollars, please. Well, uh, except for some change, all I got is a ten dollar bill. Oh, I can make change. You win. I wonder what happened to my girl. Where did she go? The, uh, uh, the powder room. Oh, I can find out for you. Uh, uh, would you mind running my stand till I come back? Uh, here's your six dollars change. Hey, you trust me with this? Why shouldn't I? Are you all right, my dear? What? Oh, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, Cousin Anne. Oh, I'm Candy Minton. Why did you ask if I was all right? Oh, well, because um, your young man was worried about you. Well, he's I... not my young man. I, I just came with him and I... And now I... you're sorry you did, huh? I, I didn't say that. You didn't have to. He's a bit of a swinger. Is that what it is, Candy? Yeah, like, well, like he, he wants to take me home, see? Well, naturally. Yeah, but you don't see it. I... I live alone, you know, and I can feel this is like he's trouble, and I don't want any. Fascinating. How do you know? Well, I... I wasn't born yesterday. I... I know his type by now. He's some kind of drifter, deadbeat. I, I don't know what. All you got to do is look in his eyes. This dude is trouble. Oh, I don't think so. Seemed like quite a nice boy to me. Oh, don't let him fool you. I think he's just lonely. Maybe a bit scared. Oh, not him. But what am I going to do? Well, if you if you want to go home without him, nothing's easier. But I can't slip him. I I just know it. He he's watching for me to come out. Well, he won't be when you do. I'll make sure of that. How? Very simple. I'm going out now, and I'm going to ask him to dance with me. <laughs> dance with you? Why not? I've always been a very good dancer. Just a minute. How oh, nice. Just my speed and right on cue. <laughs> They're playing a waltz. Now, Candy, while he's dancing with me, you watch. And when you get the chance, duck down the back car to the rear door and out of his life. He won't see you, I guarantee. I'll keep him busy. <laughs> standing by the punch bowl when this uh, wrinkled up little prune blows back, almost catching me sneaking the last drink in the bowl. I figure the best defense is attack since I see she's uh, alone. Huh? Hey, uh, where's my girl? Oh, she's um, otherwise engaged for the moment. Well, I see the bowl is empty. I'm not surprised. Well, I've been doing a Russian business here. Uh, let's see, uh, 23 bucks. Thank you. Well, that frees me from my duties. So while we're waiting for your young lady, why don't you ask me to dance? To dance? They're playing a waltz. My favorite. Uh, well, I ain't much on that kind of dancing, cousin. You... Cousin Anne, please. Use my name. And there's no problem. I can show you very easily. <laughs> hey. Hey, you know, you dance pretty good. So do you, um, uh... Sai. Is that with a C? Uh, no, it's with an S. You know, for Simon. Simon. Oh, I might have known it. He looks so much like him. It's almost as if he were alive all over again. Uh, some guy you know named Simon? No, his name was Peter. But that's just the same, isn't it? Oh, dig it. Oh, it's in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. It all just seems as though it's fated, Sai. What's that? That I should command you, as our Lord did to the man Simon called Peter, to follow me. Yeah, where? Oh, I would hope to your salvation. Well, now, that's sort of a rocker for a number one man whose life is dedicated to the pursuit of the easy buck, isn't it? To say nothing of the fact that he's a man who doesn't need an elastic conscience. 
because in his life to date, he's never needed one at all. Just how do you suppose he'll make out if he ever has to use one? Let's see when I return with Act Two. The tall, dark, handsome boy dances with the little sparrow bird of a woman. A half a century lies between them. The boy, for all his easy carriage, is a coiled spring, tensed, dangerous. His agate bright eyes, afraid and menacing, behind the surface charm. The little old lady is serene and unafraid, with the dauntless armor of extreme age and inner faith. An ill-assorted couple, joined by an accident of fate, which can lead only to disaster. Hey, you're too much for me, cousin Anne. I don't think so, Simon. Maybe just enough, or at least what you need. You're up against it, aren't you? Come again? You're broke, practically down to your last dime, and you're looking for a meal ticket. <laughs> Lady, you fracture me, you know? I mean, how's an old woman like you know where anything's at? <laughs> I put in my apprenticeship finding out. I've lived a lot of years. Yeah, in the past. Oh, I'm still here. You'll have to tell me if I'm right. I think you've run out the string side. That ten bucks I changed for you was your last line of defense. <laughs> hey, what is this? I know I'm right, and so do you. And this girl tonight, she was just a means to an end, a place to spend the night on. Huh? What do you What do you mean? Uh, was? Hey, look, I I gotta find her. And I... She isn't here anymore. How do you know? You scared her. She wanted to go home, and she's gone alone. I'm sorry if I broke up your date, but it really was for the best. Yeah, I'm glad you figure it that way. Now, before you get too mad, why don't you listen to me? Yeah, listen to what? I don't have a date. So you can be mine. The party's over, Simon. Will you see me home? I never figured this. Me, walking a little old bundle of bones, couldn't weigh over 85 pounds soaking wet home. But what else have I got going for me, you know? So, that's my proposition. Now, how does it feel for a change? What do you mean, uh, change? <laughs> well, aren't you the one who usually makes the proposition? <laughs> I say it again, Cousin Ann. You are really something else. Something else from you, Simon, baby. I'd like you to cross over and join my world. Well, what's your world? Well, I told you. The way to salvation. You mean you're ready to take me in? Uh, you stake me till I find a job? Get back on my feet? But what's the payoff? Payoff? What am I letting myself in for? What, what have I got to pay back? Oh, nothing really except companionship and maybe sort of the miracle of a memory coming alive. For even only a little while. You're so like him, Simon. Well, here we are home. We can say good night and you keep on walking, or you come in with me and make it yours, too. You're taking some risk. <laughs> At 85. Uh, 84. <laughs> You uh, really want me to come stay with you? I really do, Simon. I think it would be very good for both of us. I got a suitcase down at the bus station with my things. I, I could go fetch it and come back. You do that. And I'll have a nice little supper waiting for you by the time you come back, Peter. I, I mean, Simon. This'll be your room, Simon. With your own bath right across the hall. Put out towels for you. Oh, uh, th there's a closet over there. And whenever you're ready, I have a little surprise for you. Keep it hot in the kitchen. Yeah, well, I can unpack later. Uh, why don't I come on down with you now? Whatever you want. From now on, you're home. 
you buy this? You can see this happen? I had to shake all the cobwebs from that loaded punch out of my head to make sure it was for real, and, I, and I'd fallen knee-deep in it. Suddenly I was cold sober, and I knew I'd hit the jackpot if I just played it right. I washed my face quickly, I combed my hair, and went down to supper in the kitchen. More coffee? As much as you want. How's the pizza? Oh, it's the most. I don't eat it myself. I really don't remember just why I bought it. Maybe someone nudged my elbow. Huh? Oh, since it wasn't my idea, it must have come from above. I don't think you crossed my path by accident. Mm. I don't know what else. Well, you don't believe in him as easily as I do. Yeah, you know, religion uh, ain't my speed. Perhaps not yet. Oh, you're so like him. Go back to Peter again, eh? Simon called Peter. Does that upset you? Yeah, well, you know, I kind of like to be number one guy. Who was this Peter guy, anyway? It was the man I should have married. The man I should have made marry me. I was too romantic for our own good, so I just let him walk out of my life. Uh, he ditched you? No, not exactly. No, he had another appointment, which kept him in, in France. Villa Wood, near Chateau Thierry. Yeah, that's what I say, another day. No. No, a gentleman with a scythe. Huh? Death, Simon. Death. In the Dark Ages, long before you were born, May 27th, 1918, a German machine gun cut him down. Peter. Peter Hurst, who should have been my husband, except that he refused to marry me. And why? Oh, just exactly because of what happened. When he marched away to war, he had a premonition he'd never come back. He thought that 28 would be too young for a widow. And I was fool enough to let him have his way. Well, I don't know, Cousin Ann. Uh, maybe he pegged it right. No sense for making a... Well, you know, like uh, making a commitment to some poor Joe couldn't be around. Now, this way he lets you swing free. You know what I mean? If we'd been married, we'd have been together. And if we'd been together, I know we'd have had a child. This way... I was left with nothing. You mean you never... Nothing to bother about. Yet. But if I had had that child, he might have looked just like you. Oh, come on, Cousin Annie. B -B -B would have been old enough to be my father. I could have been a girl. Either way, I might have ended up with a grandson. <laughs> I ain't the guy. No, not yet. Huh? Oh, forget that. Now, the first thing to do is get you a job, isn't it? Well, how would you like to work in a bank? A bank? Yes, Mr. Gillette is the man who handles my affairs. And I'm sure if I recommended you, he might find something for you. Should I recommend you, Simon? Why not? Oh, I'm the one who was asking the questions. I mean, can you be trusted? <laughs> what do you think? I mean, uh, what do you think? I want to heist the joint? Well, I'd like to feel that I could be sure you wouldn't. I told you I was interested in your salvation. I get a job at the bank. Interest clerk in the savings department. <laughs> and I lived with Cousin Anne, and she, she tried to make my peace with her God, and uh, maybe it wasn't all con, because she sort of got to me, you know, and... Who knows, the way things could have gone, except for Ted Slade turning up one day. Hey, man, I've been waiting for you. Yeah? <laughs> you don't recognize me? Ted. Ted yeah. Slade. Yeah, I know. Hey, where are you heading? It's my lunch hour. I got some place to grab a fast sandwich. Okay, I'll walk with you. Hey, working that joint? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. I never thought I'd see you go square. I gotta eat. Yeah. Best you could do. It ain't like that. 
So how is it? And tell me. Shut up. Well, just figured you for a little inside info. Yeah? About what? Mm, the way banks work. Like, uh, since you're on the inside. What do you got in mind? Hey, I'll buy you lunch. And maybe we could get our heads together, huh? I'm not copping out. I'm not trying to duck it. I, I knew as well as Ted did where he was heading, you know. We, we were both main chance boys, and the way it stacked up, whatever religion I'd got kind of, like, melted. It all looked so easy. Ah, who's trying to knock off your bank, chum, huh? Yeah, then what? Well, I've cased this little neighborhood bank corner of Stillwell and Seven. Same pattern as yours. Now, Friday should be the big day when the cash is still alive, not buried in a vault. You drive. That's all the risk you take. I pay off one-third. Yeah, is it worth it? <laughs> you gotta know it is. That's payday for the consolidated machine plant. There's like 150,000 riding on this. You want in? Hmm? Yeah, you got me. I want in. When? Next Friday. Take off sick. In the morning, you pick up the getaway car. From then on in, it's smooth sailing. Sure, I should have told him to get lost, you know? You think I don't know that? But there were other things going for me right then. Like I was broke. And anyway, I, I had a grab at it. Huh. What did you say? Cousin Ann? Oh, come on. She was just a lucky break I'd latched on to. Or was she? Wasn't she maybe a... I don't know what to call it, like... Maybe a force that was shoving me into a corner. I couldn't break out of it. Say, so maybe Ted was handing me a brass ring. I I could grab it and I could get off the merry-go-round. Wrong or right, I grabbed it. You okay? Sure. All right, I'm going out now. I just saw a consolidator make the big deposit. You can handle it alone? <laughs> Duck soup. You just hold fast. Be ready to take off when I come out. No rough stuff? Hey, you playing with children. Not unless there has to be. Hang in there, partner. I saw him saunter into the bank. Then nothing. But the waiting. When I finally heard them, like... Like I guess I knew all along I was going to. That this was one heist which wasn't gonna work. I shoved that getaway car into gear and took off. I junked it four blocks away and went back meekly to my job as interest clerk. But I knew right then, no matter how it went, I had to get out, even away from Cousin Ann. Oh, terrible. What a waste. Hmm? A young man robbing a bank shot to death. And what for? Let me see. Ted Slade. Oh, did you know him? Uh, I'm just uh, reading his name here in a paper. Where? Yeah, right there. Oh, oh, at the end of the story, I hadn't got that far. Police speculated that the robber could not have been alone. Mrs. James C. Nielsen, returning from lunch, remembers a gray sedan sitting near the bank with its engine running. A search is being made for the car and a possible driver. Oh, what a terrible thing. A young man throwing away his life for a, a few dollars. You wouldn't have to do that, Simon. Huh? You have a future if you want it with me. May not be much. But all I have when I die is going to you. And I just hope you're willing to wait. But I wasn't. And I was too scared some smart cop would get a make on me. And I was long past being Mama's boy. So that night, I picked up stakes and I took off for the Big Apple. If you want to get lost, where else is better than New York? Hmm? And I thought I'd said goodbye to Cousin Anne... Forever. 
sooner or later, every grifter, every guy with an angle gravitates to New York. The city isn't to blame. It's just so big that, like blotting paper, it absorbs and disidentifies anyone who wants to become anonymous. A petty crook like Sai could have remained forever that way if... But that's the story. So we'll save that till I return shortly with Act Three. Three months in New York have not been very kind to Cy Berman. Oh, he has a new girl. There's always a girl in the life of a man like Cy, but what he doesn't have is money, or what he would call a connection to raise any. Worse than that, he's in the hands of the loan sharks, so he's not at his best this morning. Lou! Hey, Lou! Yes, I mean, what is it? That devil is a wreck. Oh, they're tearing down the building next door. They've been at it since 8 o'clock this morning. Shut the window, will you? Put down the noise. Oh, the place will get like a steam bag. I don't care. I'd rather sweat than have my brain scrambled. Come on, move it. Do what I say. Yes, sure, Sai, sure. Don't, don't flip. Huh. Huh. How's that? Vibration's still enough to knock my head off. I need a drink. Where's the bottle? I threw it out. What? Now, take it easy, Sai. Si. You'll mark me up again. It was empty. You've been hitting it again? Sai, si, no. You, you knocked it off yourself last night. Oh, please, you're hurting me. I ought to lay one across you. Go on, get out of here. Get me another one. Oh, what'll I use for money? We clean again? You ought to know. Oh, jeez, what are we going to do, Sai? Si? I don't know. I can't get nowhere. Well, if it hadn't been for me, we'd have been on welfare the past month and a half. Sure, sure. Big deal your brother rung me in on. Get me in the hands of the loan sharks. How am I going to dig myself out of that, huh? Oh, if you could only get something going. Yeah, not legitimate, that's for sure. You know, I'm never going to dig myself out that... Who's that? I don't know. Maybe Sal. Yeah? Give him my gun just in case. Now, don't go off like a rocket, Sai. I'm sure it's only my brother. Yeah, I'm not taking any chances. Who is it? It's Sal. Are you alone? Sure. What do you think? You better be. I'm nervous. I'm real edgy. Open that door, Sai. Si. Go ahead, Lou. Open it up. Ah, will you put the gun away, Sai? Si? I'm alone. This time. What do you want? <sighs> You're overdue, Sai. Si. Oh, I haven't got it. Well, you'd better get it. You know, the man gets nervous when it goes over a gram. A thousand bucks? Mm -hmm. Hey, I only borrowed three bills. Well, that's the way it is with interest. <laughs> it mounts up. How am I going to get that kind of dough? Search me. But if I was you, I'd, I'd get it. I mean, by Monday next week. That's all the time you got. Oh, Sal, can't you give him a break? You're my brother, after all. Lou, hon, there ain't no family connections with the man. Now, I am just a messenger. It's my neck or sides. So who's do you figure I'm going to look out for? Yeah, but he hasn't got it, honest. Well, he'd better find some way to get it. Hey, ain't you got no family you can put the bee on, huh, Sai? Nah, I've been on my own ever since I was a... Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. Maybe there is a way. It took me pretty near ten minutes on the phone to get Cousin Ann to stop trying to hang up on me. She sure soured on me the way I walked out on her. But when the chips are down, I can wheedle with the best. Oh, well, I'm probably being very foolish, Simon. And that's another privilege of old age. Do you want to come home again? Oh, more than anything, Cousin Ann. But, well, only I can't, see? What's the matter? You're in trouble? Yeah. With, with the police? Oh, no, no, no. Nothing like that. Uh, a girl? Uh, well, no, I, I don't have any trouble with them. Yes, I don't imagine you do. Well, what is it, then? Uh, I... I was very foolish, see. I... I had to live. I'm... I'm in hock. You mean you owe money? Yeah, you can say that again. Well, how much? A thousand dollars. <laughs> but maybe I could... I could stave them off, you know, uh, with less. You're asking me for the money, Simon? Just 
Just as a loan. Uh, but you'd rather have it as a gift, huh? Oh, uh, well, you you know, you once said something about putting me in your will. I'm, 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 I'm sure I'd rather have it now, you know. A thousand dollars? You gotta help me, uh, Cousin Ann, please. Well, give me your New York address and phone number, Simon, and I I'll think it over. I guess I don't have to tell nobody how I sweated out the next couple of days. Like, uh, I must have jumped a foot every time the phone rang. And I had Lou running up and down the stairs ten times a day looking for the mail. Who's that, Lou? Search me. Look, they said I had till Monday. I still got time. Yeah? Yeah, who is it? It's Cousin Ann, Simon. Will you come down and, and help me with my bags, please? Who is it? It's Cousin Ann. What the devil's she doing here in New York? So, this is how you're living. Uh, yeah, it's the best I've been able to manage. Well, now that Cousin Ann is here, we'll see if we can't improve things for you. You mean you, you brought the... I mean, uh... I mean the money? Now, that's something we can discuss when I get settled in. <laughs> I want us to enjoy my visit while I'm here, before we go back to Cleveland. The next few days was enough to get me annoyed enough to murder this old babe. Like it gets to be Saturday, and I sneak out of the house to phone Lou from a booth and let her know how the land lays, see? Sally ain't here right now, Si. Nothing he could do anyways. Hey, look, Lou, don't be mad at me. I'm just trying to play the angles, only nothing pays off. She hasn't come up with the dough? Nah. She says it's uh, usury and uh, it's against the law. She, she, she wanted to bring in the cops. Oh, no. Yeah, it was all I could do to stop her. Lou, what am I going to do? Don't tell me you've run out of snake oil, John boy. There you off. Yeah. I tell you, I'm scared silly. And what's driving me bananas is all she's got to do is write a check and I'm home free. I've only got today and tomorrow to make her see reason. If she doesn't come through, I'm going to murder her. Oh, there you are, Simon. I didn't know where you'd go to. I was afraid you'd forgotten our little trip to the Metropolitan Art Museum today. Look, uh, Cousin Anne, uh, maybe this trip here is a big blast to you, but uh, with me, it's uh, life and death. I got less than 24 hours to come up with a thousand big ones, or else I'm going to get hurt. I'm hurt bad. I gotta know. You're going to give it to me or not? I have no intention of having any traffic with crooks and criminals. Or of condoning usury. I am not going to pay it, and neither are you. What? The matter is in much better hands than ours, Simon. And that's the last I intend to say about it. Whose hands? You think this is something that, uh, that guy you pray to is going to take care of? I have no doubt in the last analysis. I am sure when we go to church tomorrow, he will answer my prayers. There's a right way... And a wrong way to go about things. Now, you listen to me, Simon. No. I... Now, you listen to me, you silly old doll. You're going to make that payoff. You see this? Yes, it's a pistol. Yeah, with real bullets. One of which, so help me, is going to make you very dead if you don't sit down and write me a check for that thousand. I can't do that, Simon. You better, cousin. I am not kidding. I'm desperate. I, I, it, it wouldn't do any good even if, if I had a check, which I haven't. I haven't even a bank account. And I haven't any money. Certainly not a thousand dollars. What are you talking about? You're loaded. I have a small insurance annuity policy, which pays me barely enough to live on. Yeah, but the, but the house... Oh, I don't own that. The church has been kind enough to let me use it these last years rent-free in return... But you said I'd be in your will. You are, but... Why, it's only a few dollars that I thought might help. Why, me. you silly old fraud. You led me down a garden path. And because of you, I'm going to get my brains knocked out. I could kill you for that. Only you won't. Because God wouldn't allow a boy like you. Damn you. And your... Ah. Ah. <gasps> oh, oh no. C Cousin Ann, look. And me. Please, drop your gun and open up. When the door opens, you better have your hands on top of your head.
Okay. Okay, I dropped the gun. Uh, I'm opening up. That's nice, buddy. Just hold it like that. See to the old lady there. Right, sir. How did you know to be here? We weren't looking for homicide, buddy. Just answering a complaint at the precinct two days back by the old lady. Something about usury and loan shocks. We just came by to check it out. What's the matter, Crumb? She didn't want to pay off? They had me dead to rights. They threw the book at me. Maximum security. Solitary. The night I arrived here in jail, so did Cousin Anne. I was getting ready to turn in. Washing my face. As I reached for the towel, there she was. Sitting on the bed. Knitting on something. Hello, Simon. What are you doing here? Keeping you company. Yeah, but you... You can't. You're dead. Oh, no. No, you took my life in the midst of a deception. And my punishment is I cannot die till you do. We're going to be together a long time. No. 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 Get me out of here. God. God. Get me out. I can't stand it. I'd rather die. I'd rather be dead. Not a pleasant story, I'm sorry to say. But then Simon Berman wasn't, uh, I should say isn't, a very pleasant character. So perhaps the punishment fits the crime. He'll have a long, long time to learn with Hamlet that conscience doth make cowards of us all. I'll be back shortly. Cy Berman is no longer housed on death row. He lives part of the time in a padded cell when he doesn't have to be confined to a straitjacket in his own room. They've even given up treatments. No form of therapy helps. He lives in his private world with only one other companion, a gentle ghost named Cousin Anne, whose kindly presence, far from soothing him, has driven him mad. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Mary Jane Higby, Bryna Rayburn, and Earl Hammond. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I'm E.G. Marshall. May I be your guide once again for that trip through another world, a world of the weird and the unusual? Consider, what we are pleased to call science is based primarily on our observation of cause and effect. So, we say the rooster crows to herald the approach of dawn. But what does the rooster think? From his point of view, 
Isn't he justified in believing that the sun rises because he commands it? In the final analysis, it all becomes a matter of perspective, doesn't it? Our mystery drama, The Deadliest Favor, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Norman Rose and Marion Seldes. said, he that dies pays all his debts. And while this may be true, it is neither a practical nor a popular way to discharge one's obligations. And yet, how can we ever hope to pay the vast accumulation of debt that accrues during our lifetime? Well, this has nothing to do with money. We refer rather to the true obligations when we ask, can anyone live long enough to repay all the favors extended, all the kindnesses shown, all the comforting words spoken by friends and strangers? Rare is that fortunate man or woman whose account is not in arrears. The Prime Minister described the situation as one of the utmost gravity. And now, let us go to the West Coast where they are having a fantastic premiere of that super-sensational million-dollar epic, Kiss of Blood. This is a premiere like they had in the good old days. Everybody who is anybody is here. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. That's a long way from here, Carlotta, baby. <laughs> a long, long way. I made myself this bed. I'll just have to learn to like it. Live with it. Hello, darling. Hi. Anything exciting in the news? Um, uh, man said there's going to be a war, I think. <laughs> well, that's not new. Hungry? Mm-hmm. Steak and salad, okay? Okay. Uh, do you have a good work session? No. Oh, I'm sorry. What's the problem? I don't know. That first draft is due in two months, Edmund. Yeah, I just can't seem to get it down. Well, why not? I can't concentrate. Up here, <laughs> a million miles from no place. Maybe that's why. Well, but you are the one who wanted to get away from the hustle and the bustle and the hurly-burly. Yeah, believe me, I don't miss it. I'm, I'm happy to be up here. Then why can't you write? Because... Well, Carlotta, because I've, I've got a guilty conscience. I feel guilty about you. Me? Mm -hmm. See, I don't need people. I don't need parties, a theater, opening nights. I don't either. But, Carlotta, you were always so... I was always... what? Always in the middle of it, in the, in the middle of a whole world of excitement and glamour. No, no, darling. I wasn't in the middle of it. I was on the fringes. I was merely one of 2,470,000 aspiring young actresses. <laughs> and that's just one year's crop. Yeah, but I have a feeling it must be so dull for you up here. Dull? I can read, I can paint. And I get the feeling that I'm dull, too. Edmund. No, dear, let me say this. I'm, I'm just a writer. Just a writer. You're the... Best, and most... I'm not even the kind of writer who gets his name in the paper. Well, not the part of the paper anybody bothers to read. Oh, darling, you mustn't run yourself down. My book, my latest book, what is it concerned with? <laughs> you said you'd explain it to me. Well, in this book, I explore the pupil and the larval stages in the development of the caddis fly. Oh. Exactly. Oh. Oh, but I'm sure it must be very interesting. Really? To whom? Well, to, to those people who would be interested. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, you find it exciting, don't you? Well, yes, because it is exciting. You see, Carlotta, the, the caddis fly encloses himself in what he thinks is a golden protective sheath. But in reality, 
It's his coffin. Ah, that sounds good. And the fish, the fish that prey upon him. They also meet their doom. That sounds even better. Because the fish in their turn are eaten by other predators. Well, you've got plenty of action. <laughs> and listen, the largest and most powerful predator is man. Consider how we in our turn are eaten, not by stronger carnivorous, but by our own artificially induced anxieties and tensions. But that sounds great. Uh, yeah. But it's not the kind of thing that'll head a bestseller list or get me on the talk shows. Is that what you want? No, but... But what? Well, I have an idea. It's what you would want. Edmund, I'm happy. I'm very happy. I've got you and you're everything I could wish for. Come in. Oh, Sheriff. Good afternoon, Mr. Churchill. Miss Churchill? Well, you're just in time for dinner, Sheriff. Well, thank you both very kindly, but I happen to be here in line of duty. Oh, do you mean there's a possibility you may have to arrest me or Mr. Churchill? <laughs> or maybe both of us. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. Well, what can we do for you, Sheriff? Well, now, Mr. Churchill, it's about an old friend of yours named Mike Perry. M Mike Perry? The Mike Perry? Killer, Mike Perry. He's a friend of yours, Edmund? Uh, that's what we've been told. Well, you learn something every day. After all these years, they finally did catch up with Killer Mike. They got him on a charge that can stick. And what does he go ahead and do? Smooth as you please, he just busts his way out of jail. And he's here? He's up here? Well, no, he... Probably ain't up here. Well, then why are you... The big city cops and the federals, they went and compiled this list of all his friends. You were one of his friends, Edmund. Oh, well, 20 years ago, we went to school together. And that's what I mean. We've got to run down those leads. You uh, seen him around here, Mr. Churchill? Oh, no, Sheriff. If you do, you'll get in touch. Certainly. Well, I just done my day's work. Drive 20 miles up to see the Churchills. Ask my two questions, and I'll drive 20 miles back to town. <laughs> well, I'm sorry I bothered you, folks. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, drop in again, any time. Well, goodbye now, and have a nice evening. Oh, uh, are you going to take part in the annual fly casting contest week from Saturday, Mr. Churchill? You couldn't keep him away. Well, I almost won last year, remember? Well, Frank Miller over at the motel asked me to remind you. You haven't sent in your entry fee. It's got to be paid by tomorrow. All oh, right, thank you. I'm not going to be disqualified on a technicality. Uh, would you take the money to him, Sheriff? Oh, sure thing. Uh, darling, do you have five dollars? Mm -hmm. He's gone up to ten this year. We have twice as many prizes. Oh, well, here you are, Sheriff. Right. Well, let me know if you hear anything or see anything. Good night. Good night. Edmund. This gang leader. This Mike Perry. How could he possibly have been a friend of yours? Well, we were roommates in college. No. He's an educated man, Carlotta. Then how could he... Rob? Kill? <laughs> I don't know. And how could you associate with a gangster? Well, he wasn't a gangster in those days. Actually, he was a history major. Oh, darling, do you know something? If this were a movie, that door would open right now. And he'd storm in here with a gun in his hand. <laughs> <laughs> no, he wouldn't do that. He'd knock on the door and he'd politely ask permission to come in. And he'd say to me, Well, Eddie, I'm here to collect. Collect? What? The debt I owe him. What? What do you owe him? Well, it's hard to say, Carlotta, on the face of it. I owe him $3,000. $3,000? 3000 $3,000 can mean a little or a lot. Depends on the situation. To me, it once meant life itself. But you never told me. It was tuition and living expenses for my senior year. There would be a job waiting for me in June. A job in research. A job I dreamed about. But I would need the degree. Well, my uncle, who was executor of my father's estate, gambled away the money. And... Are you about to tell me that Mike Perry gave you the 3000 Yes. Where'd he get the money? He robbed a bank. He what? 
Yeah. He robbed a bank. But... He came into my room that day and he said, Eddie, nobody has the right to be that down in the mouth. You look as if you're ready to hang yourself. And I said I was. And he said, kid, tomorrow morning, I'm going to lay that three thou right in your hot little hand. And he did. And when I asked him where he got it, he told me. He robbed a bank. And you believed him? Oh, he did. I said to him, how could you? And he said, they got plenty of money. They'll never miss it. But for you, it's the end of the world. And you took that money? I took it. Because at that time, without that money, it would have been the end of the world for me. But Carlotta, I'll tell you this. I repaid the bank. You did? After I sold my first book. I sent them 3000 in cash. Anonymously, of course. Oh, well then, then you don't owe anybody anything. No, that's not true. I'm still indebted to Mike Perry. Well, I'm sure he doesn't need your $3,000. They say he has millions. Well, I don't owe him the money, exactly. You see, what I owe him is uh, a favor. What kind of a favor? I don't know. Whatever he asks. Well, what could he ask of you? Well, when he gave me the money all those years ago, he said, Eddie, one day I'm going to come to you for a favor. Maybe to save my life the way I just saved yours. And you better be good for it. Well, there isn't anything you can do for him, Edmund. It's all ancient history. It's... 20 years, that's so long ago, that's another world. Yes. And so much has happened to, to both of you. <laughs> oh, listen, I'd venture to say he doesn't even remember you. I just can't get used to the idea. What idea? What idea? Edmund, the idea of Mike Perry being a college man and your roommate. <sighs> when was the last time you saw Mike Perry? When? Or can't you even remember? Oh, yeah, I can remember. The last time I saw Mike Perry was about 30 minutes ago. Look out for the quiet people. At any rate, Mike Perry, a lord of the underworld, has come to this remote mountain area to collect a debt. A debt of 20 years standing. But is Edmund Churchill ready, willing, and able to pay it? I shall return with further news of the principal and interest shortly in Act Two. Ladies, what do you know about your husbands? To Carlotta Churchill, Edmund, her husband, was mild, self-effacing, unassuming, a writer of books on nature. Now she has discovered that Edmund is providing refuge for Mike Perry, an underworld overlord, who is a fugitive from justice. Why? Well, it seems the two men are old friends. He's here? Mike Perry is here? Yes, Carlotta. Where? In my studio, above the barn. Then... then you lied to Sheriff Parker. Yes. But... but... well, we... you and I were not... We're, we're not what, Carlotta? We're not the kind of people who, who, who assist gangsters, killers. At one time, Mike Perry did me a favor. Now he's calling it in. But the law, the law, Edmund. Yes, yes, I've thought about it, and... Well, sometimes you just have to. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's not the point. Are you telling me that we are going to shelter this murderer? I'm telling you I have no alternative as a man of honor. Honor? What has honor got to do with this hoodlum? How can you pervert the word honor? Honor is a personal thing, Carlotta. He's come here to destroy you. But I owe a debt to the roommate I had in my senior year. Now, please, Carlotta, try to understand. I hope it's okay to come in. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, Mike, come in. Uh, Carlotta, this is Mike Perry, very old friend. How do you do, Carlotta? 
Well, I must say, Eddie, your taste has improved since we were undergraduates. Mr. Perry, my husband is under the misguided impression that he is somehow obligated to you. That's his affair. If I had my way, I would call the police. You would? Why? You stand for everything I find evil, vicious and depraved in our society. Well, surely not everything. Uh, well, darling, why don't I help you with dinner, huh? I'm particular with whom I break bread. If you care to feed Mr. Perry, you'll find something in the refrigerator. Meanwhile, you'll excuse me, I have a headache. You know, Eddie... I don't think she likes me. Uh, good morning, dear. I prepared breakfast. Just coffee for me. Where's the gangster chieftain? I put him in the spare room. Uh, Carlotta. Yes? Carlotta, there are certain laws that one does not violate. The law of hospitality... And? and it doesn't matter who a man is or what he does if he's a guest under your roof. He's a guest under your roof, Edmund, not mine. Good morning. Morning. Did you sleep well, Mike? I always sleep well. Oh, one might think you have a clear conscience. Yeah. Like some breakfast? Well, I can help myself, thank you. Oh, I've been up for hours. I did some pages. Now I'll cast a few flies, sharpen up for the tournament, and maybe catch a few rainbows for lunch. Uh, well, uh, I'll see you both later. Well, alone at last. If you'll excuse me, Mr. Perry. Oh, no, no, don't go. If my presence is so distasteful, I'll leave the table and have breakfast later. Thank you. Tell me, Carlotta, why do you hate me? <laughs> you flatter yourself. I have contempt for what you are. But hate, that's too important an emotion to squander. Well, I'll say this for you. You don't squander it. You invested very carefully. You lowered the boom on me last night. You said I was everything vile and evil and depraved. It's true. Well, it's immaterial. Those are only words, but uh, I saw something that you didn't see when you said that about What me. do you think you saw? The flush in your cheeks, the fire in your eyes. Well, of course. I was angry. Yes, I know. But show me a person who really hates something or someone. I'll tell you why. They hate because they're afraid. Afraid of what? Of themselves. They know, they instinctively know, they're fascinated by that something or that someone. Are you saying that I'm fascinated by you? Aren't you? No, no, don't answer that right now. Because you're probably not aware of it. Just yet. Oh. Hello? Morning, Miss Churchill. Oh, good morning, Sheriff. Mr. Churchill about? He's fishing. Is it important? Well, uh, uh, just tell him I gave Frank Miller his entry fee. And he's all set for the contest. Yes, I'll tell him... Oh, uh, is there any news about the escaped gangster? Not a whisper. Although they do think he may be headed toward this part of the country. Oh? When it comes to hiding out, this is as good a place as any, and better than most. Keep an eye peeled, will you, Miss Churchill? Well, of course. Bye now. Goodbye. Thank you. For what? For not calling in the hounds. Had I told the sheriff you were here, I'm sure you would have killed me on the spot. That isn't true. You mean you're not capable of it? Oh, no, no, no. Of course I am. But there'd be no point to it. They'd have me. Where can I go in this wilderness? But... But how do you know I won't call him back? I know. I know. <laughs> Hmm. You've got a good highlight on the cliffside there. And your shadows are remarkable. What are you... What am I doing here? Well, I thought I'd take a walk. 
You're not a bad painter. <laughs> what would you know about it? Oh, I'm quite a patron of the arts. Haven't you heard? Oh, I can imagine. No, 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 no. People like the Medicis and the Borgias, they robbed and they killed. Yet they practically financed the Renaissance. You know, you have delusions of grandeur. <laughs> Why did you quit? Quit what? The theater. I was never in the theater. Oh, that isn't true. I saw you in a play. It was ten years ago. I'll never forget your performance. <laughs> you have developed flattery into a fine art. It was a great performance. What happened? Nothing. Tell me the truth. I told you, nothing happened. I had a bit part in an off-Broadway play. I had one scene and I stole the show. The critics raved and... <laughs> and that was the end of it. It couldn't be. I never got another job. That's impossible. No, it's... It's the way things can work out or not work out in the theater. So I decided to go back to school and get a degree and maybe teach. And you married your professor. That's right. And you've been miserable ever since. That's not true. Now go ahead, tell me. Tell me you've been deliriously happy. Nobody is deliriously happy in this world. That's not true. I am. You? Oh, yes. Because I live. Every second of every minute of every hour. I have everything I want. But you can be shot down at any time. And you can get hit by a truck. You abdicated from life. I'm reconciled to it. Reconciled? You? I saw you on the stage. I saw fire and ice. Excuse me. Uh, where are you going? I'm, I'm going back to the house. I... Yes? Please, I, I said I'm going back. Well, of course. You know why? You're afraid. Afraid of what? Of this. Let go of me. Please let go. Oh, now, who are you kidding? Let... let... Oh... Now I'll let you go. I despise you. Oh, sure. And now for the news headlines. There is still no word on the whereabouts of Mike Perry, who escaped from federal custody in New York last Monday. It's believed he may be headed west. Little Dolly Prescott, the teenage sex queen, is suing... Uh, not so good. Oh, they'll never think to look here, Eddie. Uh, you can't tell. Look, don't walk around in the open. They may be patrolling in helicopters. And how long shall we be honored with your company, Mr. Perry? Uh, darling, Mike is welcome to stay as long as he likes. Well, until the heat's off. I see. You know, Mike, I don't believe it. What? Well, everything I read in the papers. You should always believe what you read in the papers, even if it isn't true. You never killed anybody. No one could ever prove I did. You are the same guy I went to school with. Sure. I mean it. <laughs> well, I don't know what's gotten into me, but I'm writing again. 26 pages yesterday and nine this morning already. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to get back to that typewriter. Uh, will you both excuse me? Oh, sure. You know how it is when you're hot. See you good people at cocktail time. Well, I'll, uh, I'll have to get out of here. Where will you go? Well, don't tell me you care. I... You know, I have an idea. There's going to be some heat here. It's time to make a move. The big one. Well, I'm prepared for it. I got the place all set up. There's only one thing missing. You know what that is? I, I'm not interested. Well, you should be. It concerns you. Listen, Mr. Perry, get this straight. Nothing you do concerns me. You're coming with me. Where? Ah. I caught you. Your instinctive reaction was not to say no, but where? We're leaving the country. What makes you think... I want you. And I get what I want. It's that simple. And besides, you want me. What gives you that idea? As of right now, you don't have the courage to take what you want. It's all right, I'll help you. 
And what makes you think I want you? You mean you want what you've got now? Eddie? This hermitage, a million miles from nowhere? I... I'm happy. Oh, yes. Doing what? Every year that goes by is wasted. Soon you'll be old. Too old. Where are you running to? You see, your problem is with timing. You quit the theater too soon. You stayed with Eddie too long. Make your move. Now. You'll never get another chance. Please. Please keep away from me. Why? Because... Be because, because I'm I... right, huh? You know the poem? Full many a flower was made to blush unseen and waste its fragrance on the desert air. Don't waste the fragrance, baby. Don't. Mike, I... I... That's better. Oh, that's much better. What about... What about Eddie? Eddie? Oh, we'll take care of Eddie. What are you saying, Mike? I'm saying we'll just let things work out. No, 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 no. Don't move. Edmund! Shh! Let me just finish this paragraph. I know just how I want to say this, and if I stop, I... I... Carlotta! What did you do? I want you to listen to me. You could have torn that paper. Edmund, please. Please, I beg of you. Pick up that phone right now. Why? Do it. All right, all right. Now, when the operator comes on, ask her to give you the sheriff's office and tell Sheriff Parker that Mike Perry is here. Carlotta, how can you ask me? I won't ask you again. I should hope not. I won't have the strength. You know, I don't understand please you at all. Please, call, please, before it's too late. Too late for what? Too late for what? Nothing. <sighs> nothing. You mean you became so excited over nothing? I tried. Oh, Edmund, I tried. Whatever happens, at least I did try. If at first they don't succeed, some people will try, try again. On the other hand, there are others who quit. And there's a lot to be said for both points of view. Will she try again to convince Edmund? If so, how hard? Everything will be revealed in good time when I return shortly with Act Three. Friendship can form the strangest pairs. And one of these is Edmund Churchill, a writer of nature books, and Mike Perry, a notorious gangster. Right now, Mike is hiding out in Edmund's secluded mountain home. And far from being bored by the solitude, he is quite happy. Why not? Edmund has a lovely young wife. And as they say, all's fair. And then Mike said to the professor, Sir, there is every reason to believe that the Arthurian legend is based on fact. Furthermore... Furthermore, I must have been a bore in those days. Wait, wait. What is it? Hear that outside? It's a car. Who is it, Edmund? Coming up the hill. It's the sheriff. What would the sheriff... Mike, go to the spare room quickly. All right. Oh, Edmund, the ashtray. Get rid of it. Everybody knows we don't smoke. But it's no good. The smell will still oh, be in the... Okay, okay. Give me one of Mike's cigarettes. Yeah, okay. Leave the pack on the table and I I I'll say I started again if you notice. No, wait. Wait, something must be wrong. What? I don't understand why. God. Edmund, the table's set for three. Uh, come in. What did you say, Carlotta? The table is... Oh, uh... 
Hello, Sheriff. Hi, folks. How's that casting arm, Mr. Churchill? Oh, it's, it's first rate. Well, you people having company? Table set for three, I notice. It's lunchtime. I saw your car coming up the hill, so I set another plate. Join us? Don't mind if I do. Mmm, that platter of roast beef looks great. <laughs> uh, Sheriff, what's going on? Well, I'll tell you, I figure Mike Perry's gonna head this way. You do? Why? Because he's that type of person. He does the unexpected. Goes where you'd never dream to look for him. But to come here? Every place else is red hot. And my theory is he's headed this way. Hmm? Oh, I see you started smoking again. Yes, sir. Ever since this uh, this thing started, I've been so nervous, I just... Well, there's nothing to worry about. Well, we're, we're not worried, it's just... We're going to patrol this whole area. On foot, in cars, by helicopter. We'll get him. That is, if your hunch is correct. Well, I got a feeling. It's more than a hunch. It's based on a pretty fair analysis of all the known factors. Now... Could I trouble you for a slice of that terrific roast beef? Morning, Carlotta. You slept late. Where's Eddie? Oh, fishing. Hmm. That's become a big thing with him. He's got the contest coming up on Saturday. We have to get out of here. Mike. I don't like that sheriff. Oh, he's just... Just one. A hick constable? Don't sell him short. He makes smart moves. But where could you go? Where could we go? Remember that we. Well, where? Out of the country. But what's the good? You'd be extradited. What for? Well, for... I'm not wanted for crimes like murder. All I have on me is income taxes. Maybe embezzlement. There are plenty of places where they can't extradite you. But... Come with me. But... Edmund. I said we'd take care of Edmund. No! Carlotta. Come into a new world. The world of the people who have power. It's a world where rules have no meaning. But Ed Edmund's such a good person. Good, bad, they mean nothing. You do what must be done. And I'm not sure that I can and stay here. Oh, Mike, I... Where we're going, I have a palace, a yacht. There's nothing you can't have. Name it, it's yours. But I, I don't want just the thing. I'll buy you a theater, your own theater, your own company, act, star. Oh, Mike. Everything, I, anything, I... yours for the asking. This is my world. I want to share it with you. But what's supposed to happen to Edmund? Edmund... Edmund must be taken care of. You mean... killed? There's nothing personal involved. I even like Eddie. No! There's no other way. When he finds out we're gone, he calls the sheriff. Now look. I've been told there's only one road out of these mountains. Yes, it leads right through the main street of Council Forks, 20 miles from here. Well, we'll have to chance it. No, no, it's dangerous. At night, late, I'll wear a hat. I do look a little like Eddie. We'll be moving pretty quickly. Yes, we'll go as soon as it gets dark. The stores will be closed. No one will be on the streets. But Mike, it's still a three-hour drive through these hills before we get to the turnpike. Suppose the sheriff should call here. He won't. Oh, how can you be sure? Call him. And here's what to tell him. Sheriff Parker speaking. Oh, uh, Sheriff, I... I just called to tell you we're leaving. Leaving? When? This evening. Uh, we received a call from Mr. Churchill's agent. He has to be in Hollywood by tomorrow afternoon. Will we be seeing him on the screen? Uh, well, you'll be seeing characters from his book. Well, good luck. And we won't be back for... Well, I don't know how long. Well, maybe it's for the best. Might have been dangerous if that gangster fella showed up. Well, we'll see you when we return. 
Goodbye, Sheriff. Bye now. Oh, uh, tell Mr. Churchill I'll get back. Miss Churchill? Miss Churchill? Well, I guess she hung up. Uh, it doesn't matter. I can catch them when they come through town. Mike. Mike, I... You what? Oh, I'm not sure. Of what? Of... Oh, of anything. Come here. No, that won't help. Yes, it will. Oh, Mike. I'm so frightened. You should be. You know why? You're crossing the line. Promise me you won't hurt Edmund. Of course. Are you packed? Yes. Okay. When he comes in, you go out to the car. I'll... You won't hurt him. Promise. I promise. Well, greetings. We're just in time for a drink, Eddie. Oh, I'm in great form. Shame you can't come to town with us Saturday and watch the contest. Well, <laughs> I'll keep a meal. <laughs> Fix you something, darling? Who? Me? Join us? Uh, uh, I don't think so. I, I feel so... I, it's a little stuffy in here. I think I'll get a breath of fresh air. Uh, uh, listen, Carlotta. I, uh, I appreciate this. What? Well, what you're doing. It's plain you have no use for Mike and... You're going against your code of morality. I, I know it's uncomfortable for you, but you're doing it for me, and well, I think you're wonderful. Goodbye, Edmund. Goodbye? Where are you going? Oh, just for a walk. Well, Mike, here's to us. Yes, Eddie. To us. She's right, but she doesn't understand how it used to be between you and me. Of course not. But after this is over, after this is over, we're finished, Mike. We're square. If that's how you want it. It can't be any other way. That's right. It can't be any other way. Mike? Mike, what are you doing with that gun? Hmm? Well, you see what I'm doing. I'm aiming it. Mike... Mike, why? Because I have no choice. As you said, it can't be any other way. Oh, why? I, I mean, why do you want to kill me? I don't want to kill you, Eddie. I have to. And therefore... Mike! Mike, it's, it's me. It's Eddie. If you stand still, Eddie, you won't feel a thing. Mike! No! Ah! Yes, I killed but him. But you promised, you promised! I promised I wouldn't hurt him, and I didn't. Oh. He died instantly. Oh, no. Oh, I didn't think, I didn't realize. Yes, you did. You did. No, I don't, I, I don't want to go with you. You have to go. You have no choice. You just crossed the line. Now, dear, Please. I have to drive with two hands, especially when we go through town. Oh, slow down, slow down. The local cops love to pick up people for speeding. Hmm. Not much of a town. Well, we chose the right hour. All the stores are closed, the people have finished dinner. The movie won't break for at least an hour. I'm so nervous. It's all right. Everything's all right. Edmund, I... Oh, I thought I'd never stop being sick. You'll be okay. Up ahead. Is that a police car? It's the sheriff's car. I think somebody's in it. Well, we... We have to go down this street, but... Well, why not? He can't suspect anything. It's dark, he won't recognize me. Look, as we go by, you wave at him. All right. There's nothing to be scared of. Now, give him a loud, cheerful goodbye. And a big wave. Hi, Sheriff. Hi, Miss Churchill. There. You see? 
There's nothing to it. We're in the clear. You don't have to look back. Mike! He's pulling away from the curb! Well, okay. That doesn't mean he's after Mike! us. Mike! He's following us! Now, don't panic. Oh. Maybe he's heading someplace else. Nowhere! This road leads away from town. There's nothing for more than 80 miles. He's after us. Why? I... I don't know What why. do you mean you don't know? You know everything. Shut up. He's after us. Look, he's gaining on I us. I lose him. He wants us. Oh, God. Hold the wheel. Hold, oh, hold the wheel. Steady. Steer. Don't shoot at him. I've got a gavel. If he has no. this radio yet, I can no, stop it. No, don't. Steer to the right. No. Hold the car, Steady. Oh, with me here, the man who captured the fugitive gangster Mike Perry, our own Sheriff Pete Parker. Sheriff, what's the story? I, um, I didn't know anything. I saw them drive by in the car, and I thought it was Mr. Churchill with her. And since he was not going to be here for the fly-casting tournament on Saturday, I wanted to give him back his entry fee. After all, it was ten bucks, and that don't grow on trees, you know. Of course not. But that ten dollars discharged the debt. And while we don't know who did win that fishing contest the following day, the grand winner should be Sheriff Parker, who caught the biggest fish of all the night before. We're going to catch you for some more mystery theater when I return in a few moments. Certain emotions slumber inside each of us. We lead lives that may have nothing to do with our true desires. And then one day, a Mike Perry can arrive to awaken a Carlotta Churchill. Well, we certainly hope there are no Carlottas among our listeners. And if any of you are even contemplating a Carlotta-like move, tune us in instead. You'll get all the vicarious enjoyment with none of the actual penalties. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Norman Rose, Ralph Bell, and Dan Arco. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Bleak, lonely, evil, such are the moors of England, where even today one can go for mile on mile without sight of another house or another human soul, where death-dealing quicksand bogs and mires wait to trap the unwary walker, where many who enter are not seen again, and where some of those who are seen again are strangely changed. For example, Sandy and Jack Burton. We didn't see it, Jack. 
Where wrong, Sandy? We did. We couldn't have. Sandy, we saw what we saw. No, we we saw what what our nerves saw. We saw what that moor out there made us see. <laughs> mystery drama, The Executioner, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Tony Roberts. Few will deny, I'm sure, that weather and climate play a great part in our lives. To a large degree, affect our mood, our nerves. People in warm and sunny climates tend to take life more casually than those where the weather is cold and bleak. What I'm getting at is that one of the characters in the tale I bring you now is not a person, but a moor. Moor. The very sound of the word strikes a note of dread to the soul. Dread, but fascination too. For believe me, there is a certain allure in evil. A compelling magnetism which some cannot withstand. Two such people were Sandy and Jack Burton. Jack, how much further to Linton? Twenty, thirty miles. Not sure. We'll never make it by nightfall. We may not make it at all. The road is running with water. I try to go faster than five miles or so. The engine gets wet and starts to die. The wiring is soaking wet. That old farmer was right. We should never have taken the shortcut across the moor. He warned us. What, oh, honey, I wanted to see the moor. I've never been on a moor in all my life. <laughs> There's a writer. Not like... a writer who's supposed to be on vacation. Resting and recuperating from a nervous breakdown. Oh, no. You promised me. On the plane over, you promised not a stroke of work till we got back from England. What's that? It's wet wires. I better slow down a bit more. All you've been doing since we landed is take notes of this and notes of that. You filled I don't know how many notebooks. Well, I am a writer, and it's sort of second nature to take notes. Yes, I keep hoping I'll hit on an idea that'll pay off for an article. Even better, a series of articles when we get back home. All I wish. All I wish is you just plain stop worrying when you ought to be resting. And you... Oh, Jack... It looks like we've uh, bought it, as our English cousins say. You, you mean we're stuck? I'm afraid I do. The water on the road's gotten deeper. It's practically a lake. Well, what'll we do? Let's see if we can find shelter for the night at that castle on the hill. <laughs> what castle and what hill? That hill over there. I see a hill. I don't see any... It's shrouded in fog, but when the fog lifted for a second or two, five minutes ago... There. See? You're right. There is a castle or... It's a house or something. You think you can make it that far? Oh, I'll make it. Anything but spend the night out here in this awful, absolutely awful moor. to trouble you, ma'am. Uh, my name's Jack Burton. Uh, this is my wife, Sandy. Our car broke down on the road below, and I'm afraid we need shelter for the night. Not here. But, ma'am... I said not here. Oh, now, just a minute. Jack, don't argue. That man... I see him, but big as he is, never mind. Ma'am, we're in a serious situation. Our car is stalled in what's practically become a lake. In common decency, you got to let us come in. Honey, Jack, look out. That man... Now, hold it, chum. All I'm asking... Hey, wait a minute. Get your hands off me. Dunning, don't hurt him. Just put him out. Put who out? In weather like this? Never mind, Dunning. Too late. This is rude. What's going on here? Now, who are these nice young people, and why was Dunning putting them out? Sir, our car is stalled on the road below, and with night coming on and all, we were hoping you could put us up until morning. Well, of course we can. Come in, come in. Dunning, close the door. Permit me to introduce myself. Sir Leonard Hastings Brook. And this is my home, Bodmoor Manor. My housekeeper, Mrs. Drood, with whom I shall have a few words later about her lack of hospitality. And this is Dunning, man of all work. He cannot speak. He's a mute. But he can hear well enough and carry out orders. 
And you, sir? Jack Burton. And this is my wife, Sandra. We're Americans here on vacation. We were taking a shortcut across the moor to Lynchburg. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. You can fill me in on the particulars later. Right now, you both look like drowned rats. Um... Uh, <laughs> A very pretty rat in your case, Mrs. Burton. We must get you both into dry, warm clothes. You're awfully kind. I can't thank you. And... What was that? I beg your pardon. I heard it. I thought I heard... I heard it, too. Someone screamed. Oh, just a trick of the wind, that's all. The wind? Yes, yes. Howling about these old manor houses, it can sometimes make the strangest and most nerve-wracking noises. Well, I shall look forward to seeing you again at dinner. If you... Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mrs. Drood. Jack, that wasn't the wind. That was a scream. It sure sounded like it. Oh, Jack. Jack, let's leave. And go where, Sandy? Where? And so you see, you're not only dining in what was called the Great Hall in Elizabethan times, but at the very table graced by Her Majesty, the Virgin Queen herself. Then, if I follow you, Sir Leonard... Bodmore Manor was owned by Elizabeth the First? Uh, Her Majesty Elizabeth the First. Her Sovereign Majesty. Oh, well, yes, of, of course. Did she uh, use it for any special purpose? She? Her oh. Majesty used it as temporary quarters while one castle or another was being renovated. How uh, did it come into your family, Sir Leonard? Well, it was a gift from... Her Majesty to the first Sir Leonard Hastings Brook when he was knighted in 1584. Mm, for performing some worthwhile service, I'm sure. Worthwhile? Special might be a better word, or, or, or distinctive, or, or peculiar. Peculiar? My ancestor, the first Sir Leonard, was special executioner to Her Majesty. Executioner? <laughs> head, head chopper, you might say. Little family joke. Oh. <laughs> and uh, many of his victims, I suppose, I should say Her Majesty's victims, were dispatched right here at Bodmore. I thought that most, uh, if not all, executions took place at the Tower of London. Oh, most of them did. Most of them did, especially when a public beheading was considered useful. But there were times, too, when Elizabeth found it politic to remove certain malcontents, hotheads, other threats to her power in secret. And here, at Bodmore Manor, was where those executions were carried out. Again. Now, that was a scream, Sir Leonard. Uh, not the wind playing tricks. It was a scream, wasn't it? I didn't want to admit it the first time. Indeed, Mr. Burton, I hoped it was nothing more than the wind, but since you and your wife have heard it a second time... You, you heard it too, didn't you? You all heard it. Oh, no, no, no. Only those on whom the curse of Bodmore is about to fall ever hear it. It's the scream of someone about to be beheaded just before the axe falls. You didn't hear that scream? Oh, no. Mrs. Drood? I didn't want you to stay here. The curse of Bodmore, what happens? Nothing, if you follow orders. What orders? There is a room, the room at the far east end of the corridor where your own bedroom is, that you must never go into. Okay, but why not? Do not go into it, that's all I tell you. The room is locked, but there have been those who forced the lock and came to a sorry end. I warn you, don't try to enter that room. What's in the room, Sir Leonard? Believe me, Mr. Burton, it's best you not know. Can it be that horrible? Oh, my dear, horrible to you is but a word. On my 21st birthday, my father took me to that room and showed what is in it, and horrible became to me actuality. I beg you, as you value your sanity, as you value your life, stay out of that room. <laughs> Jack. 
Jack? Jack? Here, honey, by the window. What are you doing over there? Why aren't you in bed? Oh, just looking out at the moor, thinking. The rain stopped, and there's a moon. Yeah, with black clouds scudding across it. What have you been thinking about? No, I'm not thinking exactly. Wondering is more like it. Wondering about this whole freaked out setup. Sir Leonard and Mrs. Drood. I'm wondering, could I do an article if I can find the right handle? Did we hear that scream? Really hear it? Or was it just the wind? Well, Sir Leonard said... I know, but... Well, was he maybe just taking advantage of the circumstances, us thinking we'd heard a scream? But why would he? I don't know. That's what I've been sitting here trying to figure out. All I can come up with is that he's playing some kind of childish game. He doesn't act like a child. No, but... Come on. Come on to bed. No, no, no. You, you go on and on. I'll sit up for a while yet. Jack, what are you up to? Up to? Me? That room at the end of the corridor. Now, whatever gave you the idea that I would... Jack! Honey, it would make one terrific article. If there is anything in that room, something really horrifying or whatever, or even if there isn't, the experience we're having here right now, I mean, the car stalling, the Bodmore Manor being Liz the One's private execution place, the curse, the whole bit. I mean... I can sell it like that when we get back. You are not supposed to be working. Dr. Delmar warned oh, you. Oh, and, yeah, and sent me his bill at the same time. Now, you don't pay that kind of bill and a few others that are bugging me by resting. <sighs> All right. Let's go. Well, you don't have to go. I have to. Now, question. Sir Leonard said the room is locked. How do you propose to open it? Simple. You've forgotten that article I did on safe crackers and lock pickers. You're right. I had forgotten. All right, if you're ready. Come on. Well? Coming? Just the sight of that long corridor. All those suits of armor lining the walls. Look, go back to bed and I'll... No, no. Go ahead. I'm with you. Something, isn't it? A big glass case filled with clothes worn in the 16th century, I guess. There's no need to guess. Look at that one there. If that wasn't worn by Elizabeth I, the jeweled high stand up collar, flounced sleeves sewn with semi precious stones. Oh, Jack. Elizabeth herself wore that. Yeah, I guess she did. But look, it's oh. the inside of that room down there that I want to get. What's that? I don't know. I thought I heard... It sounds like some... someone's... Coming from the end of the corridor. Jack. Jack, look. What? Where? There. Walking through the patch of moonlight. Walking towards us. Oh, no. Oh, no. What is it that Sandy and Jack see? Wish I could tell you. Matter of fact, I could, but uh, there's a place for everything. And everything in its place, I say. I'll return shortly for Act Two. Now we're in the Burton's room at Bodmore Manor. It's a little past three in the morning. And as you can see, Jack is trying to revive Sandy, who fainted, I guess. But come, stand with me here by the window for a moment and look out across the great mysterious moor. Silent. Silent as a grave in moonlight. Brooding. Waiting. For what? For whom? Come on, Sandy. Come on, snap out of it, honey. Jack... What? Here, drink, uh, drink this. Oh, Jack. I... I fainted. I... I don't blame you. Oh. Gruesome. Horrible. 
I've never seen anything like it. If I really did see it... You saw it. We both saw it. An executioner, a headsman, black hood, black doublet and hose, and the axe gleaming silver in the moonlight with blood, ruby red, dripping from it. And coming straight toward us down that corridor out there. Oh, well, what happened after I fainted? He vanished. Vanished? Or maybe he just slipped away into the shadows. But, Jack, was it a ghost, do you think? I don't know. It could be we... Oh, Jack! Easy. Who's there? Mrs. Drew. Oh, that awful woman with her jet black hair pulled back and that long white face. Would you open the door, please? Uh, yes. Yes, of course. Yes? May I come in? Uh, well, uh... Thank you. Are you all right now, Mrs. Burton? Oh, yes. How did you know I... Wasn't all right. Nothing goes on in this house, I don't know. I know the dangers that lurk here. The mind-shattering things that can happen. That's why I've come to warn you again. Again? Sir Leonard warned you at dinner. Warned you to stay away from that room at the end of the corridor. I knew, even as he warned you, that he was arousing your curiosity. That at the first opportunity you try to find out what lies behind that locked door... That's what you did, didn't you? Yes. Take care. Don't do it again. If you do, you may not leave Bodmore Manor alive. We... We are in danger of death? Nothing less. I don't understand. No need to understand. But... The, the... You saw the headsman, did you not? The headsman with his axe dripping blood? Yes. Count yourselves fortunate that you only saw him. That you still bear your heads on your shoulders. Still? Are you saying there's a murderer in this house? Am I telling you something you didn't already know? Didn't already feel? Haven't you felt its loathsome presence? Who? What are you talking about, Mrs. Drood? The moor. The moor, child. It more than surrounds this old manor house... This house that reeks of blood. It's poisonous fog slipping under doors, through cracks. Smell it. The dampness, clammy and moldering as the grave. Bolt your door and do not leave this room till I come for you in the morning. Under no circumstances, leave it. The dame is spaced out. A yo-yo. Bolt the door. Okay, okay. But if she thinks she can keep me from finding out what's in that room... She doesn't have to. What? I'm keeping you from that room. I'm keeping you in this room until morning. Oh, Sir Leonard. I've been waiting for you, Mrs. Drood. What are you doing out of your quarters at nearly four in the morning? What are you doing in my quarters at nearly four in the morning? The Queen has sent word that she wishes to be present at the next execution. Her chambers must be put in readiness and all else required for her comfort. See to it. Of course. I've already instructed Dunning as to the axe. I want it sword blade sharp. It will be. You can depend on Dunning. What troubles me is... And I depend on you, Mrs. Drood. Have I ever given cause for doubt, Sir Leonard? Not until now. Take heed, woman. Her sovereign majesty, Elizabeth Regina, demands unswerving loyalty of her subjects. I warn you, try no more to save another's head, lest your own be forfeit. Is your car, Burton? None the worse for wear, I should think. Uh, if the wires have dried out, Sir Leonard. See if it will start, Jack. Right on. Well, we figure Linton to be about 30 miles away, Sir Leonard, according to our map. Oh, 30, give or take a few. You should be there in an hour. Oh, less than that. 30 miles? It's more like 60 on this road, Mrs. Burton. I say, Burton, your, your car sounds a bit sick. 
That certainly doesn't sound good. I'm going to have a look under the hood. The hood? Oh, uh, the bonnet. <clears throat> I can't... I can't find anything wrong under the bonnet. I'll give her another try. You know, Mrs. Burton, I'm rather hoping your husband won't get the car started. Why? I uh, lead rather a lonely existence out here, and I shall be sorry to see you go. I'm more than delighted to have you stay, you know. Well, that's awfully kind of you, Sir Leonard. I, I wish we could, but we do have a schedule to keep to. In fact, we'd better. We're booked on a flight out of Heathrow next Monday. It's no go. I mean, she just won't start, and there's no sense in wearing down the battery. These wires have got to dry out. Well, schedule or no schedule, Mrs. Burton, looks as if I'll have the pleasure of your company at least through luncheon. And if my stars are right, perhaps through uh, dinner, too. Oh, it seems that way. I'll hurry on up to the house and tell Mrs. Drood she'll have preparations to make. Uh, you two can saunter along at your leisure. Enjoy the morning. All right, Jack. Level. Level? What did you do to the car? Me? To the car? What do you... I know you, husband mine. I know you all too well. You're going to find out what's in that room if it's the last thing you do. Sandy, I have to. I mean, there's something really hairy going on here, and I'm going to get to the bottom of it, because if I don't, no editor will buy the article I intend to write. I don't care whether the editor... I do. I've been out of circulation too long. Lord knows how many contracts I've lost, and heaven knows we could use the dough. No, I've got a hot article in the palm of my hand, Sandy, and I mean to play it for all it's worth. Now, no more talk. That's the end of it. I hope you're right. What? I hope it isn't just the beginning. The beginning of something I'd rather not think about. Oh, Mrs. Burton, I saw you sitting out here on the terrace. Brought you a cup of tea. Thank you, Mrs. Drood. How very thoughtful of you. Not at all. Sir Leonard tells me your husband couldn't get the car started and you'll be spending the night with us. Yes. Well, if you must, you must. Can I get you anything else? Oh, thank you, no. The tea's enough. In that case, I'll... Mrs. Drood? Yes. What you said last night, in the middle of the night, about the moor, what exactly did you mean? If you need ask the question, I cannot answer. I don't understand. Some things in life can't be put into words. There are things. Things of the spirit. Beyond words. Look out at the moor now. With the sun all rose and gold. Setting in the west. What does it look like to you? What feelings does it bring to you? Why, it looks quiet. Beautiful, serene, lovely. Yes. But within the hour, when the sun is gone, and the mists begin to rise from the boglands, and the moonlight plays strange tricks, it will be anything but quiet and beautiful and serene. It will be pure evil. Mrs. Burton, I strongly suspect that if your husband wanted to, he could get your car started. Take my advice. Persuade him to do so. And then leave Bodmore Manor. Leave as quickly as ever you can. Eleven. Now's as good a time as any, I guess. If I could only make you listen to reason. I am listening to reason, but mine, Sandy, not yours. Now, I'm the one in this family who has to make the bread. Oh, you don't think I'm going to let you go there alone? I would rather. If you hadn't fainted last night, I might have found out then what's going on here. Don't worry, I won't faint. Not this time. No. No, I can't be sure of that, Sandy, and I've got to find... What is that? Drums. Sounds like muffled Drums. Muffled drums? Yes, I've read somewhere that they were used just before someone was executed, beheaded. Elizabethan times, I mean. Let's go. Jack, that sound is coming from the other end of the corridor, from that room. Whatever's going on, now is the time to see what it is. Come on. 
Now quiet. Try not to make any noise. This cupboard. It's so dark. It's so full of shadows. Smells. <laughs> It's coming from that room, all right. The drums. Shh. Listen, what's that? It's voices. I know. Sandy, the door. Look, it's a jar. Thin crack of light. You can see it. Yes. I, I'm going to see if I can open it quietly. If you have no last words, place your head on the block. Please accept the small bag of gold pieces, Executioner. Dispatch me quickly, I beg you. It shall be done. There now, your head. Place it on the block so it lieth properly. Yes. A beheading. Woman with a head on the block. When I stretch out my hands. The Executioner. That will be my signal for you to strike. Axe raised. Now. That's up. What? Master Dunning, we are observed. That man standing in the door. Seize him. No. No, wait. Now, listen. Seize him, Master Dunning. Seize him. And bring him to the block. I don't want you to worry. Jack and Sandy Burton are going to come out of this all right. What intrigues me, and should intrigue you, is not that they will escape, but how will they escape the headman's axe? The truth is that if it hadn't been for some quick thinking on Sandy's part, some of the quickest thinking on record, well, back in a minute for Act Three. manor house that dates back to Elizabethan times, a frightful scene is taking place. A beheading. Ignoring the orders of Sir Leonard Hastings Brook, owner of Bodmore Manor, and the warnings of Mrs. Brood, Jack and Sandy Burton dared to open the door of that forbidden room. To their horror. For on the very moment of opening it, they saw the great axe of a headsman fall and cleave the head from the body of his victim. That man, standing in the door. Seize him, Dunning, seize him, and bring him to the block. No, stay your hand, Dunning. Mistress Drood, you dare countermand an order I have given? Nay, Sir Leonard, I dare but entreat that you give a moment's thought to what you are about to do. Dunning, fetch him here. Oh, oh. I say hold. You forget yourself, oh. mistress. Nay, sir, you forget who I am. Who are you, then? Minerva Drood, first lady in waiting to Her Majesty. <laughs> I represent the Queen in her absence, and I have the right to give orders as she might do were she here. Well, it's the first time I've ever heard of such a right. Your ignorance, sir, will not protect you from Her Majesty's wrath should you dare take my entreatment lightly. But... But there stands Sir Jonathan Burton, a traitor to England and to her sovereign majesty, if ever one lived. Jack, he's pointing at you. Not proven. Not proven. He has not even been put to the question. Yes, but I thought... Well, never mind. I shall look into this at once. Come, Dunny. We must consult the records. You, Mistress Trude, remain here with the prisoners. But, Sir Leonard... Do as I bid you, madam. Dunning. Come! Mrs. Trude, what in heaven's name is this all about? Use your eyes, Mr. Burton, and I think you'll have the answer for yourself. Jack, that... that figure kneeling at the block, it's... A dummy. As you can see, a storefront mannequin dressed in Elizabethan clothes. The head, just a dummy's head. Uh, the, the executioner, the uh, headsman in the long black hood. That was Sir Leonard? Yes. Is he crazy? Again. Yes. Oh, good Lord. Nothing to be alarmed about, oh. Mrs. Burton. In any case, not until now. 
But I'm afraid he's begun to take a turn for the worse. Yeah, but what's just happened here? I don't get it. Let me explain. Bodmore Manor was, as Sir Leonard told you at dinner last night, a secret place of execution used by Elizabeth I. Sir Leonard, of course, knew this when he inherited the estate on his 21st birthday. You see, he had never been what you might call mentally stable. Learning he was the descendant of a headsman was all it took to send him over the edge. He's harmless, you said? Yes, or has been till now. Until now, when these seizures came on him, about every three months or so, we put on the little act you just saw. I would pretend that an order of execution had come from Elizabeth. Sir Leonard would get dressed in the headsman's outfit, the original, by the way. And we'd go through this mock beheading, even to the sound of muffled drums, recorded on tape, incidentally. Good heavens! Yes, it's all rather mad and ghastly, but harmless. Till now. Now I can't be sure. But I think his mania has begun to make more violent demands on him. In other words, he... Beheading a dummy doesn't seem to satisfy him anymore. He remains restless, unsatisfied. I don't like to think this. But I'm beginning to fear that he may... He's returned. Sir Leonard. I am in your debt, good mistress. There is nothing in the records to indicate that Sir Jonathan has been put to the question. You see? And so we must put him to the question. Master Dunning is at this moment preparing the Star Chamber. A Star Chamber trial? Is that not what Her Majesty would wish? I suppose so. As for you, Sir Jonathan, found guilty or not guilty, you will at least have the comfort of knowing you were accorded... The highest honor of trial in Her Majesty's own tribunal. Come, sir. To the Star Chamber. Is it not true that you, Sir Jonathan, allied yourself with my Lord Essex in his abortive attempt to seize the reins of government? The attempt which cost him his head. <laughs> Not me, Your Honor. Oh, you laugh, sir. In God's name, be serious. And address me as, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, 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 Your Honor, well, either you will show proper respect to this court, sir, or it will go hard with you. Uh, now look, uh, Sir Leonard. Be serious, and it's my lord, Jack. Uh, my lord, I didn't mean to upset you, and I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Will you see to it? You, uh, deny any allegiance to my lord Essex? I do, your, uh, I mean, uh, my lord. And what of your association with Sir Mortimer Shawcross? Sir Mortimer Shawcross? I've never heard of him. Oh, 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 oh. you've never heard of Sir Mortimer Shawcross? Why, you serious man, or are you again showing contempt for this court? My lord, I assure you... This court has heard enough. I pronounce you guilty. Well... Okay, I'm guilty. And such being the findings of this star chamber, you are hereby sentenced to be executed at dawn tomorrow morning. Dunning, take the prisoner to the place of execution there to wait the headman's axe at dawn. I shall retire to rest until that time. <laughs> Look, wait a minute, Dunning. I'm... Come on, now. Dunning, no rough stuff. Play acting is play acting. This is going too far. This is true. Warn him, it isn't play acting anymore. Well, it isn't play acting. Damn it, Dunning! Let go of me! What is this? The real thing, you foolish man. The real thing. You and Lady Sandra will remain here while Sir Jonathan's execution is carried out. Within, I assure you, the next hour. I beg you. Entreat you. Beg not, entreat not. It will gather you no recompense from me. Oh, Mrs. Drood, what are we to do? What am I to do? Keep our heads about us to begin with. Sir Leonard, poor man, has gone completely insane. No question of it now. This time it won't be a store mannequin he beheads. It'll be the real thing. Jack! If only he'd listened to me. Left well enough alone. Well, he didn't. That's beside the point now. The point is we've got to save him. How? We're no match for him and Dunning, even if we could get out of here. Oh, we can get out. 
That's no trick. What? I read an article of Jack some years ago on safe cracking and lock picking, that sort of thing. That bolt on the doors will be a piece of cake with a charge card. A charge card? I think I can slip that bolt with one of my plastic charge cards. But then what do we do? Cross that bridge when we come to it. <laughs> moving, but I... You've been almost an hour at it, and you said it would be simple. I also said I'd only read Jack's article. I never tried it out. The bolt's slipping. We'll... We'll get this door open all right. The drums. The muffled drums. Mrs. Burton, I can tell you, you have ten minutes. Ten minutes before that axe falls. <laughs> Look, you two, this joke has gone far enough. Dunning, take it easy, will you? The straps are biting into me. Listen not to him, Dunning. Bind him tightly, tightly. You're crazy, Sir Leonard. You have gone stark raving mad. Oh, no, Sir Jonathan. My name is Jack. Jack Burton. I am an American, a writer. I am... You are a traitor, sir. And as such, you shall die. Good, Dunning, good. Bring him to the block. To the block? Salamat! Salamat! Open the door! Who knocks? Mistress Drood! Mistress Drood! Not Mistress Drood! This is in heaven's name! Come to your senses! Don't you realize what you're doing? Well, drop the letters! Sandy, save me! They, they bound me with straps! They're laying my head on the block! Oh, no. This nut! He's pulling that black hood over his head! Mrs. Drood, he's gonna kill Jack! Not now, get you to top of my husband's head if we don't stop it. We've got to stop it. How? Tell me how. I don't know. I don't know. Wait. The costumes. Mrs. Drew, the costumes. Costumes? In the glass case. Queen Elizabeth's gown, the one with the high neck and the jewels. What of it? Get it! I can't. The glass cases are locked. We'll break the... Oh, never mind. I will. Help me, please! please help me. What are you doing? What good can those cops... Stop talking and help me get this on. Quick, Mrs. Drew, quick! Help me. Sandy, help! Dunning, don't let him do this. He's crazy, can't you see that? He's gone right out of his head. Dunning! Sandy! This is Drood! Help me! Open up! I, Elizabeth of England, call on you to open this door! What? What was that? You hear me, Sir Leonard? It is your queen who speaks! Open this door! Dunning! It is Her Majesty! She's here! Open the door, man! Open it! Your Majesty. Your gracious Majesty. What find I here? What knavery is this? Well, Your Majesty... Put down I... that axe this instant. Put it down, I say. Or your own head shall fall beneath it. Put it down. Well, yes, yes. So of course, Your Majesty. I wished only to obey Your Majesty. To do my duty... To send from this world a traitor who threatened traitor? your... Traitor? Sir Jonathan Burton, a traitor? Are you mad? I have no more loyal subject, no dearer friend, than this man whose life you would have taken. Fool, leave at once, be gone! Get your majesty! Go! I go. I go. Sandy. You saved my life. With that costume. It's the one in the glass case, Jack. The one Elizabeth herself wore. And it, it suddenly struck me. No, no. God gave me the idea that only Elizabeth herself could stop Sir Leonard. <laughs> it was as simple as that. Simple, perhaps. Brilliant, definitely. Mr. Burton, your wife has told me that you are a most accomplished writer, but somewhat inclined to have things your way. May I give you a word of advice? Right now, I'll take anything. Have things your way if you must, but listen to others, especially your charming and decidedly practical wife. A bit more than you have in the past. Otherwise, 
Otherwise? Otherwise what, Mrs. Truth? You may indeed lose your head. A strange story? Yes. Incredible? Definitely. True? Well, I can personally vouch for its authenticity. How? Uh, now what have I got myself into? Uh, well, uh, you see, uh, the truth is that before I became an actor, I was a writer. No, no, wait a moment. I didn't say I was Jack Burton. I didn't say that at all. I'll be back shortly. truth will out. I was Jack Burton. Pen name. Real name, well, you know it. No matter. Important thing, you enjoyed my story. I hope you did anyhow. And another important thing, very important to me, I've still got my head. I do, don't I? Our cast included Tony Roberts, Marion Seldes, Jacqueline Brooks, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. place. Here we present a unique kind of drama. Drama that uses your ears to stimulate your fears. The story you are about to hear concerns another part of the human anatomy. It's a tale about a very frightening pair of hands. Not because they're ugly or mutilated or because they do evil things. On the contrary, the hands of our heroine do nothing at all. And therein lies her terror. But there's one other subject our story deals with. And it's the most mysterious of all. The human mind. Our mystery drama, The Hands of Mrs. Mallory, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Henry Slesser and stars Celeste Holm. of the most beautiful day you can imagine. A day so perfect that the birds are singing its praises. And even the people who line the park benches, those roosting creatures who seem to exist in a vacuum without emotion, seem happy and contented today. But there's one exception. A lady of middle years who sits alone on a bench. Is it her glum expression that has driven away other people? Or perhaps it's the obvious elegance of her mink stole and the glistening perfection of the diamond on her finger. Hey, lady, is this seat taken? No. It's okay if I sit here and wait for my brother? He's playing in the ball game. How nice. He plays first base. Hey, you want to see my baseball? Uh, not especially. It's got Reggie Jackson's autograph on it. Here, look at it. No, please, I, I, I really don't know. What, uh, what's the matter with your hands? Nothing. It's... They're just a little stiff, that's all. 
Now, why don't you go watch your brother play? Well, he says I jinx him. Gee, your hands look funny. I mean, can't you move them at all? No. As a matter of fact, I can't. Gee, that's funny. I never saw anything like that. How come you can't move your hands? It's a kind of a sickness. You wouldn't understand. But maybe if you explained it to me, I would. Yes. If I could explain it to you, son, I would be very happy to do so. You don't know how happy. Come in, Ida. Have a seat. I always feel so guilty when I take your time. Each examination seems to produce exactly the same result. Well, that's no reason not to keep examining you. Then there isn't any change. No, Ida. No change. What have you been doing lately? Well, I've been sitting in the park a lot. <laughs> I see. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? I have this glamorous terrace. I could sit there like a queen and view the whole park and all the people in it. But I prefer to sit on a bench and watch the squirrels and listen to the children. Oh, I think that's a good thing, frankly. To be on the ground, in touch with things. Herbert never believed in that. Herbert liked to get away from the smell of the crowd. Yes, that was the phrase he always used, the smell of the crowd. My husband knew a great number of unkind phrases. Well, I never knew him, of course. No. Neither did I, I suppose. Even when he was lying in his coffin, I felt as though I was saying goodbye to a stranger. And after Mr. Mallory died, how soon after that did the paralysis set in? Oh, it was about a month. Yes, a month after, I suppose. That soon? Yes. And now it's been... How long since you haven't been able to move your hands? Five years. Can you believe it, Doctor? Hmm. I can't. After the first six months of this terrible paralysis, I thought I, well, I couldn't go on living with these stone fingers of mine. I thought it would be preferable to be dead. But you never lost hope of a cure. No. I mean, that's what's kept me going. The hope of a cure. Oh, and something else. I suppose one must say a kind word for money. If there was one thing Herbert did in his life, he managed to leave a very rich widow behind him. Ida, I hope you won't misunderstand what I'm going to say. Doctor, you don't have to say it. I know what comes next. You're going to advise me to get out of myself. To stop thinking about my poor hands and think about other people. Charity work. Well, Ida, that's one suggestion. But... Oh, if you knew how many charity committees use my name, or how many thousands of dollars I give to every foundation with an impressive name. Ida, I was going to talk about going back to that psychiatrist. Oh, that. I honestly think you gave up too soon. If you'd given the man a chance... Dr. Merritt, my hands are paralyzed. I'm not imagining it. They're paralyzed, frozen, insensitive. You've made all the tests yourself. Do you think I've been faking? No, 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 of course not. The illness is genuine, but... But sometimes the origin of an illness of this nature can... It's all in the mind, yes, of course. All in the mind. So easy to say that, isn't it? So many doctors have told me the same thing. It's so much easier to blame my mind than their own failure. Ida, please. Doctor, excuse me. It's time for me to go. You've got lots of patients waiting for you. Some of them you might even help. Hey, hi. Oh, it's you again. Waiting for your brother? Nah, he's not playing today. Oh, that's too bad. It's a lovely day. He broke his leg. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Hey, is that what happened to your hands? I mean, did they get broken? Mm, something like that. Well, do you feel anything at all? I mean, like your fingers? You're a very curious boy. Did anyone ever tell you that? Can I just touch him, lady? Please? No, please don't. Hey, hey, you kid. Now cut that uh -huh. out. Well, Stop I... bothering this lady. You hear me? I wasn't bothering her. All right, was... now go on. Get out of here. Leave her alone. Okay, okay. I just wanted to touch her hand. I'm sorry, ma'am. I just couldn't help overhearing. Uh, thank you. He was getting a little too bothersome, although I'm sure he didn't mean any harm. Well, I could see that you were getting annoyed. Ted? Ted? Oh, yes, I'm over here, Melinda. <laughs> your hand, huh? 
I can't manage two hot dogs and a bag of peanuts and two crutches at the same time. Oh, sure, honey. I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Oh, this one's yours. With the mustard. Thanks. But do you think I could sit down? Of course. Ted, would you grab that crutch? Yeah, I got it. Listen, I told you that I'd get the hot dogs. I mean, you didn't have to be quite so independent. <laughs> That's funny. You're always complaining that I'm not independent enough. Oh, am I crowding you, ma'am? Oh, no, no. Plenty of room. Ted, who, who was that boy I saw running off? Oh, I drove him off. He was uh, bothering this woman. Oh, dear. Oh, are you all right? Oh, yes, I'm fine. As a matter of fact, he was telling me about his brother's accident. He hurt his foot. I guess this must be the season for accident. You mean these crutches? I'm afraid that was another season. Hey, you know, gee, it's warm, isn't it? Huh? For this time of year? <laughs> of course, you're warm. Saving fair damsels and all that stuff. I didn't know you were a regular St. George, Ted. Yeah, sure I am, with kid dragons. <laughs> uh, would you like some peanuts, ma'am? We've been trying to give them away to the squirrels all day, but we haven't seen any. <laughs> no, thank you. I, I don't like peanuts very much. I can't imagine what squirrels see in them. <laughs> don't worry. My brother will happily eat them all by himself. Your brother? Uh, oh, I'm Melinda West. This is my brother, Ted. And my name is Mrs. Mallory. How do you do? Uh, haven't I seen you two here before? Oh, you probably have. We live close to the park. Are you from around here, Mrs. Mallory? Oh, yes. I live in that building right there. Oh. What a view you must have. Uh, can you see the park from your window? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, if I had a window like that, I'd never come down to the park. Well, of course, these crutches sort of discourage you walking around very much. Do you both live in the city? No, no, we're from Ohio. We've only been here about two months, but uh, I guess we'll be going back soon. Don't say that. Don't even think that, Ted, please. I'm sorry, Melinda. I, I didn't I mean to... I gather that uh, you don't want to leave. Well, not if it means that... Well, the truth is we came here to see a doctor, a, a surgeon who specializes in cases like mine. You... See, I was in an automobile accident two years ago. I haven't walked since. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. I know exactly how you must feel. Well, people always think they do, but they really can't... Ah, uh, Melinda. What? I think your brother is trying to signal you, Melinda, about me. What do you mean? He means... These... My hand. Oh. oh. I'm so sorry. I... I... I didn't even realize. No, some people don't realize that I can't move them. See, as long as I sit here very quietly, my whole body is as immobilized as my hand. Yes. Now I know what you mean. I know how tempting it is to just want to sit, be a statue, so that for a little while you can forget that part of you is dead. Oh, come on, Melinda, please. Let's cut this out, huh? Please. Tell me more about this surgeon. I can tell you what he said in one word. One two-letter word. Oh, dear. He won't operate, then. He said it wouldn't do any good. Now, he turned us down flat. That's why I want Melinda to let me take her back home. Oh, well, do you have parents there? No. No, no, we have no one. Uh, but I don't want to go back. I, I don't. I want to see... What were you going to say? Never mind, Mrs. Mallory. Now, come on, Melinda. You finished your hot dog. Let's let's go home. Ted, let me tell her. Let me ask well, for her. For Pete's sake, what kind of nonsense is this? What do you want to bother the woman for? Because there's no one else I can talk to about Dr. Griff. I, I can't talk to you about him. You just get red in the face and stomp away from well, me. There's nothing to talk about, and I'm sure Mrs. Mallory isn't interested in fairy stories. I really don't know what either one of you is talking about. Who is Dr. Griff? Oh, he's a quack, a phony. Ted. Well, that's all he is. A two-bit faith healer who robs every cripple he can get his hands you on. You don't know anything about him. You only met him once. Yeah, well, that was enough. I could tell in one second that the man is a fake. He can't cure a broken spine. But why not let him try? Somebody has to try. I don't want to be the way I am. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, I don't want to be this way. Help me. Help me, please. <laughs> Mrs. Mallory's physician would be very pleased right now. At last, his patient seems to be taking his advice to interest herself in the outside world, in problems other than her own. But how involved will those problems become? We'll wait to find out until I return shortly with Act Two.
good weather is holding in the city, and Mrs. Ida Mallory has returned day after day to her bench in the park. A bench which seems to have become her property by right of eminent domain. But even Mrs. Mallory would have to admit that her interest in these daily visits is no longer restricted to sunshine and green grass. Each day, she hopes for another glimpse of the young couple, the scowling brother and his pretty, pathetic sister. And then, on the fourth day, there they were. Excuse me. I don't know if you'll remember me. Why, of course. You're Mrs. Mallory. The lady with the view. <laughs> yes, that's right. How are you both? Oh, we're okay. Well, I really didn't mean to interrupt your conversation. Oh, don't be concerned about the way Ted looks. His face always is like a thundercloud. Especially when we discuss the forbidden topic. I suppose you mean that doctor. Yeah, she talked me into seeing him again. You know something? Every feeling I had about him the first time was confirmed. That's really impossible, Mrs. Mallory. Tell me something. Is he a real doctor? Well, I'm not sure he's a medical doctor, Mrs. Mallory, but I'm sure he's entitled to the degree. Maybe a, a doctor of psychology or something like that. I'll tell you what he's entitled to. A good swift kick in the... I'll a... tell you one thing about Dr. Griff. He's the only one, the only one who said he could help me. He didn't promise. He just said he was hopeful. Well, that's something anyway. Yeah, I'll tell you what he's hopeful about, getting your 500 bucks. He says he's very hopeful I can be cured. And that's worth a great deal more than $500. All right, go on. Tell her the rest. Tell her the real clincher. Are you afraid to? What do you mean? Mrs. Mallory, you're an intelligent woman. So listen to how Dr. Griff plans to cure my sister. I know it sounds sort of melodramatic. Oh, it's idiotic. That's what it is. Please. Please, I'd still like to know. Well, he says he uses something called the water of faith. See what I mean? The water of faith? Yeah. Sounds sort of, um, hmm, religious. Like, uh... The holy water of Lord. It's it's related to that, yes. Oh, now do you see why I say the guy is an out and out fraud? The water of faith. Where are we? Back in the Middle Ages? Well, I must admit it does sound sort of odd. Just the same. He said that it works. That it's worked for dozens of people. He wants five hundred dollars for the treatment. With but... no guarantees, you understand. Hmm. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, will you help me, please? Will you talk some sense to this woman? Oh, my dear. I mean, I have to admit, it really doesn't sound reasonable. You mean the five hundred dollars? Oh, but it's a very special treatment, Doctor Griff said. Well, I meant it's not reasonable to assume that such things can do any good. I see. So I'll never know. Is that it? I'll just turn around and take a plane back to Ohio and live out the rest of my life as a cripple. And for $500, at least I might have had a chance to yes. live. Yes, I see what you mean. Ted. Oh, I hope you don't mind my calling you Ted. Oh, no, no, of course not. Your sister, well, she may have a point there. I mean, even if it is a waste of money, perhaps she'll never be happy unless you let this man try. If not, she'll always wonder about it. Always. Yes. Yes, I know that. That's what his whole bag is, making you wonder if it just might work. And, well, about the money, I don't know how to say this, but you see, $500 may seem like a lot to you, but it isn't to me. So if I can help you... Oh, no, no. Oh, no, please. Absolutely not. It's not really a problem, Mrs. Mallory. We've got the money. Besides, it's not the money so much as, well... Seeing Melinda disappointed again. I've had so many disappointments, you see. Yes. Yes, I know all about such things. Oh, dear. Yes, of, of course you do. Oh, you see what a selfish person I've become. I keep forgetting that you have your own affliction. I'm not sure that it isn't even worse than mine. To lose the use of your hands. Well, never mind about me. What, what are you two going to do? Oh, I did. It looks like I'm outnumbered on this thing. Dad, does that mean you... You'll let me do it? You'll let me? Well, if you go back without trying this dumb water of faith, you'll always regret it. So, okay, let's get it over with. Oh, Mrs. Mallory. Oh, thank you, thank you. You're the one who did it. Oh, my dear. I just hope your miracle happened. All my life, I wanted to believe... 
miracles that miracles happen. Melinda? Melinda? Wait a minute. Oh, oh, Mrs. Mallory. Well, you move faster on those crutches than I do on my two feet. You're, you're not here alone, are you? No, Ted's with me. I just wanted to take a little stroll by myself. No, that isn't true. We just had another fight, and I had to get away from him. Oh, dear. Now, that doesn't sound too good. Well, you know how Ted is. Well, I haven't seen you for two days. How are you? The truth is, I don't really know. But I've... I started treatments, Mrs. Mallory. With Dr. Griff? Yes. I started about five days ago. And it's... It's nothing at all like what I expected. Well, tell me about it. Well, do you remember how silly it all sounded, this water of faith business? Well, it sounded a little theatrical. But it isn't. It's scientific, Mrs. Mallory. That's the most wonderful part of it. Dr. Griff only used that phrase as a, as a convenient description of, of the, the drug. What drug is that? Well, maybe I shouldn't tell you this. Why not? Oh, I don't know. I, I have the feeling that, that there might be something slightly illegal about it, the, the drug oh. he uses. A psychedelic suggestion. Psychedelic suggestion? Now, what on earth is that? Uh, it's the technique Dr. Griff uses. He, he uses it to, to liberate the mind from its control over the body whenever that control is negative. I'm sorry. You know, I really don't understand that kind of talk. Well, I'm not saying I understand it myself. Completely. But it does sound to me as if he believes that your illness is psychosomatic. I don't know, Mrs. Mallory. All I know is that I have to go through with it. Kill or cure. It isn't a dangerous treatment, is it? No, no, I, I'm sure it isn't. It, it's well, it's more like a sort of a hypnosis. I go to his office, he administers the drug, and then he talks to me. And uh, that's all there is to it. And has it helped? I... I think I'd better go back to Teddy. He, he's probably getting worried about me. Melinda, please tell me if... Melinda, look out! I'm a bicycle! Oh! Melinda! I'm sorry, Miss. I'm sorry. Melinda, are you all right? Oh, you let, let me help you up, Miss. Oh, you idiot. I mean, can't you what? see that that girl is crippled? Quick, give me that crutch. Oh, yes, sure. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I think I, I can manage to pick myself up. This way. Now, just, just take it easy. Mrs. Mallory. What is it? Are you hurt? No, no. No, it, it's my leg. D did you see that? My leg bent slightly at the knee. No, no, I didn't see Look, it. Miss, if you're sure you're okay. Oh, get out of here. Go away and be more careful next yes, time. Yes, oh, Miss Ma Mrs. Mallory. I'm sure it happened. I, I saw it happen. My leg moved. For the first time in two years, it moved. No, Ida, I'm sorry. I can't find any reference to this Dr. Griff in any medical directory. But that doesn't prove he's a fraud, though, does it? Oh, no, of course not. And as you say, the man may not be a medical doctor. I certainly hope he isn't. Well, why do you say that? Pride of profession, my dear. We don't like to have faith healers bearing the same credentials. And that's what you think he is, a faith healer? Well, of course. Oh, I'm not knocking the power of faith far from it. Very often, it's simply another way of getting at psychosomatic difficulties. Oh, I hate that word. I know you do. Oh, I've been through all that psychosomatic nonsense. All those doctors who tried to tell me that my paralyzed hands weren't, well, what they are. But there's something in me, some emotional problem. You didn't give them much chance to prove or disprove it, either. I did. I submitted to their therapy, even if I didn't believe in it. And it didn't do the slightest bit of good. Well, maybe if you had believed them, it would have. 
Flesh is flesh, doctor. Bone is bone. That kind of therapy can't make my hands move any more than it can make that poor girl walk. And I have a good mind to tell him so. Please come in, Mrs. Mallory. Thank you. Won't you have a chair? All right. Well, do you mind if I ask who referred you to me? Well, actually, it was one of your patients, Melinda West. Yes, yes, of course. A very charming young woman. Have you known her long? Just a few weeks. See, I haven't seen her for the last ten days or so. How is she coming along? Well, actually, you'll get a chance to see her soon. She has a three o'clock appointment with me, which is only a few minutes from now. So, if you wouldn't mind telling me what's on your mind, Mrs. Mallory. Well, I just thought it would be um, worthwhile talking to you, Doctor. About yourself? Well, as you can see, I am afflicted. Uh, do you mind if I look at your hands? Yes, frankly, I'd rather you wouldn't. Not just now. I'd, I'd rather hear something about yourself. About this... Uh, treatment of yours. Melinda said something about a technique you used called uh, psychedelic suggestion. Now, just what is that? It's a medical principle. As old as mesmerism, as new as chemotherapy. The power of mind over body. Uh, psychosomatic. Well, who knows what afflictions is psychosomatic. Some illnesses start with the emotions, some with the body. And more often, it's a combination of both. Really? Germs aren't imaginary. Viruses are very real little creatures. Yet the mind has strange powers over them to make them hurt us or to render them harmless. All right, then. What about a broken leg? Can the mind cause that? Of course. If you use your head, you wouldn't break your leg in the first place. Oh. <laughs> You're thinking of Miss West, of the fact that she suffered a spine injury. That's right. I hardly see how you can correct something like that. You've seen her x-rays then? Mm, no. You believe the damage is neurological? Well, I know nothing about it. That's strange, Mrs. Mallory. You certainly seem to have an opinion. <laughs> Be careful, though. You don't have a medical degree. Someone might call you a quack. Listen, Doctor. I came here... Oh, uh, excuse me, Mrs. Mallory. Ah, Melinda... I'll be with you in just a minute. No. No, come to think of it. Why don't you come in now? There's a friend of yours here. A friend? Oh, it's I, Melinda, Mrs. Mallory. Oh, Mrs. Mallory, how nice to see you. Come in, Melinda, please. Melinda? Your crutches. Where are your crutches? Look at me, Mrs. Mallory. I can walk without crutches now. I'm not very steady, but I can walk. <laughs> Well, there goes at least one of Mrs. Ida Mallory's cherished notions that the mind can't cure the body. But she sees the evidence of her own eyes. And something tells me that this is one prejudice she's willing to give up. After all, she wants to believe in miracles. And don't we all? Mrs. Ida Mallory has spent a sleepless night dreaming of things she never thought possible. But when the sun streamed in her windows, her first thought was to get out into the park and with only one hope of seeing Melinda West again and seeing her miracle confirmed. It's true. It's really true, Mrs. Mallory. Even Ted has to admit it. Well, I guess there's something to it, all right. I haven't seen my sister off those crutches in two years. But how did it all happen? I don't really know. As I told you, he, he used this drug. He made me go to sleep. And then he simply talked to me. At first, there was nothing. And then I started feeling life in my legs again. You saw me that day in the park when I fell down. Oh, Melinda. Melinda. I, well, I just can't tell you how happy I am for you. Well, and what are your plans now? Oh, go home, I guess. I've got to get back to my job if it's still there. The treatment costs much more than we thought it would. Yes, the oh. 500 went in no time at all. Then he asked for another thousand. He said it couldn't be helped. The drug he uses is so horribly expensive. Now, listen. 
I told you once that if there were any way I could help you out financially. Oh, uh-uh. no, no. No, that's out, Mrs. Mallory. We'll we'll manage your case. Of course we will. Well. <laughs> and I can go back to work now. I can do anything I want now. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, that must be a wonderful feeling. To be able to do anything you want. <laughs> Mrs. Mallory, please come in. Thank you, Doctor. You know, it was really very good of you to see me on such short notice. That's quite all right. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, I don't quite know where to begin. Well, suppose I begin for you. You've been thinking about Melinda West. Yes, I saw her only this morning. She really is cured, isn't she? Yes, Mrs. Mallory. In my opinion, the young woman was cured. But you realize that all I really cured by psychedelic suggestion was the illness that existed in her mind, not her body. But I still don't fully comprehend it. I'm sure there was no real neurological damage to the girl. Oh. I think her bones and muscles and nerves were all in the proper place and functioning normally. Only her mind wasn't. But she seemed so sensible. Mrs. Mallory... Do you know the story of that accident? I beg your pardon? Did Melinda ever tell you exactly what occurred that caused her injuries? No. No, as a matter of fact, she didn't. She simply said it was an automobile accident. That's correct. And she was the driver. Oh. There were two other passengers, her mother and her father. Both of them were killed. Oh, dear Lord. She did sustain some injuries in the crash. But it was apparent to me that they were not sufficiently grave to cause her the total paralysis she suffered. Ah, uh, you mean she felt that guilty about what had happened? Mm. Guilty enough to seek punishment for herself. And she did. She punished herself by losing the use of her legs. And, and so your treatment was able to cure her? Yes, I'm happy to say. But of course it couldn't cure... Someone like me. What was that? I said it couldn't cure me. See, I didn't lose use of my hands for any kind of reason like that. I mean, it's just some sort of nerve damage. Doctors could never explain it. Well, if that's the diagnosis of your physician, that it's purely physical and incurable... But I didn't say that. See, I mean, my doctor has never used the word incurable. I have been hoping for years that it would just heal itself. I can't go on living like this. So helpless and so useless. Uh, Mrs. Mallory, have you come here to talk about Melinda West or yourself? Myself. Hmm. I want my hands back. Oh, dear God, I want my hands. Yes, I was afraid that's what you had in mind. Afraid? Why? Why? Because if you had any idea of becoming my patient, I I regret to say that it's not possible. But why not? I mean, you accepted her as a patient, and, and you cured her. I mean, you really did. Unfortunately, Miss West is the last patient I can accept, at least in this part of the world. Doctor, I, I don't understand. Are you... Do you have to go somewhere? That's correct. But where are you going? Abroad. And my plans will keep me abroad for at least a year. Oh, no. I mean, listen, if you're going to Europe, I I mean, I was thinking of taking a trip there myself. No, no, Mrs. Mallory, my destination isn't Europe. I'm going to North Africa, a case of some importance. Well, since when is one patient more important than another? Oh, no, no, I didn't mean it that way. It's simply that this is a prior commitment. But maybe then, maybe I could go with you. I mean, I could take up residence there. I'm afraid that's impossible, too. Why? Well, the country I'm going to is a Muslim country. My patient is the son of, well, a a notable Arab leader. Why would that make any difference? What does it matter? I'll be living within the bachelor section of the official residence. It's an area restricted by Muslim law. You wouldn't be allowed near the place, my dear lady, even if I were free to treat you. And I'm not. But I have money. 
I'll pay you. I'll pay you anything you want to stay and treat me. I mean, I'll, I'll meet this Arab leader's offer. Mrs. Mallory, the fee I'm about to receive, I wouldn't ask of any individual. I've been asked to remain with him for a period not to exceed one year. A year? For that year, in a Swiss bank, there will be deposited for me $150,000 in Swiss francs. One hundred fifty thousand. I'm very sorry that you made me reveal that confidence. No, I I trust that it goes no farther. I'll pay you the same. What? You heard me. I'll pay you the same. I mean, not in a year's time, but as soon as you cured me. I'm sorry. Your offer is very generous, but it's also conditional. What do you mean conditional? You will pay only for a cure. That's something I've never guaranteed a patient. Not Miss West, not my Arab friend. No one at all. All right, then. Suppose it isn't conditional. Suppose I agree to pay you in advance. Well, that, of course, would be something worth consideration. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Merritt. This is certainly a surprise. I think it must be the first time that a doctor ever made a voluntary house call. Well, I, I didn't come here to see you as a patient, Ida. Only as a friend. Well, that's very kind of you. Ever since I saw you last, I've been thinking over what you told me about this Dr. Griff. Oh, yes. Well, what about him? I thought it would be worthwhile just to ask around about the gentleman. And last week I was attending a joint conference of my medical association and psychological group. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I did learn something that I thought you might be interested in. There is no Dr. Griff. Well, what was that? Oh, maybe he has a Ph.D. and tack that in front of his name, but I'm quite sure that the man is not a medical doctor. All right. Be that as it may, he's still not necessarily a fraud. Well, I... I didn't say he was anything. But I suspect that your original judgment was correct. But... That he's not someone to be trusted. But you don't know the whole story. Well, what I do know is you're more impressed with a man than you were willing to admit. Isn't that right? Dr. Merritt, he cured that girl. What? You know that girl I told you about, the crippled girl? She's walking again. I saw her walk. Well, I suppose that could be true. Faith healing does have its successes. Well, I'm sorry, Doctor, but I'd rather not discuss this any further. Oh, wait a minute. I don't like the way you sound. Ida, have you made any sort of... Arrangement with this charlatan? Dr. Merritt, I appreciate your interest, but I refuse to say another word about this matter. I mean, do you understand? Not another word. That's right, Mrs. Mallory. Just relax. Close your eyes. And let the water of faith flow through your bloodstream. You can feel it tingling through your body, bringing you peace and tranquility, total peace and happiness. Do you feel it? Yes. Yes, I feel it. And now, I'm reaching out for your hand. Reaching out for you. Yes. Yes, I see you. And now... Oh, of all times. Who's that now? Yes, what do you want? Are you Dr. Helmut Griff? Yes, who are you? The name's Barry, Doctor. Lieutenant Barry, Racket and Bunko Squad, Police Department. 
May I come in? No, you can't. I happen to have a patient with me right now. Would her name be Ida Mallory? And who are you? I'm her physician. You might say her accredited physician. I demand to know what this intrusion is all it's about. It's not an intrusion, Dr. Griff. It's an arrest. What? Doctor? Well, Dr. Griff? So, uh, may we come in now? Ida. Ida, are you all right? Yes. Well, what, what is it? Well, I mean, what's right, happening? It's all right, Ida. Everything's going to be fine. They've got them all now. All of them. Well, what are you talking about? Uh, is this the lady, Doc? Yes, this is Mrs. Mallory. I don't think she's in any condition to talk. She's obviously given us some kind of drug. It's a, a legitimate drug. A, a perfectly legitimate sedative. Yes, yes, of course. Doctor. I'm sure it's nothing very unusual. Second all or something of that nature. No mysterious water of faith. Please, please, won't someone tell me what's going on? No, I'll tell you, Ida. But it may hurt just a little. You see, I told the police your story and... They investigated. He is a fraud, Ida. How dare you Be say quiet, that? Be quiet, mister. You're no more a doctor than I'm police commissioner. His real name is Michael Lanning. Alias Dr. George Watkins, alias Dr. John Wilson, and that's his modus operandi, Mrs. Mallory, posing as a fake doctor, offering miracle cures, usually for sick widows with lots of money. Oh... But he cured her. I mean, he cured Melinda. This is the part that may hurt most, Ida. He did not cure Melinda West. Because Melinda West was never crippled to begin with. I know. It was just psychosomatic. Oh, no. She's... No, no. No, Ida. Just crooked. What? She I... was in on the racket with him, Mrs. Mallory. Her real name is Anna Fraser. Oh. Her so-called brother is Tony Fraser. And I'm sorry, they're not brother and sister at all. They're man and wife. No. And I believed them. I believed them. Well, we haven't caught up with those two yet, Mrs. Mallory, but we will. Oh, I, uh... Brought some pictures for you to identify. No, no, I don't want to look at them. I can't bear to look at them. Please, Ida, you must. But I don't want to prosecute them. I don't. Why really. not? They're crooks, plain and simple crooks, all three of them. I don't care. You have to help us now, Ida. You have to identify these parasites. Now, please, look at the photographs. You know something, Doctor? Sometimes people set out to do good and end up doing harm. And sometimes. It works the other way around. What do you mean? Hey, now. Hey, now, stop that. Now, don't rip up those photos. I don't. I don't. What are you... What? Oh, for the love of heaven, you're tearing up the pictures. You're tearing them up. With my hands, Doctor. With my own hands. <laughs> Well, they say that it's an ill wind that doesn't blow someone some good. And in this case, it looks like three evil people have managed to be very good to Mrs. Ida Mallory, in spite of themselves. If there's a moral to this tale, I'd frankly hate to be the one to say it. not recommending that the best way to cure your ills is to fall into the hands of confidence men. Our cast included Celeste Holm, Patricia Elliott, William Redfield, E.V. Juster, Arnold Moss, and Leon Janney. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams...
welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In the mythology of ancient Greece, Hypnos, the god of sleep, and Thanatos, the god of death, were twin brothers. And for good reason. When you turn out the light beside your bed and snuggle down under the sheets for a good night's rest, you finally, slowly drift off into a form of unconsciousness. This blacking out, this easing into a soft and shapeless state of non-existence, gives you an inkling, a kind of preview of what it may mean to enter the doorway of sleep's shadowy brother, death. Our mystery drama, The Long, Long Sleep, was suggested by a short story of H.G. Wells and was especially written for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Larry Haynes. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Destiny decides a man's time has run out. When a gaunt figure menacingly emerges from the half-darkness, his face cloaked under a huge black cowl, and his long, bony finger beckons you to join him. How can you be sure whether or not you are ready? By what signs do you recognize this to be the final eternal sleep? The sleep from which no one awakes. It's the night of December 31st, and Norman Hill and his wife, Lori, a couple in their middle 50s, are at home, alone. New Year's Eve. The end and the beginning. For the first time ever, Lori and I had decided to stay home together. Why? I wasn't really sure. But there was an unknown something that was bothering me. Only a couple of minutes to go, Lori. Well, oh, another year will have gone by. Mm -hmm. You don't feel bad about our not going out? Norman, of course not. What we're doing makes the only sense. This is perfect. Yeah. Just the two of us alone. In an apartment that's begging to be painted. Well, I'll have the painters in any day now. I promise. Okay. Ooh, now let's get to that jar of caviar. Right, and real imported champagne. The best that money can buy. Now, when you get the promotion they've been promising you at the office. Yeah, and the very good chance of my book being picked up as a paperback. Oh, Norman, I'm a very lucky woman. Hmm. And I love you very much. And, Lori, I love you. Still... After all these years, you don't want to trade me in for a later model? Uh, not just yet, dear. But I'm delighted to be stuck with what I've got for a while, anyway. <laughs> well, thank you, darling. You're still very sweet and so romantic. <laughs> and this is it. Oh, add some of the toast and caviar. Yes, of course. Mm. Oh, it's great. <laughs> One. Happy New Year, darling. Oh, Happy New Year to you. And with luck, to another 30 years to come. Well, at the very least, I'll drink to that. <laughs> to us. <laughs> what is it, Norman? What's wrong? Oh. Norman? What's oh. happening? Oh. What can I get you? Oh. Norman? <coughs> Speak to me. What is it? Oh. Norman? Norman, darling. Open your eyes. You're frightening me. Are you all right? Uh, where am I? Oh. Lori. Oh, everything's going to be all right. Uh, uh, you started to drink your champagne. You began to choke. Uh, suddenly you passed out. For long? Five, ten seconds maybe. You, you all right now? Yeah, I'm fine. Just fine. I think... Has this happened before, Norman? I, uh, didn't want to worry you. Recently? The last couple of weeks, two or three times. Oh. Once at lunch with a 
couple of fellas from the office. Have you been in pain? No, no, not really. But you've got to see a doctor. Yeah, I suppose so. Maybe I will. No, no, no maybes, Norman. Tomorrow morning you make an appointment with Forrest Hatton. What, New Year's Day? It's a holiday, even for doctors. Well, then the next day, Tuesday. Yeah. All right, maybe... Maybe it's not a bad idea. I'll call him at home. Norman, you just scared the living daylights out of me. Yeah, I guess I did. Anyway, happy new year, darling. The both of us. Lori was scared. And I was, too. If you've made up your mind you want to go on living, then you make up your mind to follow the rules. The doctor's rules. Forrest Haddon, who was one of my closest and most trusted friends, put me through the most thorough physical examination I'd ever had in my life. Every test in the book. And then a few days later, at his office... Norman, I've never kidded any of my patients, least of all you. I don't see the point. <sighs> when, Forrest Hassel? The operation? Yesterday, Norman. No... <laughs> The longer we wait, the greater the chance we take. We? Do they suspect of the office? No, no, of course not. And, uh, Lori? Lori. Lori is something else. Oh, what do you say? I'm all yours, Dr. Haddon. I guess. I've already called the hospital. They can take you Thursday morning. It's the uh, day after tomorrow. I wouldn't wait, Norman. Okay. Then Thursday morning it is. And, uh, the odds of my survival, of my, uh, pulling through? Oh, I'm a doctor, Norman, not a gambler. I don't give up. But if you did? All right, I'd say an even 50 50. No worse? No worse. You'll be at the hospital Thursday morning at 8, admitting room. Um, where are you headed now? The office, then home. I think I'll walk clear my head a bit. Do you mind if I walk along with you? <laughs> you were my last patient. No, no. Of course not first. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. You're, um... You're afraid I'm about to dissolve into a huge mess of self-pity and despair, aren't you, first? Uh, I might take it into my head to do something rash, right? Could be. And if I did? Oh, that would be very foolish. Well, what would be the sense? None. No, no, Forrest, you're wrong. At this moment, I feel absolutely nothing. Not self-pity, not despair, nothing. Just a big... big emptiness. As if... I were already dead. This afternoon, as I walked along with Forrest Haddon facing the possibility of my own death, it was all very strange. Every deep, passionate feeling I might have had, depression, fear, resentment, anger, was in some curious way drained out of me. There was nothing left inside me except a bloodless, tranquil resignation to a 50-50 chance. Of the inevitable. Now, there's no point in minimizing the danger, Norman. It's a very tricky, delicate procedure. Well, I'm not an alarmist, you know that. I know what I'm doing. And I'll be working with a team... And as experts. we trudged through the snow across from the park toward my office, Forrest kept on assuring me that my life was in the most capable hands. But I couldn't get over the feeling that here I was, living in the very real shadow of death, without my being able to do a thing about it, to control in any way what was happening to me. And what surprised me most was the fact that I was unmoved by the whole thing. And I was cool. Lucky that I, I was calm uh, no. until... Norman, look out! Move what? Well, what happened? Uh, that big pot with a plant in it must have toppled off the roof of that penthouse. The wind must have blown it. Well, it's a good thing you saw it coming first. And pushed me out of the way. It was just in time. I missed my head by inches. You split your skull right in two. Well, come on, let's not stand here, Norman. Let's move before anything else happens. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Thank you very much. 
For a moment, I'd been brought back to reality. And then a minute later, that same dullness, the feeling of being isolated from the rest of the world, began to take over again. I think that's wonderful about your book, Norman. You know, I don't see how you manage it. A full-time forest kept on talking about my work, possibly to get my mind off whatever was wrong with me. We kept walking through the slush and snow, and I was oblivious to what was going on. I remember starting to cross the street, and then... Norman! What are you doing? To come back here. Against you. The brakes on that fellow's car hadn't held you to have been killed. Yes, I, I suppose so. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't thinking for us. My mind uh, uh, on other things. Of course, I'm aware of that, but for Pete's sake, Norm, what are you trying to do? Uh, my, uh, my office is in that building over there. I think I'd like to sit in the park alone, if you don't mind, for us before I go up. Oh, sure, Norman. I, I appreciate your company. It was very thoughtful. I'll, uh, See you. Day after tomorrow at the hospital. 8 a.m. Admitting room. Thanks again, Forrest. And whatever you do, you take it easy, please. I sat down on one of the park benches and I must have dozed off into a kind of dream. I thought I saw myself actually dead, with it, tattered one eye, pecked out by birds. Through the trees, I saw a vision of the resurrection. A flat plain of writhing graves and rolling tombstones. The rising dead seemed unable to breathe as they struggled upward through the frozen snow out of the earth. After no more than a minute, I came to and started for my office of self-preservation before that cold and bony hand was laid on mine I had no way of knowing a certain soothsayer warned Julius Caesar to be on his guard against a great peril a peril that could lead to his death on the day of the month the Romans called the Ides the Ides of March when that day came and Caesar was on his way to the Senate, he passed a soothsayer in the street and with a smile he said, The Ides of March have come and nothing terrible has happened to me. The soothsayer answered, Yes, the Ides have come, but they are not yet gone. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. is the veil which those who live call life. They sleep and it is lifted. That was written by one of our great poets. Do those words apply to Norman Hill or are the words of Aesop, the teller of fables, more appropriate? He said, better die once and for all than to live in the continual terror of death. On a bitterly cold winter's day, Norman sits alone on a park bench, taking the measure of death. The year was only a few days old, the beginning of things. I wandered slowly out of the park toward my office. The children were romping with their sleds in the fresh snow in the winter sun, gathering strength and experience for the business of life. And I kept thinking, I have been part of all this. And for all I know, I'm nearly done with it now. I walked through the doors of my office, and a curious thing, no one paid any attention to me. Not a soul even looked up from his desk to greet me. It was as if I weren't there. I couldn't understand it. Had I suddenly become invisible or what? I got to my own little cubicle of an office, and I felt a sharp jab of pain just below the heart. My office was bare, completely bare. The chair and the desk were gone, the carpeting, my books, the pictures on the walls, everything. My, my nameplate on the door, even that had been removed. 
for the first time since leaving the doctor's office, I lost the feeling I'd had. That feeling of numbness. Now, what's been happening here? Where are my things? Huh? Well, somebody talk to me! Talk to me! Hey, hey, easy. No, I'm take it easy. Relax. Now, Mr. Lewis, what is this? Just look at my office. <laughs> Surprise! Surprise? Now, for Pete's sake, what on earth are you talking about? That... I'm sorry, excuse me, excuse me for shouting. I, I didn't mean to yell. No, oh, that's perfectly all right. We may have overdone things a bit. We had no idea you'd take it this way. Take what? What way? <laughs> Your promotion. My what? Oh, my boy, the way you handled our new account, that was absolutely brilliant. No one in the office could have done it the way you did. And so the board and I decided to kick you up to an executive vice presidency. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's wonderful. Wonderful, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Th thank you very much. <laughs> that's why we had, to, had them clear out your old office. Uh, the big one in the corner, over there. That's yours. All new furnishings. Your personal things are already in. Well, you know, for a minute there with nobody in the office even looking well, at that me... that was part of the act. Part of the surprise. Yeah, well, I... I must say you threw a real scare into me. I had the feeling maybe... Maybe I wasn't really here that none of those things was actually happening. Oh, they're happening all right, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you'll be with us for a very long, long time. Well, that, Mr. Lewis, at the moment is uh, a little questionable. Questionable? Well, I'll, I'll know better on Thursday, Thursday morning. Now, now look, we're, we're ready to match any offer anyone else is making you. Oh, I doubt that you could match this one, Mr. Lewis. Anyway, I wouldn't... Uh, call it an offer. Not exactly. On my way home, I found myself lost again in a shifting maze of thoughts about death. I felt more and more certain that on Thursday morning, I was going to die under the operation. Laurie? You home, dear? It's me. My wife wasn't home. She was shopping, of course. Shopping. At this time, something very odd was going on. The, the chairs, the, the sofa were all covered with big white sheets. Every surface of every table had been cleared. The drapes had been taken down. And that dull stab of pain hit me once again in the pit of the stomach. I started for the bedroom to change my clothes. Hello? So glad to find you in at last. Been trying to get you all afternoon. Who is this? Who's calling? About the arrangements. The director wasn't quite clear about one or two of the details. Uh, what? What arrangements? Which details? Who is this? First, he wasn't altogether certain how many limousines you had ordered. Limousines? The remains will be properly embalmed, of course, as ordered. But was it your desire to have the lid of the casket of the departed left open or closed? Now, will you, for heaven's sake, tell me who this is? Sir, you are not answering my question. Now, before I hang up on you for the last time, who are you? Who is this? The Golden Rule Funeral Services, of course. Serving families, as you know, with dignity and sympathy at all modest costs since 1898. This is the secretary of the director speaking, Mrs. Haven Castle. F funeral services? Why, why are you calling us? Well, isn't this Mr. Yamashita? Mr. Shizuki Shamashita? Or have I by some mischance got a wrong number? Oh, sister, have you got a wrong number? Sorry, terribly sorry. <laughs> I drifted back into the bedroom. Is that you, dear? Oh, what a surprise. What a big surprise. Laurie? Have you been home all this time? Well, of course, in the other bedroom, trying on a couple of new dresses I bought. I had the door shut. Is that, is that one of the new dresses? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think? And what are you doing home? Uh, at this time of day, that is. Oh, well, uh... It's been a long day. A pretty full day, too. I, uh, I saw 
Forrest Haddon this morning. He had the x-rays, lab reports, everything. And? And he, uh, he's operating on me uh, Thursday morning. That soon? Yeah, my, uh, my chances of getting through the operation are no better than 50-50, uh, Forrest says. Lori, at the office, I, um, uh, I've been promoted. Executive vice, vice president. New office, new everything. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, vice president. Maybe, uh, for one whole day. And what do you mean by that? Why? Well, could be dead day after tomorrow. Norman, dear, worrying about it isn't going to help. Now, both of us, we have to think positively. And feeling sorry for yourself won't help. You know, uh, a strange phone call as, as I came in. A uh, funeral parlor. What? Yeah, it was the wrong number, they said. Now, Laurie, what on, what on earth is going on here? Now, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. Norman, you're hurting me. Let go of me, please. What's the matter with you? Now, why have you got sheets all over the furniture? Why is everything cleaned up and put away? As, as if we or you were, were going on a, on, a, on a long trip someplace. As if I were making arrangements to close down the place. Now, why? But darling, you know as well as I do. The painters are coming in to do the apartment tomorrow morning. Tomorrow? <laughs> Try to control yourself. I know the strain you've been under. It, it's not been easy for me either. I, I don't know. I don't know. Your your whole attitude since I came in, like I was speaking to a stranger, the way you look at me, the way you talk. It's all in your mind. As if for some reason you were frightened of me. As though you were looking at a, at a ghost. Somebody who'd come back from the grave. Norma. That dress, that dress you're wearing. Well, what about well, when you take it off? That's what a widow wears, isn't it? You're in mourning for me already. Oh, Norman, you can't mean what you're saying. That's a black dress. It's black. Out of respect for the dead. Let me turn on the lights. Now, what color is my dress, Norman? It's, uh... It's blue. It's blue, isn't it? Kind of a, a navy blue. I thought it was black. I'm sorry. It's all right. Worry. Lori, what's wrong with me? Oh, you're upset, Norman. Terribly upset. And you have every reason, every right to be. Oh, look, darling, why don't you lie down for a bit? You know, when Forrest told me about my chances of pulling through, my, my, my body, my mind, everything seemed to go numb, lifeless. As if this were about to happen to somebody else, not to me. And then, and then it suddenly hit me. This is, this is happening to me. And I'm afraid. A, a nap. A nap before dinner will do you a world of good. Put all those dreadful thoughts out of your head. And in the morning... In the morning, nothing will have changed. Nothing. But in the morning, after tossing frantically in my bed all night without even a minute's sleep, I had an idea that I... I thought my... Put my mind at ease. Laurie, let's drive up to Avalon. Avalon? Uh -huh. The cemetery? Yes, exactly. You want to drive to the cemetery in this rainstorm? We'll be drowned. Darling, I'd like to go. I, I, I'd just like to walk around and look at the family gravestones. You know, the, the whole families. I don't know why, but I think it'll make me feel better. Well, if that's what you want, dress warmly. Oh, it'll be freezing up there. And we'll take two umbrellas. Thank you, Lori. In less than an hour, we were at Avalon Cemetery, where my family had been buried for over a hundred years. And we stood there before the big family plot, while the wind almost tore our words away and the rain drummed down on our two black umbrellas. Oh, well, keep your coat buttoned tight around your neck. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, Grandfather Curtis over there, my mother's father. Christopher Curtis, born 1859, died 1911. That, that big headstone over there? Yeah, my, my father's father's father, my great-grandfather, Charles Robert Hill, born 1838, died 1863, only 25. Oh. Killed at the Battle of... 
ship him off while in the Civil War. The lettering on some of these stones is so worn, you, you can hardly read it. This is your father's grave over here, isn't it? And, uh, and next to him, your mother. Yes, yes, that's right. And right behind them, over there... No. Oh, no. I, I don't believe it. Oh, Norman, what is it? Next next to Grandfather Hills. That's, that's impossible. What are you talking about? The letters are badly worn, but you, you can still see the name. Norman Hill. Lori, the grave we're looking at is mine. At this moment, it would seem that his fear of death has led Norman Hill to the point where he questions whether or not he is still alive. With Shakespeare's Prince of Denmark, he may be thinking, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long a life. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Norman Hill, under the dark shadow of a fate he sees as fairly certain, death has suddenly become definable, perceptible, real. So much so that he's beginning to doubt whether he is still alive, or perhaps he has fallen into the kind of deep sleep that is death without dying, living but not life. He and his wife, Lori, on a windy, rain-swept morning, stand in a corner of a cemetery looking at the cold, gray headstones over the graves of Norman's family. Don't you see? Right behind those other gravestones over there. Oh, no, I don't believe it. Norman, what is it? That, that headstone next to my grandfather's. It, it's impossible. What are you talking about? The letters are badly worn. You can barely make out the name, but look closely. It says, Norman Hill. Lori, the, the grave we're looking at is mine. Norman, be sensible. Now, get closer to it. Look again. No, it's so hard to see in the rain. Well, look at it. Look at the letters. Look at the dates. Born 1859. That's Grandma Hill. That's my grandmother's grave. Of course. And her name? Her name was Norma. I was named after her. That's what the headstone reads. An O-R-M-A. The extra N. I thought I read. It just isn't there. Darling, it's cold. Yeah. Wouldn't it be more sensible to go back home now before we both come down with pneumonia? up at dawn. I'd been awake and hot and thirsty all night long. The glow of pain under my ribs seemed more massive than ever. We'd better go, Norman. Sure. On a dot of eight, I checked into the admitting room at the hospital. I kissed Lori. Was it goodbye? After what seemed like an eternity of details of preparation, I was finally placed on a table and wheeled into the operating room. Forrest Haddon and his operating greens were standing over me. Good morning, Norman. How do you feel? All right, I guess. <laughs> Will it hurt much? No, not a bit. You'll be out cold under a general anesthetic. And your heart's as sound as a bell, so we don't have to worry about that. Oh, that's good. All right now, Norman. Start counting backwards. Begin with the hundred. Backwards. One hundred. Ninety-nine. Ninety-eight. Ninety-seven. That's very good, Norman. Excellent. Ninety-six. Mm-hmm. Ninety-five. Mm-hmm. Ninety-four. Just breathe normally. Ninety-three. Spine. Ninety-two. Fine. Ninety-one. I knew I'd never come out of the ether. 
just as I was going under, I think I heard Forrest say to one of his assistants, We've got to be extra careful. One little slip of the knife into a branch, any branch of the portal vein, and we're out of luck. I could still make out his words. This was my last moment of awareness, my last act of consciousness. 33, 72, 71, and then a great silence, a monstrous silence, an impenetrable blackness came over me. must have been an interval of absolute unconsciousness, seconds, maybe minutes. And I realized I was not dead. I was still in my body. But all the sensations that make up the background of consciousness had gone. I do not think I saw. I do not think I heard, but I was aware of everything that was going on. Forrest was bending over me. The lower part of his face was masked. Behind his glasses, his eyes were intent, unmoving, glued onto whatever he was doing. Stand by the suction. Scalpel. I saw him reach for the scalpel, a large one. I saw him slice into my flesh with swift dexterity. It was interesting to see myself being cut into as if I were a drum of cheese without the slightest bit of pain. I was looking into Forrest's eyes, into his mind, his brain. I could see that he was being extremely careful, afraid of cutting a branch, uh, what do you call it? Oh, yes, a branch of the portal vein and ending my life right there and then. I could read his thoughts in his eyes. You're right, Norman. Absolutely right. I'm struggling between the two possibilities of either cutting too little or cutting too much. And I'm afraid. Afraid. And then suddenly, like an escape of water from under a floodgate, I could see a great swirling a brush of horrible realization in Forrest's eyes. Damn, the vein. I've cut into the vein. The brown purple blood gathered in a swift bead trickling over my side. Forrest flung the scalpel aside and began to shout, Ice! Ice! Quick, ice! Lots of it! And hand me that clamp! Thoughts rushed through my mind with incredible speed, but with perfect clarity. Even though my body still clung to me by the merest thread, I knew... That in spite of all his skill, Forrest had killed me. I was aware of a growing pull upon me as though some huge magnet were drawing me out of my body. The doctor, his assistants, the nurses seemed to have vanished. And I was in midair, flying swiftly upward. And the circle of scenery beneath me grew wider and wider. And the sky became deeper and richer in color until in no time at all, it had become a terrifying black. As dark and foreboding as no blackness I had ever beheld before. An innumerable host of stars broke out upon the sky. And then as from nowhere, the sun suddenly appeared. Wiping out the darkness, an incredibly strange and wonderful disk of blinding white light rimmed about with a fringe of writhing tongues of red fire. Turn away, Norman. Don't look at it. Protect your eyes. How? How do I do that? Put your hands over your eyes. Uh, just... Just a minute. Who are you? Where are we? I'm here to help you. Why? I, I can't see you. I have the feeling that I've not left the earth, but that the earth is pulling away, leaving me. It's interesting that you should notice uh, so soon. Well, not only, not only the earth, but the, the whole solar system seems to be streaming past me. I wonder if scattered in the wake of the earth there must be others like me, maybe millions and millions of them floating through space, the same as I am. That's altogether possible. But suppose I, I, I should... 
collide into some of them. Oh, that's not very likely. Why not? The space through which you're all traveling, you and they, is infinite. It has no beginning. It has no end. Plenty of room for all of you. Look. Look. The North Star. Over there, the Little Dipper. Isn't that... The Southern Cross, it's so clear, so big. You know your stars. What you, what you see in my latest book, Lost in the Stars, I, I, I called it. Yes? Oh, I, I shouldn't be talking about my book, not now. Oh, my. Such color. As though the light were coming from a world of sapphires. And, and that, oh, that big red one down there, like a brilliant ruby rushing up to us. That's Mars. And uh, that one was Venus. Oh, yes. And, and the... The one with the little moons around it and all those rings. Saturn, of course. Oh, yes. And those rings are all crystals of ice. Now, with luck, we get to the interesting part. Oh, and what's that? Outside and beyond your solar system. Past all the planets you know. With luck. What does that mean? Where... Where are we? Where have we come to... To the edge of the outer universe. It was hard to believe what I was saying. Faster and faster, one galaxy after another rushed by. A hurry of whirling fireballs speeding into the endless void of space. Countless unfamiliar planets and constellations circled about me, catching the light in some ghostly fashion and then vanished into non-existence. I had at last reached the complete wilderness of space. And now, at last, I knew what happens when you leave this earthly life. The long, long sleep. Now I knew what it felt like to be dead. I was no longer a detached observer. I was terrified, thrown into an intolerable darkness, horror, and despair. Because I knew now, I knew now I didn't want to leave the earth so soon. I knew now I wanted to live. And again, I heard that same voice. Norman, you see that little speck of light? Yes. Keep your eye on it. It's growing bigger. It's more distinct, like... Like a pale brown cloud of some kind. That's funny. Funny? The, the shape of it, I, I think... I think I've seen something like it somewhere before. It's, it's like a... Yes? Like a clenched fist. Do you see anything else? Yes, the, the fist, the, ha the hand. is holding a, a stick... A shiny white stick of some kind, but not, nothing, nothing is very clear. Nothing is in focus. And above the hand, there's a little circle of, of light, sort of phosphorescent. Uh, the, the stick and the hand are just below it. You'll be all right, Norman. Everything's going to be all right. All right. And there will be no pain, Norman. No pain ever again. Why? You may live to be 115, Norman, and able to eat and drink almost anything. The operation, I'm happy to say, has been 100% successful. Forrest Haddon, my doctor, was standing beside me. I was in a hospital bed. The circle of light I'd been looking at was the face of a clock on the wall. And the white rod was the railing at the foot of the bed. Norman. Norman, darling. Oh, thank heavens it's all over. Lori. Lori, I'm alive. Of course you're alive. How do you feel? I'm not sure. A little weak. See, I've been away for a while. Far away. On a rather long trip. I know, dear. I know just what you mean. You know what? I have a wonderful idea. 
idea for my next book. Oh, you mustn't talk. You must rest. It's about this fella whose doctor starts to operate on him. A 50-50 chance of his making it. The doctor's knife slips. The patient sees the accident, realizes he's dead. Goes off on a journey into space. Sees all kinds of strange phenomena. If a writer of science fiction envisions his passage to eternity as an eerie odyssey through space, how do you suppose another person would see it? A coal miner, for example. Would he perhaps find himself digging down, down, down forever until he reaches ink-black oblivion? Or a carpenter? Would he be building an unending stairway of steps and risers leading to a perpetual, everlasting nothingness? We'll never know. I'll be back shortly. In recent days, there have been many heated discussions over the true definition of the word death. Biological death, where there is total and permanent cessation of all vital functions. Legal death, where many of these vital functions continue, but where there are no other signs of life as we know it. We leave the resolution of this question to the theologians, the scientists, even the lawyers. One thing we're almost sure of, along with Norman Hill, the journey to death may not only be terrifying, but it will also be very interesting. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Ann Williams, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. our capacity for belief. Most people would probably claim they'll believe anything they can see, feel, taste, touch, or hear. In short, anything they could experience with their senses. But I will venture to say there are things in this world so fantastic, so incredible, that you or I could stare at them with our own two eyes and swear under oath that we were not seeing what was there. Our mystery drama, The Ninth Volume, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Percy Granger and stars Michael Wager. Energy is something we hear a great deal about these days. The kind of energy provided by oil and coal, that is. We hear debates as to how much of these precious substances are left. Some say supplies are virtually unlimited. Others say we'll run out in two to three hundred years. And the more dire prophets claim a mere 25 years. Whatever the figures, one thing is certain. As the situation becomes more urgent, some of those looking for new reserves are not going to let anything stand in their way. The year is 1998. 
We're at a drilling site on the western slopes of the Rocky Mountains. Okay, start her up. Start her up! Chunky? Yes, sir? What are the chances of that well getting down another 50 feet by noon? I don't know, boss. That's pretty solid stuff we're drilling through now. I don't understand this. Not in all my 42 years in this business as a company geologist told me to drill halfway up a mountain instead of on the low ground. He seems pretty confident. He's a young smart aleck, if you ask me. He isn't quite right. You mean in the head? Yeah. But he went to college. All right, get on the back of that rig, Sharky, and take it as fast as you can. But remember, under no circumstances do I want any more delays. Morning, Milo. Morning, John. Coffee's on. Uh Uh-huh. Everything underway okay today? How can you be so cheerful when we've only got less than a week left and no sign of oil? Less than a week? Five days, to be exact. I got a call from headquarters last night. They've decided against renewing the lease on this land. Oh, they're crazy. Do they know how much oil there is under that mountain? Well, John, forgive me, but you seem to be the only one still under the illusion that there's anything at all down there. We've drilled ten dry holes over the past two years. Ten dusters. And all of them have been based on your so-called calculations. That's right, because headquarters always pulled the pipe before we got down far enough. Do you have any idea how much drilling costs go up when you get down past the second mile? Milo, I'm going to make you a little wager. How many feet do you think the boys can take it down today? I asked Sharky for 50 by noon. That I will bet you $100 that by noon we've struck oil. A hundred bucks. How far down are we now? As of last night at quitting time, it was 19,967 feet. Okay. I'll make that bet even more specific. I say that by the time we reach 19,980 feet, we'll be into the biggest pool of oil you ever saw. Well, it's only 13 more feet. That's right. Is it a bet, Milo? Well, uh, uh, Mr. Hawkins, yeah? uh, Mr. Burke, I think we've hit something. What? We've hit an air pocket. Are you sure? I think that's what it is. The rock bit's not meeting any resistance. None at all? No, sir. Are you holding in position? Yes, sir. Good. Get ready to cap. Keep the rig going, but wait till I give you a signal. I want to get company headquarters on the phone. Yes, sir. Hello, Milo. I think you just saved yourself a hundred bucks. I want headquarters to put this over the intercom. When this geyser goes, everybody in that whole building is going to hear it. What? What was that? Sounded like the rig. The rig. It stopped. What's the matter? What's... what's happened? Shocky, what's gone wrong? I... I don't know. Well, why did you stop the rig? Something weird is happening, boss. What? What are you talking about? Uh, well, there was this, uh... I, I, I mean, I don't know how to describe it. The rotor was kicking up rock dust. You know, that yellowish granite we've been drilling through and... Then all of a sudden, well, it changed color. Changed color? Yeah. And for that, you stopped the rig? Well... Oh, now, I... wait a minute, Milo. Chalky, you uh, said the dust changed color to what? Well, I think it was kind of reddish. Ah, well, it sounds like we may have hit a stratum of clay. So where is this red dust? Let me see it. Well, now, that's what I'm trying to tell you. It isn't here anymore. It was in my hands. I was holding it in my hands, looking at it, and it just disappeared. You mean the wind blew it away? No. My hands were cut. There wasn't any wind. It just evaporated. It just evaporated? Disappeared? Yes, sir. Now I've got two nuts to deal with. As a scientist, I'd be rather curious to have a look at some of this dust. Still, some of this stuff in the hole here. If I can just turn the pipe. Ah, here we are. No, I, I don't know if I'd touch it, Mr. Perk. What if it's not safe? That looks harmless enough to me. Yeah, but you don't know. 
That's from nearly four miles down in the earth. It could be almost anything. That's why I had him stop the rig. I think my first guess was right. It seems to be clay of some sort. It's very odd, though. What would it? There had to be a seam of clay that deep in the earth. And the kind of rock formation we've been cutting through. Look. Look there. See what I mean? Hey, what happened to it? It just vanishes. That's what I was telling you. Chalky, bring me some kind of small container, will you? A, a, a plastic bag, anything, so long as it's airtight. Okay. Why airtight? I think it must be the fresh air that's causing this stuff, whatever it is, to disintegrate. I, I want to get a sample of it down at Boulder to the university there and have it analyzed. Well, this is the only airtight bag I can find, Mr. Perth. What is it? Well, it's from my lunch pail. Wife put my sandwich in it this morning. <laughs> well, I guess it'll have to do. Milo, will you give me a ride? Well, what about the well? I think we'd better leave the rig off until we find out what this stuff is. It's past one o'clock. We've lost the whole morning. How much longer is this friend of yours going to take? Milo, Professor Anderson is a very thorough person. He'll be finished when he's finished. This is ridiculous. You saw that dust disintegrate with your own eyes. So... Stuff comes up from the center of the earth and acts weird. Why not? If I was down there, I'd, I'd act weird. It doesn't raise your curiosity at all. Ah, Professor Anderson. Gentlemen. What did you find out? Were you able to analyze the powder? Uh, Mr. Hawkins, is that right? Yes, sir. You, know, you can call me Milo. Milo, how do you enjoy working with this practical joker here? Professor, what? You see, Mr. Hawkins... Mr. Perk here was one of my more intelligent students, so I assume he must be attempting humor when he comes around bothering a busy old man with a handful of powdered tile. Tile? That's right, John. What you asked me to drop everything for and analyze is nothing but common tile, such as one might use to roof a house. Uh, what's so special about it? What? What's so special about it, Professor? is that it comes from the bottom of a well shaft nearly four miles down inside a mountain. Oh, I see. So you were pulling my leg. Why, why did you ask me to keep the sample in an airtight container? It made my examination much more difficult. Because when that dust is exposed to fresh air, it disintegrates. Disintegrates? Uh, John, if that's true, do you realize how old this material could be? Your find must be investigated at once. Well, there's just one problem, Professor. How would you get down there? I don't know. I only know the site must be excavated. And this powder could well be far older than all our previous estimates. It could be all that remains of a civilization we never even knew existed. Which reminds me, John, I must keep this sample and run dating tests on it. Of course. Now, look. Our company has a deadline. If we don't find oil, we've got to be off that land by the end of the week. Oh, but you can't continue to drill for oil, son. Don't you realize that by continuing to drill, you might destroy an invaluable clue to our past? I don't care about the past, Professor. I care about the future. And I don't see that the excavation of one more prehistoric Indian dwelling or whatever is going to make any difference. But getting to that oil, if it's there, will. The problem still is how to reach the site. Uh, uh, just a minute. You're drilling up near Pine Creek, aren't you? Yeah, three miles up the mountain from there. Well, then I think there might be a way. There used to be a big silver mine at Pine Creek, remember? Ah, that's right. It was abandoned at the turn of the century, 95 years ago. Yeah, but, but the last shaft the miners dug struck a cave system. Of course. You took us there on a field trip. Now, uh, let me see. I should have some maps around here someplace. Ah, yes. Ah, here we are. This is the one I'm looking for. A cutaway view of the mountain. Now, <clears throat> You can see here how extensive the cave system is. Now, where exactly is the location of your drilling site? Uh, right here. Ah, there you see. 
Trace line straight down 20,000 feet. That's your depth. Uh Uh-huh. And it would place you here, the very deepest bowels of the mountain. But here you see the cave starting at the base of the mine shaft, which is already at the base of the mountain, and you give yourself a head start of nearly 15,000 feet. Mm. And, And look, here's a branch of the cave which comes practically to the point our drill has reached. But we could crawl there in a matter of hours. Now, just a minute, John. Seem to be forgetting who pays your salary. Milo, look. It's now one o'clock. Give me until starting time tomorrow, nine o'clock. What do we lose? A half a day. Uh, I think perhaps you better allow Mr. Perk to attempt the descent. My analysis showed traces of a rather strange substance. An adhesive, I believe. Well, why was it strange? Because it was entirely synthetic. And no primitives we're familiar with could possibly have known about it. I'm reminded of an old story about a cabin boy on a clipper ship. It seems he was always losing things. One day, the captain asked him to clean his favorite clock. But when he asked to have it back, the boy couldn't produce it. The captain flew into a rage. I suppose it's lost, he said. Oh, no, sir, replied the cabin boy. I know exactly where it is. It fell out of my hands as I was cleaning it, and it's at the bottom of the ocean. The characters in our story know where something is, too. And like the captain's clock, the only problem is how to get to it. We shall dig deeper into all of this when I return with Act Two. many things which distinguish man from the so-called lower orders of the animal kingdom. And geologist John Pert is giving us a good demonstration of one of them right now. For man is the only animal who will deliberately set off to confront the unknown. John Pert has bought a few precious hours from a grudging Milo Hawkins, and with Sharkey as his assistant, is descending into the mountain. Sharkey... Carefully, yeah. the ledge isn't too wide. Is there room for both of us? Just barely. What time is it, Sharky? Uh, almost midnight. Sharky, huh? There it is. The end of the tunnel. Oh. Hand me the bag with the drill and the explosives. Here we go. While I'm drilling the hole for the dynamite, you get out the oxygen packs. That inflate one of those balloons to seal off the tunnel behind us. We don't want any fresh air getting into whatever is behind that rock. The tunnel's all sealed off, Mr. Burke. Good. Charge is ready. Now let's just back up around this corner here. Yeah. Okay. okay. It'll just take a second to hook up the wires. Mr. Burke. Yeah. Are we sure we want to do this? I mean, are we sure we want to know what's back there? I'm a scientist, Sharky. Yes, sir. It's all wide. Push the plunger. Okay. (coughs) Can't you see anything? (coughs) This flashlight. No. Wait. Uh, we've dusted. This looks like there's a chamber of some sort. Come on. Let's get back in there and set up the light. Yeah. Here. Give me the light. You you crank up the generator. Okay. Okay, turn her on. Good Lord. I don't get it, Mr. Perk. We must have taken the wrong turn. This isn't a prehistoric dwelling. It's somebody's house. We didn't take any wrong turns, Sharky. Well, look. See in the ceiling there? The nose of our rock bed from the drilling rig. Yeah, but look at this. A stove, a sink, even a dishwasher. Ah, and look. Look at here. A dining room, rugs, a table, chairs. 
They look like they stay right out of a department store. I don't like this. I wish we'd brought guns or something. What if this is some kind of criminal hideout? Four miles underground? Well, we don't know. Maybe it's a secret government project, a bomb shelter or something. But how was it built? I don't know. But there's got to be a reason why it's here. Let's have a look around. Maybe there's another way in which the survey charts don't show. Did you find anything, Mr. Perk? Nothing. How about you? Well, nothing. Fantastic. This entire house is encased in solid bedrock. But I saw bedrooms, a bathroom, even a TV set. Everything just like people lived here. Except that there are no signs of life anywhere. Hey, look at this. Glass in the windows, not even cracked. And curtains. I wonder if the plumbing works. Well, it's one one way to find out, isn't it? <laughs> ah! Hey, the stuff that came out of the tap. It's black. Black? What is it? Let me take that. No, Mr. Perk, don't! What I thought. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with this, Shocky. It is perfectly good crude oil. Oil? Yep. I don't believe what I'm seeing. A ranch house in the middle of the earth with oil coming out of the faucets. It's like magic. I think there may be a more rational explanation, at least for the oil. Did you see any stairs leading to the basement? Hey, I saw some stairs down the hallway. Come on, then. Let's follow these pipes. Pipes should be over on that far wall. What's that? No, no, I, I kept in something. The whole basement floor seems to be covered with it. Shine your lights out. Yeah. Hey, look. It's oil. Whole floor is three inches deep in oil. You see, I was right all along. There is oil in this mountain. We were right on target. And the only thing that stands between us and a gold mine is this house. <laughs> this solves everything. At last, we have proof that the oil exists. The company can go ahead and take a new lease on the land, and we'll have the time to try to find an answer to the mystery of this house. <laughs> the generator here. We've got to get back and stop Milo starting the rig up. What time is it? Uh, 2.57 a.m. Uh, we should just about make it. We'll inflate another balloon to seal the passage behind us before removing the first one. Are we all set to go? All set. Wait. Wait a minute. What's this? What? This door. I, I didn't see it before. Did, did you check it out? No, I thought you did. Well, we better have a look. Uh, Mr. Perk, this place gives me the creeps. I got this funny feeling. Why don't we just leave well enough alone? Help me move the light over. What kind of thing could survive down here without air? Mr. Perk, I'm frightened. Now, don't open this door. Get out of the way! Uh, what is it? A library. A library? Only a library. Room filled with books. You're not afraid of them, are you? I'm, I'm going to have a look. Maybe they'll provide some kind of clue. <laughs> the owner is obviously a man of refinement and culture. This. Complete works of Shakespeare, Milton, Plato's dialogues, Aristotle, Dante, Plutarch. Yeah, here are the more recent authors, Faulkner, Fitzgerald, Hemingway. Now, this isn't offering us much in the way of clues. Huh. Did you find something? This reclining chair. My father-in-law's got one just like it in his den. Oh. <laughs> exactly like it. I, well, I mean, it's a different color. But it's the same model. Now, here's something. Whoever owns these books is obviously interested in history. Here's an entire case devoted to it. Herodotus. Tacitus. Livy. <laughs> Arranged in chronological order. Hollinshed's Chronicles. Gibbon's French Revolution. 
Who's this? Who? Someone named D.V. Davis wrote A History of the World. I thought I... I never heard of him, Sharky. Well, don't look at me. I never heard of half those other guys you mentioned. Davis. Strange. Every other author on the shelf is familiar with him. Uh, Mr. Perk, you, you remember that feeling I had before? Well, it's coming back. I think we ought to go. Now, wait a minute. History of the World by David Vladimir Davis. In nine volumes. But there are only eight volumes here. Well, there's a space. The ninth volume is missing. And the eighth volume covers... Lord, Sharky, you don't see the ninth line of this set lying around anywhere, do you? No, why? Did you see it anywhere lying around the house? I don't know. I'll I just try to remember. Well, there were some books on a table in the living room. I've got to find it. Here, yeah, but the time, it's after three. Forget the time. We've got to find the ninth volumes of this set. Why? Because I am holding the eighth volume in my hand. I can feel its weight. I know it's real. It's not an illusion. The eighth volume of a nine-volume set of books on the history of the world. Our world as we know it and have lived it. And this eighth volume goes from the year 1815, the Battle of Waterloo, to the year 2000. But this is 1998. What is this guy, a fortune teller? Don't you see? There's still another entire volume to the set. I think I'm beginning to understand. Hey, wait, wait. What's that noise? Miss Burke, the house is beginning to shake. It's stopping. What was it? I'm not sure. But if we really are sitting on top of an oil field, it's a highly unstable situation. The vibrations from the dynamite must have disturbed things. We've got to get out of here. First, we have got to find that book. Why? Why? What's so important about some old fortune teller's book? That's not it, Sharky. That's not it at all. Don't you realize what we've discovered? This is... What's that smell? What? That smell. Hey. It's gas. There's gas escaping from somewhere. That explosion must open a leak in a gas pocket. Quick. Put this book in our bag. We'll have to come back later with masks to search for the ninth volume. Hi, Mr. Burke. There's daylight. At last. There's someone there at the mine entrance. Huh? Oh, my God, it looks like Professor Anderson. John! John, is that you? Yeah. We're, we're coming, Professor. But, uh... Oh, what are you doing here? I must know what you found down there. I've been up the entire night running dating tests on that tile sample. At first, I couldn't believe it. But now I know there can be no doubt. That powder you brought me is over... Twelve billion years old. But we know the world's only four and a half billion years old. Well, I mean, that's what I heard Mr. Hawkins say once. Yes, that's what we've always thought, Mr. Sharkey, but evidently we've been wrong. Now tell me what you found. At the bottom of our well hole is a house. Even more perfectly preserved in the ruins of Pompeii. It has every modern appliance we're familiar with, from electric can openers to reclining chairs. It's just like the houses in the suburb where I live. Only difference is it is from a civilization so far in the past. Until now, not even a trace of it's been known. But what about all those books, Mr. Perk? The Shakespeare and all? How'd they get there? Shakespeare? That's the most incredible thing of all, Professor. That 12 billion year old civilization was ours. Same names, same events, same people fighting the same wars, making the same inventions, creating the same masterpieces. Probably making the same mistakes. Oh, so that's why you wanted the ninth volume of that history. That's right, Sharky, because whatever fatal mistake they made, whatever happened to cause their extinction, it's going to happen to us. Unless we can discover what it was and avoid it. The ninth volume? There isn't time to explain now, Professor. We've got to get back to camp and stop Milo before he turns on that rig. In our beginning is our end. 
said T.S. Eliot. All living things duplicate themselves in reproduction with a phenomenal precision. So is it not at least possible, then, that nature repeats itself on a larger scale, too? In fact, on the largest scale of all. I shall return shortly with our final act. Catch but glimpses of our past. The legend of Atlantis lives on. The mysteries of Stonehenge and the giant statues of Easter Island continue to baffle us. The most advanced and sophisticated civilizations are represented by mere shards of pottery stumbled on by accident. For all our research, there is still behind us a vast unknown. But now... A discovery, fantastic, terrifying evidence of a former civilization identical to our own. A civilization whose end was so cataclysmic, no trace had ever been discovered until now. Right. Thank goodness we got here before you started that rig. John, I've got a bone to pick. There's no time for that. Sharky? Yes, sir? Get out there and get the rig started. No, wait, you've got to listen to us. I've got a better idea, John. Why don't you listen to me for a change? I got a little phone call last night from headquarters. You remember them, don't you? They wanted to know how things were going. Understandably, they're getting a little anxious, considering the fact that we've got only four days before our lease here is up. And you can imagine my chagrin when I had to tell them the rig wasn't even running. That my geologist, who's supposed to be telling me where to drill has told me to stop so he could go down and nose around some prehistoric Indian hut. That's not what's down there. I don't care what's down there. My job is to drill for oil. You know who's arriving today? Sid Dobbs. Sid Dobbs. That's right. The company executive vice president. He wants to know what the heck is going on here. He's flying up personally to take over the operation. Well, if you would let me get a word in edgewise, I can tell you what's going on. All I want to know is why we haven't struck oil. Well, that's one thing you don't have to worry about. There is oil down there. We saw it. You saw it? I stuck my finger in it. I tasted it. It's there, right where I said it would be. The drill is no more than 20 feet above the strike at this very moment. Well, well then, let's get it going and have that oil coming up for Mr. Dobbs. So he won't have our heads in a sling. Charlie? Yes, sir? No, wait a minute. You can't start the rig, not until we've had a chance to go back down there. Go back down? What for? Milo, what we've discovered, it wasn't... Well, it wasn't what we expected. There's a house down there, all right, but it's... Modern. I mean, well, not modern exactly. <laughs> it's 12 billion years old. But Sharky, what's he talking about? I know, I know it sounds incredible, but Professor Anderson ran dating tests on that powder we took him, and it is 12 billion years old. Ah, so you found a modern 12 billion year old house. But the important thing is the book. That's why we've got to go back down. Oh, I see. What? The ninth volume. It's a history of the world from the year 2000 on. John, I'm doing my best to stay with you, but you aren't making it easy for me. Milo, now listen. There is a house down there from a civilization that existed 12 billion years ago. That was ours. It was us. Don't you see what that means? We're being given the chance to look into the future. I see. Sharky? Yes, sir? You've been awful quiet. Yeah, I guess so. You were down there with Mr. Perk, weren't you? Yes. You went all the way with him? You saw everything he saw? Yes. And you saw this house he's talking about? No. No, I didn't. What? Sharky! You didn't see a 12 billion year old house that looks just like ours, that has a set of books that's going to tell us what's going to happen? No, sir, I didn't. 
I didn't see any of that. That's what I thought. No! Fuck you, what are you saying? Milo, look in this bag. We brought up the eighth volume of that set. See, look, it goes from 1815 to the year 2000. Now, now will you believe me? There's nothing in here but a pile of dust. What? Oh, good grief, we're in such a hurry. I must not have sealed the container properly. Look, Milo, you've got to believe me. Twelve more hours is all I need. But we've got to go back down there. Yeah. Hello, Hawkins here. He has? Okay, I'll be right over. The company plane has just landed with Mr. Dobbs. I'm going to meet him, and I want that rig in full operation by the time we return. Milo, listen to me. Remember when we were at Anderson's lab? He said his analysis of the powder showed traces of a substance that primitive man couldn't have known about. Oh, yes. Yes, I meant to tell you. Professor Anderson called yesterday, right after you and Sharky had gone down into the mine. He'd run another test. And discovered what it was. But doesn't that convince you I'm telling the truth? It was mayonnaise, John. Mayonnaise? That's right. Remember? We used a sandwich bag from Sharky's lunch pail. Mayonnaise. Sharky. Mr. Perk, please, let me get by. Why did you lie? I gotta get the rig started. Are you crazy? Do you realize what we'll be destroying? Mr. Perk, I don't want to talk about it. What are you afraid of? Going back down there, we'll run hoses down to pump out the gas. Anyway, you don't have to go if you don't want to. I can find somebody else. I know it's risky, but it's too important not to take the chance. Mr. Perk, please let me go. Not until you tell me why you lied to Milo. Don't you see what this discovery could mean? The chance to look into the future. The chance to avoid making the same mistake twice. How? What? How are we going to avoid it? Don't you want to know your own fate? No. I don't want to know. An entire civilization may perish because of your cowardice. Why won't you support me? Didn't you see that house? Of course I saw it. Did you take a good look at it? What are you getting at, Sharky? What's the matter? It's a modern house. So... It's not ultra-modern. It's not some weird, futuristic contraption filled with gadgets we've never seen. It's modern. It's contemporary. Don't you see what that means? This is as far as we're coming. This is the end of the line. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen soon. And it's probably too late to stop it. But we can try if we know what it is. I don't want to know what it is. I don't want to know. So you won't support me. When Sid Dobbs arrives, you won't back me up. Huh? Sorry, Mr. Burke. You'll think I'm a raving lunatic. Sharky, why isn't that rig going yet? Oh, man. Hello, John. Hello, Sid. Mr. Dobbs, I'm sorry. I, I gave orders for the rig to be running. It. That's all right, Milo. Forget it. The rig isn't going on. It isn't? No. We've decided to suspend operations altogether. Suspend operations? Our lease is up in four days. It'll take us that long to pack up and be out of here. And as far as I'm concerned, the sooner we never see this place again, the better. Sid, uh, when you say suspend operations, you mean you intend to pull a pipe... We sure can't afford to leave it behind. You can't do that. What? Why not? Removing the pipe would expose the hole to the fresh air and... Well, there's something down there that would be destroyed. By fresh air? Uh, Sid, we struck some old clay rock yesterday. That's why the rig isn't going. John insisted on exploring in a nearby cave. Sid, you have to listen to me. Sharky's right. There is oil down there. We're within 20 feet of it. Are you asking me to start the rig going again? No, no, no. I'm asking you to take a new lease on the land and hold off making the strike until I found... until I've completed my explorations. John, I remind you that we've been listening to you for two years. There's no more time. It's all run out. You are also sitting on top of something infinitely more important than oil... And it's going to be destroyed. John, I think you need some sleep. That's your problem. Now, wait a minute. Just a minute, Milo. 
I'm curious about these continued illusions, John. I might give you one more chance. I will accept your considered judgment as a rational scientist that the oil is there and hold off drilling. If you'll tell me what's down there that's so important. My judgment as a rational scientist. Oh, never mind, Sid, never mind. Go ahead and pull the pipe. Okay. Milo, have the men pack up. We'll pull the pipe and dismantle the rig in the morning. John, why didn't you just tell Mr. Dobbs what it was you'd seen? He wouldn't have believed me, Professor Anderson. Not not without Sharky's corroboration. So? You're going to start pulling the pipe in the morning in a golden opportunity and we'll be lost forever. No, not exactly. Oh? What chance remains? Surely you don't intend to stop them at gunpoint. Oh, no. I'm going to try going down again. She said there was gas leaking, that the ground was beginning to shift. We can wear masks against the gas, and as for the shifting, well, we'll just have to take that risk. Who said we? That's why I came to you, Professor. I need someone to go with me. It's a two-man job. I, I, I don't know who else to turn to. I, I know you're. N- I mean, oh, <laughs> I know what you're trying to say. But on a mission of such importance, uh, I wouldn't hesitate. Not for one minute. And then you'll come with me. Yes, of course I will. Good, we've got to start at once. There's barely enough time as it is. Sharky, I can't say I'll be sorry to see the last of this place. Something about it always did give me the willies. That you better lock the gate for the last time. Oh, okay, Mr. Hawkins. Hey, wait a minute. What's that? Why? The stuff on your boots. The black stuff. Why, that... That's the oil. Oil? Where'd it come from? Well, that's what I was trying to tell you all along. The oil that's down there. Mr. Perk and I saw it and we waded through it. Sharky, get Mr. Dobbs from the office. Why? You've got to start up that rig. There is oil, Sharky. Oil. Do you know what that means? Ha! Our future's golden. Here. Here it is, Professor. This is amazing. A house in every detail. Exactly like our own. From a duplicate civilization that inhabited the earth 12 billion years ago. Oh, how much it could teach us. Wait a minute. Sharky said he thought he'd seen some books in the living room. This way. Oh, look. Over there on the table. Yeah, this is it. The History of the World by D.V. Davis. Volume 9. Do you realize what this will mean, Professor, when we open this book? Yes. I wonder what it is, John, that we're to learn about ourselves from ourselves. Hey, what's that? Professor, they started the drill. The whole house! It's, it's collapsing into dust! There is a legend in classical mythology about the Sibyl, a prophetess who lived appropriately enough to our story in a cave. She offered to sell nine prophetic books to Tarquin the Proud, the last of Rome's legendary kings. He refused, for he felt her price was too high. So she burned three of the books and offered him the remaining six for the same price. Again, Tarquin refused. And again, Sybil burned three of the precious volumes. Finally, he bought the last three for the price of the original nine. But because of his stingy short-sightedness, mankind lost forever his chance to know what the future holds. I shall return shortly. to know 
what fate has in store for us. That would probably depend on whether or not we had the ability to act on that knowledge and to alter the impending course of events. But would it be a simple matter of avoiding a single fatal mistake? Or would we discover a future as complex as human nature itself? And as unchangeable. Our cast included Michael Wager, Court Benson, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. E.G. Marshall. A Chinese proverb holds that nobody's family can hang out the sign, nothing the matter here. There's wisdom in that, don't you agree? Think about your own family. Isn't there at least one skeleton lurking in your closet? At some time and for some reason, it will surely reveal itself. The consequences have raised Cain with ruling powers, business, and even love between two persons. That is why Dr. Tom Lodge, a young resident in a Boston hospital, has long safeguarded a dark family secret from his wife, Nancy. Tom, what are you hiding? Nothing, darling. Now, that doesn't ring true. We don't have secrets between us. Or do we? All right, now, look, don't get on your high horse. Well, then don't treat me like a child. What have you done? Are you married to someone else? Is there a girl you left behind you? Did you kill someone on a hunting trip? Oh, Tom, please, tell me. I have a right to know. Our mystery drama, The Recluse was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Tony Roberts and Patricia Elliott. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. When we are young, family especially our immediate family, is to us the world in microcosm. And we know that we are part of a self-contained unit in which we are fed, clothed, and protected. When we become adults, however, we can view our parents and relatives more objectively. Uncle Bill never was really that amusing, was he? And why did Father always unthinkingly vote the straight ticket? Because he read only the sport pages. And so, family unity becomes subject to the strains of objective thinking, as we are about to find out. I'm home, darling. So you are. What a treat. Give me a kiss. Mm. Mm. What happened? It's only six o'clock. Did the patient die? Oh, you're too much, Nancy. Hey, something smells good. Stew. Or call it Bispa Vignon. It's all the same. Oh, that's a sacrilege, and you know better. And no, the patient did not die. It was a hot appendix, and she'll be up on her feet tomorrow. Now, what's the news of the day? Uh, not good. My mother? No. No, arthritis is wicked, but I don't think it's a killer. No, it's your grandmother in White River. She died this afternoon. Your mother called. I see. 
your mother wants us to attend the funeral, she can't. Well, neither can I. I just can't up and leave the hospital. My mother should know that. Well, somebody has to represent the family, and your mother and you are the only living relatives. You can't not go, Tom. You seem so unfeeling. After all, she is your grandmother. I know, I know. Didn't you like her? I thought everyone liked his grandmother. Well, sure, but... You really adored her, didn't you? Oh, come off it, Nancy. Well, first your mother sounded if she didn't care that her mother had died, and now here you are not caring either and feeling that her death is a manipulation. Hey, what are you so worked up about over this old lady? I mean, you never even met her. Maybe I'm lucky. What was Mrs. Schuyler, some kind of witch? Uh, no, but... Uh, oh, well, let it go, hmm? Why won't you talk about her, Tom? Look, I don't remember her very well. I've, I've kind of lost track. Hey, look, let's have our... Supper will keep. You realize, don't you, that the more you evade the subject, the more you arouse my curiosity. Now, tell me about your grandmother. Well, the Skyler family has been in White River for hundreds of years, uh, dating from before they built the inn, uh, a place named Riverfront. My grandmother's lived there all her life. An old inn? Oh, like the ones you see on the book covers of Gothic novels? Yeah, something like that. It's on the edge of the uh, river, and it's more than 100 years old. Twenty rooms. Most of them were closed off when the inn was closed to travelers. And you explored every one of them, didn't you? Uh, as a matter of fact, I did. But you don't remember her very well. Isn't that what you said? Okay, doctor, what's the mystery... There, there is none. Uh, really, really. Uh, Grandma lived in three rooms, never went out. She's been a recluse since my mother and I left. Why? Heartbroken to see you go? No, not exactly. Hey, how about dropping the subject? No, sirree. There's a skeleton in the family closet, and I want to know what it is, and I'll find out tomorrow. Pardon? When we reach White River. Now, look. It's all decided. We're driving up for the funeral. But... No but about it. What is this dark secret? It goes to the grave with her. My grandmother's death has laid that skeleton to rest. Forever. Stay here, Nancy, in the waiting room. Huh? Now, I'm not sitting here while Mr. Martin reads you the will. As your wife, I'm entitled to know the provisions of your grandmother's will. Oh, what am I going to do with you? All right, all right. Come in, come in. Come in, Dr. Lodge. Ah, Mrs. Lodge. See? He expects me in his office. Well, it's nice to see you again, Tom. Thank you, sir. Uh, my wife, Nancy. How do you do? Hello. Well, sit down, if you please been several years, Tom. Yes, sir. Six. And you're a doctor in a big Boston hospital. Oh, a resident. Mm hmm. How interesting. I telephoned your mother. She couldn't, couldn't be here for the funeral. Yes, arthritis. She's pretty much confined to her house. Yes, so she told me. A tasteful service. Simple, but reverent. Thank you for attending, Mr. Martin. Well, your grandmother was my client and a friend. Uh, you didn't know her, Mrs. Lodge? No, only by hearsay. Is that so? Hearsay, indeed. Well... Tom told me that she was a reckless. Well, I suppose she had become so. Of course, she was an old woman and set in her ways. And what were those, if I may ask, Mr. Martin? My grandmother was austere, self-righteous, and unforgiving. She turned her back on my mother and me six years ago, and we've never heard from her since. We learned not to care. Oh. Why, Tom? She never forgave my mother for marrying my father. Grandma considered him several cuts below her social level. Now, let's forget what's past and hear what Mr. Martin has to say. <clears throat> yes. Well, the provisions of her will are clear and simple. You, Tom, inherit her entire estate. The old inn and the... Fifteen acres surrounding it? And the small house where Mrs. Meggs lives. Tom, it's a fortune. Well, I don't know about that, but... Well, the land is valuable, but the inn... Uh... Well, it's in bad disrepair. And useless. 
I'm afraid that your grandmother let it go over the past few years. It's weather-worn and rotted. And mice have replaced the ghosts of all those old travelers. Well, it'll have to be raised and the land sold. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> well, now, uh, your grandmother left a codicil to her will, Tom, in her handwriting. Whatever is realized from the sale of the inn and the land is to be paid to the bank. But why? Was she in debt? Is that the... Is that the skeleton in the large closet, Tom? Uh, why don't we just leave it that way, Nancy? Yes, it uh, might be best, Mrs. Lodge. But it's not the truth, is it? A woman like your grandmother, why would she get herself into debt and, and over what? Well, a family matter. So it wasn't her debt. Tom, was it yours? Look, darling, it's really unimportant. I, I don't think it is. I... I want to understand what this is about. Did you know about this indebtedness? Is that why you and your mother lost touch with your grandmother? <clears throat> well, I, I'll file the will for probate, Tom. Uh, do you want me to uh, dispose of the inn and the land and carry out your grandmother's last wish? Yes, I'd appreciate it, Mr. Martin. Tom, how did you get into debt and for how much? I really do have a right to know. If you persist, Nancy... You will regret the day you said, yes, I'll marry you. Darling, no matter what you did, I'll never regret that decision. You'd better tell her, Mr. Martin. Yes, perhaps I should. Well, um, Tom's father was assistant cashier at the Merchants Bank over there across the street. Now, six years ago, in February 1970, Tom's father... My father stole $70,000 from his bank and disappeared. And neither have been seen since, him or the money. Now, are you satisfied? Oh, Tom, darling. My mother and I were so ashamed that we slunk out of White River and I hoped I'd never have to come back here and face the old neighbors. The sins of the father. How oh, cruel. Your grandmother renounced your mother and you for something your father did? Well, that was my grandmother's way. And now, in the codicil to her will, she makes me responsible to see that her estate is sold and the proceeds paid to the bank. I still can't be free of what my father did. I'm still made to feel guilty because he grabbed a bundle and flew the coop. Now, do you understand why I didn't want to come here for the funeral? And why I hope my father has already had his. Sit down, Ruth. Uh, a cold wind. Mm. Coming on to snow. A cup of hot tea will do you good. Uh, uh, nice of Tom to invite me to the funeral. He always was nice as a boy. Yep. Yeah, and nice wife, too. What happened now, Leo? You got any idea? Mm, he'll sell, is my guess. Except for Tom and his mother, the old lady was the last of the line. Yeah, well, that's the Scarlet family. Well, I can't complain, but it makes me feel kind of peculiar that I won't be working the land no more. Forty years. Now, how about you, Lil? You pulling up stakes? Ain't your sister Faye someplace south? Lord of Dale? I'm thinking about it. After all you did for the old woman over the years, I thought maybe she'd leave something to you. Nice little house, I'd say. Not her ladyship. She was a tight one. Well, I better get up to the inn and light a fire for him. Every once in a while on a snowy night, I, I wonder what happened to him, Lil. To the father? Yeah. Snowbound. The car found stuck in the snow next morning. No sign of him or the money. Where'd he get to, Lil? All I remember is he stormed out of the inn and disappeared. Yeah, that's what I mean. Gone. Without a trace. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, it's just Ruth's dog. I'll chain him up in the barn. Thanks, Mrs. Maggs. Anything else I can do? I left bacon and eggs in the refrigerator and then... Oh, nothing. Bread. Thank you. That's fine. Well, then I'll say goodnight and get back while I can see my way. We'll have snow. I wouldn't wander around, Tom. The old place is falling apart and some of the floors ain't too firm. I'll say goodnight. Mm -hmm. oh, goodnight. Good night. Good night. Good night. Ooh. 
sleepy. I hate this place. There's been a pall over it ever since what happened. I'll tell you one thing, Nancy. I am not spending the night in this, uh, this mausoleum. What did happen to your father? How could he have gotten away? Search me. Police went all over the inn for days. There was no trace of him. You lived here as a boy? Yeah, sure. My friends and I used to play games here. You know, hide and seek. I remember those days. And you were the hero. <laughs> I mean, did you ever hide where no one could find you? Oh, well, there were lots of places. Cubby holes, uh, one room with a false wall, uh, trap doors and some ceilings. Oh. It's a wonder one of us was never found. Maybe that's what happened, Tom. Huh? But did you have a special hiding place? You knew the old inn better than anybody else. Good Lord. The sealed room. The, the, the what? Yeah, the sealed room beneath the long clothes closet off the entry hall. Oh, but... No, it's impossible. Is it? If your father couldn't have gotten away because of the snowstorm... He must still be here. Or what's left of him. Well, what have we here? Old deeds have a way of coming to light. And the skeleton in your closet can be made to rattle because of an inquiring mind. If a major premise and a minor premise are true, so is the logical conclusion. Tom Lodge's father disappeared. It was impossible for him to have left the old inn. Therefore, he never left the inn. I will return shortly with Act Two. unusual and unlikely for a person to disappear and never be heard of again. Exceptions are rare. Rip Van Winkle to be sure, but that was fantasy. Dr. Livingston, and that was fact, both were presumed to be lost, but after their disappearance, neither was accused of a crime. Tom Lodge's father was. He absconded with $70,000, and therein lies a difference. He was a criminal and in danger. What happened to him? Tom Lodge hopes to find out. Strike another match, Nancy, and I'll let myself down the ladder. Haven't we got a flashlight? Uh, in the car. I'll get it later. I want to see if anything's in there right now. You could slip and break a leg, Tom. No, no, no. no, no. The ladder's strong. Let's strike a match. Come oh, it's really black down here. I can't see a thing. Well, I'll hand the matches to you. I'm flat on the floor on my stomach. Reach up. Okay. Now, let me see. Oh, darling, be careful. Don't worry. Oh, there's the pot-bellied stove and the wood scuttle and a chair. Small table Good Lord. Oh, what is it, Tom? Tom, answer me. I'm coming up. Tom? Yeah. Look, let's, let's get back to the common room. Tell me, did you... Is, is there something there? My father. The, uh... His... His bones. A clothed skeleton. Oh, oh how horrible. I've got to think. You said that the police went all over the inn, Tom. How, how could they have missed the sealed room? I don't know. Nobody remembered it, probably. Well, what was it for? The caretaker. He, back around the turn of the century, he acted as a registration clerk and a handyman, and uh, he, he lived down there. In that hole in the ground? Yes. It's a real room with flooring and walls of wood, and it, it was very snug and warm. After he closed the inn for the night, he lifted the trapdoor in the long closet in the hall and 
pulled it closed after him. I see. Then the flooring in the closet was covered over. It was carpeting, and that sealed it off. Unless a person knew a room was down there, uh, he'd never find it. But you did, as a boy. Was the floor covered over then? Uh, I don't think so. No. So, the carpeting was laid over the trapdoor recently. Six years ago? Right after your father disappeared? Yeah. Your grandmother must have known about the room, Tom. Yes, of course. Would Mrs. Meggs have known about the sealed room? I don't know. Why? Well, who, who was here the night your father disappeared? No one. Uh, my grandmother and Mrs. Meggs. And, of course, my father. Your father stole money. He came here, and six years later we find his remains in a sealed room. Why did he hide? And why did he die? I can't answer those questions, Nancy. We'll never know the answers. I know one of them. He came here and told your grandmother he'd stolen money from his bank. Why would he tell her? No idea. What? If he'd been dipping into your grandmother's money and was caught and stole from the bank in order to replace it. Oh, that's far out. Well, your grandmother refused the money. That's why she wanted the proceeds from her estate to go to the bank. To help repay a debt of honor. Hey, that's pretty far-fetched, darling. Maybe. I have the answer to another one of my questions. Your father hid here because he couldn't get away. Was he a healthy man, Tom? Yes. Why? How did he die? There he was, safe in the sealed room. Did he have a stroke, a heart attack? Did somebody bring him food? Mrs. Meggs? Could be. Tom, get the flashlight and let's examine that room carefully. Oh, I feel like I'm in a tomb. It's my father, all right. Look, where I'm shining the light, you see this break in the skull? Oh. Now, that's how he died, Nancy. He was struck a hard blow. He was murdered. And look at this. His watch. Huh. The strap's rotted, but it's his watch, all right. Look, his initials are on the back. Oh, let's get out of here. Uh, in a minute. Now, it's my turn to ask a question. What became of the money? The 70 grand? Well, whoever murdered him took it. That was the motive. Yeah, but it was hot money, Nancy. It was hard to use for a long time. And the sealed room would be an ideal place to hide it. Where? Where could it be hidden? And I went over the mattress on the cot. It's not there. And the small closet is empty. Well, let me see. In the stove? No, why not? Tom! How about that? Look at this wad of money. Wrapped in oil skin. Oh, I'm afraid, Tom. Leave that money and, and, and close off the room. Well, there's only 15000 55000 is gone. Someone squirreled it away. Tom, let's go back to the hotel and think it through. Okay. Okay. I'll telephone my mother. Uh, maybe she'll know the answers to some of our questions. Gee, you are scared, aren't you, darling? Oh, of course I am. Someone committed a murder for money. We found it. If the murderer discovers that we know, he may try to kill us. Down, boy, down. Thanks, Lou. Have a chance to talk with Tom? Nothing to talk about, Ruth. What's on your mind? Well, if you don't sell the land, maybe I could tenant farm it for him. I'd say he'd want to sell. Yeah. Well, if I had two dimes to rub together, I'd buy it. Oh, you can always get work, Ruth, so you said. Yeah. May change your mind? Oh, I've been thinking about it, that's all. I'm getting on. The winter's around here are mighty rugged. I wonder if they could use me down south. Sure. An experienced field hand like you? I'd say so. Why, what you got you thinking about moving south? <laughs> I guess you did, Lou. Talking about your sister down in Lauderdale. <laughs> That's where you're going, ain't it? Oh, I think so. Of course, if the old lady had left me the house, 
But she didn't. Well, you got money laid aside? Mm, a little. I could help you out, Ruth. Not with much, but enough to give you a stake. Oh, no, that's mighty nice of you, Lil. When are you thinking of heading on down south? As soon as I can sell my furniture and pack, we could spell each other at the wheel. Yeah. Well, I'd like that. Then it's settled. Well, I'll be back after I make quick inspection about the inn. If the snow's piling up, maybe I could drive Tom's car down here and put it in the barn. Otherwise, it might get stuck in the morning. Oh, yes, that's true. It's happened before. Yep, I remember. Tom's father. James. That's what you need in heavy snow. Mr. Martin had him. The lawyer? Yeah. He left that night around 10 o'clock. I saw him drive away. James. That's what got him through. You didn't know he'd been to the inn. Thanks, Mother. This has been very helpful. Well? My father did manage my grandmother's money, and he had begun to dip into it. So he dipped into the bank to repay her. That's why he absconded with all that money. How did he think he'd get away with robbing the bank? Oh, who knows? Your grandmother must have been furious. Well, it was through her that he got his job at Merchants. He must have loved your mother very much. Yes. Well, I'm afraid he wasn't much of a banker. Oh, it's all tragic, and they're both dead because a willful old matriarch couldn't form him into her own image. Well, let's pay a visit to Mr. Martin, huh? I'll turn this money over to him, and uh, he can give it to the bank. Fifteen thousand? What about the rest? It's gone. Can't be traced now. I wonder... The snow is beautiful. You won't think so if it doesn't light up, darling. Driving is no fun in the North Country. Uh, come in, come in. Thank you. Forgive us for uh, calling at your home. Oh, perfectly all right. Oh, what a charming room. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, let me get right to the point, Mr. Martin. I found the remains of my father in a sealed room. What? Your, your father? He'd been murdered. In heaven's name. And here is 15 of the $70,000 he stole from the bank. Oh, you... You stagger me, Tom. Well, he didn't disappear. He was murdered and hidden in the sealed room, and the money, most of it, was taken away. I came to you... Well, of course, of course. I, I'll notify the police in the morning. Not tonight. We're in danger, Mr. Martin. Danger? I don't see how. Well, if the murderer finds out what we've discovered, he'll come after us. Well, who knows about your discovery? Well, no one. Except you, of course. You didn't speak to Mrs. Meggs? No. Why not? Well, we think that she must know something about all this. She was in the house the night my father vanished. You know that, Mr. Martin. I do. Well, that's what my mother says. I talked to her half an hour ago, and uh, she had had it from uh, Roof Box. She'd had what from Roof? That you were at the inn. He saw you drive away. Oh, that. Well, yes, now that you remind me, I'd, I'd driven out to see your grandmother, but I left quite early. May I ask a question? I don't mean to be impertinent, but... Were you aware that Tom's father was stealing from his mother-in-law? Well, goodness, no. You didn't check her account periodically? Well, very seldom. I, I thought it was in good hands. Your father's. My father stole for the purpose of making investments. You were his broker. Didn't you ever wonder where he was getting his money? You're on dangerous ground, young man. I know it, Mr. Martin, but we mean two different things. I'm not worried about slander. I'm worried about my skin. Nancy's and mine. We're in danger, and I think you know it. Two hundred years ago, Samuel Johnson remarked, There is nothing which has been contrived by man through which so much happiness is produced as by a good tavern or inn. True enough. All gone now swallowed up in progress, including riverfront, 
an old New England inn which has now divested itself of a murder and its remains. There are more surprises when I return shortly with Act Three. Other sins can only speak. Murder shrieks out. That metaphor by John Webster from his 16th century play, The Duchess of Malfi, best expresses the repugnance we feel when we learn that someone has been murdered. Murder cries to be solved. And Dr. Tom Lodge confronts one, that of his long-missing father. We still have three suspects, and one of them is the handyman at Riverfront, Rufus Boggs. Lord almighty heaven, help us. Go on, open up. Come in, Ruth. Oh, no. Oh, what's wrong? You're white as the snow. He was there all the time, Ruth. Well, what were you talking about? Tom's father. You sound crazy. Now sit down and go slow. Now what's this about Tom's father? I found him in a room in the cellar. Tom's father? I was going round the inn. I was riverside when they drove off, leaving all the lights on, and I went up to the door, and it wasn't closed tight. I opened it and called hello. And then me and Shark stepped inside, and he began to bark, and the hair went up on his back. Scared me stiff. Go on. He ran into that old hall closet and barked his head off. There's a trap door there. Did you know that, Lil? No. A trap door to where? Well, a room, sort of, under the common room. I had my flashlight, so I, I kneeled down and played the light around it. And I saw it. A skeleton. Oh, my. Stretched out on a cot. Oh. Which to give me a terrible turn. A skeleton? <laughs> Tom's father. Oh. It has to be. That's where he's been these six years. And they drove away? That's right. We'll, we'll have the police swarming all over the place soon, and there'll be questions like, what do I know about it? And, and I don't know nothing, Lil, nothing. Neither do I. Now, you leave the talking to me. All I know is Tom's father bolted out of the house and slammed the door behind him. That's the last anybody's seen of him. And I was in the barn all evening, except when I left my room to quiet shark. That's when I seen Mr. Martin drive away. His car, anyway. Well, we'd better go back up there, Ruth. What for? Well, they found out the murder. He was murdered? Well, well that's my guess. The, the man wouldn't just stay in there and starve himself to death. No, I guess you're right. Uh, Tom and the wife made the discovery, and, and you can bet whoever killed his father is going to do something about it. Like what? Like, get that evidence out of there, and then kill them. Now, we've got to stop that, Ruth. What do you, what's, the, what's the gun for? Why well, I may need it. Why don't we wait for the police? No, no, no. No, there's no time. There's no time at all. There was a message at the hotel desk. Mrs. Meggs telephoned. She has to see me, and she's driving into town. When did she call? Half an hour ago. Sure to be here any minute. <laughs> you were pretty rough on Mr. Martin, darling. Yeah, but his role strikes me as funny. I mean, funny odd. Look, he was my father's friend and broker. He must have wondered where the money was coming from for those stocks my father bought. On the other hand, uh, people up here pretty much mind their own business. Oh, it's all very confusing. Not all of it. There was a murder. Miss... Mrs. Meggs. Uh. Oh, Tom. Oh, Tom, the most dreadful thing's happened. Ruth, it's... Ruth killed himself. Oh, no. Killed himself? You found him out, and that's why he did it. You found the room and the skeleton. Where did you find Ruth? At the inn. The door was unlocked. I went in with Shark and turned on the light. And there he was, Ruth stretched out on the floor, dead. Shot in the head. I near fainted. I ran back to my house. I didn't know what to do. You didn't call the police? Well, I phoned you. Well, then I chained Shark in the barn. 
and went into Ruth's room. And I I found the money. He had he had hidden it in his room? Well, not all of it. Just about five thousand dollars. I I can't believe it, Tom. I can't believe it. I brought it to give it to you. Ruth Boggs. He was such a gentle old man. Gosh, I don't believe it either. <laughs> He killed himself because he was found out. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess that should clear up the mystery. Huh? You'd better stay here in the hotel, Mrs. Meggs. Uh, oh. I'll get you a room. No, no, no. I'll go back and, and be there when the police come. And the ambulance. I, oh, I'm half out of my head with grief, Tom. Yes, it's a terrible shock. Isn't it? Oh. Well, we'll be out in the morning if we can get through. Oh, they'll have the roads cleared. Never fear. I don't know what to say. Good, good night. That's a blow. Roof box. Gosh, I've known him since I was a little boy. Kind and patient. He was a little slow, but he was a good man. He must have gone off his trolley. Mrs. Meggs is a liar. Nancy, your imagination... It's lucky for you I've got some... Ask yourself a few questions, darling. But from what you remember, did Ruth ever go into that inn? Oh, well, rarely. But, uh, well, he, look, he saw us drive off, and uh, maybe we, we left the light on us. So he goes in, finds the skeleton, and shoots himself? Well, that's what Mrs. Meg says. His dog is always with him? Sure. So the dog went into the inn with him? Go on. Then how... Come, Mrs. Meggs heard the dog howling outside. Yeah. Mrs. Meggs had said goodnight to us. Why did she want to return to the inn? Not for the reason she gave, Tom. I think Ruth told her what he found, and they returned to the inn together. And she shot him. Oh, that's crazy. Is it? What about this? Where did she find the $5,000? In his room. Just like that? She could walk into Ruth's room and just like that find $5,000? If he'd stolen the money, he'd have hidden it. Yeah, well, all right, that's the point. Uh, her story does set on kind of path, doesn't it? Sure, because it's a lie. Darling, she murdered Ruth just as she murdered your father six years ago. All right, but just saying it doesn't make it so. I mean, how do we prove it? Two ways. The police can check on the gun used to kill Ruth. And they can also help us to find the rest of the money. I kept asking myself, where did it all go? Well, for all I know, we just flew away. Oh, that's what I think, too. Are you... Are you serious? Very. The money flew away? Yes. You give me a day with the police, and I think I can find that money. And when I do, we'll put Mrs. Meggs behind bars for life. Nancy, where have you been? I've been worried to death. I told you where I'd be, darling, with the police. You want to hear something interesting? Now go ahead. Every time your father placed a stock order, he placed a similar one from Mr. Martin and paid for all of it. What? That's right. I'll make a guess. Your father and Martin were in collusion. Your father used your grandmother's money with Martin's tacit approval. You mean the two of them were dipping into the old woman's funds? That's what it looks like to me. Your grandmother demanded an accounting, and to repay her, your father robbed his bank. Oh, gosh, it gets worse and worse. But it's going to get better and better, darling, because the police have supplied me with two very helpful pieces of information. The gun? Yes, they traced the gun. Rufus Boggs never had a handgun, as far as the police can tell. But old man Meggs did, and he had a permit to carry it. The permit expired when he died, but the gun was never turned in. It was Meggs' gun which was used to murder Rufus. Well, I should clinch it. Without question. She murdered Ruth. But what about your father? Uh, were the police helpful there? Oh, very. D did you know that Mrs. Meggs has a sister living in Fort Lauderdale? No. Well, she has. And they are very regular correspondents. Remember what you said, Tom? That maybe the money just flew away? Yeah. Well, it did. 
Can't you guess? You're telling me that... Exactly. Now let's call on her and see if she doesn't fall apart. Well, it's still beyond me. Killing your father and then taking his own life. Is that what you think he did, Mrs. Max? Why, it's plain as the nose on your face, Tom. But why would a man shoot himself unless he was guilty of some terrible crime? Hmm. I guess you're right. <sighs> I've decided to sell the estate, Mrs. Meggs, because I'm tied down in Boston and I just couldn't manage the place from there. Oh. I'm, I'm sorry about that. You've uh, lived here... Uh, Rent-free for over 30 years. That was part of the agreements when Meggs and me moved out here. Yes, I know. Well, if you would like to stay on... I... No, no, thanks. I don't want charity. Have you thought about what you're going to do? Well, Meggs left me a little insurance and I kept it tucked away. I might move to where it's a little warmer than up here. Arizona, maybe. Not Florida. Pardon me? Isn't that uh, where your sister is? Why do you ask? Your sister confessed that there are five savings accounts in Fort Lauderdale Banks in your name, Mrs. Banks. And the police here in White River want you to explain how it happens that there is a small fortune waiting for you down there. Over $15,000. It's no business of theirs. Oh, yes, it is. I found 15000 in the stove in the sealed room. You placed five more where you said Roof had hidden it, 20000 That plus the fifteen makes $35,000. Half the amount my father stole from the merchant's bank. How do you explain that, Mrs. Meggs? And how do you explain that the bullet that killed Rufus Boggs was fired by your handgun? My handgun? I never in my life owned a handgun. Your husband did, and he didn't fire that shot from the grave, did he? You murdered Ruth to save your skin, Mrs. Meggs, so you'd better tell me and tell me quick what happened six years ago to my father. I didn't touch him. He didn't crush his own skull, Mrs. Meggs. Martin killed him. His friend, Martin. Uh Uh-huh. That's more like it. Go on. Your father came to give your grandmother money. She turned him away. He had the money with him. Martin spoke to me, said he'd divide it. Half for him and half for me. I was afraid. Ah, I'll just bet you were. Well, then he struck your father and killed him. We hid the body in the sealed room. And from time to time, you dipped into your half of the money and sent it to your sister for deposit. And you murdered Ruth to cover the old crime. Well, I didn't know what to do. I was crazy with fear. I just lost my head. I doubt that, Mrs. Meggs. You deliberately murdered the old man. Tom, please, be merciful. If you and Martin don't hang for the crime, the court will be merciful. You're cold-blooded killers. You deserve to die. The thief who understands his business never steals in his own neighborhood. An old Arab precept. But greed and opportunity usually go hand in hand. What a killer does not understand are the consequences of premeditated murder. Not for the victim, but for his relatives and friends. There are degrees of crime, from petty thievery to grand larceny. But murder is the worst and most repugnant. I will draw the curtain on the recluse when I return shortly. The 1977 Buick Regal. It comes with Buick's terrific V6 engine. It carries six people and lots of Buick comfort. It's lean. It's maneuverable in city traffic. It's the most luxurious mid-sized car Buick builds. Yeah, this new Regal is pretty much everything a car should be. Except for one thing. It isn't yours yet. But it can be. Just see your Buick dealer for a test drive. Soon. Tom Lodge and his mother had lived for six years under a pall of shame. But then two deaths lifted the curtain. And the truth was revealed. What Tom's father did was wrong. What was done to him was worse. I can report with pleasure that 
Mrs. Meggs and Martin were sentenced to prison for life. And for all I know, they are still there. Still a burden to taxpayers like you and me. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Patricia Elliott, Francis Sternhagen, and Court Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Have you ever been in the cockpit of a jet plane... Faced that amazing array of instruments, row on row. Everything that science and mathematics can do to make man safe. And yet, when the elements choose to outwit them, the pilots still have to answer the challenge. And of all nature's challenges in the air, the most dreaded is the one known as C.A.T., Clear air turbulence. I don't like the way the temperature's dropping, Jake. I smell trouble. Ah, we're cleared at this altitude, Chad. No wind here. What about clear air turbulence? There have been reports. That... <laughs> ah, I knew it. I knew it. Hey, the good Lord help us. The cat's got us by the tail. Our mystery drama, The Time Fold was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Paul Hecht. In the field of private executive airplanes, number one is the Silver Streak, a twin-engine jet designed to seat 12 in the utmost luxury, capable of flying 3,000 miles without refueling, Fully automatic. A jewel. Feed its computer, the size of a small camera, and except for takeoff and landing, you could rely on automatic pilot. The Barracuda, as this plane is named, is a corporate plane. But no one ever uses it except J. Bruce Proctor. He is the only passenger, with the exception of Meg Chatham, his secretary. Flying the plane are number one and two boys, pilot Chad Stevens, co-pilot Jake Slade. How's the weather, Jake? Wild, Chad, wild. What? We get a front eating up the sky, 6-0, it's a big mother. Not so long as we stay clear. This doesn't bother me, it's the other. Huh? What? Hold it a minute. XN 743 to Little Rock VOR. Do you have a weather update, my flight path? Roger, XN743. Stand by. That's a good word. Well, he put in his nickel. Now we wait for Charlie Computer to answer. Is that possible CAT canceled? Well, what do you have to ask for? You can see what's up front. Well, it isn't always what's up front that counts. Like who's going through that? Oh, well, like you said, we bypass. Yeah, only which way? We are. This is to 743. I read you. Well, what about those pilot reports? No sweat. Light terminus, 1900 hours, central. Commercial 747 to 350, this side of Kansas City. Ditto corporate pilot flying jet over Freesport at 280, 2010 central. All other flights report 
No turbulence. Will you follow machine plan or file to flight plan? Notify. I'll get back to you, VOR. Chad, what's eating you? Uh, anytime I hear anything about clear air turbulence, I get goosebumps. You ever ridden any out? Nope. Oh, me neither. I'm not anxious to try. So why play Lone Ranger? You got a clean bill of health if you pick up the new MFP. Yeah, which will bring us into New York pretty near an hour late. I'll be later if you try to go around the front the other way. I guess. Okay, I'll swallow my hunches and follow the rest of the sheep. You better tell our boss, the great shepherd, that his little sheep are going to be late tonight. Yeah, look, why don't you tell Proctor? You handled him better than me. Mm, not anymore, I don't. Not after the last few flights and the way he's handled Mick. Hey, 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 hold up, lover boy. Anybody got an eye for that lady's got to be me. You're married up and all. Yeah, don't remind me. Oh, uh, gone sour again? <laughs> Still. You, uh... You think Proctor's really making out with Meg? Proctor doesn't make out with anyone. He just issues a requisition. He owns us all, body and soul. Oh, he doesn't own me. Uh, okay, free spirit. Then what are you wasting your life up here in this old cockpit playing second fiddle to Mr. Proctor's uniformed air chauffeur? He can't knock the pay, and I like to hang loose. There's too much red tape with the airlines. Oh, you could call your life your own. You don't like it? What do you check out? Don't knock your elders. I'm too old to go into commercial flying. <laughs> At 35. 37. It would take too long to get seniority and fall down that captain's pay. I have a wife keeps me in debt, remember? All right, go back and tell the boss man we're going to be behind schedule. He'll blow his stack. <laughs> Money can't buy everything. Yeah, just try to tell him that. You're the diplomat. Besides, I want some privacy. For what? I want to call the wife. Meg, build me another scotch. Yes, J.B. How about one for you? Oh, no, not while I'm working. I, I mean, as a secretary. One hour out of Houston, we're still working on these merger papers. Oh, why bother with New York steel and casing? That's small potatoes. Because once I get that pokey little firm in my hip pocket, then international's got to come to me on its knees. <laughs> and once I get them, I'm pretty near as big as I want to be. And how big is big? The most. Number one. I got a hind end don't fit too comfortable in anything short of the catbird seat. Hmm. I guess we all ought to know that by now. Here's a drink. Hmm. A little short on scotch and long on ice. Oh, I thought you might like to try something in moderation. Tell me, what are you going to do when you die, J.B.? <laughs> what the devil are you talking about? I'm not planning to die. Oh, I don't mean right away, but that's one deal you can't buy yourself out of. As it must to all men. You know, I don't know what the Sam has got into you lately, Meg. But I'll tell you one thing. I don't lay out all I do on you to get sniped at. If you think you can... Yes, yeah, Slade, what do you want? Uh, excuse me, sir, but Skipper asked me to tell you we've got some weather we got to go around. We're going to get into New York about, uh, about an hour late. No, no, that's no good. I got a meeting with my lawyer as soon as the plane lands. Can't we climb over the stuff? Uh, it's too high, Mr. Proctor. This is a 60,000-foot front. Then go through it. Mm, you're in that much hurry to mount the throne? Forget it, Meg. This is business. Business is time, and time is money. <clears throat> Slade, no way we can beat it. When the man upstairs makes the deal, no, sir. No shortcuts. Well, you'd have to talk that over with the skipper. I might just do that right now. Uh, uh, give him a couple of minutes, sir. He's just uh, busy uh, realigning the course. Where are you calling from, Chad? You mean, where am I calling from, Alice? Isn't that obvious? 33,000 feet over Shreveport. And would you mind telling me where you were when I called before you left Houston? Fine. Yeah, you were so tied up you couldn't answer the phone, huh? Maybe I wasn't home. Look, let's not play games. Just wanted to let you know we should be at LaGuardia around 11 and to ask you to please pick me up at the usual place. Oh, just like that. I expected you home for dinner. Did you? And why didn't you answer the phone when I tried to call you to tell you I wouldn't make it? I went down to the store for cigarettes or something. Or something, Alice, huh? You're not drinking again, hmm? Same old thing. You can't trust me. Alice, are you going to meet me at the field? Maybe. 
I've nothing better to do. Ah, never mind. I'll grab the limo or a cab, and I'll be home in a few hours. And then we can... Well, don't hurry up my account. Maybe I'll be around, maybe not. What difference does it make anymore? We've got nothing left. No, we're back to that again. We never left. Well, why don't you come right out and say it? You want a divorce. Only on my terms, lover. Well, you can't expect me to sit back and let you take me six ways from nowhere. Why not? Didn't you, me? Alice, come on. Just because we've lost whatever we once had, we don't have to fight dirty, do we? Not us. Then cut me loose. On your terms. Only on my terms. I want it all, lover. Now, why don't you find your own way home? Alice? Alice? Yeah. It's kicking up. Whew. Look at that. Hey, Jake. Yes, your brother. Hey, uh, how's it going? I don't know. Maybe we're kicking around quite a bit on my way up for Now, that's just loose turbulence around the edge of the front. That doesn't matter. Yeah, so what does? Uh, I, I don't know. Get your phones on. Pull on Kansas City and get me a weather update. Roger. Look, what's got you so steam? Uh, hunch. The wrong vibes. Look at that outside temperature, how it's dropping. So what? Why should... No, no, no. Forget it. Just get me that weather report. Roger. This is XN743 to flight service station... Request weather information on our new heading. We are at 330, bearing 320. Repeat, that is 320. Are we still at same signal? Hey, Meg, uh, how'd you like to build me another scotch? Hmm? Mm, to stoke you so you can keep knocking out enough ideas to gobble up the world? Or to relax. Oh, we sifted through all the papers. It's uh, time for a fun game. Ah, in that case, you got your scotch. Uh, you'll join me? Mm, I just might. <laughs> Sometimes you even like me, don't you? <laughs> That's a fine question to ask a woman. Who... I want you to be different. Now I can buy all of that. I know. You bought me. Oh, now, don't say that, Meg. No, it's true. Well, I didn't think so at first. But then the sun was in my eyes. Huh? There's a wild glory and absolute power, J.B. It dazzles the subject. Like Louis XIV did. You're trying to make fun of me again. No, no, not really. Here. Want to drink a toast? Sure. To what? To thanks. So many thanks. And farewell. Hmm? To... to... To me. No, no way. Oh, why not, J.B.? We're at a dead end. It didn't work for us. It works for me as long as I say it does. No one walks out on me. Well, I'm not walking out. I just want to shake hands. And agree to end a bargain. Hmm? Not until I'm ready. You know too much about me, lover. You're too dangerous to let go. How can you stop me if I want to? You'd be surprised how many ways, if I ever made up my mind to use them. I don't believe it. Hey, what is this, killer? The temperature, it's dropped again. We've left the front behind. There's only light turbulence. I know, but something's out there. Hey, 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 what are you doing? Cutting airspeed. What do you read? Mach 8, 245. But with all the hurry, what... what... Did you press the call button, Chad? Yeah, Meg, I want you to secure everything back in the cabin in the galley. Belt yourself in with the uh, big boss. Oh, I just mixed a drink. Well, dump it. Get rid of the glasses and do as I say. But we just passed the front. The sky's as blue as the 4th of July. Let's and... not mess around, Meg. I'm preparing for severe air turbulence, and you'd better get back inside pronto. Yes, sir, Captain. Hey, come on, Chad. What's eating you? It's a hunch. You know where I got my schooling? Barnstorming, stunt flying, ever since I came out of Korea and went civilian. I love all these instruments. And for all they feed into my brain, I still fly by what's at the other end of my spine. And when that aches, when I feel my backsides in a bucket, 
I'll fly by that every time. Yeah, I smelled it. Oh, here, here, turbulence. Hang in with me, Jake. It's trying to take a stick out of my hands. You must have shot up a thousand feet. The updraft's wild. Watch your trim. I'm holding. Oh, no, you're not. You're upside down. We're in a dive. You're disoriented, Jake. We're climbing. You've got to be crazy. Check your instruments. Come on, help me bring her nose down. Roger. Holy mother, will you look at the wing shake? They'll throw the engines right out of their mouth. There goes one of them, I think. Jake, help me get her nose down. Or... Jake. <laughs> ah, she stalled out. Now we dive. Hang in there. We're going into a spin. in a modern aircraft equipped with every safety device and instrument to protect lives caught in the pilot's dread the phenomenon known as clear air turbulence or more simply C.A.T. CAT spinning as helplessly as a bullet but without any destination or target and doomed to end up in a world beyond our own I shall return shortly with Act Two. Now that the cat's out of the bag, I think I should say a few words about this acronym, the three letters that spell out clear air turbulence. It's a very rare phenomenon, and every commercial pilot is trained to react instinctively to its unexpected appearance. But like every other cataclysm in nature, sometimes it's beyond mechanical or human control. The air shock has sent the plane into a high-speed stall. As it whirls and falls, the instruments vibrate violently. Impossible to read. Skipper, what can we do? Hit left rudder hard as he can. Nose up. She's lead. Oh, manual. Buster got it. The only chance we have. Uh, what? Damn, we chased hit me right on the head. Never mind your head. What you're trying to say right now is your... What was that? I don't know. We're not in a dive anymore. And we're out of the spin. Look out for the briefcase. It's not... It's not going anywhere. Yeah. That's right. It's, it's just... Hanging there in midair. Hey, look outside. It's bright sunlight. Well, it can't be. We were coming up on 2,100 hours. It was night. Well, it isn't anymore. Hey, look at the controls. They're slack. Well, maybe the cable snapped if we're out of electric power. No, no, I don't think so. I'm a gander at the instruments. Holy cow. They're crazy. They just don't read. How come? Did every system, all the backups blew? I don't know. I don't think so. What I guess is... I'm afraid to say. What, Chad? We're in free flight. I don't know how. But somewhere we spun right through a hole out of the atmosphere and... ended up in space. Are you nuts? If you had just one point of reference after a blind flight, what would you guess the only land mass we could see might be? Where? About 10 o'clock, right off to the left. Well, we were only at 33,000. That couldn't be... The Earth? No. No way. Oh, but you know what it is just as well as I do. The moon. Yeah, that's just what I read. Look at the configuration. But, but that, that, that's crazy, Chad. What are we, dreaming or dead or what? I think we're in free orbit around the moon. Come on, how? From 33,000 feet to nearly 90 million miles in one second, how? Maybe it wasn't CAT after all. Maybe we just fell through a hole in space, got folded up in the time warp. Whatever's happened, we got to get busy. First, there's too much pressure in this cabin. we got to release it before we just plain disintegrate. Okay, Ken. Why not stay? Take it easy, real slow. Roger. Well, not too much. We have to hang on to all the oxygen we have. What for, if you're right? All we're with now is the insurance. Well, we can try to get the engines turning over. But no atmosphere? Well, for what? We're yawing pretty badly. We could get her on an even keel. I'm going to try to fire them. Well, you better check aft and see what happened to Meg and the big wheel. Hey, there's 
Baby? Hey, B? Huh? You all right? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Hey, that was some kicking around. I'm going to have a few words with Chad Stevens. Oh, why do you have to automatically blame Chad? He's flying the plane, isn't he? Who else would I blame? Well, it seems to me, thanks to Chad's foresight in building us in, that we're lucky to be alive. Yeah, it's what I pay him for. And I pay him enough so he doesn't have to get caught in them. Well, you were the one who didn't want him to go around. I'm not going to argue with you. Let's get out of our seatbelts. Well, don't you think we should wait till we're released? I don't have to take orders from anyone. And I'm getting a little tired of... TV, what is it? What the devil? Now, what's wrong? It, it's like... It's like I'm floating. D- don't unbckle your belt. Why not? Uh, I, I can't tell you except uh, move your arm. Maybe you'll see. It's, oh. it's as if we didn't have any weight at all anymore. Yeah, I see what you mean. But what... But Jake, what's the matter? Look, uh, I'll try to explain that in a moment best I can. I, I don't really understand myself, but until we all get belted down, nothing's going to make much sense. Uh, when I belt myself down again, it's going to be beside the so-called pilot of this plane. Now, I want to know what's going on straight from the horse's mouth. <laughs> I demand to know what's happening. Just take up on your belt and sit back, Mr. Proctor. Hollering isn't going to help. Where are we? How late are we going to be into New York? All right. First questions first. Where are we, sir? Just an educated guess. In orbit around the moon. (laughs) Are you out of your mind? I don't know. What I suspect is um, I'm out of our world. Now, what the deuce does that mean? Well, at the least, I don't think we're on our way to LaGuardia Airport in New York. Then where are we on our way to? Infinity. You know, Mr. Proctor, if I were a deeply religious man, I would say that all four of us on this plane were on the way to meet our maker. Ah, there's no question, Meg. We're... We're in free flight somehow. How, Jake? Search me. Chad says we fell through a hole in the time warp. What? But I don't even know what that means. All I do know is where we are right now. Where? In orbit about the moon. (gasps) Well, can we land there? In this craft? Forget it. Then what's going to happen to us? That's the question none of us should ask, honey. Because I'm sure none of us wants the answer. How long? Oh, 48, 72 hours, as long as the oxygen lasts. We can't get back to Earth? How? If we really are in moon orbit, no way. No way we can get this crate back home. I'd like to talk to Chad. He won't tell you any different. Well, that's that's not what I'd like to talk to him about. Where are you going, Mike? That's a good question, J.B., since I have to float and bump. I, I don't seem to have much control. None of us do. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. Who does? Where are you going? Back for a drink. If I can ever make the galley. Uh, why don't you build one for me? Hmm? Build your own, J.B. I've got other fish to fry. Just relax. Let yourself go, Meg. It's so long since I could do that. I've forgotten how. Well, it's never too late to learn. Except now. Uh Uh-uh. Relaxing is a full-time job. Uh, There we are. You're almost in Jake's chair. Here. Uh, Let me help you with a seatbelt. No, I I, I don't need a seatbelt. This flight's smoother than you. Oh, well, you'll need it to hold you down. Oh, Oh, won't you? There you are. Now, what can I do for you? You can level with me, Chad. It's that important. Okay. What's happened to us? I don't know. Hmm. Jake said something about a hole in the sky. And the fourth dimension has to be involved somehow. By our standards, you don't travel 90 million miles in a second or two. You think we did? I I don't have any other explanation. And what happens now? We're drifting in orbit. Even if I had the kind of engines I need in this aircraft under normal conditions, we couldn't re-enter the Earth's atmosphere or or even the moon. What? Well, we'll... Will last as long as the oxygen lasts. How long? I honestly don't know, Meg. Twenty-four hours, maybe. Not more than forty-eight. 
then we're going to die. <laughs> you don't expect me to answer that. Except you did. It was something I had to know. Ted? Yeah? We could have fussed around, as we have. And nothing would ever have happened because neither of us could make it happen. Ted? Yeah? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But I couldn't start it. Oh, you had to wait for me. I guess maybe I, I just prayed. It wasn't because I was scared of him. And what? You and your conscience. What you were married to. Well, she is my wife. Oh, in name. What do you owe her? Mm, everything. Everything I own. Oh, well, give it to her. What does it matter? Do you own yourself? What? I didn't. I sold myself. And I want to buy it back. My self-respect. Is that all? Oh, no. <laughs> my whole soul. Just what you ought to do, Chad. So we can be together for good. I'm not ashamed. If there ever was a time and a place to say it, it's now. I love you. And in whatever time is left, I wish to heaven you could say it back to me that you love me. I, I never thought I'd have the chance, but... Yes, now I have. Hold it. Oh, hold it a minute. What? What is that? What, what, what is it? Uh, I raised something on the radio. Yes? Yes, would you repeat, please? Ah, this is uh, Major Alexander speaking. Good speed one. Moon constellation. Welcome. Acknowledge. Acknowledge. We welcome contact. Huh. We thought we'd bought it. Could you repeat that, please? Uh, w w we thought we were out of touch with anyone. Uh, we have oxygen supply for less than two days. You are our only hope of survival. Uh, what are you, military, pro-craft, uh, commercial flight? No, none of these. We, we, we've we had an accident. A uh, private flight lost in unaccountable weather conditions. Yes, we know. We have suspected that you were sucked in through the horn. Uh, what? Uh, repeat, please. The horn. Uh, we will not explain now. We must make preparations for your landing. Where? <laughs> On the moon? You could not maintain life there. Besides... You'll need some approximation of Earth's atmosphere to land your obsolete craft. Obsolete? That's uh, something else we can discuss later. Do you have reserve fuel? Well, enough for, say, one and a half hours of normal flying under conditions as I understand them. Uh, then you have more than enough to land at good speed one. I am not familiar with that airport. <laughs> not surprising. Where is it located? The Earth? The moon? Neither. It is a self-contained space station, one of the worlds of the future. I don't understand. We don't expect you to. Just put yourselves in our hands and uh, you will be safe. You realize that I am apparently in space in an aircraft not equipped to handle this medium. Ah, uh, that is no problem for us. Let us bring you in by electric magnetic force field controls. Hey, Chad, did you see it? There's some great big UFO right off the starboard. It's spinning like a top. Well, I not only see it, I'm talking with it. Uh, how do I identify you? Good speed one. Release all your controls and we will bring you home. Stand by your radio to start engines once we are inside of the envelope. The envelope? Certainly. You need air to land just as much as you need it to breathe. So do we. Keep this channel open. Suspended in space, one of our most sophisticated airplanes hangs out of its element on the edge of death. Four people inside it rely on the atmosphere to remain alive. Suddenly a voice from space is more than disembodied. It extends a helping hand. Who of us would not choose it? But at the same time, fear the consequences. I shall return shortly with Act Three. Can you imagine the terror of having been catapulted into an accident in the air? Only to find that instead of crashing to earth in flames and disaster, you are somehow suspended in space. In a vehicle not suited for this element, and with a rapidly diminishing supply of the air you need to breathe. Small wonder that you would grasp at any hope 
of staying alive. Now, you are inside the envelope, XN743. You are now in normal flight posture. Activate your engines. Roger. How about that? Very good. Now, take your normal declination and follow the tower's instructions in. Where am I landing? As I told you before, station good speed one. And have no fears. We may be new to you in space, but believe me, we are very little different once you bring your spacecraft to our land. If you want it, you are coming home. This is XN743. We have you, XN743. You are 1,500 feet from threshold, 50 feet high, and hot. But you the airspeed is 70 knots too high. Oh, let's hope there's plenty of concrete. Well, maybe we should go around. We're out of fuel. This is it. You better pull back on the thrust. Let's do it. I'll break your arm. Now, just hold on to your hat. Welcome to Goodspeed One. I am Major Alexander. And I'm J. Bruce Proctor, and I can't waste any time. How soon can we get a connecting flight? Oh, <laughs> I don't think you quite realize where you are, Mr. Proctor. Uh, uh, so tell me. You are now on space station number one, named at its inception as Goodspeed One. From here, the only connecting flights are to the moon and such other stopovers as you might select in our area. What are you talking about? I want to get home to Earth. <laughs> Many other people in your position have. Uh, I don't think you quite understand. Tomorrow morning, I have a meeting with my lawyers and all the other people from International Ore and Carbide. My deal has to be firmed up by the end of May. And that's the day after tomorrow. Oh, what year is that? Oh, come on, don't be ridiculous. This year, 1978. Oh. <laughs> then I think you can stop worrying about the whole deal. It's ancient history. You see, this is 2978. What? Last night before I flat was... What did you say? 2978. I don't blame you for being surprised, sir. It's the consequence of falling through a time fold. The older we get, we do nod now and then and lose a few precious moments, huh? It must be catastrophic to wake up suddenly and realize that somewhere we've lost a thousand years. I'd like to have a few words with you, Captain, if I may. Well, that suits me, Major Alexander. I'd like to have a couple with you. Where's Mr. Proctor? Uh... I'm afraid I had to have him temporarily restrained. Uh, one of our doctors is treating him now. Restrained? For his own good. He has a heart condition, or, or did you know? Oh, I knew he was hypertense. He's had at least one coronary. He should be more careful. Well, the man has no control. What's bugging him now? His belief that we are making a prisoner out of him, that is not true. I hope you understand that. Well, we are confined to the plane. You are quarantined, Captain Stevens, that is all. You must understand that this is a controlled environment. After nearly 1,000 years, we have finally managed to make our population almost 100% disease-free. We have no infectious or contagious disorders and have made gigantic strides against the normal systemic ravages of old age. This is a far different world from yours, with its poisons, its savage wear and tear, its bent for destruction. What is your world like out there, Major? Uh, let's see, you are from the 20th century, 1978, correct? Yes. Yeah. Then you know nothing, of course, of the history of space stations like this, or um, colony orbits, as we call them. No, no, there's been talk and speculation about establishing them, but of course, none have ever been started. I... I mean, uh, hadn't been before. Uh... <laughs> I can understand your problem with time folds. Even we are just getting used to them. Uh, I beg your pardon? Intergalactic flights are just moving out of the experimental stage now. It's possible to go to Centauri 4 now, for example. But the time lag there is really a bummer. Knocks you out. 
It's uh, approximately another 1,000 years. You're kidding. Not at all. Well, you were going to tell me something about the history of... Uh, what do you call this? Uh... Uh, good Speed 1. Yeah. We were the first station, you see. And when was that? Oh, back in your millennium, around uh, 1990, I think. Maybe a couple of years later. Of course, it was nothing like it is now. Then it was just an experiment to collect and store solar power to bring cheap energy to Earth. You deliver energy to Earth now? Earth? <laughs> that burnt out cinder for what? Burnt out cinder? Well, I'm afraid Earth moved too late to develop energy. By the middle of the 21st century, it choked itself to death on ecological poison. Well, how did you and the other colonies you mentioned grow so large? Well, what would your choice have been? Our colonies grew by leaps and bounds. The waiting lists grew longer and longer. Here on good speed, we rotate at such a controlled speed that gravity is reproduced within the envelope that encloses us. Our grass is always green. We live in a temperature like that of Hawaii, and the air we breathe is pure. We are, uh, insofar as it is possible, all of one class. We are as close to utopia, I suppose, as man can come. And we can be part of this. Once you are decontaminated, I would think so. Oh, our immigration laws are necessarily strict, but yours is an unusual case. However, the, uh, the question may be academic. Oh, why? Because your employer is adamant that he must return to Earth. The burnt-out cinder. Ah, uh, not that earth, no. <laughs> the one you left. Yes, but that's impossible. Not if you move quickly. I uh, won't go into scientific details, but that is why I wanted to talk to you. If we are to take advantage of the time fold that brought you here to return you, there is no time to lose. Now, as captain of the ship, it is entirely up to you. I can give you one hour to talk it over with the others, but no more. You're not going to try to get back, Chad. The big man's orders, Meg. He pays my salary. What else can I do? Oh, stay here. Don't you know what it could mean? Yes. I know. We'd all be free. We could live our own lives. It'd be like a second chance, a chance to live down the mistakes. I understand. Well, isn't that what you want? It's not what I want. It's what Mr. Proctor wants. Oh, you can't be serious. What about what I want? What Jake wants? <laughs> Jake doesn't care where he lives. And me? Well, you could be your own woman anywhere. Well, I'm not now. Uh -huh. Bought and paid for. Maybe you'd be the same here. No. Oh, Chad, don't you see? I'd be free here. He can't control me. And you're not free if you go back. You're only going back to her? To Alice? Oh, no. No, never. That's over. Well, she'll take you for everything you have. Okay, let her. We could manage somehow. If you stole me from J.B., he'd break us both, grind us to powder. We can still take the chance. Why, Chad? Why? Because if you and I are going anywhere, Meg, it has to be because we fought for it, not ran away from it. It has to be a, a matter of conscience. I have to go back. I have to live with myself. Maybe you should stay. Oh, no. No, darling. You're right. I have a conscience, too, that needs quite a bit of polishing. No, no, we'll go back together and face whatever has to be. God willing, it'll work out for us. you now, Captain Stevens, and drawing you by magnetic field toward the time fold. Roger, I read you. Uh, we cannot guarantee your safe re-entry back to the last century, so if you, or any of you, wish to change your mind, uh, this is it. What's he saying? What's he saying? He's giving us a last chance to back out, sir. Tell him absolutely not. We don't belong in this Jim Crack fantasy world. <laughs> we belong in the real one. Well, that's your decision, J.B. The others are entitled to theirs. Meg? Are you going back, Chad? Yes, I am. Then so am I. Okay. Jake? How can you fly a plane through all that flak without me, old buddy? 
Besides, I either want to be best man or give away the bride. Did you read me, Captain Stevens? I said this was your last chance to stay. I read you, sir. And our thanks for all you have done. And our decision is to return. Very well. Fire up your engines. Roger. Start completed. We'll start the countdown at 30. Bon voyage and good luck. Are you ready? Ready, sir. Synchronize. Coming up 30 on... Zip. Read 30. 29. 28. Get back and get belted in. JB, Meg. Go ahead, Meg. I heard what your co-pilot buddy said, Stephen. I just want you to know... If we get back, I'll break you in two before I ever let you take Meg away from me. Well, I hope I never have to sweat anything like that out again. <laughs> me too. But we lived through it. Hey, uh, hey, Chad. Yeah. Did, uh, did I go off on some sort of a crazy trip or... <laughs> the Major? Good speed one? I don't know. Doesn't seem very real now, does it? Oh, hazy, man, hazy. Only, uh, uh what about you and Mac? Oh, that? <laughs> That's for real. How are you going to handle the heavyweight? I don't know. <sighs> take over. And better check back in the cabin. Okay, take your time. I feel a thousand years younger and ready for anything. Chad, quick. What is it, Meg? JB, I think it was his heart. It, it, it was just too much. What? Is, is, he, is he dead? Well, right after we hit the turbulence, he just sort of hunched over. He he made this terrible sound and, and slumped. The way we were being thrown around, I couldn't get to him. Chad. Yes, dear. I feel terrible. I wished him dead so often. Oh, no, Meg, he, he, he wished this on himself. I wonder. What do you mean? It's like a gift from God. For us. Yeah. Well, the answer to a prayer. You know, you said, God willing, it'll work out for us. Meg, it seems like a thousand years, but we finally found our way home. quite a little tale to muse over. The fact of C.A.T. is real enough, but what was all the rest? Real or imagined? Does that really matter in the larger sense? All of our travelers returned safely from beyond whatever veil they penetrated, except one. And there will be few to measure the death of such a selfish man. I'll be back shortly. By the time you hear this program, or shortly after, the first experimental space station should have been placed in orbit. Of course, it'll be small, but it's a beginning. With the Earth's desperate need for new sources of energy, it doesn't stretch the imagination to think that within a thousand years, colonies like Godspeed One will not only exist, but will proliferate. Unfortunately, neither you nor I will be there to check this statement. But wouldn't you consider it a good bet? Our cast included Paul Hecht, Ian Martin, Evie Juster, and Fred Gwynn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams.
I'm E.G. Marshall. The past is like a funeral gone by. The future comes like an unwelcome guest. The future. The impenetrable, imponderable future. As the song says, who knows what tomorrow will bring? Well, would you like to know? The rest of your life is a book that has not yet been printed. However, would you like an advanced copy? A sort of pre-publication preview? The purpose of the next hour is to make you think about it. mystery drama, Tomorrow's Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Robert Dryden. Open Space. How the suffocated cities cry for green fields, tall trees, and how few are the lush and verdant places. Well, you do have Morrison City Memorial Park, which, quite frankly, is a cemetery. When it was laid out years ago, it was on the outskirts of town. But Morrison City grew up to, around, and past Memorial Park. And it is now surrounded by offices, shops, homes, apartment houses. People go for walks along its broad pathways. They rest on its benches. And why not? Shouldn't it please the dead to play host to the living? Harold K. Starbright usually has a relaxed and leisurely stroll through Memorial Park right after lunch. And as he walks along, a rather well-dressed gentleman speaks to him. I beg your pardon, sir. May I trouble you for a light? Oh, I don't think I have one because I stopped smoking. I... Oh, oh, yes, yes, here. Keep them. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. <laughs> if I were really kind, I would have refused you. What you're doing, after all, is oh, terrible. Oh, yes, I know, I know. I'm afraid I don't have enough character to break the habit. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said anything. After all, I am a perfect stranger. Well, that's true. But you see, only strangers can be perfect. Our friends we know all too well. You come here often? Yes. Yes, my office is right across the street. Delightful place for a bit of fresh air. Yes, one of my favorite haunts, too. <laughs> or is that a proper word? <laughs> I don't believe I've ever seen you before. Well, I have a hobby. Though I don't suppose you could call it a hobby, exactly. Well, what is it? Cemetery sculpture. Oh? Mm -hmm. It's hardly the type of thing you'd want to collect, or, or could, for that matter. Cemetery sculpture? Well, yes. And if you think about it, it's the most prevalent form of sculpture there is. Yes, I suppose so. And it's an art form not to be despised. Now, for example, that statue. It's a beautiful little thing. How graceful. Yeah. Now that you mention it, I... I've never really noticed it. Hmm. And on that monument, notice the relief. How clean and crisp. You know, you've opened my eyes to an entirely new thing. Well, uh, not all of it, of course, is noteworthy. But here and there, you encounter a gem. Uh, here's what I'm talking about. Hmm? This tombstone. How exquisitely proportioned. A simple shaft of stone. But what perfect balance of the delicate scroll work along the sides and the top. <laughs> Almost filigreed lace. You notice? Yes, I think so. And the lettering. How precise. How free-flowing. How his name seems to shine forth. Gerald Arthur Lyons, born April 20th, 1917, died June 4th, 1969. Yes, and look. Where? Just a few feet over this way. An almost identical stone. Well, it's even better. Obviously the work of the same sculptor. See, the same delicate lines, the same beautiful lettering. That name. A feeling of great dignity. The name on the tombstone. Yes. It reads, Harold K. Starbright. That's my name. That's me. You? <laughs> Why, that's... That, that's my name, Harold Kenneth Starbright. That's who I am. 
Well, obviously, it's, it's a coincidence. Harold Kenneth Starbright, born July 1st, 1937. That's my birthday. Well, died. Look. Look at that date. Look. Died March 15th, 1978. March 15th, 1978? How's that possible? I, I, I don't understand. March 15th, 1978 hasn't happened yet. Is that what's going to happen to me? I'm sure there must be some mistake. My name, my exact date of birth, and the day of my death. March 15th, 1978. Is that the day I'm going to die? Well, I'm sure there must be some explanation. I, uh, I, Sir, I, are, are you all right? That's my tombstone. My tombstone. <gasps> Mr. Starbright. Mr. Starbright. There's somebody. Call a cop. Get an ambulance. Harold. Yes? It's me, Gretchen. The doctors here at the hospital think it's wise for you to stay overnight. Yes? You fainted in Memorial Park. What was the matter? I fainted because I was terribly frightened. What are you saying? I, uh... I was walking along in Memorial Park. On such a lovely day, what could frighten you? A tombstone. Oh, whose tombstone? Mine. <laughs> what? I saw my own tombstone. But how... How do you know it was your tombstone? It had my name on it. Harold Kenneth Starbright. Oh, there could be more than one Harold Kenneth. It had the date of my birth and the date of my death. How could it have the date of your death? You're still alive. It's the date. Harold Kenneth Starbright died... March 15th, 1978. Harold, you need rest. Now get some sleep. Get some sleep? In a year, I'll be dead. Uh, Darling, why don't I ring for the nurse? Ring and tell her I'm leaving. But you can't do that. I'm taking you to that cemetery, and I'm going to show you that tombstone. Harold, you're not well. I'm perfectly all right. It's just that I'm, I'm, I'm scared to death. You'll feel better tomorrow morning. You don't believe me, do you? You don't believe I saw my own tombstone. Well, why don't we wait for Fred? Fred Stoneman's a quack. Oh, hell. I'm getting dressed and I'm taking you to that cemetery. But, darling, there, there is something wrong with you. That's why you have to see that tombstone. That'll convince you that there's nothing wrong with me. All right. All right. But let's wait till Fred Stoneman has a last look at you. I don't want to see him. Harold, what happened between you and Fred? Why this sudden hostility? I never liked him. You, you never liked... But you went to college together. You were boys together. He's your best friend. That doesn't mean I like him. Harold, now I know something's wrong. What happened to turn you against Fred? Wait a minute. Why are you so worried about Fred all of a sudden? And why don't you answer my question? I have more important things to do right now. Well, the most important thing you have to do right now is rest. Oh, Fred, I'm so glad you're here. Harold, uh, what's this the resident's been telling me? You got upset over some tombstone? Why? Why? Because it's mine. Well, did you order one night? Some folks do, you know. He's not well, Fred. Well, what's bothering you, Harold? What's bothering me? After what I saw today, you can ask me that question. Now, look, I want to get dressed, and I want the two of you to come with me. Fred, would that be wise? Uh, Harold... I'm uh, going back to that cemetery, and you can come with me or not as you like. Now, now you say you saw this tombstone, your tombstone. That's true. Hmm? All right, Harold. Why? What do you mean, Why? Well, what is it doing there? Well, how do I know? Who put it there? What are you asking me these questions for? Because I want to know why you should believe you're going to be dead within the year. All I'm telling you is what I saw. Now, you are in the best of health. 
Now, why should you be dead in a year? What what premonitions do you have of your death? Huh? Look, all I know is what I saw engraved on that tombstone. Well, somehow you're convinced you'll be dead within the year, and that's why you saw it. I saw it because I happened to be walking by, and there it was. No, Harold, it's not there. It's here in your mind. Oh, first I get it from Gretchen, and now I get it from you. Everybody's trying to take some psychological stew out of this. There is no... No such graves. But I saw it. But it doesn't exist in reality. Reality is waiting for you on a plot of ground in Morrison City Memorial Park. Now, let's settle this once and for all. This is the path we were walking along. We? This man and I, he stopped to ask me for a match, and we began to chat. Now, just, just a minute, Harold. What? He stopped you to ask for a match. Did you give it to him? What kind of a question is that? Of course I gave it to him. Well, how could you? You don't carry matches. You have them for the last ten years since you stopped smoking. I'm telling you what happened in your dream. It wasn't a dream. It was real. Uh, of course. Don't, don't humor me, Fred. We walked and we talked about the kind of sculpture you can see in the cemetery. Why should anyone discuss such a gruesome subject? Well, obviously, Harold is in a morbid mood these days. Oh, what's morbid? Why is it gruesome? Look at all the time you're going to spend under that stone. Shouldn't it be a work of art? Uh, uh, very, very well. Now, you encountered this gentleman and you discussed this particular subject. Uh, then what? Well, we were right here. He called this particular stone to my attention. You see? It reads, Gerald Arthur Lyons, born April 20th, 1917, died June 4th, 1969. I remember... Well? Just a few feet over this way, an identical stone, just as beautifully carved. Where? Well, right here. Just a few steps to the left. Well, I... Wait, 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 wait. No, I think it was to the right. Uh, Harold? Just a second now. Wait, 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 let me get my bearings. It, uh... It was the identical stone. Well, I don't see any stone around here that looks just like this one. Well, it was here. Harold, don't you think that you... The stone was here. With, with, with my name on it. It was here, I tell you. Sure it was, Harold. Sure it was. Sure it was. Or was it? Well, remember this. He has a witness. The gentleman who pointed it out to him originally. And he has all of us who were present at the scene. We know who we are. But who was the gentleman? The gentleman. I fear I must withhold his identity until Act Two, which I shall bring to you in just a few moments. The reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated, said Mark Twain when he opened a newspaper one morning and read his obituary. Well... What is Harold Kenneth Starbright supposed to say? He has seen not an item in the press, which after all is only printed paper, but his own tombstone, which has been engraved in granite. That is, he is convinced he saw it. On a return trip to the cemetery, he is having a bit of trouble locating that tombstone. But it was here. It was right here. I, 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 I was standing here, and it was... Harold... You've got to go back to the hospital. But I tell you... Now, now, Harold, the thing thing to do is not to get excited. Just try to gather your wits. I'm not crazy. Darling, nobody said you were. Harold, we'll take you back, and then you can rest and relax. Everybody talks to me as though I were crazy. I know what I saw. I know it. All right, just a minute. Well, hello, Harold. Fred. Gretchen isn't home. Uh, may I come in? Well, thought I'd check up on you. Okay, thanks. You want a drink? Uh, why did you say that? You saw me and you said Gretchen isn't home. 
It was practically a, a reflex action. Well, maybe I did say it. Why? Obviously, I've come here to see uh, you. All right, all right, all right. Skip it. Well, if you don't want to talk about it, we well, don't have to, but... Um, come on. Now, what is bothering you, Harold? And and what was all that about the, the tombstone? Uh, all I did that I walked along that cemetery and... Yes, yes, I heard that story, but it didn't happen. All right, go ahead. Say I had a hallucination. All right, now, look, let me tell you what I did. I did what you should have done, the sensible, the practical thing. Now, after all, people just don't get buried in cemeteries. They just don't erect tombstones where and when they please. You have to buy space. Now, it's real estate, just like anything else. Now, you get a deed, a title, uh, whatever. Now, look, Fred, don't make fun of me. I'm in no mood. I am serious. Now, I went to the office of the cemetery. I asked the manager, has a plot been bought here for a Mr. Harold K. Starbright? And he said no. And I asked, has a monument been erected here in the memory of uh, Mr. Harold K. Starbright? And he said, how, if Mr. Starbright doesn't have a grave here? And I said, could a monument have been erected without their knowing it? And he said, impossible. Show me the monument. Well, I couldn't. So, shouldn't that be the end of it? I only know I'm not crazy. Uh, then, and maybe it all goes back to my original question. What question for crying out loud? I asked you why you opened the door and said to me, Gretchen isn't home. I don't know why I said that. Ah, yes, you do. It means that you think I came here to see Gretchen. All right. Maybe that is what I think. <sighs> okay. Now, it's out in the open. Are you having an affair with my wife, Fred? No. Are you in love with her? Harold, I'm a married man. That doesn't answer the question. Are you in love with her? Uh, you, look, you are my best friend. You still haven't answered the question. I know. Well, the fact that you can ask such a question means that you can only expect one answer. Yes. Then, is that your answer? Uh, maybe. What does that mean? I don't, I don't know what it means. Now, look, I'm trying to be honest with you and with myself. It's the first time I've ever been confronted with that question. You know, we... The both of us have known Gretchen since we were kids. Have I been in love with her, too? Well, have you? Something has come over you. I don't know what. But suddenly you, you see relationships more clearly than ever. Actually, with a kind of a frightening clarity. And then, and then this tombstone thing. I know, it's, it's very scary. I saw that tombstone. It was real. I don't care what anyone says. Well, if it was real to you, then that's real enough. But why did you see it? I wish I could tell you. Well, maybe I can tell you. Things at the office are not too good, are they? They're very bad. Are you worried? It's, uh, it's this new vice president, Jones. He's an administration type. He simply cannot appreciate the problems of the sales force. And we, uh, we had a very intense session before I left for lunch that day. Well, could you actually uh, lose your job? Yes. Well, I know how you feel about your work in the company, and I... If you were fired, it would be as if the world came to an end. <laughs> That'd be a dead pigeon. Ah, uh, you just said it yourself. I'm uh, kidding a little, but you just used the word dead. And with that in mind, you were walking in the cemetery, and there was your tombstone. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're probably right. You have a tense situation with Mr. Vice President Jones, and it's if, well, it, it's as if your life has come to an end. You know something, Fred? Hmm. That's just how he makes me feel. And every time he does, if you walk in the park, you'll see your tombstone. Breakfast is ready, darling. Oh, I'm not hungry. Now, Fred says you have to have a sensible diet. You and I and Fred were kids together. Hmm? That's right. You're sorry you didn't marry Fred? Oh, Fred never asked me. Well, that's a reply that raises more questions than it answers. Would you have married Fred? I married you. Because he never asked you. 
Well, suppose he had asked you. But he didn't. What would your answer have been? How do I know what my answer would have been? How do I know what I might have been feeling or thinking or dreaming about at that exact moment? Uh, Is it too much to expect a simple answer? Are you suspecting Fred and me of having an affair? Oh, I never said that. Then what is the purpose of this inquisition? I only asked you a very simple question. No, you asked a very complicated question, a loaded question. A question no man should ever ask of his wife and no wife should ever ask of her husband. Why not? When you asked if I was sorry I didn't marry Fred... What you really meant was... Was I sorry I married you? Are you? Yes. Well, there are times I'm sorry. Just as there are times when you're sorry you married me. Well, isn't it that way with many married people? With all honest married people? Now, why don't you have your breakfast and go to your office? Oh, yes. Yes, so I did. Yes, I have him come in. Yeah, you uh, want to see me, Mr. Jones? Ah, uh, yes, yes, so I did uh, have a chair. It's up here now, a uh, cigarette? No, no, thank you. No, yes, yeah, that's right. You don't smoke. Hey, how's your golf? Well, I have good days and I have bad days. <laughs> it's only all. How's Gresham? Just fine. I heard you were a bit under the weather a few days ago. Oh, it's nothing serious. Well, I certainly hope so. You'll have to fire five men. I what? Unless you rather I did it. Fire five men? I can't cover the territory now. Well, you know the rule. We pay 5% for sales and our sales volume is down, so we adjust. Well, I'll tell you why our sales volume is down. We took the quality out of the product. Uh, what we did was to invest a certain amount of manufacturing money in promotion. What we did was try to fool the public. And unfortunately, we failed. Ah, and who pays for it? Not the big wheels whose stupidity is responsible, but five little guys. Well, the world was ever to us. Don't you understand you're going to need these guys? We'll have to make more calls on dealers just to put out more fires. Just give me five names. How can I run my department? I'm shorthanded now. I was told to effectuate a savings of $75,000. But you can't do it. You can't destroy the sales department. This company will go out of business. Harold, you are becoming a fanatic. Whatever you want to call me, I built up the best sales force in the industry. Unfortunately, our volume doesn't support that statement. If every other department put out the way we do. All right. Now, you've made your statement. Fanatics usually become bores, and that's, that's, that's where we are now. Can you give me the list? The names, please. You want to fire five men? I'll give you one name, and that's all. You can start with Harold Kenneth Starbright. Well, thank you, Harold. I was hoping you'd do that. Sir? I, uh... I I beg your pardon? No. What? Are you, uh... Are you all right? Am I all right? I, um, I was walking along the park here with my little boy, and I noticed you standing here, standing very still, and just staring, you know, just staring. Is, uh, that what I was doing? Yes, and I couldn't imagine. But, sir, you, you do look very pale. Uh... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Are you sure? Yes. You're very kind. Well, if you're sure you're all right, I... Uh, just a minute, ma'am. Hmm? I, I, I wonder if you could do something for me. If I can. This tombstone right over here. Yes? Would you read what's written on it? Would I read... Um, all right. It reads... Harold K... Starbright, born July 1st, 1937. Yes. And, um, died March 15th, 1978. You're positive? That's what it says. Yes, sure, that's, that's what it says. Well, doesn't something strike you as a bit strange? 
No, I... I don't think so. That date, March 15th, 1978. Well, what about it? It hasn't happened yet. Oh. It won't be March 15th, 1978 for more than a year. Um, uh, please, I- excuse me. Junior, come along now. Now, hurry, and don't stop the gun. That's, uh... That's what Fred told me would happen, and he's right. Every time I have a tense situation with Jones, I'll see my tombstone. And that's what it is. That's all it is. I'm not going to panic. I, I'm just not going to panic. Whether he does or not is something you will find out a little bit later. Now, a loose end. Remember the gentleman Harold encountered at the beginning of our story? The one who called his attention to the tombstone in the first place? At the end of Act One, I said I would tell you more about him in Act Two. Well, I just didn't get the chance, that's all. But we will definitely hear from him again in Act Three, which I shall bring you in just a few moments. Today, Bensonville, Kentucky died, wiped out by a devastating plague that breaks down immunity to any disease. What's happening to me? Tomorrow, it will be breached in Minnesota, then San Salino, California, and only the deadly Messiah knows why. Please, help! The deadly Messiah from Avon Paperbacks. The one novel you will read this year as though your life depended on it. And maybe, just maybe, it does. Help! is believing. But what is seeing? No two pair of eyes ever see the exact same image. In the first place, we see what we want to see. And in the second, we can only see what we can physically register on our own more or less imperfect eyesight. The situation, as you can appreciate, is thus fraught with possibilities. How bad was it with Jones? It was the maximum. The ultimate. I'm out. Mm. I'm sorry. I had to leave. The place was destroying me. Made me doubt my wife. And my best friend. Made me believe my life was finished. It's not, Harold. Of course not. I can find a better job tomorrow. (laughs) That's the way to talk. Now, I'm sure if you go back to the cemetery now, you won't see the tombstone either. Well, I might. I'm getting better, but... I'm not really recovered from the shock of it yet. Well, the inhuman pressure is off you now. Now, all you have to do is just live sensibly. And don't let your next job become all-consuming. Oh, no, 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 I won't. I learned my lesson. Is the music bothering you, dear? No. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, why do you ask? Well, you seem to have such a pained expression on your face. Is something wrong? I was thinking, Gretchen. I might have been a bit hasty in leaving the job. I've been idle the past three months. Well, it takes time. It shouldn't take this much time. Damn, that Jones, he ruined me. Now, Harold. He made me quit. He got me mad, and he made me quit. You're not supposed to get excited. I let Jones ease me out of the best company in the industry. Well, you do just as well elsewhere. There isn't any elsewhere. And it's, 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 it's Fred's fault. If you lost your temper with Jones and quit, why is that Fred's fault? Because Fred steamed me up. Steamed you up? Fred was trying to calm you down. Well, it amounts to the same thing. Doctors. Take it easy. Oh, Harold. Just didn't understand the nature of competitive business. He can sit back and wisely shake his head. Relax. Does he know the jungle many of us live in? Oh, Harold, you're exciting yourself, and it's Does not... Fred relax? He works day and night himself. He's out to make the very last buck now, possible. Now, darling, please. Here. Here, swallow this. Huh? And, and you'll feel better. Here, come on. There. I wouldn't mind if I were killed by a tiger. But to get it from Jones. He's nothing but a hyena. Don't work against this pill. Just 
Relax. I tell you... You'll feel much better. Oh, I've, I've got to get another job soon. Oh, it isn't as if we were starving. we got to be doing something. Of course. Uh, you know, I feel sleepy. Mm. Is that what the pill's supposed to do? Oh, it's just supposed to ease the tension. <laughs> it's doing a great job. <laughs> Would you like to take a little nap? Middle of the day? Mm-hmm. I never did that in my life. Oh, it's a wonderful idea. Well, what do you do? Oh, I'll go to a movie. I'll be back in time for dinner. Sure you don't mind? Of course not, silly. Now, you just get some rest. I think I'll just stretch out here. Oh, God. Harold. Hmm? What? See you in ten minutes. Uh, uh, who was, uh, uh, all right, all right, all right, I'm coming. Uh, uh, oh, 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 the mailman. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Starbright. Uh, is Terry off today? Terry? What do you mean, Terry? Well, Terry... Terry Brzezinski, he's the regular man. <laughs> You're a great kidder, Mr. Starbright. What are you talking about? Who are you? Well, you know who I am. I'm Joe Cronin. I'm the regular man on this route. I've never seen you before in my life. <laughs> Mr. Starbright, you okay? You, uh, you say your name is Joe Cronin? You sure you're okay? Look, uh... Uh, c come inside for a minute. Well, uh, I, I got to do my round. No, just for a minute. Oh, please, uh, sit down. Uh, now, uh, how long have you been the regular man? Well, it's got to be uh, six months now. You've been the regular man for six months, you say? Sure. I've been bringing the mail every day. It's been exactly six months today. I guess I'm dreaming. You don't look so uh, good, Mr. Starbright. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are you wearing that heavy overcoat? Well, because I don't want to freeze to death. Well, how can you freeze to death in the middle of August? August? Hey, Mr. Starbright, what are you talking about? It's February the 5th. There's four feet of snow on the ground. That's impossible. Impossible? Take a look out the window. Uh, it's winter. Winter. What made you talk about Terry all of a sudden? He's, he's been dead for six months. Terry died six months ago? But he delivered my mail only yesterday. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Sometimes you get up from a nap, you, you kind of forget where you are. Look, uh, look I got to be moving. I, I'm late. Oh, I got this letter for you from Kohler's. Uh, I'm not expecting anything from Kohler's. Well, your name's on it. It's impossible. From Kohler's? Well, maybe you did and you forgot. Now, uh, we'll wait another few seconds, please. Yeah, what's this? It says... Dear Mr. Starbright, the revolver you ordered is ready. But I never... There's got to be some mistake. But the letter is addressed to you. Mr. Harold K. Starbright, 18 Oriole Drive. He asked, but I... Well, it's, it's, it's a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> well, i got to be getting on there. You... Wait a minute. The date, the date on the letter, February 4th. Yeah, that's yesterday. Yeah, but today is August 5th. I must have wakened you out of a real sound snooze. Yeah, I, I'm that way myself sometimes. Yeah, but today is August 5th. August? With snow on the ground? I don't care what anyone says. It's August 1976. Yeah. Well, don't bet any money. You'd lose. It's February 1977. 
Well, then... Then I must be dreaming. Well, like I've been telling you... Oh, I'll see you around. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Don't go yet, please. I, I'm 45 minutes behind schedule. Yeah, but I... I, I just, Look, uh, I'm sure you'll be feeling better tomorrow. Come back. Come, come back. Really? February? It can't be. Of course it isn't. Green trees, lush grass. It's the middle of summer. It was a dream. A dream? No. No, it wasn't a dream. I know it wasn't a dream. Was it like the tombstone? A glimpse of the future? Hungry, Gretchen. Uh, what day is this? Thursday. No, I mean the date. August 6th. You sure? Uh, that looks like the mailman coming up the walk. You can ask him. Yesterday afternoon, I dreamed it was next February, and we had a new mailman. Old Terry Brzezinski had died. <laughs> it's nonsense. Terry Brzezinski's going to live forever. I'll get it. Oh. Good morning, uh, Mrs. Starbright. Yes, that's right. I'm the new mailman. Oh, did something happen to Terry? Yeah. He was killed in an accident last night. What? Oh. Oh, I'm terribly sorry to hear that. Yeah. Oh. Well, I'm the new guy. Uh, my name is... Your name is Joe Cronin. Oh. <laughs> hey, how did you know? I saw you yesterday. Me? I wasn't here yesterday. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Starbright. Yeah, pleased to meet you. We've already met. We had a long talk. We did? Maybe I ought to say we're going to have a long talk one day six months from now. Oh, yeah. Well, sure. <laughs> I hope so. Well, I'll see you folks tomorrow. Why did you talk that way? Is there any mail for me? No. Is there any mail for you? Oh, just a postcard from Fred. Hmm. They're in Paris. Why does he write it to you and not to us? Because he knows how bored you are with wish you were here postcards. Why did you talk so, so spooky to that poor old mailman? Because, because... Because? <sighs> you wouldn't believe it. make a sound, honey. Not a sound. But you sure we should be doing this? Mm -hmm. After all, Harold. Oh, shut the door. Harold, what does Harold know? Oh, can you hear us? <laughs> Good old Harold's fast asleep. Those pills you give him should do the trick. How much longer is old Harold going to last, Fred, honey? Well, not mm -hmm. too much longer. Well, suppose they do an autopsy. Won't they find, you know... Darling, I'm his doctor. I'll sign the death certificate. Who's going to find anything? <laughs> oh, you think of everything. Come on, give Gretchen a little kiss. Well, first, give Freddy a little drink. Oh, I don't know what we have in the house. I do. <gasps> then I give each of you a little shot. Oh, Harold! Yeah, Harold! Harold, please don't! I, I didn't mean... She made me... You... Morning, officer. Morning, sir. Great day, huh? Oh, yes. Ah, I see there's a new tombstone. Is there? No, I don't count them. Excellently crafted stone. Work of art. Harold K. Starbright. Born July the 1st, 1937. Died... March 15th, 1978. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He's the guy that was involved in those murders. 
Murders? Yes. It was in the papers. He's been in the dumps ever since he lost his job. He must be over a year. So one day he goes out and kills his ex-boss. And then he comes home and shoots his wife and her boyfriend. It's a tragic thing. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Never did stand trial, though. He was dying of some kind of uh, uh, disease. Nobody could figure out just what, but it, it, it killed him. Mm-hmm. It's just as well, I suppose. Well, you're right about the stone. I never did notice, notice this kind of thing before, but it's a beauty. Yes. But the one just over here to the left of it, that's even prettier. Hey. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah. Isn't it magnificent? It sure is. It says, Philip... Richard Maltby, born November 23rd, 1940, died... Hey, that's my name. That's my birthday. Well, it's probably a coincidence. <laughs> died August 30, 1980. Now, how can that be? August 30, 1980. It's almost two years from now. That's... That's my tombstone. Officer. Officer, are you all right? That's my tombstone. I told you we'd hear from that gentleman again. And uh, perhaps I've been able to perform a most uh, vital service for all of you. Should you ever find yourself in a cemetery for any reason other than the ultimate... And a gentleman offers to show you some excellent examples of sculpture. Avoid him at all costs. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs>